just a moment, Suspense with Edward G. Robinson. Boy, have I got the hic- hiccups. <laughs> I'll say you have. And the way you're sputtering, you sound like a car that needs a set of new auto lights box. No, Hap, it isn't funny. Billy, <laughs> have you tried drinking a glass of water while you hold your breath? Mom, I'm so full of water now, I feel hic- I feel like an auto light stay full battery. You men never take anything seriously. Maybe what Billy needs is a hiccup. <laughs> uh, I mean a checkup at an auto light ignition service station. It might help if I could get my mind on something else. Say, I know what'll make you forget those hiccups and give you a bunch of thrills to boot. A switch to auto light, Mary. It's time for suspense. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Edward G. Robinson in Anton Leder's production of The Man Who Wanted to Be Edward G. Robinson. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I, I, I'm making this statement in accordance with a promise to a very dear friend. It's a complete statement in every detail, even including those matters which are to me personally most incriminating. Because my trust in my friend is such that I haven't the slightest concern on that score, or any other. Uh, uh, what follows concerns primarily two persons. Myself, Homer J. Hubbard, and my wife... Ada Samsey Hubbard. Um, Even when I was courting Ada, I was aware that hers was a strong and domineering personality, to say the least. And after we were married, well, at first I put up with Ada's constant nagging and petty persecutions as best I could. I put up with them for 20 long years. It wasn't until a memorable evening a little over a year ago that the first dim outlines of an escape and... Finally, a plan began to take shape in my mind. You see, I I never was much of a one for movies, but uh, Ada and I had gone to see a picture called uh, Little Caesar. It was a reissue, I think they call it, uh, with an actor in it whom I'd never even heard of before. Oh, so you thought you rat on me, huh? Well, get this. Nobody rats on Little Caesar, see? moment I saw that face on the screen, the minute I heard that voice, the world of reality around me simply ceased to exist. I lived that picture. I was Little Caesar. I was Edward G. Robinson. I was dimly conscious that my voice was like his, that even my face without my spectacles and with my hair parted differently might have been mistaken for his, but it was more than that. It was his personality that fascinated me, and that I assumed. Calm, assured. A tough, a kind of a man who made people do what he wanted done the way he wanted it done. Uh, walking out of the movie theater afterward, I knew something had happened that was going to change my whole life. Well, there's a man. Yes. Well, Caesar, they call him, mm-hmm. and well, they may. Yes. And that Edward G. Robinson, I'll wager he's no Casper Milk Toast either. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> Is that all you have to say? Well, Yes, uh... dear. Hmm. What does it take to arouse a little enthusiasm in you, anyway? Well, Ada, Here you've seen a fine performance. A yeah. picture that'd get anybody in the world excited. That's and right. all you can say is, yes, dear. Mm-hmm. I wish you were half the man that Robinson is. Mm-hmm. But from that moment, I no longer really cared what Ada wished or thought. I'd begun my escape into a dream world of my own making. A world in which I was Edward G. Robinson. As the weeks went by, I began to identify myself with him more and more. I imagined myself in countless dangerous situations, and when no one was looking, I imitated him and I affected his mannerisms. I would start daydreaming at my desk, wondering what the other people in the office would think if I suddenly exposed this hidden side of my personality. 
Okay, everybody. Uh, stay where you are. Will you? Hold, hold your hands over your head. What is this? I don't want any monkey business, see? Now stand back there, Ryan. Why? Any funny stuff from you, and I'll let you have it. Oh, but this is preposterous. What do you mean by such behavior? Is this your idea of a I joke? You'll see whether it's a joke or not if you make one false move. Now, this isn't a water pistol I'm holding here, you know. Oh, but you're fired. Leave this office immediately. Well, I'm getting out, all right, but I'm not fired, see? I'm leaving well here. That's where you come in, Mr. Ryan. Oh, please, please, Hubbard, be reasonable. Now, shut up and do what I tell you. <coughs> Keep your hands up in the air, will you? Walk over to that safe. Well, I... Open it up. Get all the money out of it and put it right here on the desk but in front of me. I, I... I get moving. <coughs> I don't want to have any trouble with you, Ryan. I'm going to count three, and if you're not moving when I finish, you'll never move again, see? One. Two. Hubbard. Huh? What are you doing daydreaming? Oh. You better get busy, or I should be forced to report you to Mr. Pemberton again. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Mr. Ryan. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I can't understand what could have come over me. Well, that's the way it went. At the office, walking down the street, riding home on the bus. My life outwardly calm and well-ordered, possibly even dull. It was actually 24 hours of harrowing adventure, with myself as the central figure. I saw every Edward G. Robinson picture that came out. It was the day after seeing Key Largo for the third time that Ada finally caught me. I was lathering my face and talking to myself. Uh, okay, you rat, you asked for it. You don't come out, see? We're coming in and get you, see? And uh, we're coming in shooting, see? What's that? Oh, yeah? Well, only a dirty yellow rat would say that. Okay, boys, let him have it. Well, I never. Of all the oh. four performances I ever heard oh. of, this beats everything. Yeah. What in the world are you jabbering about in here? Oh, uh, well, uh, it's really nothing, dear Ada. I, I, I was just sort of trying to imitate Edward G. Robinson. <laughs> you were... what? <laughs> <laughs> Edward G. Robinson? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's rich. You trying to imitate Edward G. Robinson? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't stand it. Oh. Don't stop. Don't let me interrupt the performance, Mr. Movie Star. Come on. Come on. Do your act for me. Well, well, dear, I, I, I don't see anything so funny about it. Oh, maybe you don't, but you're the only person in the world who wants to. Oh, oh, my. Oh, well, I'll leave you to your rehearsing. Why don't you imitate any Bracken or Margaret O'Brien? I think you'd find it easier. <laughs> it was right then that I decided to kill her. <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Edward G. Robinson in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Mary, looks like Billy's all over those hiccups thanks to Edward G. Robinson and Suspense. Shh, don't uh, mention hiccups again. He might get them back. Oh. Let's switch his mind to something else. Well, uh... You know how he is about anything Autolite makes. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to Frank Martin. That'll do the trick. Friends, money can't buy better electrical equipment for your car than Autolite. And here's why. In the first place, Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Original factory equipment for many of the finest cars and trucks in America. In its 26 nationwide plants... Autolite manufactures distributors, generators, starting motors, spark plugs, batteries, wire, not to mention such things as bumpers, die castings, horns, instruments and gauges, lights, ornamental plastics, and over 400 other products. What's more, Autolite service stations all over the country are staffed with trained men and specialized machines to give your car the best possible electrical service. So friends, when your car's electrical equipment needs attention, Drive into your nearest Autolite service station or the dealer who sells your make of car and ask for original factory parts and service. Remember, Autolite service stations are listed in your classified telephone directory under Automotive Electrical Equipment. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Mr. Edward G. Robinson in The Man Who Wanted to Be. Edward G. Robinson, 
A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I, uh, I might have decided to have mercy on her if she'd only let me alone. But Ada could never leave anyone alone. She ridiculed me at home and in front of our friends. Sometimes she'd let a few weeks go by without saying anything, and I would think that perhaps she had forgotten. No, Ada never forgot. She would wait until we were in a group of people, and then she would come out with it. Why, my dear, you mean I haven't told you? About Homer's dream world? Uh, no. He thinks he's Edward G. Robinson. Edward? Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Do tell us, Mr. Homer G. Robinson. When do you think you'll be getting your next contract from Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you folks have got Homer all wrong. He's a killer at heart. Oh. Just a cold-blooded killer. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy a gun. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what kind of a gun? Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know much about guns, but it, that one looks all right. Oh, yes, yes. It's a nice little gun. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> Twenty-eight fifty. Mm -hmm. uh, do I uh, have to have a license? Oh, not unless you're going to carry it on your person. Oh. Uh, otherwise, we just register it for the police records under your name. Oh, yeah. What's the name? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson. I... I, I, I beg your pardon. You heard me, Mug. Edward G. Robinson. See? I had made my plans uh, very carefully. My plan was that uh, her murder would look like suicide. It would be a night when the moon was full, so that I could see a head on the pillow and aim carefully. I would fire the shot through the temple, quickly wipe my fingerprints from the handle of the gun, and then push it into her hand. And as the shocked and bereaved husband, I would call Dr. Wallace. The police wouldn't come until later, and when they did, I would be ready for them. I was so busy laying my plans that I hadn't been reading the papers and had to be told the big news. Homer? Hmm? Oh, I beg your pardon. Mr. Robinson. Oh, please. <laughs> Would you mind passing the spinach? Yeah. That is, if you're not too preoccupied with planning your next murder. Oh, please, please, Ada. <laughs> yeah, held up any banks lately, Homer? <laughs> uh, here, here you are, dear. <laughs> oh, say, that reminds me, all kidding aside. Did you know that he's going to be here next week? Who? Edward G. Robinson. What? He's going to address the hobbyist convention. Oh, is that so? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I'd like to hear him. I would, too. Oh, I'd love to see what a real He-Man is like. Not just a poor imitation. We went. And at first, it was the most terrible disappointment of my life because he wasn't tough or hard-boiled or anything like it. He seemed to be a mild-mannered little fellow, a little shy, <laughs> almost like me. And he talked about orchids and modern art. They were his hobbies, he said, raising orchids and collecting paintings, modern paintings. <laughs> yes, but the, as the lecture went on, <laughs> I began to understand. <laughs> By the time it was over, I, I knew. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, I consider myself twice blessed. Every man is blessed who has a hobby, but I am among the fortunate few who have two hobbies. And as the fellow said, whose fiancée had a twin sister, I love them both. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Later that evening, I made an excuse to get away from Ada and went down to the hotel where I knew Mr. Robinson was staying. I bribed the bellboy, $1.75, to tell me which was his room. I went down the hall and knocked at the door of 708. Yeah? The Western Union. Come on in. Just put it on the... Well, say, Western Union dresses their boys up pretty snappy in this town, don't they? <laughs> I, I, I must... Uh... I apologize for adopting the subterfuge, Mr. Robinson, but I have something of the utmost importance to discuss with you, and I was afraid you might not see me since, well, we've never been formally in introduced. 
<laughs> Formally introduced. Why, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> what is it, uh, autograph? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's, it, it's something a good deal more serious than that, Mr. Robinson. Yeah? Well, you caught me right in the middle of shaving, as you see, but if you don't mind my finishing the job while you talk, why, uh, come right along inside. Tell me all about it. Thank you. Well, now, <clears throat> what's on your mind? Well, uh, Mr. Robinson, I have a problem, and I feel you are the person best fitted in the world to tell me what to do. That's so? Well, uh, what is the problem? Well, uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, uh, suppose... Of course, this is purely hypothetical. Uh, but suppose you were going to kill somebody. Kill somebody? Yes, in, 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 in your own home, somebody who is, uh, shall we say, related to you. Yeah, now, hold on a minute, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hubbard. Homer J. Hubbard. Uh, Mr. Hubbard, I may look like a bad guy on the screen, but when I'm not working, I'm just a plain, peace-loving citizen like anybody else. <laughs> oh, 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 oh you, 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 you can fool people like that audience tonight with all that talk about orchids and modern art. And it, it was very good, and I quite understand why you do it. A man in your position uh, must have a, a, a front, of course, but <laughs> you didn't fool me. I didn't, huh? Well, I, I know, uh, rather, I, I knew I, I could come to you and be perfectly frank. Yeah, about what? Why, uh, about the murder. About the what? Look at me, Mr. Robinson. I'm a shy, inhibited, weak, utterly ineffectual person. I have none of your assurance, your hardness, your ability to cope with any situation in a direct, ruthless way. Yeah? Well, uh, uh, how many times I, I wished I had, because for 20 years my life has been made horribly, unbearably miserable by one person, my wife. Oh, so that's the way it is. Yes. For years, I bore it as best I could. And then one day I thought, how would you have coped with it? And of course, I knew at once, you would kill her. Here, now, wait a minute. Are you kidding me? Oh, oh no, no, Mr. Robinson. I, I wouldn't think of such a thing. Look, look here. I, I even secured a gun to do it with. Hmm? Hey, yeah, here, you better give me that. No, no, don't point it. Well, hand it to me by the barrel. Here. Well, put it over here. <laughs> Safer, you know. Yeah, I, I must admit I, I, I know very little about firearms, and they're, they're quite distasteful to me. Yes, you and me both. You, Mr. Robinson? Well, I mean, uh, uh, small arms like that. Of course, uh, Tommy gun, that's different. That's the only thing to use. Yeah, I suppose you're right. But I, I didn't know where to get a Tommy gun. <laughs> I was afraid even if I did, I'd never master the art of using it. Yeah, well, uh, now you want to kill your wife, is that it? You want me to help you? If you would, Mr. Robinson, if you could spare the time, I, I can't tell you how grateful I'd be. Yeah, well, you know, Mr. Hubbard, you, uh, well, you look like a pretty nice little guy, uh, why, it must really be an old battle axe to have got you in a frame of mind like this. All right, now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will help you. Oh, Mr. Robinson. Yes, but uh, it's got to be done my way, see? It's uh, got to be done right. You've got to plan these things. Yeah, now, uh, take this gat, this little flea, for instance, that you got over there. That's no kind of a rod to kill your wife with. Why, the uh, uh, caliber is all wrong. The uh, ballistics would be all wrong. Dicks would be on your trail just like that. Now, I uh, got a gat home that's perfect for the job, get me? I've knocked off Orson Welles, Jimmy Cag. Oh, I don't know how many guys with this. Now, the uh, first thing when I get home, I'll send it to you, Parcel Post, see? Would you, Mr. Robinson? Oh, sure, sure. Now, when you get it, just lay low, see? Now, don't do a thing till you hear from me. I'll lay this thing out for some of my boys, and then I'll get in touch with you, okay? Oh, yes, Mr. Robinson. I don't know how to thank you. Ah, forget it, pal. What's a little moiter between friends? I could, I could scarcely maintain my composure in the two days that followed. The second day, sure enough, the gun arrived. It was a, a great, heavy thing, the kind that's referred to, I think, uh, as an automatic. Remembering its history, I handled it with the utmost care and reverence. I hid it in the garage where I keep my pipe that... Peter won't let me smoke in the house. 
was the next afternoon, a Saturday, that the phone rang. I rushed into the bedroom to answer it and close the door after me so Ada wouldn't hear in case it was. Hello, Homer. Yes? Uh, this is Eddie. Eddie? Yeah, yeah, you know, Eddie Robinson. Oh, yes, yes, Miss... Uh, uh, Eddie. Uh, you get that uh, package I sent you? Oh, oh yes, yes, I, I got it. Okay, but uh, don't fool around with it, will you, until the time comes. Kind of tricky. Oh, no, 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 I won't. Now, uh, listen. The uh, deadline is tomorrow night. Midnight, got it? Yes. Now, here's the layout. Tomorrow night, you go to bed, just as always, but uh, have that cat handy and leave the front door open, see? I, I, I understand. Oh, uh, say, uh... Wait a minute, I meant to ask you, is it uh, safe to talk where you are? Oh, yes, yes, the phone's in, in the bedroom and the door's closed. In the bedroom, huh? That's uh, swell. Well, now, uh, listen, uh, a little before midnight, you get up, see? When she's asleep, you uh, take a spot just outside the bedroom door, see? Where you can keep an eye on her and on the front door, too, see? Yes. Well, at uh, midnight, I'll contact you. We'll do your job, and then make a quick getaway, and you can hold up in the hide until the heat's off. Get it? Tomorrow night, midnight. Uh, I'll do everything just as you say, Eddie. I followed his instructions to the letter. Oh, it seemed hours before Ada went to sleep that night. It seemed days until my watch finally crept around towards midnight. But at last, the time had come. I crept out of bed, got the gun out of my coat pocket, and took my position on the landing outside the bedroom door, door as he had told me to. And then suddenly, suddenly the phone rang. The plan was ruined. Even Edward G. Robinson couldn't have foreseen this. I, I rushed back into the bedroom, hoping against hope that I could catch it before Ada woke up. But she already had the light on. Homer! What in the world are you doing prowling around at this time of night oh. with a gun in your hand? Why, I, I, I thought I heard a burglar. Burglar? Mm. When I've answered this phone, I want to talk to you, Homer Jeremiah Hubbard. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yes. What? Hmm? Oh. What? Homer, there is a burglar. Is there? Someone just saw him trying to get into the house. Oh, uh, uh, are you sure? Of course I am. A man just phoned that he saw the burglar. Well, don't just stand there. Yeah, no. You've got a gun. Go on yeah. down and stop him. Yes, but, but Ada... Go on. Do you want us to be killed in our beds? No. Go on, I say. Oh, wait. Why do you have to spoil everything? There was nothing to do but go. I crept down the stairs in the darkness... I knew what Edward G. Robinson would have done. He would have gone down and captured the burglar without the slightest trouble and turned him over to the police after giving him the beating he deserved. But somehow I, I didn't feel much like Edward G. Robinson just then. It was at that moment that the terrible thought occurred to me that maybe it wasn't a burglar. Maybe this was Edward G. Robinson. I had no time to pursue the thought further. Let him but, have it! Uh, uh, Suddenly, suddenly, there was a barrage of shots and a confused yelling of voices. In my terror, I suppose I must have squeezed the trigger of my own gun. Because it began jumping and pushing in my hand. I tripped on something and the next thing I knew, I was tumbling headlong down the stairs. And that was the last I remember. When I woke up, Ada was holding my head in her arms. And she was crying. They made me stay in bed for a couple of days, but uh, I really didn't mind. There were reporters to see me and take my picture for the paper, and all kinds of people. <laughs> Even Mr. Ryan and Mr. Pemberton came to see me, and Ada? Well, Ada was simply a changed person. Nothing was too good for me. My slightest wish was literally her command. If the whole thing hadn't been an accident, if I'd planned it that way, it, it couldn't have turned out better. And then... Then as the final climax that afternoon when the phone rang by my bed. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, Eddie? You did, you did, huh? Oh, nothing, nothing, really. Yes? Oh. Well, uh, um, about that, uh, 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 things have changed. Oh, yes, they, they've changed quite a lot. Uh, I don't think we'll have to uh, go through with it. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, she's right here. Just a minute. Eddie wants to talk to you, Ada. Eddie? Yeah, Eddie Robinson. Quite a pal of mine. <laughs> you mean Edward G. Robinson? Oh, yes. He, we uh, had uh, quite a little chat that night. He was in town uh, after I let you. He got pretty chummy. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, hello? Hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, Mr. Robinson. Oh, I know he is. Oh, I certainly will, Mr. Robinson. Yes, yes, I know I'm very lucky. <sighs> All right, Mr. Robinson. Goodbye. Oh, Homer, mm. he knew all about it. He'd seen it in the papers. Yeah, so he said. <laughs> and he said you were a hero. Mm. A real hero. Bigger than any movie hero that ever was. He did, huh? <laughs> oh, Homer. Well, if Eddie Robinson says I'm a hero, uh, well, I guess maybe I am. <laughs> Couldn't have turned out better, Eddie. You know how grateful I am. I'm a regular little Caesar around town now, and my married life is all I've ever wanted to be. Of course, there are some things about the whole thing that confuse me a little. It has even occurred to me, I'll, I'll confess, that you might have had a, more of a hand in it than was generally known, and that the gun you sent me might have contained blanks, I, I believe you called them, because in spite of all the shooting, there wasn't one bullet hole anywhere in the house. And the gun had disappeared, which confused the police on what, too, and... The burglars might have been some of your boys playing a little joke. But I don't think you would do a thing like that to a pal, Eddie. Would you? I don't even think you would use the statement that you asked me to send you to hold over my head as a guarantee that I wouldn't try to kill Eddie again. Now, not, not that I ever would. Yes, but even if you did all that, Eddie, I don't really mind. Because as you might say yourself, what's a little joke between pals? <laughs> Thank you, Edward G. Robinson, for a splendid performance. Mr. Robinson will return in just a moment. My, that was a wonderful performance, wasn't it, Hap? Sure was. Oh, oh say, Billy, uh, how are the hiccups? Oh, God, Dad. I think I lost them during Mr. Martin's last Autolite commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Well, I guess it's time to... Oh, my gosh. Now I've got them. Mary, turn up Frank Martin again, quick. Autolite original factory parts and Autolite service stations work as a team to help you maintain carefree, economical performance for your car. So friends, when your car's electrical system needs attention, drive into your nearest Autolite service station or the dealer who sells your make of car and ask for original factory parts and Autolite service. Money can't buy better electrical equipment than Autolite. And remember, Autolite means spark plug. Ignition engineered spark plug. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Mr. Edward G. Robinson. It's been fun appearing in our suspense story tonight, but uh, just so nobody gets the wrong idea, it was only a story. I'm not really so tough. Only get this. I'm telling you, see, you better listen to suspense next week, see? Because uh, Ray Milan <laughs> will be here in a story called Night Cry by William L. Stewart. Another gripping study in... Suspense. Edward G. Robinson may soon be seen in the Paramount production, Night Has a Thousand Eyes. Tonight's suspense play was written by Leslie Raditz, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as William Powell, Lucille Ball, John Garfield, Sidney Greenstreet, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Ray Milland in Night Cry. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive as if your life depends on it. It does. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Edward G. Robinson in You Can't Die Twice. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, if a camel got a drink of water only three times a year, his tongue would hang out like a Christmas necktie. But an Autolite Stay Full battery thrives on three drinks a year. Yes, sir, an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And by Cornelius, an Autolite Stay Full battery has extra plates for extra, extra power. Protected by fiberglass insulation for stronger, longer life. Why, in recent tests conducted according to the Society of Automotive Engineers' Life Cycle Standards, Autolite Stay-Full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without the Stay-Full features. So remember, be battery right. Get Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Edward G. Robinson in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yeah. It's funny how it happened. Take a good look at me. Am I the type you'd say could harm a fly? Ask around my neighborhood or ask any of my old customers. Sam, they tell you... Sam Brown? Why, he wouldn't say boo. Sam Brown a murderer? (laughs) Besides, there must be some mistake somewhere. Uh, Sam's dead a whole year now. So that's what I want to explain, how it all happened. It all began that Sunday morning at home with my wife, Katie. Poor Katie. An April fool. Today is April fool, isn't it, Sam? Yeah, I guess it is, Katie. Why? Why? Because we'll have to expect a lot of silly tricks today, that's why, from your so-called friends. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I guess we'll have to be on our guard, huh? (laughs) You're talking. After the way you fell for that April fool's joke last year. (laughs) Yeah, some letdown, all right. When I learned it was all a practical joke and I hadn't won 50000 in the Irish sweepstake. Hey, you, you sure took it to heart, too. Oh, why not? Will I ever in my life even see money like that? Oh, Katie, please. Will you ever make it from your miserable milk route, will you? Oh, I'm sorry I even mentioned it. You were going to give me so much. You were going to get places. Throw a million at my feet. A million what? Empty milk bottles? Well, so I didn't get the brakes. Now, what do you want me to do, Katie? Rob a bank? Murder someone? Please let me alone, will you? I want to hear... Turn that off and listen to me. Murder somebody, he says. Being poor is murdering me. I'm fed up, I tell you. Look up to here. Oh, Katie, please. No, Katie, me. What's the matter? So early in the morning. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Catherine Brown? Yes. You're the wife of Samuel E. Brown of 22 Maple Street? Yes. I'm sorry to have to inform you that your husband uh, has been killed, Mrs. Brown. What's that? His body was found just a few hours ago in a ditch on the Clinton Turnpike. Killed by a hit-and-run driver, Mrs. Brown. Ha, ha, ha. What is this? Somebody's idea of an April Fool gag? Now cut it out. Well, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Brown, but this is not an April Fool gag. I wish it was for your sake. Please call it the county morgue, will you? What? Well, you'll have to identify the the remains. It's almost beyond recognition. But there's a wallet, Mrs. Brown. Okay, That's all we have to go on. L- listen, you. You think a joke like this is funny? You ought to have your head examined. Who is this? Police Sergeant Ryan, ma'am. Third precinct. Go on, you crazy dope. Mrs. Brown. Please be at the morgue as soon as you can. That is, if you want to claim your husband's body. Hey, what was it? Some gag? Of course it was a gag. Well, you're right here. Probably that Joe Brody again with his April Fool jokes. He'll get a piece of my mind, believe you me. Four firemen, however, Must you listen to that radio? Oh, Katie, my one day off a week. Let me live, please. The body of a man tentatively identified as Samuel E. Brown... A local milk driver employed by Dessel Berry's company. What? What did you say? Shut up! The victim of a hit and run driver. Listen. The body was found in the ditch on the Clinton Turnpike, mutilated almost beyond recognition. A wallet is the sole clue as to his identity. And that winds up the 9:30 edition of the. Well, what do you know about? Did you hear that, Katie? Yeah, I did. Well, that was me, wasn't it? Me they were talking about. <laughs> That's a hot one, isn't it? Huh? Sam. That phone call just now. Yeah? I thought it was an April Fool joke. Must have been the police. Wonder how in the world... Huh? Now what? Let me... Hello? Uh, Katie? This is Harry, Katie. Gert and me, we just heard. We we were listening to the radio and you... 
You all right, Katie? You know about it? Sure, I know about it, but... Oh, that... we feel awful about it, Katie. And we're coming right over. We'll take care of everything. Uh, Harry, listen, uh, it's the all... The will go downtown with you when you're ready. I'll take care of all the paperwork. Now, excuse me for mentioning it at a time like this. I don't have to go any... What paperwork? By the insurance policy I sold Sam, remember? Remember I told you both how someday it might be... Well, little did I dream. I'm so glad I talked you both into it. 10000 with double indemnity for accidental death? That's 20000 you know. A final thought for your welfare from Sam. Harry, I, I can't... I know, I know. I know you don't want to talk about it now. Listen, Katie, we'll be right over. 10, 15 minutes. Harry! Hey, uh, Harry. Well, 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 what was that all about? Well, what do you want? Katie, I, I'm talking to you. Wait. Sam, I'm trying to think. Oh, it's impossible. You're right here. Yeah, Sam, what do they mean? Huh? They identified you by your wallet. You have it, don't you? My wallet? Your wallet! Well, naturally, right here in my pocket where I all... Not the devil. I'm wearing the same pants. It's not here. Wait a minute. I remember something now. Well, that maybe clears up this whole mystery. Yes, Ham? Well, uh, last night after the poker game, uh, coming home on the bus, there was uh, some character jostling against me. We almost had a fight on the bus. Sure, now I think of it, he must have picked my pocket. Why, Katie, it's him they must have found on the turnpike. Sure, uh, say, let me at that phone, will you? I'll call the police and straighten out this No, hall. wait. Wait, Sam. What for? Sam, maybe we ought to consider this thing a little. Consider what? Your $10,000 life insurance policy, Sam, with that double indemnity clause. What are you talking about? About our one big chance that we've been waiting for. See, well, what are you driving at? Did anybody see you coming home last night? No, I don't think so. Why? Can't you understand? There's a body lying in the morgue. The only thing they got to go by was that wallet. Say you never came home last night, Sam. Or ever again. Say I went right now huh? and identified that wallet. The insurance company would pay me $20,000, wouldn't they? Yes, I... I guess they would. Are you out of your mind? You could disappear right now. Go to Chicago, say, without being seen. I could write you general delivery. After a while, after I collect, I could join you there. Oh, no one will be the wiser. Uh, we can begin life all over. Rich! Um, this could be it, Sam. No, oh, no, no. Money gotten this way would never do us any good, Katie. For that amount of money, I'll take my chance, and uh, so will you. Katie. You'll do it, Sam. Uh, well, oh, yes, you will. K because if you let me down uh, this time, oh, it's the end. Katie, I... Uh... $20,000. 20000 $20,000. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Edward G. Robinson in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, uh, Hap, will you help me out here? Why, sure. Honey. All right. Uh, pretend you're on a quiz program, and I asked you this question. Uh -huh. What is it that needs water only three times a year? Mm, let's see. It's, uh... Is it a kangaroo? No, it's not a camel, nor a cactus. Oh. Well, can you give me a hint? All right. Goes on your car. The oh. initials are A-L-S-F-B. A-L-S-F-B. Oh, I've heard that somewhere before. It's dandy. It's dynamic. It delivers power, pep, performance. It's an Autolite Stay Full battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Hey, don't tell me. Let me think. It's, uh... Um... I can't give you any more hints, except to say it's an Autolite Stay Full battery with that extra liquid reserve. That's it. It's an Autolite Stay Full battery. Right. With Autolite, the gentleman wins a hand-embroidered Autolite Stay Full battery carrying case <laughs> and the right to drive into the nearest Autolite service station and buy an Autolite Stay Full battery. Remember, be battery right. Switch to Autolite. And now... Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Edward G. Robinson as Sam in You Can't Die Twice, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Katie always could make me jump through a hoop. Besides, I, I might as well admit it, I'm human. Show me the human can spit of that kind of money. Anyway, I snuck out of town that very day, got to Chicago, got me a crummy room under the name of Lionel Hendricks. Weeks went by and nothing happened. No news at all from Katie, and I got really frightened. Something gone wrong. I wrote her, got an answer, general delivery. Dear Mr. Robinson, I'm sorry to 
Dear Mr. Hendricks, in answer to your inquiry, everything is proceeding smoothly. I'm advised that the delay on the transaction is because of its unusual nature. No more letters, please. Thank you for your interest sincerely. More weeks passed. Another month, two, three, without a word from her. Now the police found out. Were they on my trail? And then I began to get suspicious of Katie. What was she up to? I had a phone her. Hello? Uh, this is me. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> oh, it's you, Clara. Well, I, I had to talk to you. Why haven't you written? What are you up to? Haven't you got it yet? Not yet. Well, when? In a little while, Clara. Just have a little more patience. Oh, cut out that Clara stuff. I'll be seeing you soon, dear. Oh, Katie, it's awful lonesome for me. Do you love me, Katie? Of course I do. Well, I get to wondering. It's six months now. This is crazy. I I'm a wreck. I I'm scared. I can't stand this life. I've never been away from home. I'm a family man, Katie. Hey, Katie, make it quick, will you, for Pete's sake? Who is that? What? That voice. You're imagining... I heard a man's voice. He's right there in the room with you. Now, don't deny it. I'll... I'll explain everything when I see you, Clara. I see. So you're two-timing me, huh? Well, that explains everything. I'll fix you. I'm coming home right now. If you do... You'll go to jail for about ten years. Think it over. Goodbye, Clara. Hey, you see? What could I do? Anyway, that's when I started the drink. What else was there? There I was, all mixed up and alone. I used to get good and drunk and wish someone would at least say... Hello. I said Hello. You all alone? Hmm? What's that? <laughs> you really tied one on, haven't you? Stranger in town? Oh, a stranger everywhere. How do you know? You're lonely, huh? Ah. Mm. Oh. Well, don't cry no, about I'm it. I'm not crying. You want company? Sure. <laughs> You're kind of cute. Mm. Luther! Yeah, Cleo? Rye high on the gentleman here. Coming up. Your name is Cleo, hmm? Yeah, I know. Mm. Cleo Carter. What's your name? Sam. Sam? Oh, Sam. Sam what? Oh, I mean uh, Lionel. My name is Lionel Hendricks. That's my name. Lionel Hendricks. Uh, what happened to Sam? Oh, he's dead. Dead? Yeah, dead. Poor lonesome ghost. <laughs> Nobody cared. Are you married? Uh-huh. <laughs> Where are you from, Lionel? You're not on the lamb or something, are you? Cop shy? No, nobody cared. Not even his widow. Sam's widow. <laughs> Name is Katie. Catherine, you know. Mm -hmm. Katie don't even care. Two timing him. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Change the subject. What do you do, Cleo? Ah, oh, this and that. What do you do, Lionel? Oh, that and this. <laughs> where, where are you from, Cleo? Here and there. And you? Oh, they're in here. <laughs> <laughs> we make a great team, don't we, yeah, Sam? <laughs> we sure do. Uh, here you are, Cleo. Why, hi. Thanks, hi, Luther. Uh, how about a trip up the Nile, Cleo? <laughs> Character. Uh, Luther's a comic, Sam. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, my name isn't Sam. Now, nah, Lionel is my name. Lionel Hendricks. Hey, excuse me, Lionel That's Luther, right. not Sam. Uh, I remember. Hiya, Cleo. Hey, when did you get back? I gotta pay a visit. Uh, nice to have met you. Oh, no, no, no. Where you go? Where well, you I going? Uh, oh, no, no, no. Don't leave me alone, will you? You like my company? Oh, very much. Oh, very, very, very much. <laughs> much as that. <laughs> yeah, I certainly Well, well it's, it's this way with me, Lionel. I'll yeah. be very frank. First of all, you're a married man. Oh, no, I, no, 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 no. Not me. No, no, Sam's married. Not Lionel. That's Sam Brown. You're a good fellow. All of a sudden, dead. Killed dead. <laughs> you know, all was left of him? Oh. A wallet. There's a few cents of it. Now he has $20,000. Success story. $20,000? Mm-hmm. 
He was worth more dead than alive. Uh, Lionel, let go of my hand. Look, oh. I'm trying to see your friend oh, over no. there. Yeah, but why? Percentage, Lionel. He always shows me a good time. Spends money like it was water. Mm. He's rich. See? Oh, he's rich. Well, I'm richer. Now, no, don't leave me alone, Cleo. I, I got $20,000, I tell you. Not you, Sam. Well, what's his is mine. I can lay my hands on it any time I want. You wouldn't kid me, would you, I, Mr.? Oh, I not said a word. Not a word. Oh, I think I'm going to be sick. Well, I think you better come rest at my apartment, Lionel. I really do. We can talk there. I like your talk. It jingles. <laughs> Oh, uh, what? You awake, Angel? Huh? What? Where am I? A little Cleo's, don't you remember? Just running the vacuum. All those butts you tumbled on the floor. Cleo? Cleo Carter. Took pity on you, let you sleep off a hangover on the couch here. Cleo. Are you forgotten? I remember. Guess what you need is a little drink, huh? Yeah. Well, it's on. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You know why I'm laughing? I'm surprised at myself. Why? Because I like you. I don't know when I ever felt this way before, so fast. Hmm? You said you felt the same way about me. Did you mean it, or was it that bottle talking? Yeah, I, I must have meant it, Cleo. All right, then. How does it feel to be dead, Sam Brown? What? How do you suppose Katie's taking it? Uh, uh, no, no, I, I didn't tell you. That's all right, it's all right. You told me everything, but it's safe with me. To me, Sam Brown is dead. Oh. Uh, c could I please have that drink? Mm, oh, sure. Okay. The insurance money really comes to $20,000, doesn't it? Or were you exaggerating? No, I mean, yes, it's, uh, it's 20000 Why are they taking so long to pay off? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Ten months is a very long time. Maybe they've already paid and Katie's holding out on you. No, 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 no. Katie wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, why not? Look what she's already done for the money. Well, not Katie. She wouldn't. She may have had another man she likes more than you. Oh, no, stop it, stop it. Well, you, Katie isn't like that. Look, you. Did you mean what you told me about you and me, or didn't you? Will you repeat it sober? Right now? What? Re repeat what? That you never felt about her in all your married life the way you feel about me? That you're going to leave her for me? After you get the money? Say it again, Sam, or walk right out of my life. Oh, please. I mean it. Well, I, I, I can't say that about Katie. I just can't. Get out! Uh, that's the way you feel. I'll go. Go ahead. When you leave, you might think about whether or not you can trust me now that I know all about it. What? I could call the police, you know. Oh, Cleo. <laughs> I never did know how to handle women. That was always my big trouble. Well, she, she could have called the cops, couldn't she? So I made up with her. Anyway, I had someone to talk to now. Maybe something would happen. <laughs> it did. Oh, she was smart, that Cleo. You know, Sam, it'll be good to have $10,000 all at once. Yeah, sure will. Know what would be twice as good? 20,000. <laughs> Wish for the moon, why don't you? <laughs> My share's only 10. Your share's as much as you can get. And you can get it all. Oh, no, no. Katie would never give it to me. Not all of it. The way I figure it, Sam's this. She'll come here to Chicago when she finally collects. Well, she can't afford to have you suddenly turn up alive back there, so she'll come here. When she does, we'll take it all, you and me. Oh, no, no. She, she'll never give me all of it. I know, Katie. I said we'd take it. Use your head, Sammy. Use your head. There's ways. Huh? Oh. Oh, no, Cleo, no. Well, perhaps not. But uh, get used to the idea just the same. Like breaking in a pair of shoes. Know what I mean? That's the way she worked on me, over and over again. Then she began to get impatient until... One day, you're less a day from the time I left home. What is all of this? A practical joke? Tomorrow's April 1st. You waiting to tell me, April fool? I'm calling your bluff, Sam. Come on down to a phone booth right now and call that wife of yours. Let me hear with my own ears. Hello? What do I say? Answer. Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Brown? This is uh, 
me. I've got it. I'm holding it in my hand now. I'm leaving for Chicago this afternoon. I'll be there at midnight. Get me a room at the Stevens. You'll meet her at the station information booth. Tell her! Huh? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you at the station in information booth, Katie. But why? Why? You're renting a cabin out in the country. You're taking her on a second honeymoon. Cleo. Tell her. Hello! Uh, Hello! Uh, uh, Katie, I'm, I'm uh, renting a cabin out in the country for us. We're, we're going on a second honeymoon. <laughs> Cleo, I can't go through with it. Please change your mind. I'll give you just 15 minutes. I'll be hiding in the back of the car, and if you're not out there with her and the money in 15 minutes, I'll have every cop in Chicago looking for you. I mean it, Sam. Lionel! Lionel! Darling! Uh, thank you, Mr. Gittner. Darling! Darling! Uh, <laughs> Lionel. Uh, oh, Sam. My darling Sam. <laughs> I'm so happy. Uh, hello, Katie. <laughs> uh, d- d- don't, don't, don't cry. <laughs> You're crying, too. Oh, oh, no. Damn. <laughs> we're together again. Uh, yeah. And we're rich. We're rich. Yeah. Oh, aren't you excited? Wasn't it worth waiting for? And no one suspects. I can't believe it. We have money and we're together. Uh, yeah. Here, here. Uh, let me take your bag. Yeah. It hasn't been out of my hand the whole trip. It's all in here. In hundred dollar bills. Well, no wonder it's so heavy. <laughs> Come on. Let's, let's go quick. We're really going on a second honeymoon. Oh, Sam, I could die for joy. Well, it certainly is way out in the country, Sam. Say that for it. So quiet. Yeah, I know. We're acting funny, Sam. I couldn't help it that it took so long. They said they had to investigate and everything. It was no picnic, let me tell you. Oh, the devil is that light. Oh. What is... Is this the cabin you rented for our second honeymoon? This shack? Sam, what is it? You couldn't have brought me here for a honeymoon. Why did you bring me here? Answer me, Sam. Sam. I'm leaving you, Katie. What? I'm leaving you. This is the end of our life together. But why? Yeah. Why? Uh, open the bag and get out the money. Yeah. Now you take half and I take half and we each go our way. Uh, please, quick, quick, quick. How can you do oh, that? I, I want my half now. You mean you want it what? all, Sam? Now you said you'd let me handle it alone, Cleo. You promised not to interfere. You promised. So that's it. Another woman. Uh, take the money out of the bag, Sam, and let's go. <laughs> oh, Sam. <laughs> Oh, Katie. <laughs> How could you do this to me? I loved you, Sam. <laughs> I loved you. I wanted only your good. Believe me. Oh, Katie. I... Katie, don't cry. <laughs> I can't stand seeing you cry. It hurts me. Sam! <laughs> Katie. Sam! Huh? Get the money, Sam. All of it. Uh. Katie, I have to do this. Not one cent. Now, give it to me, Katie. Cleo, can't, can't you keep half? Half? I'm keeping it all. Uh. And you know what else I'll do? I'll send the police a letter. Oh, no. And tell them everything. No, no, you wouldn't. Wouldn't I? Oh, wouldn't no, no. I, though? Kate, 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 you don't mean that. Just try me. No, Go please, ahead. Katie. You might as well put down that wrench, no, because Katie. I'm not scared of you. Not that much. Katie. I'll send them a letter with a whole story, and no. your description, and hers, and everything. You won't. Ah! You won't. You won't. Because it's all your fault. All your fault. All your fault. Katie was dead. I don't remember much of the ride back to Cleo's place with the police with the money on my lap. I was numb, exhausted. I collapsed on the floor of the apartment and fell asleep, cradling that valise, and it was past noon I woke up. The valise was still in my arms, but it was open, and the money was gone. And so was Cleo. She wasn't there. She was gone. I was alone. Cleo. Luther. 
Have you, you, you seen Cleo today? So she left you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you better have a drink. Yeah. You look as though you could stand it. That's right. Well, you can't blame Cleo. Not after what you'd done last night. Huh? Huh? Last night? I know all about it. What do you mean? You know what I mean, Sam. Ah, uh, how can you live with yourself? Uh, I didn't do anything. I... Don't give me that. I know everything because I was there. No, no. You think no one was watching you, huh? <laughs> but, Sam, I saw the whole thing from start to finish. You couldn't have. You can't, will you? If I'd done that, I couldn't live with myself for the rest of my life. It'll torture you, see? Now, stop it. You won't eat. You won't sleep. Because the memory of it will always haunt you. Oh, stop it, stop it. It'll haunt you and haunt you until the day you die. Unless you confess right here and now. No, no. Confess! All right, stop. I did it. I killed my wife. That's about all, Lieutenant. It was strange how it all happened. Strange how it started. And yeah, stranger still how Luther here knew. Yeah. How did you know, Luther? Oh, I didn't, Lieutenant. What's that? Oh, not a thing. Well, what did I say to him? How can you live with yourself after last night? So what? Everyone done something last night they was ashamed of. Oh, every night in the week. How was I to think this here guy committed murder? You see, Captain, all I was up to was a... Well, what's the date today? You get it now? I was just making what an April Fool joke. April Fool joke? April Fool? <laughs> oh, Luther, you killed me. Thank you, Edward G. Robinson, for a great suspense show. Uh, your name Wilcox? Yes, Mr. Robinson. You the uh, fellow that keeps talking about Autolite stay full batteries? Yes, Mr. Robinson. Well, I want one of those batteries in my car, see? Yes, Mr. Robinson. Can't you say anything but yes, Mr. Robinson? Yes, Mr. Robinson, I can say this. Stay full batteries are made by Autolite men who make over 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Yes, sirree, and Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Now here again is Mr. Edward G. Robinson. Once again, it has been a real pleasure to join Tony Leader and his suspense cast and crew. I hope they'll invite me back many more times, and that's no April fooling. I know, too, that all of you are going to be as anxious as I am to hear next week's show when radio's outstanding theater of thrills will present Ronald Coleman in The Noose of Coincidence, another gripping study in... Suspense! suspense. Edward G. Robinson will soon be seen, starring in the 20th Century Fox production, The House of Strangers. Tonight's suspense play was written by Joseph Ruskull and prepared for suspense by Walter Newman. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as Edmund Gwen, Bob Hope, Mickey Rooney, and many others. Next Thursday, same time, hear Ronald Coleman in The Noose of Coincidence. You can buy Autolite Stayful batteries, Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Psychiatrists can tell you some very interesting things about the symbolism of money, and they may be right. Have you ever noticed the furtive way people deposit and withdraw money in a bank? As though it were an almost indecent act, something which should be done secretly and in private. Of course, bank employees are different. Money to them is a commodity, the raw material of their business. They handle it impersonally, without feeling. That is, most of them do. But every now and then, a man can't stand working around so much loot. And he dips his hand into the till and gets it caught. Not so the hero of our story. He has time and patience and brains. He robs a bank and is never caught by the police. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Frank Lovejoy stars in Death in Box 234, which begins in just a moment. Here's actress Joan Bennett. It's terrible to try to act with a dreadful cold. To feel better quickly, I take four-way cold tablets, the fast way to relieve nasty cold distress. Yes, tests of four leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting of all. Amazing four-way starts in minutes to relieve aches, pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When you catch cold, try my way. Take four-way cold tablets, the fast way to relieve cold distress. Four-way, 29 and 59 cents. Here's a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. Had dandruff for years? Now get rid of it in three minutes with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair. Rub in one minute. Add water. Lather one minute. Then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch. Embarrassing dandruff's gone. Fitch can also leave hair up to 35% brighter. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. And now, Death in Box 234, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I'm sure you'll agree the best way to rob a bank is from the inside. Well, I was on the inside. I was the guy you had to sign in with before you could get into your safe deposit box. It sort of gave me a sense of importance and power. Made me a little dizzy, too, thinking of all the loot in those 2,000 boxes. Jewelry, bonds, and cash. And it taught me patience. I had to wait a long, long time before I could put my plan to work. But finally, one day, a little old man walked into the bank, carrying a covered birdcage. Is this where I can get a safety draw, young fella? If you mean a safety deposit box, this is the right place. Bank, uh, ever been robbed? <laughs> no, sir. Don't trust banks. But I got to unload this cage somewhere. You want to put a bird in a safe deposit box? No, no, I got my money in the cage. Always keep it there, half for years. I own a pet store. Lots of bird cages, some covered, some uncovered. You want to hide something, hide it in the open. But now, I don't know. There's been so many stick-ups lately. Tell you what, I'll take one of the safety drawers. Very well, if you'll just sign here, I'll get you a key. I turned to the key chart, my heart pounding. This was the kind of a customer I'd been waiting for. I searched the chart until I found two empty boxes, one above the other. I gave Mr. Jensen 234, and I mentally reserved box 233 for myself. After the old man had left with the empty birdcage, George, the guard, confirmed my suspicions. Well, you know what that old guy had in that birdcage? He told me it was money. Huh? Say it was. That cage was stuffed with dough. And not a bill less than a casino. George, I'm amazed that anyone who worked in a bank as long as you would be impressed by hundred-dollar bills. In a birdcage? George, you know it's against the bank's policy to discuss the contents of the customer's safe deposit boxes. What are you barking for, a vice presidency? Merely reminding you, George. It would never do for me to betray my excitement to George. Just as it would never do for me to take out the box above Mr. Jensen's in my own name. For this, I needed someone else. Someone who needed money desperately. Someone with larceny in his heart. But not grand larceny, just petty larceny. I began to search the classified ads, and a couple of days later, I found one that sounded just right. Young man wants work, it said. Will do anything for money. 
Phone UL two three seven four two. Hello. Are you the man who placed the ad in the paper? That's right, Dad. You got a job for me? If I told you that for just three hours a week you could earn thirty dollars, would you be interested? Crazy. What's the gimmick? Well, it might involve a little risk. I've taken risks before. What do you want me to do? I can't discuss it over the phone. If you'll meet me at the sandwich mill on the corner of Van Buren and Gilbert Streets tomorrow at 1.30, there's a $10 bill in it for you, whether you take the job or not. I'll be at the table by the door. I'll be there. I hadn't been in the sandwich mill for more than five minutes when he showed up. His name was Gil. He looked like he could use a buck, so I didn't waste any time putting my cards on the table. Three times a week, I'll meet you here. I'll give you twenty dollars. You'll come to the bank. You'll put ten dollars in a deposit box and keep ten for yourself. Hmm. It's too easy. What's in it for you? Well, that's beside the point. If you do as I say, you'll have thirty bucks a week. If you don't, you'll have nothing. First time you don't show up, the deal will be off. Have you got that straight? Yeah. How long will this go on? Well, that depends when I no longer need your services. All the money you leave in the deposit box will be yours, plus a $1,000 bonus. Still interested? Are you kidding? What have I got to lose? Nothing. He couldn't lose. I couldn't lose. Nobody could lose but Mr. Jensen. And any old man who carries his dough around in a birdcage deserves to lose it. Now that most medium-priced cars have raised their prices, must you settle for something less? Not if you buy an Ambassador V8 by Rambler, the medium-priced car that did not raise prices for 59. The luxurious but compact Ambassador, American Motors finest, is next year's car at last year's price. Come test our best. See how Ambassador gives you full hat room, shoulder room, and leg room for all six passengers. Discover luxuries that even the most expensive cars do not offer. Personalized luxury, including front seats that adjust back and forward separately for your individual comfort and leg room. Thrill to the new experience of a perfect power-to-weight ratio that enables Ambassador's 270 horsepower V8 to outperform other cars in its class. Turn on a dime, park easily anywhere, because Ambassador has no useless overhang. Don't let yourself be priced out of the medium-priced field. Get next year's car at last year's price. The luxurious Ambassador at Rambler Dealers. And now, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy, Act Two of Death in Box 234. <laughs> Like I said, robbing a bank takes a good plan and lots of patience. I had both. Three times a week, Gil, my hired stooge, deposited $10 in his safe deposit box. And once a week, Mr. Jensen deposited a birdcage full of $100 bills in his. There was only one hitch in the whole beautiful setup. I began to like the old man. Everything under lock and key, young fella? Safe and sound, Mr. Jensen. That's the kind of talk I like to hear. How's it with you? Well, not so good. Oh? What's the matter? I'm having trouble with Priscilla. <laughs> Somehow I didn't think you were married. I'm not. Oh? Then uh, Priscilla's your girlfriend? <laughs> At my age? Thanks, young fella. No, Priscilla's a parrot. A lady parrot? I think so. Uh, never been sure, though. Had her for ten years and I'm still not sure. Hard to tell with parrots. <laughs> what kind of trouble has Priscilla been giving you? Well, I worry about her. She's been off her feed. Hasn't had a single seed for nearly a week now. Usually eats right out of my hand. Now she just sits in a cage and droops. Well, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't worry about it. If you were me, you would worry about it. What do you suppose I run that pet shop for? Ain't the money. I got more than I'll ever need. It's for friends. Friends? Sure. Priscilla and the other birds and the puppies, even the goldfish. Friends. They're all the friends I got. But it's more friends than most fellows my age has got left. You see what I mean? He's a nice old guy. As George the guard escorted him and his birdcage into the vault, I couldn't help feeling like a heel. But only for a moment. On his way out, Mr. Jensen stopped at my desk again. 
Uh, young fella, I won't be seeing you so often anymore. Oh, you're going away? No. <laughs> no, but you got all my money here now, so I'll just drop by every month or so to uh, check up on you. <laughs> now you take good care of it, young fella. Don't you worry, Mr. Jensen. I'll take care of your money as if it were my own. Now, only one thing stood between me and Mr. Jensen's money. My friend George, the guard. George knew Mr. Jensen. George had blow the whistle if he saw Gil emptying Mr. Jensen's box. So George had to be put out of action during our action. But how? Well, in order to get anywhere in this world, you've got to use the other fellow's weakness. Gil's weakness, like mine, was that root of all evil, the love of money. And George's weakness was alcohol. He kept a pint stashed in the glove compartment of his car, and every day after lunch, he sneaked out to the parking lot for a quick belt. And a Mickey and George's pint would put him in the emergency hospital for the afternoon. That night, I called Gil to make sure he'd meet me at the usual time and place. And the next morning, on my way into the bank, I doctored George's booze. I'd buy slowly. 10.30, 11, 11.30. Everything was set for the big heist, the perfect bank robbery. I'd covered every detail. Nothing could go wrong now. I'd thought of everything. Good morning, young fella. But this. There stood Mr. Jensen, looking like death dug up, a dirty bandage around his right hand. I come in to look at my money. Of course, Mr. Jensen. What happened to your hand? It's that Priscilla. She bit me. Finally got her appetite back and had a piece of my hand for breakfast. Have you seen a doctor? No, but don't believe in doctors. But you never can tell. A thing like that might be dangerous, give you blood poisoning. Don't you worry about me, young fella. Nature will take care of it. Always been a great believer in nature. It ain't the bite that bothers me. It's Priscilla. I can't understand why she turned on me. She was my oldest friend. Mr. Jensen was in the vault for a long, long time, and I began to wonder if I'd miss my date with Gil. I couldn't leave, of course, until I was sure he was out of the bank. But at last, he came back to the desk and returned the key. Young fellow, you're doing a good job. A real good job. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Yes, sir. I just counted every single penny of my money, and it's all there. Just as safe as if I was minding it myself. Nothing like counting money, you know. Especially if it's your own. Best indoor sport I've ever heard of. Well, keep up the good work, Sonny. I will, Mr. Jensen. You better get that hand looked at. I look after my hands. You look after my money. Look, Dad, you know how much dough I got in that safe deposit box? Yes, Gil. Do you? 240 bucks, and I could use it. You know, there ain't nothing that can stop me from going in there and taking it out. That's right, Gil. It's your money. Yeah, well, and that's what I'm going to do. And lose your bonus. What bonus? A thousand dollars. A thousand bucks? <laughs> Who do I have to kill? No one. I don't dig you, man, but I learned a long time ago you don't get something for nothing. That's right. Now, here's what you have to do for your thousand dollars. Go, man. Come into the bank at 2.30. I'll give you a large manila envelope and the key to box 234. That's just below yours. There'll be a different guard, so don't worry about being recognized. Take all the money out of the box and put it in the envelope. When you come back to my counter, return the key, give me the envelope. I'll give you an identical one with a thousand dollars in it. Just like that. I'm reading your mind, Gil. Don't try to walk out of the bank with the money. All I have to do is push one little button and you'll be shot before you reach the door. Remember that. Uh, what about my 240 bucks? Well, you come back tomorrow. You get it out of box 233, and that's the last time I want to see you. Have you got everything straight? I got it straight. I, uh, I'm reading your mind again. Stop thinking about $10,000 reward leading to the arrest and conviction. You couldn't prove a thing. It's your word against mine, not a shred of proof or evidence. So just take your $1,240 and go quietly. <laughs> When I got back to the bank, George was nowhere to be seen. And Big Joe, the guard who works the front door, was back at the vault. Right on the dot of half past two, Gil came into the bank, took the manila envelope and the key to box 234 and disappeared into the vault, followed by Big Joe. 
Five minutes later, he was back. He shoved the key across the counter, but he held on to the manila envelope full of money. I held on to the envelope containing the $1,000 bonus. How do I know there's a thousand bucks in that envelope? You don't. Yeah, but I know what's in this envelope, and it's plenty. I know. More than a thousand bucks. Lots more. Don't be greedy, Gil. I got a right to some of it. All right, go ahead. Take it all. But you'd better hurry. The guard is looking this way. Now remember, there's the little button under the counter. My finger is on it, Gil. Shall I push it now? Here's the envelope. Give me the grant. I thought the day would never end, but of course it finally did. And I rushed home to my apartment, double-locked the doors, ripped open the envelope, dumped the money onto a coffee table in a beautiful green pile, and began counting. I was only up to $50,000 when I noticed there was blood on the money. Fresh, wet blood. And I discovered I'd cut my finger when I'd torn open the envelope. One of those deep paper cuts that don't hurt at first, but only bleed. I wrapped my handkerchief around it and went on counting. A hundred, a hundred and ten, a hundred and eighteen thousand dollars. Old man Jensen was right. There's no greater indoor sport than counting your own money. And every cent of it was mine now. Now here is where the story should end. With a bank robber skipping the country with his ill-gotten gains to spend the rest of his life in luxurious ease in some Central American banana republic. But this was no ordinary bank job, and I was too smart a bank robber. I didn't need to make a getaway. I went back to work the next morning. It's early evening, and you're out visiting friends. The conversation is stimulating. Perhaps a pleasant game of cards has started. You're relaxed and enjoying yourself. But your enjoyment could be spoiled if you should suddenly feel a troublesome twinge of acid indigestion, heartburn, or gas. Then your evening is ruined. But not if you bring Tums along. You take a Tums tablet with no fuss or inconvenience. You relax and let the remarkable medically tested antacid ingredients in Tums go to work. Tums work fast. As a matter of fact, in a matter of seconds, you're feeling better. You're enjoying yourself again. You see, nothing but Tums works so fast to make you feel so good so, so long. So wherever you are, always carry Tums for quick relief from acid indigestion, heartburn, gas. T-U-M-S, Tums, ten cents. Three-roll pack, a quarter. Or get the new six-roll Tums pack, just 49 cents. And now... Starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy, Act Three of Death in Box 234. Yes, I went back to work the morning after I knocked off Mr. Jensen's safe deposit box for $118,000. I went back to work as though nothing had happened, and nothing did. George was back, too, looking peaked and blaming his illness on the lousy luncheon meat his wife put in his sandwiches. Gil came in and emptied box 233 and left without a word. And days went by without a sign of old Mr. Jensen. I gave my notice to the bank and made my plans to move out to the West Coast. But I began to feel lousy. And then I began to look like I felt. George noticed it first. Hey, Harry, you look bad. I mean, real sick. Gee, thanks. I mean, bad. Like old man Jensen last time he was in here. George, you say the nicest things. But I knew he was right. I looked at myself in the mirror. I was flushed. There was a hollow look I'd never seen in my eyes before. I got scared. I couldn't figure it out. Somehow, counting the money wasn't fun anymore. Finally, I woke up one morning with a raging fever. Going to work was out of the question. I was weak as a kitten. It was all I could do to pick up the morning paper from under my apartment door. I slumped back into bed, and then I saw it. A couple of paragraphs tucked away on the back page. A diagnosis of my illness. And I knew then I would never leave this bed. A cut... If I only hadn't cut my finger on that envelope when I counted the money. 
Oh, yes. The newspaper. Here's what it says. Bird bites, man dies. Mr. A.J. Jensen, 75, was found dead last night in the back of his pet shop at 8957 Tulane Avenue. The cause of death was determined after examining a serious wound on his right hand. The wound had been inflicted by a parrot which was infected by psittacosis, a deadly disease for which no cure is known. Every article of Mr. Jensen's clothing and personal belongings had to be destroyed as they were highly contaminated. Mr. Jensen died without any living relations or close friends and apparently without any estate. Uh, by the way, I've got Mr. Jensen's money right here under my mattress if you'd like to have it. Suspense, in which Frank Lovejoy starred in William N. Robeson's production of Death in Box 234, written by Don Hahn. In a moment, the names of the supporting players and a word about next week's story of Suspense. Hi there, Frank. Fill her up, will you? Sure thing. Say, Frank, what's this I just heard on the radio about a big treasure hunt? Said I might have a Fram filter cartridge in my car right now worth $1,000 and not even know it. Well, that's right. A regular filter check is important to today's cars. So important that Fram Corporation is paying from $1 to $1,000 in prizes to get people to check their filters now. Not cash money, Frank. Oh, yes, sir. This is Fram's silver anniversary. Last year, 10,000 secretly numbered Fram filters were distributed all over the United States and installed in cars during regular servicing. And if you have one in your car now, you could get up to 1,000 silver dollars. And I'd get up to 1,000 bucks, too. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's check my oil filter. And let's check my air filter, too. Hurry, folks. Get in on the big brand treasure hunt. You could win up to $1,000 in cash. Check your car filters now. Supporting Frank Lovejoy and death in Box 234 were Edgar Staley, Lou Krugman, and Sam Pierce. Listen. Listen again next week. When we return with Script by Mark Brady, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Suspense. Will reprieve, starring Mr. John Garfield. This morning, my lawyer, Mr. Gurley, said he was trying to get me a reprieve, so I looked it up in a dictionary I got. It says, uh, reprieve, to suspend temporarily the execution of a sentence upon and relief or secession from pain or ill. Well, the first part I guess Mr. Gurley can get. He knows all the rules. But the uh, second part, cessation of pain, well, that's up to me. Maybe when I've spilled it all out put it out on a table where I can look at it, why I'm here, and about the kid, about Lori, maybe then will come secession of pain. I don't know. Anyway, I can try. Okay. Name, Steve Hannibal. My old lady had to name me something, so I guess she read the name Stephen on a book. If she could read, which I doubt. Age 34. Health, excellent. But wait up. You don't want to sell me insurance, because tonight I'm state prisoner 80483, registered in cell 77 of the state penitentiary. That's the death cell. I'm in for murder. I was always the bright boy, but right now, I don't know, I, I'm mixed up, but, but good. I, and not about being here, not about murder. Well, the pen is my home, away from home, kind of. And murder in my social set, well, murder is as common as chicken pox in PS 137. No, it's that last year of honest toil that threw me for a loss. Because I wasn't mixed up at all the night Murph and Joe and I blew out of Chicago. That was a minor inconvenience, right in line with the way I've always lived. Let's see it. 
It was nearly two years ago. Murph and Joe and I and the boys had knocked off a payroll. A good, clean job, except for a couple of guys getting hurt fatally. And the Murph was tipped off that uh, one of the boys, he didn't know who, had squealed to the cops. So Murph knew we were hot, and he came up to my room on Madison Street. I'm leaving town, Steve, tonight. It's an idea. So am I. Yeah, yeah, we'd better blow you and me and Joe. And the rest of the boys? Look, I can't take care of everybody, Steve. You know how it is. Sure, I know. You'll take care of the ones that can't, you can't get along without. That do your thinking for you. Oh, it ain't that, Steve. It's... Cut it. Well, okay. So we got around 20 grand. 23. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, 23. Well, with that, though, we can go to Florida. Yeah? Yeah. Lie down there all winter till the heat's off. <laughs> you think that's a bright idea, don't you, Murph? Well, sure, why not? Yeah, we take a nice big shiny suite in the Paradise Hotel, pick up some dolls... Yeah, and... that's right. Well, that's just what we're not going to do. What? What do you mean? We're not going to travel first class, spread dough around places like the Paradise accompanied by any dolls. And why not? The dough's marked, bird brain. The serial numbers have been written down and we'll be looking for that kind of dough in places where dough, dough changes places. Places like the Paradise. Well, we could go to some other place, like a rooming house in St. Pete. Yeah, and we could be smart if we put our minds to it. Yeah? Like what? Like putting that package of dough out of circulation in a safety deposit box. Here and you know that's all the dough we got. Sure, so we can get along without it for the time being. It's worth a little discomfort to be the murder app. Okay, okay, say you're right. But we still have to leave town. We'll leave, Murph. And this is how. I figured I'll never look for you where there isn't a stall shower, so we'll fool them. We'll ride the rails. <laughs> You can play the nine of hearts, Joe. Huh? Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to. <laughs> you were. You never saw it, huh? What a guy. Outsmarts himself in solitaire. Ooh. Hey, it's cold in this boxcar, Steve. Yeah, just pick up a phone, Murph. Tell the management. They'll give you more heat. All right, all right. I just said it was cold. At a time like this, be glad it's cold. Uh-uh, Joe. Mustn't cheat. I wasn't cheating. Oh, <laughs> new game. So you slip the card under when you can't play it, huh? Well... <laughs> So what if I'm cheating? It's my skin, ain't it? You're absolutely right. Well, I, I wonder how many of the boys have been picked up. I couldn't take care of everybody, Steve. Uh, none of them been picked up. Why should they be? Oh, boy, there's that three I've been looking for. None of them been picked up, huh? Well, who's protecting them, Joe? Your fairy godmother? Why would the cops pick them up? They know it was Murph used the gun. Huh? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, they, they probably guessed Murph was trigger man. Why, you did Shut up, Murph. What else did the cops probably guess, Joe? Well, uh, well, how, how would I know, Steve? Uh, uh, well, uh, honest, I only thought that... Talk, they... Joe. What else did they guess about me? Uh, oh, nothing about you, Steve. Honest, they... they... Spill it. Spill oh, it. They, they knew Murph was trigger man and that... And, you and that he and took the dough, no one else. Honest, Steve, I, I didn't tell him anyone else who was on the job. I, I thought if they picked up Murph, then you and me could... Hey... Steve, stop Murph. Get back, Murph. Let him finish. Go on, finish. I didn't squeal on you, Steve. You gotta believe me. Steve, you gotta... Steve, stop Murph. He can... Don't let him do it. Steve, no! That was Murph being trigger-happy. Joe went down sort of slow and quiet, like the movies you see of a parachute settling on the ground. I think he twitched a little. I looked out and saw the train was slowing up and... That we were coming into a freight yard, not 50 feet across the tracks. I, I could see a couple of guys heading our way who looked like uh, railroad dicks. I thought fast, like always, Murph was hot, very hot. And being very shy on brains, if they picked him up, he'd lead them to the payroll door like a homing pigeon. Inside of 24 hours, too. And I hadn't anything pinned on me for a few years. If anyone took the rap, it would have to be me. If I ever wanted to smell my share of that 23 gram, and this was the rap I thought I could beat. Unlucky, why... Thought for a year or so for manslaughter, claiming self-defense. Lucky, I, I bluffed my way out of it altogether. I talked fast to Murph, and when the boxcar stopped opposite those dicks, I had Murph's gun in my hand. How many of you guys in there? Three, mister. Well, pile out, boys. It's the end of the... Lo hey. What's the matter, Whitey? One of those guys has a gun. What are you doing with the gun, brother? Huh? I, uh, I don't know. And what's wrong with the other guy? He, he shot him. 
I was over there at the other end minding my own business, and, and those two guys were yelling okay, at each other, and he... Okay, drop that gun, mister. I'm coming in. Is he dead? Dead as a mackerel. All right, mister. Tell me about it. I, uh, I don't know what happened. It was his gun, or it just went off. Yeah? Did you see it? You over there. I... I didn't see nothing. I was down at this end of the car, minding my own business. They'd been yelling at each other for hours. I didn't pay any attention until the gun went off just now. Honestly, I... Okay, I, I, I okay, now I'll keep your shirt on. Looks like you're in trouble, mister. I tell you, I don't know what happened. Yeah, leave it to headquarters, buddy. Yeah. Maybe you remember better at headquarters. I don't know what happened. All right, Dreamy, no matter what you remember, the rap is murder. I've been in worse spots. The charge was murder, first degree. But I knew I could get that cut down. The best thing was that they turned Murph loose without checking on him, and Joe was unidentified. I dreamed up a name I said I knew Joe by, read something or other, and it went down all right. And so then I settled down for what might be an extended vacation, a vacation that would earn me half at 23 grand. Only one thing bothered me. It seems the town we picked to kill Joe in was going through one of those, uh, you know, reform spasms, and the papers were really lathered up about it. And my case was made to order for them. A crime they could get holy about without stepping on any local toes. While I was waiting trial, they fried me, but good, and I burned about it. So that's why I didn't exactly clap hands when they told me a reporter was coming in to see me. And I didn't shout hallelujah either when I saw it was a doll. Sharp looking, all right, but still just a doll. Uh, hello. Hiya, chick. You're Steve Hannibal? Yeah. I'm Laurie Ware of the News Press. Uh Uh-huh. I'd like to get your story. Look, sister, your job is writing. If you can't do it alone, you shouldn't have had the job. I mean your side of the story. Well, it's nice of you to take an interest. Please, I I wish you'd listen to me. Go peddle your paper somewhere else. Please. Don't you understand English? Look, I don't blame you for being suspicious of me. You see, I know the papers haven't been fair to you. I know they've been trying your case before it comes to trial. So, it happens every day. And and I feel sure there's more to this case than has been told. I... I have a feeling you got to be careful of those feelings, baby. I got a hunch you didn't do it. That maybe you were framed. So, uh, so what if I was? Oh, I don't know how much I can do. Except I know that if you have a story, I can get it printed. And, uh, and, uh, that'll make, uh, make the difference? I don't know. At least when it comes to picking your jury, there'll be some people in this town who haven't made up their minds. Oh, something in that. Well? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you the real McCoy truth. Oh, that's wonderful, Steve. I'll take it down. Well, there isn't much to tell. I, it was just what the papers call a innocent bystander. I, I was asleep when it happened. And how many men were in the boxcar? Well, before I went, I got to sleep. There were about six or seven. When the shots woke me up, I saw two guys jump off, and we were moving pretty slow. Then, because the train was coming into the yard, you see. But at the inquest, the police said you were holding a gun. Sure, sure I was. Well, the cops yelled at me, and... I saw I was holding it. Someone had planted it on me while I was half asleep. And when the old boy in the corner there, you know, he said, he said I'd done it. Yeah, so, yeah, he said that you were fighting with the other Yeah, person. I know. Uh, I'd been fighting with Red. Or the, I don't think he meant to frame me. He just got me, you know, mixed up with one of the guys who scrammed. That's it, Steve. That's what, baby? If you'd done it, you would have jumped off. You wouldn't just stand there waiting to be arrested with a gun in your hand. Or you would have thrown the gun out. Well, I claim I didn't have time, but, uh... It's an angle. And I'll pound it, Steve. I'll get you a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll need one. You'll need all the help you can get. What a doll. (laughs) Sold on me before she even got the pitch. And what made my hand all aces was the girl could really write. She had the news press giving me more space than the World Series. Well, the other papers had to pick it up. Well, by the time the trial came up, I was local hero number one, an orphan child. The whole town wanted to adopt me. So no one, least of all of me, was much surprised when the jury filed back into the jury box with their decision. Have the gentlemen of the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. 
Will you read the verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty as charged. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> well, your work, kitten. What do they say? The pen is mightier than the sword. Oh, I'm so happy I could help you, Steve. Oh, you don't see me crying, honey. Want to dance? Come on. Sure, but... Come wait, on. I want to talk first. Have you got a home you're going to? Or, or a job? Well, look, kid, you've been Girl Scout enough today. Let's dance. Come Please on. tell me, Steve. I'm worried about you. I'm going to winter in California and summer in Maine. You haven't any place to go. See America first. That's my motto. Steve, I don't want to butt in, but... Harry Singles will give you a job. <laughs> yeah, doing what? In the circulation department. Ah, you're kidding. Well, it wouldn't be such a good job to start, but I know you could work up, Steve, and you'd like Harry. Nine hours a day, five days a week, is that it? Five and a half days. Steve Hannibal punching a time clock. Boy, I suppose I'd get a social security number and everything, huh? Don't you have one? Unemployment security income? That's a lot of legality. Legality? Oh, skip it, kitten. Let me think. You know... You know, I might just take a whirl at that job. Oh, Steve, I think that's wonderful. Well, you know, it's not so much the job, but you and I have a lot of unfinished business, baby. And we can't get it all done in one day. But right now, I want to dance. Come on, baby, let's go. That was the old brain working again. You see, I had counted on drifting until it was safe to join up with Murph. I didn't know where he'd be gone, but I figured I'd be able to find him when the heat was off. But when Laurie said job, it was a kind of new angle. I could stay right here in town, pull down enough money to get by, and maybe even a little on the side. Well, it was the safest spot I could possibly be for a, the time being. I went down, I went down to the newspaper office with Laurie the next morning and was hired. First time in my life such a thing ever happened to me. Harry Singles was a sharp guy for any racket, and working with him, I... I got so I, I didn't mind. Of course, the hours were very regular, all daytime, and I had to put on a clean shirt now and then. But I always had that 23 grand to think about. And the kid, Laurie, well, I couldn't have squired a better doll in Chicago, New York, any place. Only, only sometimes she could make me nervous. Let's not go out tonight, huh, Steve? Let's stay here in my place. I'll cook something. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> what doesn't seem right? <laughs> Seeing a doll with class and an apron, I can't get used to it. Oh, you will eventually. After all, you're used to being a working man now. Well, don't be too sure, baby. Ah, Steve, you know you love it. I don't know. Sometimes I get the itch to move on. Forget the itch, Steve. <laughs> a rolling stone gathers no moss, you know. Yeah, so they tell me. But I saw some moss once, and I still wonder, what does a stone want with moss, anyway? <laughs> See what I mean? Laurie kept telling me how much I, I liked being a pillar of society, so that sometimes I even began to wonder. And then Harry started shoving razors at me and titles, and, well, inside of no time, I was a district manager. And I sat down and figured the dough angle. And it gave me a shock. Because even if it was legal, I was making more dough week in and week out than I had with Murph and the boys. Well, the, the Chicago stick-up stayed hot, and I didn't hear from Murph, so I let it all ride and kept working. Along about then, the papers were in a lather again, all about reform. And the town was just crawling with rackets, and Laurie was working on the stories. But one night, Laurie was typing a story in a room, and I was in the living room waiting for her to finish. And... I'll be with you in a minute, Steve. One more paragraph. And uh, that's finished for tonight? Yeah, mm-hmm. Finished for tonight. I got something to show you. Come in here. Okay, kid. What is it? <laughs> Buying hats again? Uh-uh. It's a letter I got in the mail, right here on the desk. Oh, the local wolves are moving in, huh? Much more exciting. Read it. Lay off or we'll measure you for a coffin. You have 24 hours to quit your job. <laughs> First time I ever got anything like that. Want to read my answer? Your answer? Yeah, my article for tomorrow morning. I've written all about the note and why it was sent to me. Yeah? Well, what do you figure? Well, there's an out-of-town mobster who's moved in on the local rackets, and he's making a good thing of it. I found out about him three days ago, and I've really tracked him down. Mm -hmm. Who is he? Well, here he goes by the name of Dude Ringler. But I knew that was an alias. 
I finally find out that he's a former big-time operator from Chicago, wanted there for a lot of things, including murder. Yeah? I'm going to print it in the paper, and he'll be picked up just about the time the papers hit the street. Oh, oh, oh you told the cops, huh? No, not yet. I thought you could go down with me. And uh, uh, what's the guy's name uh, in Chicago? I don't know all of it. He headed up a gang there. They call him Murph. I got that roller coaster feeling, only worse. I still can't figure it. She was only a half-baked doll, moving into territory where anyone was likely to get clipped. Why should I care? But something funny happened to me, and, and she could see it. Steve, what's the matter? Well, well you, you gotta lay off, Laurie. You gotta quit. Because of that ridiculous note? Don't ask me why. Just quit. Well, I certainly won't quit. Don't you see? That's just what he wants me to do. Okay. I'll tell you. I know Murph. You know him? Yeah. And he's trigger-happy. He's a rattlesnake in pants. Well, then that's all the more reason, Steve. Now, listen why... to me. I don't know why I'm doing this. I never missed figuring percentages before in my life. But I'm going to tell you something. And I'm going to tell you before I wise up. What, Steve? You remember when you got my true story when I was up for the murder rap? Of course I remember. Well, that was all a pipe dream, sweetheart. Something for the books. You lied to me? You did kill Red? His name wasn't Red. He was a slimy little punk from a mob that I ran with named Joe Tanelli. Mob? And he, he wasn't killed by me. He was killed by the other guy who was in the car. He was killed by Murph. I covered for Murph because he was hot. Steve. Then... Listen. Steve, you... They want you for those jobs, too. They... Well, shut up. I'm listening. What? What is it, Steve? I, I, uh, I thought I heard something in the other room and the door closed. Um, you're just imagining it, Steve. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I am. Yeah, this being a squealer takes my skin off. Oh, Steve. But you got the story, baby. Short and sweet. Now you can do what you want with it. Quit your job and live, or turn me in, too. <laughs> What a doll. What a doll. She cried on the front of my shirt. And then she smiled. And she called Harry Singles with me sitting there and told him she quit. She told him she was getting married the next morning to me. And oh, I played along. Then I left her. After telling her to button her lip and keep the door locked, I started to go find Murph to check out on, check on that 23 grand and put him wise so he'd lay low. I could see that he still needed me to think for him. But there was, there was something wrong, something, something very wrong. I felt like I was, I was kind of cracking up, so I, I, I let it ride until the morning. I, I was climbing the stairs to pick up Lori at nine, on the dock, and for some reason I was feeling pretty good. Open up, chick. It's me. Open. Hello, Murph. <laughs> You're still trigger-happy, huh? Hello, Steve. And you don't have to call me names. You're kind of kind of up early, aren't you, Murph? I was making a little call on your doll. Yeah, I see you was. She wasn't a bad-looking doll. You didn't have to plug her. She quit her job. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Well, she still knew too much. She wasn't going to use it, Murph. Maybe. You told her about Joe. You shouldn't have done that, Steve. Huh. So it was you I heard here last night, huh? No kidding. You really heard me? Yeah, yeah, I heard the door closed. And you heard me tell her? Yeah. Mm. This work in legal's giving you bad habits, Steve, but I'll forget it. Come here. Come over here. Just look what she would have wrote. Dude Ringler, alias Murph. Alias, we don't know how many other names. Wanted in a half a dozen cities for murder, larceny, and kidnapping. That wouldn't have looked good, Steve. She wasn't going to use it. No? Well, don't let it worry you. It's a... Well, it's about time we picked up that 23... Hey. Hey, what's up, Steve? You shouldn't have put your gun down, Murph. What's eating you? You shouldn't have put it down. Steve, you're nuts. Because I'm going to drill you, Murph. I've always wanted to drill you. And before I wise up, I'm going to do it. <laughs> That time, the neighbors heard it. 
I didn't care. I kept pumping lead. When they came in, I was standing over Murph, holding the gun. The same gun he'd used to kill the kid. <laughs> so the cops got me for both of them. Both of them. And for Joe and the payroll job, too. They really thought they hit the jackpot with me. I didn't give them any argument. It wasn't any use. But you see what I mean? I, when I'm mixed up, I've always been a sharp guy. I, I could have beat the game. Murph was right when he knocked off the kid. She did know too much. Well, it's the way things work out in our set. And why should I get, why should I get the case of highs over a dog getting drilled? I, 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 I can't figure it out. And, uh, well, now, now I'm trimming my fingernails and waiting for Mr. Gurley to get a reprieve. And I'm all mixed up about that, too. Because in a dictionary, it's a word that's got two meanings. And the way I feel, they don't mesh. They, they kind of cancel each other out. To suspend temporarily the execution of sentence upon and relief or cessation of Pain or ill? <laughs> well, any time now. Hello, Mr. Gurley. Hello, Steve. What's the good word? Oh, boy. Turn your color around, Mr. Gurley. If you're going to talk that way, spill it. Wasn't any use, Steve. No reprieve. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I... Got till 6 a.m. No reprieve. <laughs> no reprieve? I wouldn't say that, Mr. Gurley. I draw definition number two. I get secession of pain. <laughs> And so closes Reprieve, John Garfield, as star of tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. And its 96,000 dealers bring you Miss Linda Darnell in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a woman who knew her husband was trying to kill her and was powerless to stop it. A dramatic report we call A Killing in Las Vegas, starring Miss Linda Darnell. Hi, a half... Huh? Oh, 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 hello, Harlow. Boy, you really gave me a powerful start. <laughs> Just like the powerful starts you can be sure of getting from your Autolite Stay Full battery, Hap. And an Autolite Stay Full needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I know, Harlow. And, Hap, do you also know that the Autolite Stay Full gives longer life? as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. I do, Harlow. Well, okay, then. Visit your nearest Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and he has an Autolite stay full for your car in case a replacement is needed. 
To quickly learn his location, just phone Western Union by number... And ask for me, Operator 25. I'll gladly tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer. Where you can get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with A Killing in Las Vegas and the performance of Miss Linda Darnell... Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Yes, ma'am? I'd like to see the policeman in charge, please. Well, maybe I can help you, ma'am. What is it? My husband is trying to kill me. I see. Uh, you better come with me. Oh, Hank, I think you better talk with this lady. Oh. Oh, yes, ma'am. Come in. Now, have a seat. Well, thank you. Now, what is it you want to see me about, Miss... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Evans. Dixie Evans. I'm a dancer over at the Oasis Club. Oh, yeah, the Oasis. You must be one of the new acts. I don't believe I've seen you. Well, I just started my run this week. Ah. Well, what's your trouble, Mrs. Evans? My husband is trying to kill me. Your husband? Yes. Twice in the last 24 hours. Uh, well, maybe you better start at the beginning. Uh, well, my husband, Charlie, and I arrived here in Las Vegas about a week ago. Frankie Paris... A, a booking agent in Los Angeles had gotten me a six-week run at the Oasis Club over on the main highway. Yeah, yeah I know the place. Well, um, Charlie doesn't usually bother to travel with me when I go out on road bookings, but this time he did. Charlie likes to gamble. I guess that's why he came with me. Uh-huh. Well, last night, Charlie didn't show up at the club at 1.30 to pick me up like he usually does, so I waited for him. And by 2 o'clock, the club had been emptied and everybody had gone home. I was still in the back, waiting for him. Who is... Oh, it's you, Dixon. Hi, Barney. What are you doing out here all alone? Well, I, I'm waiting for my husband. He's late. He sure is. It's almost 2.30. You know where he is? No. Getting lucky, I hope. That's what I call wishful thinking. Did the house get much play tonight? About usual. Hey, would you like me to give you a lift downtown to your hotel? Oh, no, no thanks, Barney. I better wait for him. He'd have called me if he wasn't coming. He'll be along any minute. Yeah, if nothing happened to him. Oh, I know him like a book. After living with him for seven years, I should know. He'd have called. You've been married that long, huh? Yep. Well, uh... Uh, look, Dixie, I don't like to leave you out here all alone like oh, this. don't be silly. Well, if I can't offer you a lift to town... No, thanks just the same, Barney. Tell you what I'll do. I'll wait around till he gets here. I don't want you to get lonesome. Oh, no, you go on home and get some sleep. I won't be lonesome. I've got all those wide-open spaces of Nevada just to keep me company. Okay, Dixie. And besides that, i got a strong pair of lungs. I can always scream for help. Sure, but who'd hear you? Like you said, those are wide-open spaces out there. Are you trying to scare me? <laughs> nope. I'm just tired. I'll see you tomorrow night. Good night, Dixie. Good night, Barney. Charlie? Charlie? That you? Who is it? Charlie? Then, before I could move, I, I thought someone grabbed me from behind. It was a man. He twisted my arms and yanked me back in the shadows. I, I kicked and spit and tried to fight my...
myself loose, but there was no use. His hands were like steel. I, I tried to scream, but his hands closed around my throat. <laughs> When I came to, I was lying on the gravel back of the club. It was still dark. I took a deep breath and my lungs felt as if they were going to burst. And my throat ached. I staggered to my feet and ran around in front of the club on, onto the main highway. It wasn't long before a passing cab picked me up and took me back downtown to the hotel. When I let myself into the room, Charlie was in bed. I sat down and started to cry. He got up, came over, and put his arms around me. That's when I should have known. When he put his arms around me. Oh, look, Dixie, baby, come on, get hold of yourself now. Come on, take hold, honey. You're shaking like a leaf. What is it? Oh, Charlie. Charlie, it was terrible. Someone... Someone... Tried to kill me. Oh, baby. <laughs> Charlie. Look, will you stop crying long enough to tell me what you're talking about? So, someone tried to kill you? Yes. Yes. Where? In the back of the club, the Oasis. I was waiting for you and, and he... Didn't you get my telephone message? <laughs> message? Yeah, I left a message for you. Well, no. No. Well, what happened? Well, I... I was back there waiting for you. I heard a noise and... First, I thought it was you. I called your name, and then... Then this man rushed up behind me, grabbed me around the throat, and I... Did you, I, did you see what he looked like? Well, no, I couldn't see his face. It was too dark, but he... He tried to choke me, Charlie. He, Look, Dixie... You... Oh, it was terrible. His hands around my throat. Well, what happened after that? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I passed out. I guess he thought I was dead. But... Why did he want to kill me? Uh, just, just wait a minute, Dixie. How do you know he wanted to kill you? Why, I, I don't know. I... Was anyone from the club around there? Oh, no. Everybody had gone home. I see. Oh, it could have been someone trying to rob the club. Huh? Yeah, sure, that might have been it. Some guy was going to break in and rob the club. He thought everybody had gone home. And when he got a running back, he found you. Got scared, and he attacked you. Well, maybe... Maybe you're right. <laughs> of course I'm right. You say you called me? Yeah, I sure did. I was having a run of luck at the club cartwheel. Must have won about 500 bucks, baby. I didn't want to leave. So I called the club and told them to tell you to take a cab on home. But I didn't get the message. No, well, I guess somebody just forgot to give it to you. Charlie, maybe I ought to call the police. What for? To tell them what happened. Uh, it's late now, honey. I'm going to get up in the morning, huh? Well, all right, Charlie. You won $500, Charlie? Yeah. Isn't that great? Can I see it? Oh, uh, didn't want to carry a lot of money with me. I told him to make it out to me in a check and yeah, pick it up tomorrow. Oh. Now, you get to sleep, Dixie. Get a good night's rest, huh? You need it. Okay, Charlie, I will. I am tired. I had a very restless night. I didn't get much sleep. But the next morning, the more I thought about what Charlie had said, the more I began to believe that maybe he was right. Maybe it had been somebody just wanting to rob the club. We got up late and had lunch at one of the restaurants along 5th Street, then played some bingo at the palace. Then we walked around town for a while and went back to our hotel about 2.30. Hey, Dixie, why don't you go upstairs and take a nap, huh? Got to get some rest. You had a pretty restless night there. Yeah, I know. Uh, Charlie, you're not going to... Oh, no, honey. I'll, uh... I'll go on over and pick up the check at the club card. You should be ready for me. You can get yourself a half hour of sleep. It'll do you good. Maybe I will. I yeah, got your key? Uh-huh. Good. Okay, I'll come wake you up in about half an hour. All right. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, Dixie? Lay off the dice table, huh? Oh, Sure. Yes, ma'am? Three, please. Yes, ma'am.
Three out. <sighs> oh, brother, this feels good. <sighs> I didn't even bother to take my clothes off. I was too tired. All I could think about was getting some sleep. And the bed felt soft and good. I started to drift off into a dream. It was a terrible dream. I saw the man in the back of the club in my dream. He was chasing me now. I tried to run away. But he caught me and tied me up. Then he picked me up in his arms and carried me over to where a train engine stood and, and laid me down in front of it. The train in my dream hadn't started to move yet, but I could hear the hissing of the engine. And it seemed that the louder the hissing got, the harder it was for me to breathe. I tried to wake up, but it was hard, and, and, and then finally I did. And, but the hissing of the train didn't disappear with the rest of my dream... The hissing became the gas jet in the corner of the room. Oh, the window. The window. I've got to break it. Break the, my, my shoe off. is bringing you Miss Linda Darnell in A Killing in Las Vegas. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Harlow, I've told you before that I have an Autolite Stay Full battery. Ah, uh -huh. What do you think of it, Hap? Oh, it's great. It's grand. It's magnificent. And it's protected, too. Protected? Yep. Every positive plate in the Autolite Stay Full is protected by fiberglass retaining mats to reduce shedding and flaking and give the Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards and... The Autolite Stay Full needs water only three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, visit your Autolite battery dealer, the man who services all makes of batteries. To quickly learn his location, just call Western Union by number... And ask for me, Operator 25. I'll gladly tell you the name and address of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Linda Darnell in Elliot Lewis's production of A Killing in Las Vegas. A dramatic report, well calculated to keep you in suspense. All right, Mrs. Evans, uh, just try to finish your story if you can. Uh, you uh, say you tried to break the window with your shoe. Yes, it finally broke and I got some fresh air. And uh, this was how long ago? About an hour. Uh, then what happened after you were able to revive yourself? Well, I, I was scared. I, I asked myself, what have I done so bad that someone wants to kill me for it? Because now I believe that someone was trying to kill me. I tried to get hold of Charlie, my husband, to tell him to come back to the hotel right away. Main desk. Would you ring the club cartwheel for me, please? Just a moment. My name is Evans, Mrs. Dixie Evans. 
Uh, my husband was coming in to pick up a check. Can you tell me if he's still there? Pick up a check? What's he do, work here? Oh, uh, no. No, he came in there last night. He had a run of luck, and he said he told you to make out a check for him. What was that name again? Evans? Yes. Yes, Charles Evans. Just a second. Hey, does anybody know anything about a check for Evans? No. Nope. You mean he hasn't picked it up yet? No record of a check waiting for him. But he told me... Yeah, lady, sure, he told you. I'm... I'm sorry I bothered you. No bother at all. Main desk. Would you get me the Oasis Club, please? The number is 4062. One moment. Oasis Club. This is Dixie Evans. Uh, I was wondering if there were any messages left there for me last night. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'll look. Uh-uh. Not a one, Mrs. Evans. Thank you. And just like that, I find out that my husband, Charlie, is the person who's been trying to kill me. My own sweet, loving husband. He didn't win a pile at the club cartwheel. And he didn't leave a message for me at the Oasis Club. I guess I must have surprised him when I walked into the hotel room last night. He'd left me for dead. So he'd had to try again. Sleep, Dixie. Get some rest. So he could turn on the gas jet in the room and try again. What does a woman do when she finds out that her husband is trying to murder her? What does she do? What would any other woman do? She'd go to the police. So I came to talk to you. Ah, uh, uh, is that all of it, Mrs. Evans? Yes. Isn't it enough? Oh, Mrs. Evans, tell me something. A, uh, a man who tried to choke you back at the club. Did you see his face? Well, I, I didn't see his face. Well, but you he... didn't see his face. Well, no, well, but... Well, then how do you know it was your husband, Mrs. Evans? Because I told you he tried it again. Only a little while ago, up in our hotel room. I found the gas jet in the room turned on. You don't believe me, do you? Does your husband own a gun? Uh, yes. Has he ever threatened you with it? Well, well no. Uh... Oh, has he ever threatened you at all? No. No, but don't you understand... Why are you so certain that the man who tried to choke you in back of the Oasis Club was your husband? Oh, you didn't see his face. I know, but... Well, then you can't be sure. But up in the hotel room... <laughs> You'd be quite surprised at the number of people who die every year by accidentally bumping against a gas jet and turning it on and never knew they did. I tell you, my husband is trying to kill me. Why? Why? Can you tell me why your husband wants to kill you? I, I don't know why. I, I don't know. I haven't the slightest idea. There, you see, you, you can't tell me why. Now, look, Mrs. Evans, why don't you go back to your hotel now and get some rest? We'll look into it for you. Look into it? But, well, aren't you going to arrest him or something? Well, I don't see how we can. You haven't given us any kind of substantial evidence that would prove your husband is trying to kill you. In fact, you can't even tell me why he wants to kill you. I can't tell you why. I don't know myself. Well, you'd better get back to your hotel, Mrs. Evans. Get some rest. We'll get on this right away. Yes. Maybe you're right. I'll go back to my hotel. Sure. Thank you, Lieutenant. Not at all. You get taken care of, lady? Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Dixie. Charlie. Hello, Dixie. Am I get in the car, my dancing wife. I've come to take you home. Charlie, I, I thought we were going back to the hotel. This isn't the way. What are we doing on the highway? 
Charlie, what's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, don't turn the radio louder, Charlie. I, I, I want to talk to you. Charlie, you, you're mad at me, aren't you? What have I done that's made you mad? Look, Charlie, take me back to our hotel. Let's, let's get home. I, I want to go home. I don't want to go for a ride. I, I'm tired now. I'm awfully tired, Charlie. Please don't turn it louder. It makes my head hurt. Please, Charlie. Charlie, don't I mean anything to you anymore? What is it? What are you mad at me about? Is it the divorce, Charlie? I don't want to hear you talk. That's it, isn't it? That's what you're mad at me about, the divorce. But I... I can't give it to you, Charlie. I can't. Look, it doesn't matter anymore. She's married now. She wouldn't wait any longer. So yesterday she got married. Oh. Oh, Charlie. I didn't know it meant so much to you. I only tried to do what I thought was best for the both of us. We're not getting any younger, and... and well, when two people were married for as long as we were married, I, I thought maybe we should try to make something of it. You thought that. What about me? You? What about what I thought? Oh, you're right, Charlie. But you can't kill me now. Why can't I? I told the police. You told them what? That you were trying to kill me. That it was you in back of the club. That you turned on the gas jet. Oh, no. You can't kill me, Charlie. They'll pick you up in a minute. Okay, Dixie. Shall we go back to the hotel now? Okay, Dixie. Nothing to do, Charlie. We just go on, I guess. Like we have. You'd do that? You stay with me, married to me, knowing I want you dead? I have to, Charlie. Because I won't give you a divorce. Well, like chess, Dixie, we're stalemated, aren't we? Looks that way. You know how much I hate you. Now I know. Up to now, it's been a game of cat and mouse. You were the mouse and I was the cat, ready for the kill. But you tricked me, my pretty wife. You must feel pretty proud. But look, the game's going to change, Dixie. Work hard. You make lots of money because I'm going to spend it all. Charlie. Have I been a good husband to you, Dixie? And think back. Remember all the soft, sweet things that we ever held between us? Think about them, because those soft, sweet things will become just a memory. From now on, I'm going to make life hard for you, Dixie, and I'm going to make it so hard for you, you'll wish that I had killed you. I'm, I'm tired, Charlie. I'm going to try to get some rest. Yeah, get some rest. Get a lot of rest, Dixie. You're going to need it. You tell the police why I wanted to kill you, Dixie? Did you tell them how I asked you in a civilized manner for a divorce? Did you tell them that? Goodbye, Charlie. Dixie! Dixie, what did you do? Dixie! Don't die. The police, Dixie, they'll think I did it. Please, Dixie, don't die. 
that she don't die. <laughs> <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Linda Darnell. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. And during these early months of 52, the Autolite family joins in saluting the leading car manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. Our Autolite family is made up of the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and in still other Autolite plants in many foreign countries. It also includes more than 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite, as well as 96,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our Autolite family will salute the DeSoto division of Chrysler Corporation on the next Autolite Suspense television program. If you live in a television area, check the day and time of suspense on television so that you'll be sure to see this program. And remember, be with us next week for another thrilling Autolite Suspense program on radio. Next week on Suspense... Our star will be Mr. Herbert Marshall in a radio dramatization of the true story of the 39 Steps. In weeks to come, we shall also present Ray Milland and Frank Lovejoy, all on... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. A Killing in Las Vegas was written for suspense by Richard George Pettuccini. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as Charlie and Joseph Kearns as the lieutenant. Featured in the cast were Jerry Hausner, Charles Calvert, Eve McVeigh, and Jim Nusser. Linda Darnell will soon be seen in David E. Rose's production of Saturday Island. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Herbert Marshall in The 39 Steps. Did you know that more than 7 million American men, women, and children are victims of crippling arthritis? Help prevent this waste of human happiness and power. Give today to the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation. Care of your local postmaster. This is the CBS Radio Network. In just a moment, Suspense with Lucille Ball. Hi, Arnold. Well, look who's here. Say, it's mighty nice of you to be sitting around all week just to hear me tell more about Autolite. Oh, I haven't been waiting around all week. Why, I was way up in Oregon. Oh, that's swell. That's swell. Hey, Hap, do you know the real story about Autolite Stay Full Batteries? Well, sure, I know the real story about Autolite Stay Full Batteries. Needs water only three times a year in normal car use. What a battery. Stay full, that is. Why, by Cornelius, an Autolite Stay Full battery has more liquid reserve than a centipede has legs, than an ocean has waves, than a rabbit has, well, rabbits. Water, whales spout it, geysers gush it, people drink it, but Autolite Stay Full batteries carry good old Aquapura so long and so well, they take a drink about as often as you have a birthday, a wedding anniversary, and a New Year's celebration. Only three times a year in normal car use. And let me tell you something else. You'd better get an Autolite Stay Full battery before... Uh, Before you go on some more, Harlow, let's listen to Suspense. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you... Radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, 
Miss Lucille Ball in Anton Leder's production of A Little Piece of Rope, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. They said I'd never make good here in Hollywood. Everywhere I went, it was the same story. Sure, they'd see me, but the minute they took a look at my baby face, all I'd get was advice and excuses. No job. My last try was for a schoolgirl part. <laughs> I was too baby-faced to even land that one. I was walking home, still wearing the school uniform that I'd bought to help me get the part when I got the idea. Then I remembered another thing. It was years ago, reading an old copy of the Police Gazette in Grandpa's attic. Printed about 1880, I guess. With their falsely youthful faces, dressed as innocent schoolgirls, these vicious females haunt the vicinity of select young ladies' seminaries. And with their airs of artless girlhood, they entice and trap unwary gentlemen, some from the best of families. <laughs> It was funny then, but now, well, those gals were suckers. I take the exclusive gents for all they've got and give absolutely nothing. That's how I made good in Hollywood, up to $1,000 a month good. I just take a little walk. I've got uniforms for all the best schools and I still have the baby face. So help me, lots of those kids look older than I do. When school's out, I let some old wolf pick me up. They always want to park up in the hills or some other lonely place. I drop my compact. He bends over to pick it up. And I let him have it with a special little blackjack I carry. Then I leave taking their wallets and any letters I find. You'd be surprised at some of the letters some of them do have. Makes a dandy bank balance now and then. Them? <laughs> Remember, I pick them old enough to have families, dignified jobs. Would they want to admit to chasing bobby soxers? They never squawk. <laughs> My landlady thinks I'm the ideal tenant. Oh, she's no trouble at all, the poor little thing. Infantile, you know. Has to take long walks every day and rest the rest of the time. <coughs> Never any fun or dates like other pretty girls. Well, lucky she can afford it, I say. Be a county ward otherwise. And so sweet and quiet, uncomplaining, <coughs> poor little soul. Yes, Mrs. Tilford is a swell character witness. Of course, I always wear a coat over those uniforms near home, and I keep them locked up just in case she snoops. Yes, yes, I've got a nice career in Hollywood. That is, I, I did have until last month. When... You going out in this cold, Isabel? Oh, this is a good heavy coat. Well, don't you overdo now. These walks are just what the doctor ordered. Anyway, you sure look healthy enough. <laughs> oh, thank heaven for that. Anything I can pick up for you on the way back? Oh, no, thanks, dearie. I got everything done. Goodbye now. Bye. <laughs> I was dressed for Miss Cadwaller's school this time, and it was just letting out when I got there. I didn't have long to wait. You know, you get so you can tell by the way the cars move along the street if the guy's on the prowl. This one was driving a big black coupe, and he was a little younger than I liked, about 40, but you can't be too fussy. I stepped off the curb, pretending to look for a bus. <coughs> Waiting for the bus? Why, yes, I am. Which one? The... Bel Air bus. Oh, I say, that's a shame. Why? I just passed it back there. Broken axle. Oh. Uh, you know, I think I've seen you passing my house. What street do you live on? Cameron. Oh, sure. I'm just over on Bender. Hop in, I'll take you home. Oh, well, you're a neighbor. I guess it's... Gee, thanks, Mr... Um... Rice. Alex Rice. Insurance. How do you do? Like school? I hate it. School's no fun. I'd like... Oh, I... What? Oh, excitement. Danger. <laughs> I suppose you think I'm pretty silly. No. 
No, I think you're the kind of girl who'll get excitement and danger. Really? <laughs> yes, really. Look, uh, it's so early yet. I'd like to take the long way through the hills. It's pretty there now. Oh, yes, I'd love to. I think the hills are divine. Isn't it just out of this world? <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. <sighs> What's the initial on your bag for? The initial? Yeah. Irma? Oh. Inez? Ingeborg? Oh, Ingeborg. You made that up. <laughs> no, it's Swedish. Uh, Imogene? Uh, no, Irene. Irene Taylor. A pretty name for a pretty girl. I'll bet. <laughs> You have beautiful hair and eyes and a beautiful throat. Well, throat. Irene, you're very excited. Oh, Mr. Rice, I dropped my compact. You don't need it. But it might get stepped on. You won't need it. But I want it now. No, I... All right, all right, all right. Don't yell so here. I'll get it for you. Oh! <sighs> Character, huh? Well, here. Roll back a little. There. I... Well, what do you know? Rope. Now, why would a guy carry a piece of rope in his inside breast pocket? Hmm. Nice wallet. Well, goodbye, Mr. Rice, and thanks for everything. Back home, I showered and changed and settled down to see what was in this wallet worth keeping. Only about... 50 bucks. What made it so thick was a lot of newspaper clippings. Oh! Oh, no! It can't be! But it was. Those clippings were all about the strangler who'd murdered five girls in the last year, left them in the hills with a piece of rope around their necks and never a clue. And Alexander Rice carried his press notices... Alexander Rice carried a little piece of rope in his inside breast pocket, picked up girls, drove into the hills. And Alexander Rice wasn't his name. No, his, his driver's license said Benjamin Carney. I had picked up and slugged a strangler. My latest sucker was the most dangerous man in the country. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Lucille Ball in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say there, neighbor, I didn't get going very well on those Autolite stay full batteries. Now look here, Harlow Wilcox, I Never mind, you... I'm right back in there pitching. Gee, if I could only tell you about every one of those 400 Autolite automotive, aviation, and marine products. Well, that takes real breath, lots of breath. And while I'm not as short on taking breath as an Autolite stay full battery is on taking a drink, not by a jugful, even I just haven't got enough breath for that. Well, if you just stop talking so I much... I can sure you... wind up and sound off on those Autolite stay full batteries, though. Making camels look like topers is just the beginning with them. They've got oversized electrical capacity plus fiberglass insulation. You know what that means, my friend? Well, sure I know what that means. It, it means... means you should find out for yourself how long these batteries are bound to live. You'd have to hibernate like Rip Van Winkle. I guess you could at that if you had an Autolite stay full battery in your car. I've got an Autolite. By the way, those Autolite engineers designed that Autolite stay full battery is so darned ingenious by Cornelius that you could pay as little attention to your Autolite stay full battery as Rip Van Winkle did to old Father Time. Go down to your Autolite dealer and get one right away. There's no better buy in batteries, my boy, because no better batteries be behind the byline of Barlow Billcox. Now, look, Billcox, I mean Wilcox, huh? you got bees in my bonnet now. If you'll only pipe down, we'll hear some more of suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Miss Lucille Ball as Isabel in a little piece of rope. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense.
first I just shivered over my narrow escape. Why, if I hadn't been out to get him, he'd have gotten me. I'd be number six in tomorrow's headlines. Then I suddenly realized I was the only one who could identify him. I can't be silent, let him go on killing. I've got to go to the police station and tell them. I started to go out when it occurred to me I couldn't. I didn't dare go to the police and take the chance of exposing my own racket. If that ever came out, and it probably would, San Quentin, here I come. It seems they're a little stuffy about people who carry blackjacks and steal wallets and sell letters. So, instead, I went for a walk. A real one this time, and just tried to think. Pretty soon, another thought hit me. He knew I could identify him by now. The strangler was no fool. He'd have me figured out and know the kind of place and time to look for me. And he'd certainly be looking for me, to kill me, to shut my mouth forever. I had to find a way to... City desk, Thompson. I... I know who the strangler is. Who's this? I can't tell you that. Oh, I see. Well, what can you tell me? You know his name? Benjamin Carney. Carney? C-A-R-N-E-Y, 1156 A Boydell Street. Yeah, description? About 40, 5'9 or 10, 160 pounds, dark hair, eyes, skin, even features. Not ugly, not handsome. Drives a big black coupe, lady, late model. Got it. Any identifying marks, mustache? No, nothing. And how do you know this guy's the strangler? I just know. Goodbye. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you can trace the call? There'd been hundreds of phony clues, and he thought mine was another. But surely they'd check that name and address. All the way home, I had a creepy feeling he was around somewhere, following me, waiting. The evening paper barely mentioned my call, just listed it with several others. Radio wasn't very much better. An unidentified woman phoned in a description of the killer as a 40-year-old brunette, medium height and weight, with no distinguishing features, driving a new black coupe. Police checks revealed that such a man, with the name she gave, had moved from the address given several months before the first of the Strangler murders, but there is no further trace of him. Investigation continues, but it is believed this is another spite accusation. A Portland, Oregon woman reported the strangler as the man who entered her hen house last night and... No use phoning again. I didn't think a letter would help much either, but I tried. Being careful, it couldn't be traced to me and mailed it to a newspaper that night. Hey, Mike, Mike, you go to the courthouse, take this to O'Shea, will you? Another strangler letter telling all. Why can't he just strangle letter writers? One more and I'll strangle somebody. <laughs> Another failure. The letter wasn't even printed. I was getting jumpy from being cooped up like a prisoner. What if he couldn't find me as long as I stayed home? I was losing money every day I didn't pull my act. I could leave town, but why should I give up this good thing, my, my perfect setup? I'd been doing fine. In another year, I could quit the racket, make friends, invest my money, may, maybe even get married. But now this had happened. I'd never be safe. Not as long as we both lived. I finally faced it. I have to find him and kill him. This time I put an ad in the personals column. Would he see it? <laughs> well, I'd run it till he did. A.K. Rice can book your rope okay. act for mutual, mutual profit. profit. Have immediate out-of-town engagement. Signed, Slugger. <laughs> Huh. Rope act and <laughs> mutual profit, huh? <laughs> I knew that would get him because it sounded like blackmail. And by pretending to fall for a shakedown, he'd hope to get close enough to kill me. Only it was going to be the other way around. And so our strange correspondence began. He answered right away. Slugger. Interested in offers. offers. Send, Send details. Box 047M298. Rice. I had him hooked. I didn't lose any time writing. Dear Mr. Rice, 
I have an invention which I think you'll want for your... your robot. It's expensive, but remember, it's completely silent. <laughs> and yours exclusively if we agree on terms. Signed, Slugger. Mm -hmm. <coughs> completely silent. <laughs> it's delicious. And expensive. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Slugger, give price, price and, and details, details of contract. contract. Rice. So close now, I couldn't afford the slightest mistake. Now or... Dear Mr. Rice, 5,000 cash buys complete, complete... assortment of paper and leather goods. Time and place of meeting must be my choice, but decide fast. I must leave town immediately. Signed, Slugger. P.S. You should never have left that snapshot in your wallet. It's awfully good of you. Snapshot? I thought I... Oh, no. No, I didn't burn it. So, the little lady's in a jam. Needs money to hide out. <laughs> and I can help her make her get away. <laughs> Oh, I can indeed. <laughs> Slugger, price okay. okay. We'll, we'll close, close at your convenience, Rice. I've got him. My plan was as foolproof as I could make it. I packed a suitcase with the kind of clothes I'd hate to be found dead in, and maybe I would be, and told Mrs. Milford I was taking a vacation with friends. Oh, I'm so glad, dearie. I said to Miss Knight yesterday, that child should have country air. City air just don't do the same for you. Yes, I know. It'll do me good. And you stay longer if they ask mm -hmm. you. Don't worry about me holding the apartment for you. Well, thanks a lot, Mrs. Tilford. It's certainly nice of you. I have to catch that train now. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have a nice time now. <laughs> I took those awful clothes to the bus depot, changed, washed, and let the soap dry on my face till it was white and shiny and ten years older. With my hair skinned back tight under an old beret, I, I saw a stranger in the mirror. Baby face was gone. Good. No one had noticed me, and looking like this, nobody would. Then I walked to another apartment I'd rented by phone last week. It was in a dingy neighborhood. I miss Sprout. Oh, Miss Sprout, you can move right in. The people left yesterday. Here, this is the key. It's the first door at the head of the stairs. Fine, I'll, I'll go right up. It ain't clean yet. Them stairs bother me so. No, I'd really rather do it myself, thank you. Well, I'll just leave you alone then. And go. Now I was Miss Annie Sprout, librarian. And I looked as much like Isabel Town's baby face as, as an alley cat looks like a Persian. I sat down to write the last letter. Dear Mr. Rice, come to 609 Fitzgilbert Place at 10 p.m. Friday. And don't try to come near me or I'll scream my head off. Tap five times, come in, and stand right by the door while we make sure neither of us is double-crossing the other. Have the money in an unsealed envelope. I want that traveling money, but I'd rather take a chance on the cops than on you, so follow instructions. Slugger. <sighs> you fool. You baby-faced fool. He'd have to make sure the layout was right before he'd dare attack me. And the more precautions I took, the more he'd believe I was on the level. Near the door where he'd stand, I, I put a chest with a lamp on it. That was my booby trap, that lamp. The room was so dimly lit, he'd, he'd have to light my lamp to look at the wallet. And when he pulled the light chain, he'd shoot himself. I had a gun fixed where the bulb should be, and the chain pulled the trigger. It was set to get him in the chest. Heart, if I was lucky. Dead or not, I'd leave him there for the cops, with his wallet and clippings. <laughs> Pretty cute, huh? And I'd skip out the back way with all that beautiful money, go to the depot, become Isabel Towns again. Safe. 
and free. I wore gloves all the time I was there, and the suitcase with Isabel Town's identity in it was ready by the back door. The hours passed like centuries. And the old house creaked like a sick old man in a squeaky bed. Of course, it might be the house or it might be someone on the stairs. And then it was ten o'clock. I was standing at the other end of the room, facing the door. The light was very dim. I heard the feet coming up the stairs, or or was it just the creaking of the old house? No. No. Good evening, slugger. You see, I'm prompt, slugger. Stand where you are. <laughs> Certainly. Did you bring the money? Yes, indeed. Here, Miss Envelope. Throw it down in the middle of the room, between us. Go ahead, throw it down. It'll stay there while you examine the leather goods. Do you have the wallet here? Yes. Throw the money. I, I can't reach it from here, you know. It's quite safe. All right. There. The wallet. Where is it? On that chest b b beside you, by the lamp. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks, slugger. Aren't, aren't you going to look to see that everything's there? <laughs> Why should I? I trust you. So long, baby face. See you around. <sighs> He's gotten away, alive. He must have guessed I'd done something to the lamp. So he was still alive and still dangerous. But at least I had the money, the $5,000. I picked up the envelope and opened it. There was nothing in it but pieces of newspaper cut to the size of bills. <gasps> Why, you dirty cheat! I ran to the door and opened it. I looked out, but he wasn't in sight. Maybe I could catch him before he got out of the house. Oh, you won't get away with this. I stepped into the hall, and before I could turn, I felt the rope around my neck. His hands were pulling it tight. Oh, baby, I told you I'd see you around, didn't I? There you are, baby. You are paid off in full. Now, we'll just go back inside. Let's see. I guess you'll be safe on the floor while we finish our business. Now, I'll take a look at that wallet, baby. You might have held out some of those clippings. I'll just turn on this light. Ah! Thank you, Lucille Ball, for a splendid performance. Miss Ball will return in just a moment.
Say, uh, Hap, you going back to Oregon? Well, how Ah, uh, it's a nice trip if you can get it with an auto light stay full battery. You know, I'd advise you to get a sign for your thumb saying, any car with auto light stay full batteries can carry me. I forgot my canteen. But how uh, Of we... course, you could buy an auto light stay full battery and simply insist that whoever picked you up use your battery. But you couldn't get back to Oregon that way. No, sirree, they'd never let you out of the car just so they could keep that wonderful auto light stay full battery. Let's see, after you got to Oregon, you could go to Washington, Montana, Minnesota, Maine, New York, and but Florida. But, Harlow, I've been trying to tell you I've got an Autolite Stay Full battery. Oh, well, then you know that Autolite means batteries. Stay Full battery. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Miss Lucille Ball. It's always a great pleasure to appear on Suspense, especially when the part is so unusual and exciting. That's right, Miss Ball. The part of Isabel tonight was very different from your regular radio role on My Favorite Husband. <laughs> Plug. Why not? Why not? Something like, uh, listen to Lucille Ball as Liz Cougat on My Favorite Husband every Saturday night. Over your favorite CBS station. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. And I hope all of you will be listening next week when Suspense presents William Powell in a role that's also different from the parts he's been playing lately. He's playing a man who's just stolen a quarter of a million dollars and then finds out that... But you'll hear about it next Thursday when Suspense brings you Give Me Liberty, another gripping study in... Suspense. Lucille Ball may soon be seen in the Paramount production Sorrowful Jones. Barry Kroger was heard tonight in the part of The Strangler. Tonight's suspense play was written by Virginia Cross with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, suspense will present such stars as John Garfield, Margaret O'Brien, Sidney Greenstreet, Agnes Moorhead, Edmund O'Brien, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear William Powell in Give Me Liberty. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Here's your party, Miss Ball. We should all support our local community chest in their drives for funds. Money is badly needed for aid to the handicapped, child care, hospitals, clinics and a host of other humanitarian services. Subscribe to your local community chest. Everybody benefits, everybody gives. Thank you. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star this evening is Miss Maureen O'Hara, whom you've seen rise to stardom in Hollywood within the short space of a year. Her performances in the 20th Century Fox production, How Green Was My Valley, then more recently in The Immortal Sergeant, and now currently in the RKO production, This Land Is Mine, have given her an enviable place in the ranks of America's new film favorites. Miss O'Hara makes her first appearance on our suspense stage tonight as the heroine of a study in homicidal mania. The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich, which is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. 
And so it is with the White Rose murders and the performance of Maureen O'Hara. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. He stood there waiting. He knew that presently they would come out of the second-rate dance hall, out into the dimly lit street. He listened a while and smiled as the orchestra played that tune inside. And then they came out, the two girls, and still he waited, close enough to hear what they were saying. Well, I'll see you at the office tomorrow, Sally. Oh, I don't know how I'll get up. It's after one o'clock. Six hours sleep. Oh, I'll be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, gosh. Uh, I gotta have at least eight hours or I'm no good at all. I wish I had someone to walk me to the bus. It's four long blocks. I'll walk you down, Sally. Oh, don't bother. We go in different directions. Well, it's but... no trouble. Really, I don't mind. Well, really, it's not necessary. Come on. the narrow alley that divides the dance hall from an ugly office building, he stood smiling. Just a little inside the alley, he stood stiffly against the wall, his head back, eyes closed, arms straight down, and in his left hand, a white rose. Well, all right then, Sally. Good night. Good night, Joan. See you in the morning. Dum, da, 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 da. Oh, I hope I don't have to wait long for the bus. <gasps> Who are you? Keep away. Keep away from me. Let me go. Let me go. The girl is dead. Tenderly, the figure straightens her hair and gently places the limp body on the ground. Then he opens her clenched fist and carefully, so that the thorns will not bruise her flesh, he places in her hand the white rosebud. Pardon me, my good man. Is it true that you are the famous detective Terence Riley? Huh? Oh, Jenny, I didn't see you come in. Well, now that I'm here, how about offering to buy a cup of coffee for the girl you're going to marry? If you can ever get up enough nerve to ask her. Oh, it's no use, Jenny. I guess we better call it quits. I'm just a dick on the homicide squad, and that's all I'll ever be. And I'm a rich debutante. We don't belong together. Oh, you've been reading too many of those romantic stories, Terry. What is it this time? What's wrong? Yeah, they call him the White Rose Killer. And he's got to be caught. There's a general demotion coming on if he isn't, and that's all I need to get back into uniform. Oh, don't worry, darling. You always look good in blue. Yeah. Just to match the way I feel. Tell me more about the White Rose Killer. What's he like? That's the stumble. He, he could be anybody. No one's ever seen him except the dead. And they don't talk about it afterwards just slips out of the shadows and kills and then slips back again. How many has he murdered? Four. And he's not through yet. It's going to be one of those chain things if he's allowed to keep on. Are you sure it's always the same one? Yeah. That part of it we're sure of. The same touch. The same way of operating every time. How do you know that? Well, it's a rose. A white rosebud. A death rose. Puts it into each victim's hand after he kills her. Her? Yep. Yeah. It's always a woman. A young woman between 19 and 23. What's behind it? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. But here's what I figured out. You know what a rose stands for. Symbolically, I mean. Why, yes, it's, uh, it's the flower of love. The white rose, uh, the bud, has another meaning. Purity, loyalty, devotion, and especially it stands for a young girl. That's right. And that's about the way I see it. So maybe it's a double cross, committed against our murderer by some young girl whom he worshipped and who betrayed his faith in her. You ought to be a detective, not me. <laughs> Thanks, darling. I've got a very fine teacher. Ah, <laughs> sweet. There's another thing. The murders were all committed near places where there was music, 
dance halls and cabarets and the like. There's a song that brings back the original shock that, you know, gives him the final push over into the darkness. As far as we can figure out, it's the beer barrel polka. Well, how does he commit the murder? Is it always the same way? Mm, always. Strangulation between the hands, with a thumb into the windpipe to keep his victims from crying out. But isn't there anything else you know about him? No, that's, that's why it's so hopeless. He's insane, of course. But there's only this one phase to his insanity. Probably perfectly normal in appearance and behavior. You could pass him on the street and even know it. Well, it's only when he sees someone vaguely like the girl he loved and hears that song that the one defective wire in him is jangled and short circuit. But Terry, the flowers, don't the flowers tell you? He must get them somewhere you could trace. Well, we don't know where he gets them. Maybe he steals them or... Terry, what if you were the one to get him? Well, it would mean a citation and a promotion. And then all the things that stand between us would disappear? We could get married? Well, the chances would be a lot better anyway. But what chance have I? Everyone in the department has been working their heads off for weeks and they've all failed. Uh-huh. Uh, Terry, what were the girls like? The ones he killed? Well, as, as I told you, they were all between 19 and 23. Their heights were pretty much the same, too. They're all tall girls, around five feet, six or seven. A little taller than you. And all dark-haired. How did they wear their hair? Why, they... Say, what is this? Oh, nothing, darling. Just, just interested. How did they wear their hair? Well, from what I remember, they uh, wore it sort of loose and curly down the back. I suppose each one had a resemblance to that long dead love of his. That's probably it. Well, anyway, that's how the record stands. And we're all waiting for it to happen again. I see. Uh, Terry, um, I'd like to go home now. I shouldn't have told you all that stuff. I've given you the creeps. Oh, come on, Terry. Take me home. <laughs> Later, Jenny stands by the window in her room, looking out, thinking. She doesn't move for a long time. Then suddenly, quickly, she goes to her closet and begins to rummage through her many pairs of shoes. Carefully, she picks one pair with three-inch heels. Five foot six or seven. Then she walks quickly to the dresser, opens a drawer, takes out a comb and starts redoing her hair. Worn loose and curly down the back. Well, here we go. Edward! Edward! Yes, miss? Is the car ready? Yes, Miss Virginia. I've been waiting for you. Let's go before Mother sees me. Your mother's been looking for you, miss. I hope you didn't tell her. No, Miss Virginia, I didn't. Good. Come on, Edward. Where do you wish to go, Miss Virginia? The Starlight Dance Hall on Grove and 2nd Street. The Starlight, miss? Yes, Edward, that's the place. I wouldn't go there unescorted if I were you, miss. It's one of the worst places in the city. It has a very bad reputation. The Starlight Dance Hall, Edward. Very good, miss. Very good. Jenny walks slowly around the low light of dance hall, trying to make herself conspicuous. A tall figure leaning against a pillar watches her intently as he idly smokes a cigarette. He doesn't seem to belong there. His clothes don't have the nattiness of a dance lover. Jenny pauses not far from him. Deliberately, he throws his cigarette on the floor, steps on it, and slowly walks over to her. Hello. Oh. Oh, hello. You're not with anyone, are you? Oh, no, I, I'm alone. I thought so. I've been watching you all the time. Have you? I haven't seen you dance yet. I don't know anyone here. How about dancing with me, then? All right. Come on, let's go out on the floor. Do you come here often? No. I never go to the same place twice. You don't? Why? 
I'm always looking for new faces. I'm restless. Do you find the faces you're looking for? Listen. Listen to that song. I like that. I like it very much. Yes, it, it is a nice song. You know, you remind me of someone I used to know. I'm trying to think who. I do? Yeah. Do you mind if we stop dancing and go over and get a drink? No, uh, let's go. Oh, look. They sell flowers here. Yes, I see. I'll get you some. What kind would you like? Oh, uh, any kind. Uh, you pick it out. All right. Let's see. There's something kind of innocent and young about you. Different from most of the girls that come here. Can't we stay here a little longer? It's intermission now. They won't play again for ten minutes. Come on. But I, I, I like it here. Let's stay a little while longer. Well, then let's go down for some air. We can come back in a few minutes. Come on. But... We'll be back before the music starts. Oh, you're hurting my arm. Am I? I'm sorry. <sighs> Fresh air smells good, doesn't it? so dark here. Let's go back. You're not scared, are you? Oh, no, it's... it's, it's Let's walk just down this I... alley and back. Well, please, please. No, you Let me don't. go. Thanks. That's a lovely necklace, beautiful. Why, you're just a cheap... Shut thing. up. All you wanted was my necklace. So long, beautiful. Look out. What's the matter? Behind you, look. Holy... She's dead. A girl. Murdered. With a white rosebud in her hand. Well, Jenny, happened again last night. Just like the other times. A girl strangled in an alley and a white rose in her hand. Any news of the killer? No. He might just as well float through the air for all the trace he leaves. Well, he must have bought the flower upstairs in the dance hall. He must have been there earlier, bought it, and saved no, it under... No, there was only one rose sold up there all night. And to a man who had a different girl with him. We had the flower girl at... How did you know that they sold flowers there? I didn't tell you. Well, I... Uh, I must have read it somewhere. You couldn't have. It wasn't in any of the papers. No details were given, just the statement that an unidentified body was found. Well, I... Yeah, well... I just imagined that they'd sell flowers in a place like that. Well, I'm glad you don't go near those dance halls. Why, with this nut running around oh, loose... don't bother about that. We'd better catch this killer. And fast. Where do you get this wee stuff? To hear you talk, you'd think that you were on the case, too. Wouldn't you think so? To hear me talk? Again, Jenny tours the low dives, hunting for the white rose killer. Her search carries her to the waterfront. And as she walks past each dingy bar, she listens to the jukebox music. After midnight, she passes a dirty windowed saloon. The thin music catches her ear. She pauses and listens, her eyes alive for some sign, some indication of the person she's looking for. Then suddenly her body becomes rigid as her eyes fall upon a figure huddled in the shadows. Someone's watching me. Slowly, she starts to walk up the street. Behind her, the heavy tread of a man's footsteps keep pace with hers. It's a quiet tread, unhurried but deliberate. For several blocks, it keeps the exact distance. 
Jenny starts to walk faster. I've got to know if he's really following me. The man quickens his pace. Jenny starts across the street. The man follows. She's sure now, sure that the man is following her. She fumbles for something in her purse. Her hand closes around a gun. If he tried anything, I'll shoot. You in any trouble, lady? Oh, no, officer. It, it's all right. You scared him away. Scared who away? Oh, just a man who wanted to bring me flowers. That's all. Well, he brought you one anyhow, lady. What do you mean? Right there on the ground, right by your feet. A white rose. <laughs> Coffee, Mabel. Sure, coming right up. Here you are. Terry. Terry. Hello, Jenny. Sit down. Thank you. Say, what's the matter with you? Look, darling, read the gossip column in this paper. What daughter of a socially prominent family is that way about a detective and waits for him outside the station house in her limousine every night? Private chauffeur and all... But Mama says no. That's not so funny. Oh, they held a big family war council over me just now. Indian powwow, feathered headdress and everything. They did, huh? Well, what did they decide? Oh, I was asked to give my word that I wouldn't see you anymore. I refused, of course, so I'm to be exiled. Where to? Our summer home. It's just a few hours out of town, but I'll be there all by myself. Just with Mrs. Crosby, the housekeeper. Oh, maybe they're right. Why don't you listen to them? Are you on their side, too? No. When are you leaving? Right away. Edwards is driving me out. I just slipped out to let you know. Here's the address and phone number of the place in case you want to reach me. Don't lose it. I won't. Well, what's new and exciting about the White Rose Killer? Our famous lover of flowers? <laughs> We're still trying to track him down. I suppose I'll go looking for him at the flower show that's just opened. Oh, a flower show just opened? Yeah. Well, uh, goodbye now. I'll be seeing you. What uh, floor is the flower show, please? Third floor, miss. Three, please. Third floor. Where's the rose display, please? Uh, to your left, over there. See where the man in the gray coat is? In the gray coat? Oh, yes, thank you. They are lovely, aren't they? Oh, you... You were startled, Mayor. I'm sorry. I was just admiring the roses. Oh, yes, the nicest flowers here. I, I just can't keep my eyes off them. Yes, you, you can feel that way about some flowers. Well, that's the way I feel about white roses. Have you been here long? Well, I really don't know. I suppose so. You, you see, I've come here every day since the show opened. I, I like to be near the roses, the white roses. Those big ones are nice. No, I, I like the little ones best, the little tightly curled rosebuds. They're so little and innocent. Oh, well, I, I really better be going. Are you going down? Yes. Down, please. Here, miss, I... I took a rose for you. Thank you. It, it's lovely. And would you... Would you care to have a drink with me? Why, yes, thank you. I know of a little place a block or two down there. They have nice music. We'll go there. All right, whatever you say. <laughs> This is it. Where's the music? A nickel in the jukebox does it. Any special song you'd like? No. Uh, go ahead and pick one. Okay. And there we are. Oh, that's my favorite song. Reminds me of a, a girl I used to know. Oh, uh, 
Excuse me, I, um, I want to powder my nose. I'll be right back. Do you mind? No, of course not. Precinct. Sergeant Thomas speaking. Hello, I is Terry Riley there? Uh, just a moment, I'll see. Please hurry, it's important. No, sorry, Miss Terry Riley's not here just now. Oh, uh, will you uh, will you tell him tell him that I can't keep that date with him? Goodbye. Do you always go to the phone booth when you want to powder your nose? Why, I uh, well, I I had to make a call. Uh huh. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Oh, wait. Uh, let me come with you. I'm sorry, miss, but I've got other things to do. Oh. What's the matter? That car. Someone that knows me. Let's get away from here. That's just what I'm going to do. So long, lady. Wait, wait. Please don't go. Miss Virginia. Miss Virginia. I'm sorry, Miss Virginia, but I must speak to you for a minute. Oh, Edwards. What do you want? I'm sorry, miss. You'd better come with me at once. I've been looking for you everywhere. Your mother's been taken seriously ill. Mother? Well, where is she? She's out at the country place, miss. I drove her there shortly before dinner. She wanted to pay you a surprise visit. Oh. I believe the shock of not finding you there upset her, miss. Is she very bad? She had the doctor with her when I left. Mrs. Crosby has gone away for the day. Your mother needs you, miss. Well, let's go. Hurry, Edwards, please. Right, miss. <laughs> Where is Mother Edwards? In her room, miss. You'd better hurry. Mother. Mother. It's Ginny. Is the doctor in there with you? Mother. Why, there's no one here. The room's empty. The bed hasn't been touched. Edwards, what are you doing? Merely playing a song, miss. A favorite of mine. Uh, a favorite? Yes, Miss Virginia. Where's Mother? She's in the city, miss. You lied to me. I'm afraid I did, Miss Virginia. Why are you locking the door? You know why, Miss Virginia. It... it can't be. You're not the... The White Rose Killer. But you see, I am, Miss Virginia. Driving you and your family around day after day. Sitting there right in front of you all the time. It was amusing to watch you hunting for me. Hunting for someone you saw several times a day. But it, it can't be. You're not insane. Of course not. Who said I was? Edwards, you know I'm not the girl who betrayed you. Yes, I know that. Well, then unlock the door and let me out. Please, Edwards. I've killed five times. I've never regretted it. I'm going to kill you, Miss Virginia. Why, Edwards? Why? Because you've been so clever. Too clever. You made yourself look like her, the girl who deceived me. I could have killed you the day you first went out looking for me, but I had to be careful. Oh. I almost caught you that night at the waterfront, the night I dropped the white rose when that police car came. Edwards, I... Uh, I've never done you any harm. Your sweetheart, Terry. He loves you, doesn't he? Yes. That's good. Because now you won't be able to deceive him like my girl deceived me. Keep away, Edwards. Keep away or I'll... <laughs> you oh. thought you'd use your gun, eh? Well, don't think I was fool enough to overlook that. I took your gun out of your purse. It won't do you any good to kill me, Edwards. I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> no, and you're not going to have a chance to break another man's heart like she broke mine. Jenny! Jenny! Where are you? Terry, Terry! It won't do you any good to call to him. He can't get in here without breaking down the door. Keep away from me. Terry! It will be too late then, because I'm going to kill you now. Jenny, where are Terry! you? Terry! Yes, let me get my hands on that pretty white throat. Oh, keep away. Keep away from me. Uh, Terry! Uh, Stop! Jenny, are you all right? Yes, Terry, I... I'm all right. Oh, take it easy. Here, sit down. Oh, Terry, I was so scared. There was nobody here but Edwards and I. How, 
How did you know where I was? Oh, it was simple. You were supposed to meet me at the coffee shop. You never broke an appointment, and when you didn't show up, I called the number you gave me. You told me the housekeeper was here all the time, and when there was no answer, I got suspicious and came down. Besides, when I got a message down at headquarters that you had to break a date with me, I knew something was wrong. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I... I'm... Uh... Terry! Look. On the floor beside Edwards. A white rose. Must have fallen out of his pocket. That was meant for me. Oh, Terry, it's... It's all crushed. Yeah. Crushed and dead. Just like the white rose killer. And so closes the White Rose Murders, starring Maureen O'Hara. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who, speaking for Columbia, hopes you have enjoyed Miss O'Hara's performance and our play. Because of a special broadcast of the All-Star Baseball game, suspense will not be heard. But again the following week, we will be back with another play on this series and more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, and Cornell Woolrich, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Broderick Crawford in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite invites you to return to the 30s as we chronicle the true account of those turbulent years with a report called Dutch Schultz, our star, Mr. Broderick Crawford. Say, Harlow, October's great, isn't it? Yes, sir, Hap. Great for football, long drives. And for checking spark plugs, too. That's right, Johnny Plug Check. Now's the time to get that car winterized. And along with that antifreeze, change of oil and grease, don't forget the spark plugs. Well, how could anyone forget, Harlow? Spark plugs are the very heart of the car's ignition system. They sure are, Hap. And when they're right, you're, you will start quicker and surer every time, even in the coldest winter weather. So don't delay, friends. Visit your Autolite spark plug dealer now. He's a specialist in spark plug cleaning and adjustment. If replacements are needed, he'll recommend a set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, like the amazing Double Life Resistor spark plug. To quickly locate your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents... Dutch Schultz, starring Mr. Broderick Crawford, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Rogers dies in plane crash. X-Tree. Catch a New York Daily Mirror. 
Hey, give me a packet of cigarettes, sir. Oh. Yes, sir. That'll be 11 cents, sir. 11 cents? Yesterday it was 10. Yeah, sorry, mister. As of midnight, all major brands went up to 11 cents. This is 1935, you know, not 1932. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are looking up and going up, that's what I say. You say that, huh? Yeah. Ginch. What? Outside, I got something. Okie dokie. So? Certain parties is meeting tonight up at the hotel. Are you kidding? Hey, hey Flot, you kidding me? No, Ginch, I wouldn't kid you. You know that. What parties? The big brokers. You know, Harry and Lepke and Lucky. And Albert, he's going to be there. And Gurra. And the boys from Chicago, Milwaukee, Oh, Casey. nobody said nothing to my boss. I just thought you ought to know. The Dutchman ain't going to like this, Flot. He's still got you running numbers. Yeah. Why don't you quit him? I can't. Why not? Mo Weinberg quit that Schultz stuck an ice pick in his ear. Yeah, I heard about that. He's kind of a screwball, huh? Screwball? Oh, well, wait till he hears you holding another meeting without him. Boy, he'll be banging all over the place. Well, maybe you better not go back to Newark today. And who'll he be banging? Me. So I'll take a rest. Tell you what, Ginch, I'll blow you to a show. What's playing? Shirley Temple. I already seen it, but I'll see it again. Shirley Temple, huh? Yeah. She's the cutest little thing, just like a doll. I tell you, Ginch boy, I cried. I honestly did. <laughs> Are you Harry, Lucky, boys? All right, gentlemen. I think we are all assembled. Somebody turn that radio off? Hey, you're looking just fine. Hey, Harry, how was the vacation? It was very charming, very charming. The missus enjoy yourself? Her back gave her a few, what do you call it, twinges, but yeah. taken by and large, it was a charming vacation. That's nice. But enough of this pleasantries. To business, gentlemen. The question we have met to deliberate about is this new fellow in the DA's office. That bum has got to be banged in the head. Please, a little consideration? Hey, girl, don't be interrupting, Harry. Sorry. Apologies accepted. Now then, this new fellow has been investigating some matter which might prove embarrassing to we fellows if all the facts should become known. I am referring in particular to the stuff he is investigating about the numbers business. Now, since we decided to get smart... And from the syndicate... To... What do you mean I don't go in? How are you, boys? Dutch Schultz. Yes, Albert, it's the Dutchman. How come all of my good friends here, the people I've been doing business with for years, how come they're holding councils without the Dutchman, huh? Please, act like a civilized being, will you? Act like you didn't grow up in a barn or somewhere? And you, Harry, you're my pal. What is this? This is a matter concerning New York City, Mr. Schultz. Not New Jersey or Newark. Which is why you weren't invited. Well, the way I heard it was, you was going to discuss the new guy in the DA's office. Which is correct, but please, no names. That DA, he done a lot of bad things to me. I think I ought to be in on a discussion. Frankly, I didn't think you'd be interested, but since you see fit to come busting in here, you can stay. Yeah, that's more like it, Harry, thanks. One thing, though. What? What's that? You're not on the board of the syndicate, Mr. Schultz, so you don't get to vote. Wait a minute, what is this? A bunch of lead pipe hoods and you're trying to make like big businessmen, big operators. We are businessmen, Dutch. You can sit down and shut up or get out of here. All right. That's more like it. Now then, Harry, you were saying? Ever since that runaway grand jury took out Mr. Dodge, we have had great difficulties keeping the DA's office in line. We got plenty of grease, but nobody will pay it to. This new fella, he's incorruptible. So the, the question is, what are we going to do about him? Just give him a treatment he wouldn't forget, that's all. That's what I say. The bum has got to be banged in the head. Now, please, gentlemen, a little consideration. Thank you. You see, Mr. Schultz, times are changing. We don't operate with those tactics anymore. This is big business. We've got to operate with a modicum of intelligence. Modicum? What gives without their modicum? It means a itty bit. All right, why don't he say so? A itty bit intelligence. That I can understand, but modicum. Uh, please, Mr. Schultz. Let me remind you. You're here as the observer only. Oh, please proceed. I was carried away, a modicum. Uh, uh, oh, yes. I operate with intelligence. It seems to me that there is a definite possibility that we may have to resort to drastic measures in dealing with this fella. Yeah. 
And so I am deputizing Albert here to investigate the situation. This is no ordinary contract, Albert. I want you to figure out how it can be done so nobody gets fingered and nobody gets hurt. Except for that fellow, I mean. Will do. The perfect contract. Yeah, and I'll help you. I got a lot of ideas and experience in that line. No. Harry, listen, you don't know how much I hate that new DA. N-O. No. This calls for finesse. And please, no names. Albert, I'm counting on you. Gentlemen, we'll meet here in one week for Albert's report. And in the meantime, don't worry about the future. You know the old saying? Keep smiling. Five thirty-four twenty-three. Seventy-eight fifty. Twenty-three forty-six. Eight hundred ninety-one. And four hundred fifteen sixty-seven. And that, my good friend, winds it up for the night. Really, a very nice little take, Ginch, if I do say so myself. Yeah, well, just don't you plan on taking any of it for yourself, Abba Dabba. <laughs> Who can be so stupid? You needn't speak to me like that, Ginch. I know Mr. Schultz. Yeah, but you don't know him like I know him. Yeah, what's the food on the table for? Mr. Schultz. He's back from the meeting. Ah, I was hoping he'd stay in New York, see a show or something. Hi, boss. Hello, Mr. Schultz. Hi, boys. Okay, Berman, what's the tally? Oh, oh very good, Mr. Schultz. $13,561.13 for the day. Uh, that's because of you, Abba Dabba. <laughs> I, it was nothing. Yeah, so they think I'm slipping, do they? You, Gitch, what do you think? Well, I think you're on top of the world, Dutch. Yeah, and you know why? Because I use my brains. When I ain't got them, I buy them. Those knuckleheads in New York, those big businessmen. They got a numbers racket. Me, I got a numbers racket. Mine pays off the players, but hardly ever. Theirs, it's paying off all the time. And why? Because mine is superior, that's why. Because I use my head. I went out and bought me Abba Dabba here. Oh, but I was glad to get the job. I like the money. Shut up! I think... Why isn't the numbers paying me more money? Because it's too honest, that's why. It's like a bad slot. When the slot's bad and paying off too much, what do you do? You fix it. So I went over to that college there, and I bought me a student. A mathematical genius. I said to him, kid, you fix this, and I'll take care of you. You were very generous. And was really a fascinating problem. Gitch, what's the matter with South Bayonne? Uh, well, uh, the school kids. Well, we're losing their business. One of their principals is working against our runners. Oh, principal, huh? I hate principals. I had a principal once. His name was uh, uh, Jesse Condon. Did you ever hear of him? By the Lindbergh case? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. He used to beat my ears up, and I was a defenseless kid, too. Look, I'll tell you what. Gitch, you give this principal a workout. Oh, Dutch, he's an old man. I don't think you heard me good, Ginch. I heard you, Dutch. You're only working guys over. Well, you got plenty of guys who do that sort of stuff. But I want you to do this one, Ginch. Let me show you a trick, Ginch. Come here. Put your hand on the table. What, Dutch? Put it on the table there. All right. Dutch, you you broke it. You you broke my thumb. Yeah, that was pretty neat, wasn't it, eh? I know a lot of those kind of tricks, Ginch. So I tell you what now. Every week that passes without you doing what I tell you, like when I tell you to give the principal a workout, I'm going to break another finger for you. What are you staring at? Uh, 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 nothing, sir. All right, that's good. I don't like people to stare at me. Well, how about it, Gitch? How do you feel? Oh, uh, Dutch. I, I, uh, shouldn't he get that fixed, Mr. Schultz? Yeah, he should. Now, Gitch, here's 50. Go down to the drugstore and get that fixed up. Come on, Gitch. Do me a favor. Get me a present for my mother. Something nice, a, a big bottle of, of, of Tutu à l'Amour. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for your mother. Sure, Dutch. If you want, I should get her some perfume or toilet water. I'll kill you for saying that! Where does he take his ears? Where does he get off talking like that? Stop that! Everything's going crazy around him. My own boys are talking out against me and those businessmen. Just a simple contract. Hit the DA on the head and they're gonna meet with the board of directors like... Oh, that's a big deal. Keep smiling, he says. Keep smiling. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Broderick Crawford in Dutch Schultz. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense.
Say, Hap, have you had your car winterized yet? Well, no, Harlow, I haven't. Winter weather doesn't wait. Get on the ball, man. Agitate. Ah, Johnny Plug Check's right, Hap. There's no time like now to get that car into your Autolite spark plug dealer for a change of oil and grease, antifreeze. And check those important spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny Plug Check, because they're the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when the spark plugs are right, you'll always start quicker and surer, even in coldest weather. If replacements are needed, your Autolite spark plug dealer will recommend a set of world-famous Autolite spark plugs, like the resistor spark plug, which gives a double life of smoother engine performance and quick starts. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every use. So decide now to have your car winterized this week. And check those important spark plugs, too. At your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealers, because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Broderick Crawford in Elliot Lewis's production of Dutch Schultz, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. All right, gentlemen, all right. All right, Albert. Let's hear it. And Albert, don't give us none of that keep smiling stuff, huh? Look, Schultz, I don't want no trouble with you tonight. Okay, Mr. Businessman, okay. Let's hear the report, huh? All right. I want quiet. I don't want to have to tell this twice. Here it is. The subject under discussion is no DA. This guy has got it 24 hours around. Two plain clothesmen all the time. They watch his building, they escort him everywhere. There's no way to get at him. I mean, no ordinary way. Use a truck. You get a big garbage truck. See, it comes speeding down the street. Mr. Schultz, do we have to have you ejected? All right, all right, go on. My cousin, he's got a little kid, five years old. So what I did, I borrowed this kid, bought him a tricycle, see? Every morning when this fella comes walking out with his bodyguards, there I am, Joe Citizen, typical square, taking my morning physical with my little boy right there by the door. Very nice, good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He comes walking out. He smiles at the kid, sort of tips his hat to me. I swear that guy's going to be a politician someday. And then he walks down to the corner drugstore. Drugstore? Yeah, yeah. And the way I figured... Everybody in City Hall is trying to tap his phone, so he uses the drugstore's public pay station. He goes inside, the two bodyguards keep out in the street. He stays in an average of three minutes, alone, see? Then he comes out, gets in a city limousine, and goes downtown. Very nice information, Albert. Now, uh, how do you work it? He's very precise, this fella. Goes into the drugstore at 8.05 precisely every morning. The fellas who are handling the contract get there early. Bang the druggist with silences, wait. He comes in. Guards are outside. He goes into the booth, they bang him, stroll out. We got two, two and a half minutes to get away. The guns get left in the drugstore. That's good, let's do it. Listen, Albert, I think it's a very compact and neat way to handle a contract, and I only wish I still had you working for me in, in this, in your old capacity. Yeah, yeah. Incidentally, the guns I already arranged for, a pair of brand new untraceable government 45s. We lifted him out of a crate down at the federal warehouse. Uh, yeah, it's, it's perfect. Nice work, Albert. But I've been giving this entire matter a lot of thought during the past week. And I really, I, I tell you honestly, I, I haven't slept. Now, please, gentlemen, I, I beg of you, a little consideration. All right. All right. Move on. A lot I care. You wouldn't listen. Uh, no, that's better. Now, you know me. I got only your best interests at heart. And I have come to the conclusion that... It is in all our best interest that this fella from the DA's office stays alive. Harry, what are you, buggy or something? This guy's got to go. All right, all right, the boys. You can just quiet down and listen to me. Yeah, Lucky. What do you say? I say Harry's right. The guy lives. You know, we got to look at this with the, the long view. We got to think of the... Syndicate. Uh, you and a syndicate can drop dead. Albert's got the perfect plan. Let's use it. Listen, Schultz, I want you to shut up. And now. Harry's right, and here's why. What can this DA investigate? The Manhattan, nothing else. All right. So we're going to let him. 
We got a nationwide business to take care of. We ain't gonna sacrifice that just so the couple of Times Square number runner can stare at the can. The syndicate to come first. Yeah, but that fella, he's investigating pretty high up. He could, he, he could even get some of we fellas in this room. No, Gura. No? Any lawyer will tell you they can't get an indictment unless they got a solid case. And they can't get a solid case unless they got two witnesses. And that is where we pass out the contracts. You mean, instead of taking us one fellow, we're going to have to take ten, maybe twenty, huh? Yeah, yeah. And here's why. Take this fellow, and it becomes a federal case. It gets out of Manhattan, and it gets out of hand. And you boys are from Chicago and Milwaukee, and KC know what I mean. And you too, Dodge. You don't want this investigation spreading all over in uh, New Jersey. I'm sure Mr. Schultz is beginning to see the light. Now, let's take a vote. Anybody against the notion that we... Let the little fella go ahead with his investigation? Well, it seems a long way around the barn to have to kill all those witnesses instead of just one fella. We can get them before they start to be news. There's no problem in there. All right, I'm with you. Well, I'm not. Leaving us, Mr. Schultz? Yeah, yeah, I'm going back to Jersey where the air don't stink from chicken. I take it you don't like the way we operate. Look, Albert here comes up with a perfect contract and you fancy pants are too chicken to carry it out. Well, listen, Lucky, Albert, Henry, Ola, Harry, all the rest of you. Maybe there's somebody in this world who ain't too chicken. That's just a little thought, gentlemen. Just a little thought. Thanks, Dave, baby. Thanks, baby. Hopkins goes to death house. Get your New York Daily Mirror here, baby. They're over there, Dutch. Those fellas. Which ones, Gensh? Stand up by the shoe store there? Yeah. Are you gonna want me anymore today, Dutch? No, I'll go back to Newark. Sure, Dutch. Hello, Mr. Schultz. Are you the fella? Yeah. Toy's the name. This is my partner, Murray. You fellas wanna make a little? Depends on a contract. Uh, that's an easy contract. I got it all figured out, so there'll be no problem. Who's the mark? Just a fella. I gotta know who. What's the matter? What's it to you who? It's just a job, that's all. It's no problem, Toy. Look what is this. What's with you? A couple of sissies or something? You scared of a little job? I asked Inch to get me some fella who could handle a little contract. Look, you wanna know who the fella is? All right, I'll tell you, I got nothing to hide. It's the new DA in New York. Come on, Murray. Wait a minute, where you gone? You got the wrong parties, Mr. Schultz. Haven't you heard? The DA lives. That's the word from the syndicate. Hey, Ginch. Ah, uh, hello, Flat. What happened to your arm? What's with the sling? Dutch. Oh. First the thumb, then the wrist, something he thought I said about his mother. He's an animal, that's what. Another year with Dutch, I'm going to be in very bad condition. And you can't quit. That's right. You won't let me go. Bull quit, Dutch stuck an ice pick in his ear. Ginch, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, but... If I tell you something, would you tell Dutch? I wouldn't tell him if his hat was on fire. Certain parties is having a meeting tonight. Six o'clock. Oh, oh, that's one he really don't know about. Gentlemen, the situation is fraught with danger to us all. I don't know. If it was anybody else, I would say forget about it. Yeah, it being the Dutchman, he's just screwy enough to follow through. My boys never lied to me. They say he's out shopping for a man to take the contract right now. Been talking about it for almost a week. There's only one thing to do. We got to take Dutch before he takes that fellow from the DA's office. Albert, you got any ideas? Uh, Dutchman is kind of screwy, but he ain't crazy. You know what I mean. He's not the kind of a fellow you just walk up to and do it. He's covered all the time. I know where he's hanging out this week. Where's that, Lucky? The Palace Chop House over in Newark. I know that place. 
It's got a little private dining room in the back there. The fellow would have to be screwy to try it in there. Yeah, I got just a man. Bug. Huh? Mandy. In here. Got a job for you, Bug. Contract. <laughs> yeah. Who? Cool. Dutch. Okay. It's got to be fast. Sure. Fast. I mean tonight. Okay. Tonight. Mandy, you drive. Come on. Walk you down to the car. Uh, the probable business. Yeah, yeah. Well, gentlemen, we got nothing more to talk about tonight, so I would suggest we get out and get seen, if you follow me. Four hundred and eighty-three eleven. Sixty-eight fifty-one. Seventeen thirty-nine. Five hundred and fifty even. Hundred and thirty-seven forty-five. Look, stop that creepy whistling, will you? I'll fix your whistle so it'll never blow again. All right now. Seven hundred and seventy-five fifteen. That does it. What I'm gonna do to that ginch when he gets back? I told him to go back to Newark. Where is he? Maybe he missed the train. Or something. Look at Berman. I need you around here to handle my books and keep my numbers business functioning. I don't like it. You should be talking all the time and whistling like a boy, like a like a schoolboy. Uh, sorry, Mr. Schultz. I'm gonna be in business for a long time, Berman. Remember that. You wanna get rich? Stick with me. Yes, sir. I'm with you, Mr. Schultz. But keep your mouth shut, see? Tight shut. Now get those tallies added up. I'm gonna wash my hands. Yeah, okay. Kid, you with the glasses. Hmm? Whom are you addressing, may I ask? Where's Dutch? He went to the bathroom. But you, you haven't answered my question. Kid, you bother me. I'm sorry, it's busy. So am I. Busy. Busy as a bee. Say, Gincho boy, Gincho boy, was a hotsy totsy or was a hotsy totsy? Oh, it was a hotsy totsy, all right, Flato boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy, I, I sure let you talk, man, staying in New York. Dutch is really going to be sore me now. Ah, oh, forget it. Come on, come on, we'll go up to Lindy's, have a couple of drinks, see you standing around. All right, stay, Listen, Fry, I, I can't, I'm in so much I trouble now. Hey, wait, Dutch what's that? Listen. Dutch Schultz gunned to death by mystery figure, baby. I asked you get the New York Journal of America. Did you hear and that? The Dutchman gets in. Come on, let's buy a paper. Let's buy all the papers. Yeah, even the time. Yeah, we'll take them up to Lindy's. And have a drink. And have a party. A hey, boy. And hey, a newsboy. <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Broderick Crawford. This is Harlow Wilcox again. Tomorrow, members of the American Trucking Association attending the annual convention in Los Angeles will see a new three-cent stamp being issued by the post office department. This stamp commemorates the 50th anniversary of the trucking industry. In the years since they first proved themselves as winning competitors over horse-drawn vehicles, Trucks have become the backbone of our transportation system. Their versatility and dependability in war and peace and their economy of operation have made trucks the finest carrying vehicles any civilization has ever known. Today, over nine million of these modern beasts of burden serve us in countless ways and give work to some six million Americans who make, drive, and service them. Autolite has been associated with this industry for 42 years. 
and is privileged to salute the American Trucking Association on this important occasion. Next week, another true story as we dramatize the diary of a man whose unfortunate task it was to set down a report on the death of his friends. Ordeal in Donner Pass. Our star, Mr. Edmund O'Brien. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Dutch Schultz was adapted for Suspense by James Poe. Featured in tonight's cast were Jane Novello, Herb Butterfield, Hi Aberback, Paul Fries, Sidney Miller, Jack Moyles, Benny Rubin, and Anthony Barrett. Roderick Crawford will soon be seen in Night People, a 20th Century Fox picture. And remember, next week, Mr. Edmund O'Brien in Ordeal in Donner Pass. Buy Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts, and Autolite stay full batteries at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Richard Widmark in a true story of murder. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, you're going to hear a true story, a classic of American crime, as documented by criminologist Edmund Pearson. The story is called Mate Bram. Tonight's star, Mr. Richard Widmark. Well, Harlow, tomorrow marks the opening of baseball season. Why, my team's been playing all year, Hap. Oh, what team is that? The Autolite electrical system in every Autolite-equipped car. And that's a real team. Because every unit, like the coil, distributor, generator, battery, starting motor, and set of spark plugs, are related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. But that team doesn't play ball, Harlow. Oh, does a lot more, Hap. Why, the Autolite electrical system goes to bat every time you start your car. And it keeps right on working every second your car is running. Works every time you light your lights, blow your horn, use your electric windshield wiper, radio, or heater. Real major league stuff, eh, Harlow? You bet your bat, Hap. So, friends, when your Autolite-equipped car needs replacement parts, always insist on Autolite, original factory parts. It pays. Because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Mate Bram and the performance of Mr. Richard Widmark, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! Dear Mr. Cooper, I write to you as my true friend who has given me wise counsel in the past, who knows of my faults and weaknesses, and who also knows my strength. Respecting the latter, I advise you that during the past year I have totally abstained from drink in any form. And because of that and hard study, I now have a first mate's ticket. It was in that berth that in Boston I signed on the barkentine Herbert Fuller, from where I now write you to give you a report of this fatal voyage. As a matter of truth, I myself might be dead when you read this, if it ever reaches you.
I signed on, the master of the vessel being Charles I. Nash, in the company of the following men, each important to this account. Henry J. Slice Seaman. Aye, aye, sir. Here, Captain. Sign this line, Slice. Ah, you'll have the port watch. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, Charlie Brown, Seaman. Aye, hey, sir. Uh, this line, Brown. Port watch. Aye, hey, sir. Jonathan Spencer, steward. Yes, sir. Uh, right here, Spencer. Glad to have you aboard again. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thomas Bram, first officer. Yes, Captain. This line. First trip, Mr. Bram. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, August Blomberg, second officer. Aye, sir. This line, Mr. Blomberg. Aye, sir. There are two other names important to this account. Lester H. Monks, who came aboard as a passenger in the interest of his health as the nature of our voyage was to be tropical. The other name is Laura Nash, wife of Captain Nash. If I had known that this woman was going to sail with us, I never would have signed on. But when I saw her and learned that she was, I didn't sign off, although I could have. I stayed on because she was compelling, with a bold look, and because a man is always a hunter. That same day, still in harbor, when first I saw her, I went to the steward to learn more. Yes, sir, Mr. Uh, your name is Bram, isn't it? Yes, my name is Bram. Can I get a cup of tea? Yes, sir. It's hot. Are you a home man, Mr. Bram, or did you come from another ship? I came from another ship. What ship was it? The Antilles. She came in yesterday. We go out tomorrow. You don't like it, sure side, Mr. Bram. Nope, I find it too much trouble. You've sailed this ship before? Two trips. What is this woman that goes with us? She's the captain's wife, sir. I know that. Is she a good wife, Spencer? I don't know what you mean, sir. Oh, well, she's younger than he is. Why does a young woman marry with a man like that and go sailing off on a ship with him and 11 other men? I don't know, Mr. Bram. No lady would do that, would she? I don't know many ladies, Mr. Bram. You won't find out asking me. You'd better ask her. Maybe I will. Hello, Blomberg. More deck cargo ready to load for it. I'll see to it. You want tea, Mr. Blomberg? Ah, tea time. Spencer, you sailed this ship before. What do you know about this woman that goes with us? Nothing. What kind of woman she is? The way she looks at a man. I don't know, sir. I don't know. When I left the steward, the second mate was asking the same questions I asked. I mentioned this to remind you that I was not alone with my thoughts. The same ones were in the minds of the others. Perhaps all of them. This then, my good friend, was the state and nature of the ship when we made to open sea. The first day passed in shaking her down, but then evening was upon us and the woman ate supper in the cabin at the officer's table, which also included the passenger, Mr. Monks. These meals, there were only six of them, may be exaggerated in my memory, but I think not. It seems now that nothing was discussed except that I abstained from the wine that was served. It was difficult because I didn't want to give as my reason for refusal a fact that you know, sir that I am a slave to drink unless I abstain entirely. Your glass, Laura? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Monks? Yes, please. Thank you, Captain. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bryan? No, sir, I don't want any. Hmm. Mr. Blomberg? Yeah, I like good wine. Ah. Uh, are, uh, are you a religious man, Mr. Bram? No, sir, not overly so. Wondered if that was why you wouldn't have a glass of wine with us. No, I don't care for wine. What you drink, then? Rum like the pirates? <laughs> I don't drink at all. I didn't think that a seafaring man lived that didn't drink, Mr. Bram. Seafaring men are much like any men, Mr. Monk. Some of them drink, some of them don't. Uh, wine with a meal and a good whiskey or brandy at the end of a watch. Uh, Nothing can take their place. Is there a reason you don't drink, Mr. Bram? Yes. 
I don't like to. Have you ever drunk? No, I never have. I don't believe that. I've heard that some men don't drink because they expose their true selves when they do. Do you have a true self that you are hiding? I'm sorry to disappoint you, madam. You are seeing my true self, a man who doesn't drink. Oh, there must be a reason. And I'll find out now what it enough, is. That's enough, Laura. You're too forward. <clears throat> Eat your supper. As I stated, my memory of that first supper may now be exaggerated, but I think not. There was more drinking after the meal, but I left, as it was my watch. I know that the second mate stayed with the woman, though, even after Captain Nash had retired to his cot in a chart room. Now, this sleeping arrangement must be explained because it's important. The captain with a cot in the chart room, forward in the main house. The woman in the first cabin, starboard. The passenger in the second. Across the companionway, I in the first cabin, port. Mr. Blomberg in the second. I heard the woman come to her quarters after I'd been relieved. And I think that night, I started dreaming about her and her taunting smile. And with her, I dreamed of being drunk. The next day passed the same and the next night. There's little enough of interest on a ship and anything unusual is left upon. On this ship, it was my sobriety. The first sign of trouble came upon us during the third evening. And I swear upon our friendship, sir, that it was not of my doing. I was only walking aft past the main house. Mr. Bram. Yes? I'm in my quarters. I'm still on watch, Mr. Blomberg. What do you want? I think of you too much today. Now I don't like you. What you think is your business, not mine. And that I don't like you? It's a man's privilege to like or dislike. You don't care? <laughs> well, there'd be nothing for me to do about it if I did. There is something. Oh? Stop acting like you're better than us, all of us. I'm no better or worse than anyone. You think you are? You think so because we drink and you don't? You think you saint or something? You're wrong, and I'll thank you to leave me alone. No! Let go of me! I give you a chance to make me wrong. I give you a chance to act like man. I ask you now, come in my quarters. Drink with me like friends. I don't want a drink, Blumberg. His insult not to drink when man asks you? Leave off me. Take it as an insult if you like. I say I have my reasons and my rights to do as I choose. Now, mind your own affairs. There'll be no trouble. Don't try to run me. You woman. <coughs> Leave off me. Oh, you, I drink. Mr. Bram! Mr. Bomber! I'll kill you next time. <sighs> what is the meaning of this? There were some words, sir. What words? He is woman. Words about Laura? No, sir. I've seen the way both of you are mooning about her. There's an end to that right now. You'll both eat in your own quarters from this day on. Stay away from her. Your officers on this ship. Now go to your quarters, Mr. Bram. I see. There'll be a report on this, Mr. Blomberg. You'll relieve the watch. Mr. Bram. What happened? There was some trouble. About what? Nothing. Man trouble. I heard what my husband said. Were you fighting over me? No. Why should you fight over me? You've hardly looked at me. You're a married woman, Mrs. Nash. I think that makes more difference to you than it does to me. Why are you so good? <laughs> you couldn't choose a word farther from the truth, and I think I'd better go inside. Wait, why did you fight? Because he was teasing you about not drinking, wasn't it? He told me he was going to. Yes, that was why. Are you playing the game with me, too? Oh, I'm intrigued. You're a man with a past, aren't you? And you won't drink because you're afraid someone will find out what it is. Think what you like. Don't you know that's a challenge to a woman like me? Wouldn't you even drink with me? Yes. Yes, perhaps with you. Is that a promise? No, Mrs. Nash, I promise nothing anymore. I've been ordered to my quarters. I'd better go. Mr. Cooper, sir, I feel as though I should apologize even to you who know me so well, but I will not. Because I must shamelessly recount all details. 
There were no more words except ship words between Mr. Blomberg and myself. We ate in our quarters, and for the three days following the quarrel on deck, Captain Nash vigilantly allowed his wife no freedom on the ship. I hope you'll understand that, however wrong, her words to me lived in my mind, and they grew. So when I was relieved of watch on the fourth night following, I was very pleased to find her waiting inside the open door to her quarters. Mr. Bram? Yes? I've been waiting for you. Won't you come in? Where's Captain Nash? In the chart room. Asleep. I knew he wouldn't watch me forever. What do you want? Just to talk to someone who's young. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. There's no harm. I want you to know that. All right. Laura, there's no harm. Whether I'm married or not, I'm a woman, am I not? Yes, yes, you are. And I deserve to have the company that I like. Mm hmm I brought a bottle of wine. I see that you have. I stole it when he wasn't looking. You took a chance. I thought it would be nice. Shall I open it? Yes, if you like. Here you are. Thank you. You haven't been very nice to me, have you? I've hardly been able to be anything to you. Then shall we drink to... how nice you can be? All right. Oh, I drank, my friend, the bottle of wine. And when I left her, I went into Mr. Blomberg's quarters and stole what he had and took it to my own. The warmth that I remembered in my middle body. The courage I assumed. The eyes that weren't really mine, seeing things. The false happiness, the excitement. The great, proud feeling of self-satisfaction. The elation. The slipping away from reality and the wonder of it, the pleasure of numbness, the peace, and the luxury of knowing that when you went to bed, you'd sleep. What's the matter? What's the matter? There's murder. What? What's that you say? You've got to come up on the deck. The captain and his wife, Mr. Blomberg, they've all been murdered. They're dead. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Richard Widmark in Mate Bram. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Seeing Harlow, where do you expect the Autolite team to finish? Oh, I don't expect it to finish at all, Hap. That Autolite electrical system's job is never done. It works when you start your car and every second your engine runs, as well as when you blow the horn, turn on your lights, electric windshield wiper, radio, or heater. That Autolite electrical team must have some real fans, Harlow. You bet it does, Hap. The many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors that use Autolite electrical systems as original equipment. And in that great team, every unit and component part is related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill to give the finest performance money can buy. Who manages this team, Harlow? Your car dealer or authorized Autolite service station. You can quickly learn the location of your nearest authorized Autolite service station in the classified section of your telephone directory under Automobile Electrical Service. 
treat your car to a periodic checkup soon. It pays. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Richard Widmark in Elliot Lewis's production of Mate Bram, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was eight bells, midnight, when I went into the woman's quarters, some time later when I left. I didn't want a drink, but what could I do? Explain myself by telling her about the last time, the fights, the broken windows, the jail, and the other times. I should have, but considering the situation, I doubt any man would. I remember leaving, going to Mr. Blomberg's quarters, then to my own. But there, after another while... My memory stops. I have lost an hour, my good friend, or perhaps two, until Mr. Monks awoke me some minutes before four with a gun in his hand. There's a murderer on board. He killed them all with an axe. Uh, Mr. uh, Brand, what is the matter? What are you doing with that gun? None of us is safe. There's a murderer on board. (sighs) What are you doing? Water first. You've been drinking, Mr. Bram. Yes, yes, I have. You'll have to sober up. You're in command now. I'm all right. I'm all right. Where are they? Mrs. Nash is in her cabin. I'll show you. There. Ah. Uh, yes. What do you know of this? Nothing. Nothing at all. How did you learn? Something woke me up. It was like a scream, but I didn't know with all the sounds of the ship. When was that? I can't be sure. I went to sleep again. Then I woke up again. What woke you that time? I I, I don't know, but I began to worry about the sound I'd heard, the scream. I got up and went to tell the captain about it. He was dead. I was sure the sound meant something, and I came to Mrs. Nash's cabin. Then I saw Mr. Blomberg's door open and found him the same way. There's a maniac on board. Come with me. We'll look at the others. We looked in the quarters of the others and found no weapon. And I'll state now that when I looked in my locker for my gun, I also looked for bloodstains on the clothes in there and on the clothes I was wearing as I'd slept fully dressed. And I found none. Then, pursuing the actions of Mr. Muggs and me, we awoke the steward and went on deck... Wait. There's the axe. That's the one. That's the one that did it. Get rid of it, Mr. Brown. Throw it overboard. The fiend might use it on us next. No, Mr. Bram. We can't do that, sir. Throw it overboard. That's the weapon. We've got to keep it. By law, we've got to. All right, all right. We'll keep it aboard. It slice at the wheel. We'll see what he knows. What is it? What's that axe? There's been murder aboard, Slice. How long have you been at the wheel? Two hours, sir. Who is it? Brown and Cantwell share your watch, don't they? Yes, sir. Where are they? The forest, sir. Standing lookout. Who's dead? The captain and his wife and Mr. Blomberg. Have you seen anybody on deck, Slice, while you've been at the wheel? Only you, Mr. Bram. I didn't see nobody else. I didn't remember. It's a frightful thing to have a man say you were out on deck and not remember. I tried to carry on without arousing suspicion. And this is what I learned. That I had come out and asked for Mr. Blomberg. And upon being told that he was tending the foresail with two deckhands, I'd gone back inside. And that then Mr. Blomberg had come aft and gone inside, too. And that he'd never come out again. I couldn't help feeling guilty, but on the other hand, I couldn't help heeding my instinct to protect myself. For example, at my earliest opportunity, when I was not seen, I took that axe and I threw it overboard. But that was wrong. I acted in excitement and fear, and I'm sorry now that I did. When dawn came, I ordered the ship to come about and set her back toward Boston. Soon after this was done, the steward came to me. 
The crew wants me to talk to you, sir. Yes, what about? They all say they'll be afraid to go to sleep tonight for fear of being murdered in their bunks. All right. All right, I'll have them all sleep on deck where a watch can be kept over them. And if you will, Spencer, you can tell them all to come on deck in an hour for the funeral services. Funeral services, sir? Yes. We can't put those people over the side, sir. By law, we've got to take them back. Well, yes, yes, of course, Spencer, but it's not good to have them on the ship. I mean to put them in the longboat and tow it astern. Now bring them out. And with Captain Nash, bring his Bible. It's open on the table next to his cot. It is, sir. I don't know why I thought I knew where the captain's Bible was. I wasn't sure that I did know. But I was afraid to ask Spencer. So once more, on impulse and in fear, I acted. That night, I went aft to the man at the wheel and ordered him below to get my glass, telling him I'd seen a light in the distance. When he was gone, lashing the wheel, I turned with a knife to the line towing the longboat to cut the bodies adrift and to finally destroy the evidence. Mr. Bram! Mr. Bram, stop that! What? Don't do that, Mr. Bram. Leave off, Spencer. It's not good to have dead people following along behind. Leave off. What's this for? For killing those people out there. No. It was you, Mr. Bram. No, I didn't. You were with the wife last night drinking. Who says that? Mr. Slice. Mr. Blomberg told him. That's no proof. You know where his Bible was, sir. And that's nothing either. You relieved Slice at the wheel. And after that, the axe was missing. Mr. Brown saw you throw it overboard. I didn't kill them. Then why were you cutting the longboat free, Mr. Bram? Hold still, Mr. Bram. Confess and ease yourself, Mr. Bram. No, I won't confess. Nobody saw me kill them because I didn't. I didn't. Come along, Mr. Bram. Where are you taking me? To lock you up. By law, we've got to do it. They put me in irons, locked in my own quarters, and here I have stayed. There have been no more murders in the three days past, which does not stand in favor of another killer being aboard and my being innocent. What I have written, my good friend, is the whole truth, and I beg of you to be my legal counsel when my case comes to trial, as I'm sure it will. In my own mind, I am not convinced that I'm guilty. For one reason, that however violent I've been, I have never killed before... Before. Never killed before. (laughs) If I could only remember. If I could just remember. Why can't I? Why can't I? Why? Why can't I remember? As the passenger aboard the Fuller, I was called along with the crew to testify in both of Mr. Bram's trials. And each time... I stayed to hear him pronounced guilty by two separate courts of law of a crime he steadfastly swore that he did not remember committing. Suspense. A true story presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Richard Widmark. And here he is once again, our star, Richard Widmark. It's always good to have you aboard, Dick. Thank you, Harlow. I uh, sort of feel like one of the family since this is my fourth appearance on Suspense this season. Well, you are a member of the family, Dick. The Autolite family, which includes 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States... Nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast, and the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. It's a big family, Harlow, and I'm proud to be included. Now, we're all proud to be members of the Autolite family, Dick. 
because Autolite serves the greatest names in the industry. And every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the dramatic recreation of a race five brave men made with death. A true story based on the writings of one of those men. Our star will be Mr. Herbert Marshall. The story is called The Diary of Captain Scott. Presented next week on... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Mate Bram was written for Suspense by Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Joseph Kearns, Ben Wright, Lou Merrill, Steve Roberts, Roy Glenn, and Robert North. Richard Widmark appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of the Technicolor musical with a song in my heart, starring Susan Hayward. And remember next week on Suspense, Mr. Herbert Marshall in The Diary of Captain Scott. You can buy Autolite electrical parts, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Suspense. Produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, presents the last of a special series of Friday night performances at this hour. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you a most unusual broadcast, starring a famous radio couple who have never before appeared in a story of this kind. Mr. Ozzie Nelson and Miss Harriet Hilliard. You are accustomed to hearing our stars in their own comedy show. But tonight, Ozzie and Harriet appear for us as a couple who are driven to the plotting of murder in Too Little to Live On by Robert Richards, a play well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! I tell you, it doesn't matter now. How do you think anything could matter anymore to me now? You should have let me die. That was the best way. That's all that matters to me now is that I want to die. That's all I care about. Being dead. I don't know whether we ever thought about it before this morning or not. It might have crossed our minds sometime, one or the other of us, I don't know. But we never talked about it, never. Never before this morning. And then this morning, everything just seemed to come to a head. Every little thing that had happened all those months and years just seemed to pile up at once. It just seemed as though this morning was the last straw. Hi, honey. Hello, darling. Your breakfast is there keeping warm on the back of the stove. I'd get it for you, but I'm already late with his. That's all right. You better hurry, though. No, I'm not going to the office today. You're not? He wants me to stick around. His lawyer's coming over sometime today. His lawyer? Yeah, don't you remember? I, I guess I forgot. Yeah, his lawyer's coming over, so I have to stick around the house all day. Couldn't you go over to the office and come back? No, that's not the way he wants it. He says the lawyer's coming, but he doesn't know when. At least that's his story. Well, maybe he really doesn't know. Oh, he knows all right. Not that it matters much. I don't have any appointments today anyway. 
People around here wouldn't have their teeth fixed if you paid them to. Well, they can't help it if they're poor, Dave. I didn't say they could. I just said they can't afford to go to the dentist. And I'm the dentist they can't afford to go to. I know. Oh, darling, if we could only move to another neighborhood, then at least you could start building a decent practice. Sure, how? With what? I know. With Uncle Ed's money, when we get it. At least that's what we've been telling ourselves for the last three years. Well, couldn't we talk to him? Couldn't we? I him likes to see us have it tough. Likes to have us dependent on that money. That's all he lives for, and he'll probably live to be a hundred. We've just got to be patient, Dave. Oh, there he is. He's up. I've got to hurry. I think at least he'd spend enough dough to have some decent tires put on that wheelchair of his so it wouldn't bump around over our heads like a ten-ton truck day and night. Well, I suppose we ought to be thankful he doesn't spend his money. In a way... Have you seen him this morning? Uh-huh. How's he feeling? About the same, I guess. <laughs> he made me bring his lemon juice and water down and heat it up again. Said it wasn't hot enough. Willie almost bit me again. Yeah, that mutt. Well, the dog's getting old. I suppose he can't help it. Any more than Uncle Ed. They could both help it. He wants it that way. He gets a kick out of it. Now it's got so we even have to kowtow to a snarling little mutt. He sits there and laughs. We've just got to be patient, Dave. <laughs> One thing, when we get that $30,000, we sure will have earned it. Dave. Yeah? What about the lawyer? What about it? I mean, what do you suppose it means? What should it mean? He's always getting that guy over here every three or four months and going into some kind of a huddle. But why should he want you here? He probably needs us both as witnesses to something. You know, he's been talking an awful lot lately about that orphanage over in Brooklyn. Sure, and last winter all he could talk about was some foundling home for stray dogs down in Pennsylvania. He's just cracking the whip, that's all, to see us jump. Oh, Dave, if he was to change his will now after all we've been through... Oh, don't worry, he won't. Oh, there he goes. He's something for his breakfast. Coming right up, Uncle Ed. Let's see. I hope his eggs are right. Get the coffee off the back of the stove, darling, while I get a cup. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy. It's all right, honey. It's only a cup. I know. It. Sometimes it makes me so nervous. I feel as though I'm going crazy. Take it easy, dear. Here, let me get the tray. No. No, I'm all, I'm all right now. There's a pan of milk warming on the stove. Fill this bowl about half full and break up a handful of those little dog biscuits in it. Okay. Sugar. Salt. Pepper, cream. All right, come on. Open the door for me, will you, darling? Here, I'll carry the tray. No, he likes to have me bring it. What's the difference? Oh, don't ask me, Dave. Oh, the paper for him. Oh, you've got it. Oh, I haven't read the paper yet myself. Shh, shh. You can read it later. Come on. Here's your breakfast, Uncle Ed. All right. I'm sorry I was a little late. Uh, Well, set it down, set it down. I heard what you said about the paper, David. If it's getting so, you even begrudge a little thing like that to a helpless invalid. No, I I, I don't begrudge it, Uncle Ed. Here's your paper. So important for you to read the paper, why don't you subscribe for two of them? I'm afraid the budget in this family won't stand for little luxuries like that. Ah, when I was your age, I had my first thousand dollars in the bank. Well, things were a little different in those days, Uncle Ed. I was a little different. That's what the difference was. All right, set Willie's breakfast down for him, Myra. No, no, not there. Over by his bed where he can get at it. Yes, Uncle Ed. (laughs) I'm afraid Willie doesn't like me anymore. Uh, Here, I'll give it to him. Hey, 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 stop that! Don't you dare strike that dog, David! I wasn't going to hit him. I just wanted him to let go of my sleeve. Poor Willie. Oh. Well, if Meyer would take him out once in a while, he wouldn't feel that way. I take him out any time you ask me to, Uncle Ed. I forget sometimes. You want to do it without my asking. Well, you can go now. I know you don't want to stay any longer than you have to. Oh, uh, uh, Myra, hand me my glasses uh, on the bureau. Glasses? Uh. Yes, Uncle Ed. Here. Oh, what? Myra, you fool. Oh, Uncle Ed, I'm so sorry. Maybe I can mend them. Of course you can't mend them. They're broken, you idiot. Don't talk to her like that. What's that? I said don't talk to her like that. Dave, please. Oh, I see. Now you're trying to bully me. A helpless old man in a wheelchair. Well, I won't stand for it. Uncle Ed, he didn't mean anything. I made my bargain with you, David, and I intend to keep it. As long as you do. And I've never complained about the care you've given me, although heaven knows it's been little enough. But don't think for a minute I'll stand for anything like this. 
I'm sorry, Uncle Ed. <laughs> I'm afraid that's scarcely enough. Well, it... It won't happen again. Look, I'll get the glasses fixed. I know a guy that can do it right away. It'll probably take a week, and in the meantime, I'll be as blind as a bat. And don't expect me to pay for it. No, don't worry. I'll pay for it. You'll have them back tonight. Mm. Oh, this reminds me, David. Be sure that you're here when my lawyer comes today. I'll be here. That's why I stayed home from the office. Uh. Well, that's all for now. Oh, and I, I suppose neither of you's taken the trouble lately to find out which of my prescriptions need refilling. Oh, yeah, I, I was thinking of that yesterday. Oh, well, were you? Well, let's do it now. Bismuth's entirely gone. Look, entirely gone. Uh, uh, you better get another bottle of iron tonic. Let's see, the drops. Yeah, well, that's all right for now. And the thiocyanate. You better get that refilled, too, while you're at it. Take the bottle of the bismuth, too. I'll go right away, Uncle Ed. Yes, you do, and you come right back. You know that I must have my bismuth not later than 20 minutes after each meal. Yes, I, I know. Come on, Myra. myself. Oh, take it easy, dear. It's all right. It's all right now. Oh, Dave, I've tried. I've tried, but I can't go on like this. Oh, take it easy, honey. It won't be much longer. Oh, we've been saying that for three years. We're like prisoners. We can't go out of the house together because somebody oh, has to be honey. with him. We can't have friends in because they disturb him. Oh, Dave, we can't even have a baby. I could kill him. Sometimes I could kill him. Dave, don't. I mean it. When I see what he's doing to you, when I see him making a slave out of you, making a nervous wreck out of you so you can't even call your soul your own... No, no, Dave, please. Please, I'm all right now. Sure, we made a bargain, like he said. But not this kind of a bargain. Oh, darling, I know it's just as bad for you as it is for me. It's just that I'm here alone with him all day. I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have let myself go that way. Oh, I hate myself, Myra, if I'd known I was going to be like this. It's not your fault, darling. I knew what we were doing. I'm not even a man anymore. I let him sit there and say things to my wife that a man wouldn't take from anybody on earth, but I take it. I take it and smile. Oh, Dave, Dave, it's not your fault. Oh, it is my fault. If I was any kind of a man, I'd do something about well, it. Well, there's nothing to do, don't you see? I should never have acted like this. We've just got to be patient and wait, that's all. Wait. Maybe another three years, maybe ten more years. Oh, honey. Oh, what's the use of kidding ourselves? How do we know how long it's going to take him to die? Sometimes I don't even think he's sick. Sometimes I think he's just putting it on to make us wait on him. But the doctor says... He could fool the doctors. It's been done. Even when he does die, how can we ever be sure? Dave, you don't... Think... I think he's just that mean, Yes. Snatch the money away at the last minute and die laughing at us. But he said it was a bargain. He said he You promised... think promises mean anything to him? Well, could he do it without... I mean, with... Do what? Change his will? Well, sure he could do it any time he wanted to. Without even telling us? Nothing that says he has to tell us anything. Oh, Dave, the lawyer. Yeah, I know. Today. Why does he have to come today of all days? After I broke his glasses and you hollered at him? Yeah, I know. Could he do it just like that today? Sure. If he do it today, he could do it any time. We'd never know until he told us. Oh, he wouldn't. He couldn't. Why not? He might just as well do it anyway. He'll hold it over us in the last minute like he did just now. Till we probably die of heart failure before he does. But you said just a few minutes ago... I know. That... I've been kidding myself for three years, but not anymore. Oh, Dave, what are we going to do? What can we do? I don't know, Myra. I don't know. Yet? If, if only something could happen. Like what? Nothing's going to happen, Myra. Unless we make it happen. Dave, we couldn't. Well, we can't go on like this either. We can tell him to and go. And throw away three years of our lives? The three years we've rotted in this dump? We've earned that money. $10,000 a year isn't half enough for what we've gone Dave, through. Dave, I don't care about well, the money. Well, I do. Anybody but him, I'd feel different. I don't have any more feeling about him than I do that dog up there. Dave, you don't really mean... I don't know what I mean. Listen, uh, I've got to go over to the drugstore and get his medicine. All right. Hurry back. I'll only be a minute. It's just across the street. Dave. Yeah? What about the lawyer? What about him? What if he should come now? Yeah, well... 
keep an eye out for him. But what if he comes? I don't know. I've got to think. Stall him off. Tell him something. What should I tell him? Tell him the old man's sick. He can't see him. Sick? Yeah, yeah, sick. All right, Dave. Oh, Dave, have you got his glasses? Yeah, I'll give them to Mr. Herman at the drugstore. He knows an oculus right here in the neighborhood. He wouldn't mind sending them over. All right, hurry. Well, good morning, Dr. O'Connor. Oh, good morning, Clancy. Taking day off today? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Take him easy. Say, how's the old gentleman this morning? Oh, he's he's all right. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. He's a fine old man. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Herman. Well, Dr. O'Connor, you come for your regular batch of medicines, I suppose. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. How is Mr. O'Connor? Better, I hope. Well, I'm afraid he's been having a little pain lately. Oh, that's too bad. He's such a courageous old man, so yes. cheerful. Yes. Every time I go by and he's sitting up there by his window, he waves. Always he sends his little remembrance at Christmas. Yes, your uncle is a real gentleman. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, what will it be today? Oh, the iron tonic... Business, a uh, hundred tablets, and refill the thiocyanate prescription. Here, I I brought the bottle. All right, I'll get it for you right away. You got a prescription for the thiocyanate, a new one? No, but uh, I'll sign it. Oh, sure, that's right, you can sign it. You know how it is, Doctor, we got to be careful of these things. Uh, you better give me the big tablets this time. Sure thing. Uh, you reach just over the counter there, you'll find the prescription blank. Uh, uh, just, just below there. Uh, you got it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there we are. But uh, don't bother, Rabbit. All right. Uh, let's see. That's, uh, uh, that's 487. 487. Here. Here, I, I got it even. Oh, and uh, say, Mr. Herman, I, I wonder if you could do me a little favor. Why, surely anything, Doctor. Uh, my uncle broke his glasses this morning. Oh, say, that's too bad. Yeah, he's almost... Help us without them. Yes, that's right. I know uh, he is. Yeah, I wonder if you could send them around to a good oculist in the neighborhood. Why, sure, sure I could. No trouble at See, all. I could go myself, but, uh, well, he's not feeling too well this morning, and I ought to get right back. Whatever the bill is, you know I'm good for it. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. Why, sure, I'll do that right away for you, Dr. O'Connor. Yeah, well, well thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Connor. Give the old gentleman my best, Doctor. Uh, sure, sure, I, I will. Dave? Yeah, did the lawyer come? No, did you get the glasses? Yeah, please? I gave them to Mr. Herman. Come on in the kitchen. I got the medicine, Myra. Oh? Myra, do you know what these things are that he's been taking? No, not exactly. Well, this is bismuth. Stuff he takes after each meal, three or four of them. The stuff he's due to take right now. Dave? Now, no, wait a minute. These are thiocyanate. He only takes these once in a while for his heart. Just one of them. Less that one because I got bigger tablets this time. Dave, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say if he took three or four of these instead of his business, by mistake, it would kill him. Dave, no. By mistake, I said. It couldn't be. Yes, it could. Look at the tablets. Can you tell them apart? Hardly. If they were in the wrong bottle. But afterwards, they know if they were in the wrong bottle, they'd know that somebody... No, was... he'd think it was all right from the shape. But afterwards, we'd put him back in the right bottle. Well, then they'd know it couldn't be a mistake. They'd know, they'd know he could read right on the bottle from the label. No, they wouldn't. They'd know he couldn't read the label. They'd know he couldn't read anything. His glasses. That's right, his glasses. And the Oculus would have to swear to it. Dave, are you sure... Are you sure he can't see? He's blind as a bat without him. That much I know is real. Oh, Dave. Don't you see? It's the only way, Myra. It's a chance of a lifetime. No tampering with anything. No changing labels so they could analyze glue if they got suspicious. None of that. I know, but... And don't forget his lawyer's coming today. Well, couldn't we just tell him to go? What about the money? Oh, Dave, I... I can't think. The front door. That must be the lawyer now. Yeah, it is. I can see him standing outside. What should we do? Get rid of him. Well, hurry before he rings again. He might hear us. Well, I tell him. Well, what you told me to tell him, that he's had a bad turn, we're calling the doctor. And then if he asks any questions any time, we could say it was... Yeah, all right. 
Good morning, Mr. Eldridge. Well, how do you do, Dr. O'Connor? Uh, say, uh, I, I'm sorry you had to come way out here, but my uncle has had sort of a bad turn. Oh, I'm so sorry. Nothing serious. Uh, no, I we're hope. calling a doctor. I, I oh. don't think it's anything serious, Mr. Eldridge. I... I don't see how it could be. Why, no. But uh, he was wondering if, if you could come back some other day. Oh, I see. Well, it's just a matter of his uh, signature on a document. Yeah, well, I'm really afraid he is not good, Mr. Eldridge. I see. Well, uh, perhaps I could uh, phone him later in the day. Could uh, I say I could phone him? Uh, There'd be no objection to that, would there? Uh, no, no, no. But if there's any message, I, I could give it to him later. Yes, well, uh, you might say that I've made the uh, changes that he requested. He'll know what I mean. All right, I'll, I'll do that. And, and thank you, Mr. Eldridge. Thank you, Doctor. And good day, sir. Uh, goodbye. Has he gone? Yeah. Did he? No, no, no. It was all right. What is it, Dave? Did he say anything? Oh, he said that he made the changes, whatever they were, and that he'd understand. He said that all he wanted was his signature on some document. His will? He didn't say that. Oh. Now or never, Myra. Oh, Dave. Let me just think. Just for a minute. Come on. What about it? Yes. All right. All right. So here are the two bottles. Come on now. Oh, Dave, no. You've got to come. Why? Because... Because you have. All right. You don't have to say anything. All right. someone at the front door? Uh, no, there hasn't been anyone here. Has there, Myra? No. Oh, I thought it might have been Mr. Eldridge. Here, I got your medicine. Well, you took long enough about it. I'll put it over here by the bed where you can get it. Oh. Well, what do you want, Myra? I I just came to get your tray. Oh. Didn't Willie like his breakfast? Oh, it was too hot, of course. Let me give it to him now. Have you got water for your pills? Yes. Uh, what about my glasses? Oh, they'll be ready this evening. Oh, all right. You show Mr. Eldridge up here the minute he arrives. Yes, yes, I will, Uncle Ed. Yes. Want me to take the tray? No. I got it. Oh, Dave, how could we? What's the use of that? It's done now. It's horrible. Is it? Don't you realize that we're... That it's... Murder? All right, it is, and I'm glad. Dave, don't say that. What's the difference what you call it? It was the only thing to do. It's even better for him this way. David, I'm afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Listen. Yeah. He's wheeled himself over to take his pills. Dave, does it... Will it take long? At his age, and if his heart is anything like what the doctor says it is, no. Is it... Painful? No. Like a heart attack, that's all. What was that? He must have fallen. Then he... Yeah, yeah. A minute anyway. We ought to go up. No, no, wait a minute. But the bottle... That's plenty of time. Shouldn't you wear gloves or something? No, I thought it out. It'd look funnier if there weren't any fingerprints. David, we ought to go up. Even if... I mean, it would look better. Oh, all right. We'll have to call the doctor. We'll have to anyway, either way. I suppose. Don't worry. It, it won't be like that. The wheelchair's empty. He's not here. Quick, look in the closet. No. Under the bed. Dave. Look, Willie. He's dead. The dog is dead, Myra. But how? There's a note on the chair. Oh. What? Dave, what is it? It's from him. It says, my dear, dear niece and nephew... The thing has at last occurred which I have always known would someday inevitably occur. Poor little Willie has given his life to save mine. Oh. It may interest you to know that from my window I saw Mr. Eldridge leaving the house. I also suspect that the incident of breaking my glasses was not quite an accident. And so, my dear children, I have gone to the police. And the little bottles with their transposed contents are in my pocket... As final and conclusive evidence of your murderous intent. Fortunately, I have never been quite as helpless as I allowed you to believe, and have in fact conserved my strength for precisely such an emergency 
the circumstance to which it now appears I owe my life. For your further information, Mr. Eldridge was not coming to change my will. Thanks. Now my would-be heirs and assigns. A fond farewell. I will see you in court. Your loving Uncle Ed. P.S. Did you hear my body fall? I thought you would like that. I did. How could he have gotten out? Oh, down the front stairs while we were... <sighs> you said he couldn't read the label. He didn't. He tried it on the dog. What can he do? Attempted murder. Twenty years to life. But would they believe... They'd believe what everybody else believes. A fine old gentleman. Why? There it is. David. Yes. Are there any more? What? The pills? Myra. There isn't anything else to do, is there, David? No. I guess not. Are there more? Enough? Yes. Of the little ones in my pocket. These? Yeah. How many? Oh, Half a dozen. You said it didn't hurt. No. Not much. Oh, oh David. I did so want to have children. The door. Look out the window. See who it is. David, I'm afraid. What's there to be afraid of now? Couldn't we, couldn't we go away somewhere, some other country? With what? It's probably the police now. David, here. You'd better go down and tell them something, anything, just so they'll leave us alone. Give us some time. Yes, all right. Myra. Yes? Goodbye, darling. No, wait. Go on. Good, goodbye. Yes, officer? Good evening, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm sorry, but... Yes, Clancy, I know. I'm afraid you don't, ma'am. I've got some bad news for you, Mrs. O'Connor, about your uncle. Yes, Clancy, yes. I don't know how he could have got out there, but he was just hit by a car. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. He's dead. Dead? Yes. Dead? Dead! That's all. I tried, but they stopped me. David had died before I got there. That's all. I just wanted to have children. I wish I was dead. Suspense. Produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Tonight you heard Ozzie Nelson and Harriet Hilliard as stars of Too Little to Live On. Now Mr. Spear joins our stars at the microphone. Ozzie and Harriet, may I tell you sincerely that you are great. Well, thank you indeed, Bill. You really mean it? I certainly do. Well, thanks. It's been a real experience to do a show of this kind, Bill. I don't know about Ozzy there, but I never plotted a murder before. <laughs> and we had such a fine accomplice in the control booth, too. I'm, I'm blushing attractively. Uh, incidentally, I'm told that you inherit this broadcast time next week. Yeah, that's right, Bill. Next Friday night at the same time, Harriet and I will be acting like ourselves again in our own show. The Adventures of Ozzy, that's me, and Harriet, that's her. This is our last Sunday coming up. Uh-huh. Uh, how about suspense, Bill? You're changing time, too, aren't you? We are, and we have some pretty exciting things planned. Beginning a week from tomorrow, that's uh, Saturday, January 3rd, Suspense will be broadcast as a full-hour series every Saturday from 8 to 9 o'clock Eastern Time. 
Oh, a full hour. That's wonderful. Tell more. Well, with us every Saturday during the series, as the man who'll lay down the welcome mat and play host to our listeners will be a very, very distinguished star. I'm very happy and very honored to have him with us. I'll give you another hint. He's an actor-director. I guess you're going to make us wait for his name, huh? Just <laughs> creating suspense, Harriet. <laughs> the gentleman's name is Mr. Robert Montgomery. Oh, that's really something. Oh, Bob is great, Bill. Ought to be a wonderful series. <laughs> well, shall we... Wish each other some kind of good luck or something? Fine. I'm sure you've had a Merry Christmas, so let's put in a plug for a Happy New Year to you. And a Happy Friday from now on, too. And a Happy Saturday to you, Bill. Ozzie and Harriet appeared through the courtesy of International Silver Company, creators of International Sterling and 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. Tonight's suspense play, Too Little to Live On, was written by Robert Richards. Appearing in it were Joseph Kearns, who played Uncle Ed, Wally Mayer, Frank Albertson, and Jerry Hausner. Music composed by Lucian Morrowick was conducted by Lud Gluskin. Next week at the same time, listen to the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Next Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, listen to Mr. Robert Montgomery in Suspense. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry as star of The Angel of Death, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! December 31st, New Year's Eve. I shall identify myself as John Forsyth, my true name, as I have no reason to fear its being known or to assume one of a different character. My early life has no place in this narrative, save only to point out with the utmost objectivity that I've always been possessed since my tenderest youth of extraordinary intellectual powers. As witness, my acquisition at the age of 16 of degrees from not one, but three of the leading universities of Europe, where, despite my British nativity, I spent my formative years. But this fact has no special significance other than as it applies to those events which were set in motion on another New Year's Eve in London, 15 years ago. For it was on that evening, as I had planned some weeks before it should be, that I stood outside a door and listened for confirmation of the relationship I knew existed between my best friend and my wife. Oh, darling, darling, darling. Now, 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 it's all right, Pam. It's all over now. Yes. Are you happy? Yes, now that we've decided, yes. Almost for the first time since I can remember. I know, darling, and I suppose we should feel sorry for him, but I can't, not after the way he's treated you. Raymond, what do you suppose he'll... It doesn't matter, darling. Tomorrow we'll be on the Atlantic Ocean and within a month we'll be on my uncle's plantation in Brazil where he couldn't find us if he looked for a hundred years. No, I suppose it doesn't Now, matter, how long but... will it take you to pack? Oh, an hour. Well, I ought to be back by then. I've just got to pick up the tickets and a few things. You're all right. Hurry, darling. I will. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Good evening, my dear. <gasps> John! Why? What's the matter, Pamela? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. Why, nothing. You startled me, that's all. You said you were going out of town for the holidays, and 
And you, you don't usually come in by the back door. You needn't be alarmed. I shall be only a moment. I uh, forgot something. Can I get it for you? Your anxiety for my every wish is touching. But no, thank you. By the way, Pamela, have you any last words? Any what? We may not see each other for a while, you know. What are you talking about, John? What's the matter with you? Oh, my dear, sometimes I wonder if I married you out of infatuation for your beauty or pity for your stupidity. Oh, John, please. Pamela, where do you suppose we shall all be, say, within the month? Oh, does it really matter so much? <laughs> no, no. I suppose it does not. Within the month, I was on trial for their murder. You are Henry Jenkins, proprietor of the Crown and Lion, number 17 Buxton Street. Eh? I'm that one, sir. I am Henry Jenkins, sole owner Thank you. and prop Now, uh, will you kindly repeat the words spoken by the prisoner in the dock while in your place of business several weeks ago? Yes, sir. <coughs> <coughs> Well, about two weeks ago one night, uh, Mr. Forsythe there, who's a steady customer of mine, sir, although he's not what you call a sociable man. Yes, 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 yes. Well, sir, all me other customers had gone home, and I was asking Mr. Forsythe to leave uh, also, just so I could close up me shutters, you know. When all of a sudden he looks up at me and he whispers, kind of hoarse-like, you know, Jenkins, I did it. I finally did it. Well, not knowing what he did, I naturally ask him uh, what he did. And uh, what did the prisoner tell you, Mr. Jenkins? He said, sir, warning me... Warning me to keep it quiet. I found them together and I killed them. And then he laughs in a crazy way and adds, and Jenkins, I hid the bodies where no one will ever find them. That's what he said, sir. So help me it is. I saw him burning what looked to be a lot of bloody clothes. In the furnace it was. And he didn't try to hide him either. Just stared at me kind of odd-like. And went right on as brazen as you please, he did. He told me he wasn't worried at all. He said the two of them will never get away together. Except if they are dead. I heard him say it on the stair landing one night and several other times in their rooms. Pamela, he says, if you don't stop leering at Raymond Tillotson with those evil eyes of yours, I'll see the two of you in your graves. I warn you. <laughs> The uh, court feels that it is its duty at this time again to remind the prisoner that he has so far made nor allowed to be made by counsel in his defense uh, no cross-examination of witnesses nor a rebuttal to the charges made by the prosecution of any kind and that this attitude can only result adversely to his cause. Uh, the prisoner is therefore once more given opportunity at this time to make such rebuttal. Does the uh, prisoner wish to do so? No, Your Lordship, I do not. Does the uh, prisoner wish to make any statement of any nature whatsoever in his defense? I should merely like to ask the prosecution one question, Your Lordship. Yes, well, what is it? Has the prosecution found the bodies? <laughs> well, the... Uh, the prisoner wishes to know if the prosecution has yet produced the bodies of the alleged victims of the crime for which he is on trial. Well, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 no, Your Lordship, we have not. That is all. To kill them had been my plan and my intention, naturally. But not in the usual stupid way such things are done where men gamble their own lives against the lives of those whom they destroy. Every faculty of my intelligence revolted against such a thought. And so for me, the gambler's risk 
was needless. So I had planned it. It was therefore without fear or question that I stood before the court to hear the verdict which, in all the writing of it, I had contrived against myself. Order! Order! John Forsyth, the court has given most careful consideration to the fact that the bodies of the named victims have not been presented to this court as due evidence and a surety of murder a fact which admittedly must alter the circumstances of guilt. But this Crown Court, no matter how deeply it desires to aid you, cannot but recognize the fact that you have allowed every shred of evidence and element to point to you as a cold-blooded killer. Under such circumstances, questionable though they may be, I can do only as the King's law directs me to do, tempered with the mercy of His Majesty's Court. I hereby sentence you to no more than 20 and no less than 10 years at hard labor for the suspected and willful murders of your wife, one Pamela Felice Forsyth, and one Raymond Elton Tillotson. And may God protect the crown and the jurisprudence of this court of His Royal Majesty. <laughs> Ten to twenty years. <laughs> it was perhaps a bit more than I expected, but I was content. And it may be that there was even the trace of a smile upon my lips as I left the courtroom. Certainly it was justified, if only by the looks of awe and admiration turned in my direction by the spectators. Clearly they recognized my genius, and I knew they were thinking of the countless lesser men who had failed in their efforts to hide even one dead body, whereas I, apparently without effort, had successfully hidden two. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Paul Henry, in The Angel of Death by Alan Cameron. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. With the holiday excitement over, most of us are glad to enjoy evenings at home again, taking it easy and economizing. What a perfect time to serve Roma California sherry. Yes, glorious golden amber Roma sherry adds so much to happy hours at home, yet costs so very little. More Americans every day make Roma sherry first call for dinner. You'll find Roma sherry ideal for entertaining, too. Delicious anytime. For Roma sherry is a happy, mellow wine with tempting fragrance, satisfying natural sweetness, and superb nut-like taste. Roma Sherry, like all Roma wine, is a true wine, unvaryingly good always. Crushed from choicest grapes, grown in California's finest vineyards, then unhurriedly guided to tempting perfection by Roma's ancient winemaking skill. Bottled at the winery. Get Roma Sherry tomorrow, now selling at lowest prices in years. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine for uniformly fine quality at low cost. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Paul Henry as John Forsythe in The Angel of Death, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was thus that I began my prison term, and my association with William Waters, a sallow-faced, ill-favored little man who was to be my chief source of amusement and mental exercise for a long time to come, and to illustrate still further the inevitable triumph of the higher intellect over all obstacles and surroundings. <coughs> so... 
You're the great John Forsyth, eh? You have heard of me, then? Not off, I haven't. The luckiest beggar that ever cheated the hangman. Luck? <laughs> there is no such thing as luck. No? Then how is it you're sitting here safe and sound, and out as free as air in 15 or 20 years, instead of stretching your neck at the end of a rope, eh? I'm here because I choose to be here. That is all. Because you choose to be? <laughs> uh, uh, tell me, Forsyth, just between the two of us, how did you do it? By using my brains. And there's many another tried that before and been caught up with. Well, simply because they did not really have any brains to start with. No, it's luck, I tell you. Bad luck, like mine. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear the worst bit of, bit of luck that ever ruined a man's life? If you wish to call it that, why not? It was like what happened to you in a way. The sweetheart, Agnes her name was, with the biggest, bluest eyes, or the prettiest little thing you'd ever hope to see. And you killed her? I didn't mean to. It was the usual, you know. And I'd caught her dead to rights, but... She laughed at me. That was the trouble. Threw it in my face, she did. Next thing I knew, something snapped. When my head cleared, there I was sitting on the floor beside her, crying like a baby. And her lying there with her pretty blue eyes staring out of her head and her, her pretty mouth all twisted. Red marks there on her throat. The marks of the two very hands where I'd strangle the life out of her. You weren't unlucky. You were stupid. Oh. You killed her without planning it. And uh, what did you do with the body? Cemented her into the wall of the cellar. <laughs> and the bloke next door had a gas eater. Exploded uh. and blew out the old ruddy wall between us, it did. Uh. The time I got home, there was firemen and bobbies all over the place. And there was Agnes. What was left of her, lying right out in the middle of the cellar floor for all the world to see. The truly intelligent man foresees every possibility and guards against it. Who could? Who could foresee a thing like that? I could. You could? I stand before you as the living proof of it. In ten or fifteen years I shall be free because I'm intelligent. Whereas you will rot and die here because you are stupid. Oh, pretty clever, aren't you? Know just about everything there is to know, don't you? No, no, no. <laughs> Not everything. But quite a lot of things. For instance, I know something about that cough of yours. Oh, what about it? The color of your skin, the look about your eyes, the way you breathe. I hope you're not afraid to die, Waters. Rubbish. What are you talking about? Have you ever heard of retribution, Waters? What? The inevitable fate that pursues and at last destroys the criminal mind. Vengeance, you might call it. Ah, rot. You, you don't think anything's going to happen to you or me, do you? Not to me, Waters. For the intelligent man foresees and prevents even that. But to you, Waters. Most certainly to you. Oh, indeed. And who's going to do all this? Oh, he's known by various names, Waters. But best known as... The Angel of Death. <laughs> Retribution. The Angel of Death. Absurd, wasn't it? <laughs> but a most purposeful absurdity. For the intellectual stimulus so necessary to remaining mentally alert during the prison years ahead was here delivered into my hand. An experiment and one almost impossible under any other conditions. And William Waters would be my guinea pig. An experiment to determine just how far a man might succeed through sheer superiority of intelligence in breaking down and destroying the mind and the body of another. But a simple power of suggestion. I suggested nothing directly, merely a word here, a glance there, drops of water wearing away the stone. <laughs> I got a fever again tonight, haven't I, John? No, no. A touch, perhaps, but that is all. The 
My head feels hot. Why <coughs> does that blasted cough what does it? No, no. You mustn't worry about it. It's every very, very bad for people with your condition to worry. What condition? What condition, John? Oh, why, nothing. People with, with a cough like yours, people who feel, uh, well, uh, you know, indisposed, that's all. Oh. What's that book you're reading lately? Mm, just a book, a scientific book that I got from the prison library. What sort of a scientific book? General book on medicine, things like that. Uh, well, let me see it. No, no, no. I, yeah, give it to me. You wouldn't understand. Give it to you. Oh, please, give it back to me. You wouldn't be interested. Oh, you had it open in this place here, didn't you? This is what you was reading, ain't it? Well, yes, among other things, but... Tuberculosis. Is that what I got, John? Tuberculosis? Oh, don't be silly. There's nothing seriously wrong with you. John, you've got to tell me. You've got to tell me. (coughs) No. (coughs) I don't want to die. You're not going to die. If you take care of yourself. Oh, but why should it come to me? I've always been healthy. I'm not old yet. Of course you are not. You're just imagining things. Imagining things? You're worrying too much, that's all. Oh, what makes you think I'm worried? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, when when you're asleep. Uh, uh, Tell me, do you ever have uh, dreams? What sort of dreams? Oh, about uh, the past or... oh, 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 you mean... You mean about her? Yes. Do you ever dream you see her lying there on the floor with her eyes bulging out of her head and her <laughs> mouth all twisted and her tongue all black and swollen? Oh, John, don't stop it. And your stop fingers it. digging into no, her no, throat? Stop it! Stop it! Yeah, yeah. What's the matter here, eh? <laughs> he seems somewhat disturbed in his mind this evening, God. Oh, he's mourned, eh? Oh, that reminds me. Doctor said we was to try to prevail on him to get out of his bunk tomorrow and get outside, get a little exercise in the fresh air. Oh. You tell him, eh? Yes, yes. What was you two muttering about? Oh, he was just telling me what the doctor said about you. Oh, what? Well, he wants you to stay in your bunk and get plenty of rest. Time was drawing near, I knew. The time for what I had planned as the culmination of my experiment. Waters was having periods of definite delirium. But I waited. I waited for them to become more pronounced. And then, one night, when I'd listened to him tossing and muttering for hours in his bunk, I crossed over in the darkness. No, 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 wait, wait, no, it ain't time yet. I don't have to go yet. No. William Waters. I've come for you, William Waters. What? She sent me, William. She sent me. With her eyes staring out of her head. With her black, swollen tongue. I'm the angel of death. I'll kill you. Don't Take your hands off my throat. What's going on in here, eh? I said we'll quiet you. I had to hit him. The man is out of his mind. He thinks I'm some angel of death or something. There you. Come on now. Up on your feet. Come on now then, Waters. Now what's the matter with you, eh? Uh, Forsyth. You. It's you what's done this to me. I told you, he, it's he you. was out of his head. It's you what's done it to me. Oh. I'll see come it on, now. Come on, you're coming on me. Get out of here for this. If it takes hundreds of years, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Come on, John. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> it was interesting while it lasted. And I've always believed that uh, given a little more time, I could have ended my experiment uh, successfully. But I had other plans to make now. Plans for the day when I would be free. And at last it came. At last I was walking away from the prison gate, a free man. Now began my search. 
was not difficult. It led me at last to Paris, to a small apartment, where I went tonight, December 31st, New Year's Eve. Yes? Good evening. Oh, good evening. Did you wish to see someone? Don't you recognize me? Well, I do, of course, but uh, are you a friend of Pam's? I am indeed. Who is it, darling? It's a friend of yours, dear. A friend of both of you. John! Yes. Huh? In fact, your husband, my dear, and Raymond's best friend. John, it's been... Uh, Fifteen years, yes. You only returned to Paris recently, didn't you? Yes, a short time ago. And you never knew that I was convicted and sentenced to prison for your double murder, did you? Murder? <laughs> oh, that was quite as I planned it. I knew where you were, but uh, the authorities did not. John! But perhaps you have heard of a curious legal technicality which provides that a man cannot be convicted twice for the same crime. So you see, I've already paid for your murders. And now I've come to collect an ancient debt. Put down that gun. I then walked calmly from their rooms. I made no effort to hide my face, my trail, or my identity. I can now defy every element in life and in law. After 15 years, I've committed the crimes for which I've already paid my debt to society. I shall mail this letter to the police, who may give it to the newspapers, who, whoever wants it. Although it is now a matter of indifference to me if the world remarks upon my cleverness or my patience. For my life is complete. No man has ever known such happiness. John Forsyth. <laughs> yes, yes, come in, Madame Leclerc. I have a letter now ready. I wish you to mail for me. I've come for you, John Forsyth. Waters. I'm not Waters any longer. How did you get out? They said I was insane. So I hadn't been responsible when I killed her. And then they said I was cured, sane again. And then they let me out. But there was one thing they never knew. They never knew who I really was. What are you talking about? That's why I've come for you, John Forsyth. Me? I am the chosen messenger of an higher power. Uh, look here, Waters. Die, John Forsyth. <laughs> And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. Let me read it to you. Paris, January 1st. This gay metropolis spent one of its quietest New Year's Eves in recent years. In all greater Paris, there were only two recorded deaths by violence, both of which, by a strange coincidence, occurred within a few yards of each other. The first was the fatal shooting by an unknown assailant of an Englishman, John Forsyth. The second victim, unidentified, had apparently leaped from a window or roof of the same dwelling occupied by Forsyth. Police were at a loss to explain a weird black silk robe and cape worn by the man. Jean-Vierre Leclerc, concierge of the building, alleges to have heard a voice repeating an English phrase, I am the angel of death, just before the suicidal leap. However, this can hardly have any bearing on the case, since the said phrase was undoubtedly uttered by New Year's revelers in the neighborhood. <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. How much more pleasurable any meal becomes when Roma wine is served. Yes, a fine table wine such as Roma California Burgundy makes any food taste better. Brings out all the flavor. 
lends romance and friendly companionship to the meal. America's famed hostess Elsa Maxwell says, My simple secret for gracious and enjoyable dining is to serve my guests Roma Burgundy. It's so easy to make your meals more delicious, more exciting, as Elsa Maxwell does. Because Roma wine costs so little, anyone can serve it often. Compliment your next dinner with the fruity fragrance and appetizing piquant taste of red, robust Roma Burgundy. Get Roma Burgundy tomorrow, now selling at the lowest prices in years. And you get extra saving when you buy Roma in the half-gallon and gallon size. No wine but Roma offers you so much for so little. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Paul Henry appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studios and will soon be seen in their production, Devotion. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Phil Terry as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you the story of an accidental death and an attempted escape. Death on My Hands, starring Phil Harris and Alice Faye. Well, flood my carburetor if it isn't Oscar the orating auto. What's up? My hood, Harlow. It's been nearly 5,000 miles since my last spark plug check. And you're set for a session with your Autolite spark plug dealer, eh, Oscar? His exclusive new plug check indicator will quickly show the condition of your spark plugs and whether they're right for your style of driving. I'm not up to par, Harlow. I've lost my usual pep on the hills, and I'm using too much gasoline. Well, if the plug check indicator shows your spark plugs need cleaning or adjustments, your Autolite spark plug dealer has all the equipment to do the job right. And if my plugs are worn out, Harlow? Then he'll replace the worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite. Resistor type or standard type spark plugs to give you smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. So, friends, have your spark plugs checked regularly. And when you do, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Death on My Hands and the performances of Alice Faye and Phil Harris, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I won't mention the name of the town. It won't help any. I don't think I'll even tell you what part of the country it's in. It's just a place in a long valley with hundred-year-old elms and hills you can't stop looking at. And the people? Well, maybe they're not much different than anybody else. Twenty-five hundred of them. The kids went to schools with big lawns and long walks. And the men walked up Oak Street from the mills right after the five o'clock whistle. Some stopped for a beer at Mike's or the Green Rooster or Eddie's Tavern. And some went right on home. Sounds wonderfully ordinary, doesn't it? That's what I thought. Until they tried to hang me. Dixie! Dixie! Oh, Dixie. I can't believe it. It's me, all right. I I saw you from across the street. Well, what in the world are you doing in this little town, Julia? Oh, just... Just getting a little rest. <laughs> Don't give me that. Your idea of rest was always to sit in a, an air-conditioned cocktail lounge. Gee, you look good. Well, what about you? I wish you'd have stayed with the band, Julia. I just just felt like drifting, Dixie. Where did you drift? 
all over. Ended up with a carnival. A carnival? Uh, I saw the posters about you and the band playing for the high school dance tonight. I, I couldn't believe it. Well, you don't get young doing one-nighters, but you see a lot of country and some swell people. You, for example. Oh. Well, how are all the boys? Well, I'm the only one of the original bunch left. No. Yeah. Chigger Thompson went with Kenton. Bill Candoli joined the circus in Cleveland, married a snake charmer. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And then Squeak Hanley lost himself up with the law in Virginia. You know how it goes. I got all new sidemen now, just kids. Yeah. Things change, don't they? Yeah, they do. Hey, look, Julia, why don't you drop in at the dance? They'd think I was an old science teacher. Nah, you'll knock them dead. No. No, look, Dixie, I want to talk to you. I'm at the embassy, across from the railroad station, the only hotel in town. I'll see you after the dance, outside. And we'll have a sandwich and a drink and a talk, huh? Okay. That's the way you want it. Look, it's the high school auditorium, you know. Uh-huh. Well, I'll see you. Uh, Dixie. Yeah. Who's singing in my place now? <laughs> Me. We walked opposite directions and caught each other looking back a couple of times. She looked good. But then she always had. There had never been anything wrong with, with how Julia looked. That night at the high school dance, I played like I hadn't played for weeks. Man, that band caught fire. You should have seen the faces of those kids dancing by the bandstand. They looked at me as if I invented music. <laughs> and me, a third-rate clarinet player. Trouble was as far from my mind as Carnegie Hall is from Bop City. It was backstage after the dance that the bubble blew up in my face. Here's the loot, boss. Look at it. Big, coarse notes. Yeah, what does it come to, Teddy? Well, the cashier says 1,200 round simoleons, but I count it myself. That's not bad for this town. Listen, it's a lot better than standing on Vine Street waiting for a recording date. I'll take this kind of loot any day in a week. Yeah, I better put this in my bag. Hey, that bag must be loaded by now. I got two weeks' take in there, but I'll drop it in the bank when we get to Kansas City. Hey, you still carrying that gun for protection? Yeah, Ted, right here. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to use it, though. Loaded? Every chamber. See? Oh, those things give me the creeps. Hey, what else you got in that bag? Just some publicity pictures of me. I'm going to get some new ones, though. Get them while you're young. When they start camouflaging those age lines in your face, the cost goes up by leaps and bounds. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, Teddy, uh, tell the boys I'll be at the next stop tomorrow. Oh? Who'd you tie up with? Julia. She here? Well, I'll be done. Small world, huh? What's she doing now? I'll tell you tomorrow. We got about six years talking to do in eight hours. Now get on out of here, huh? Yeah, right, boss. Come in. Come in. I'll be in with you in a minute, Julia. I just want... My, my name isn't Julia. It's Emily. Oh. Oh, Emily. Well, what can I do for you? Well, they all dared me to come in and tell you how much we liked your music. Well, bless you. So you liked it, huh? Never had such a good band at our dance before. It was like having Benny Goodman. Well, now, aren't you sweet? I'll tell Benny when I see him. Do you have a picture I could have? Well, I don't have any real good ones, but... Hey, I'll tell you what. You give me your name and address, and I'll send you one autographed. With love to Emily, my prettiest fan. I can see some in that suitcase. No, those aren't any good. They're kind of old. I mean, uh... I just got to get one. They dared me. All right, but don't pull that suitcase, kid. Look out! Oh! Kid! Kid! What did you do? She fell to the floor and her head suddenly spurted red. For a moment, I was so shocked, I, I didn't know what to do. Then I bent over and I picked her up and... I ran to find the nearest doctor. I ran almost four blocks with people staring at me like I was crazy. I couldn't even feel myself. I was just a thought. Get to a doctor. Get to a doctor. And I finally did. She died instantly. No doctor in the world could help her. From then on, it was a nightmare. There was only four policemen in town, and they were all handling highway traffic 30 miles away because of a big mill fire. I told the doctor and the people who crowded around me that I'd stay in town and face a police inquest the next morning. 
There were some grumbles and some nasty words, but nobody stopped me from checking in at the embassy hotel. But I was there only an hour when I realized I wasn't going to get off that easily. A group of men formed outside the hotel and stood looking up at my window. Then all of a sudden I realized they wanted to lynch me. down there. I know you're there. You don't need no rocks through no windows. You don't need any lousy notes. I know why you're there. How long are you waiting, Dixie? How tired the rope's gonna be? You're never gonna use a rope on me, never. Do you understand? Never. Who is it? Who is it? Julia. What do you want? Who are you doing all the shouting at? them. Those people down there. If you can call them people. They threw a note through the window on a rock. They want me for killing that girl. Well, maybe I can help you. What can you do? Don't kick a friendship in the face, Dixie. You never know when it'll come in handy. Yeah, tell me all about it. Look at them down there. Watching the window like hound dogs with a treed possum. Oh, Dixie, why don't you think of something to do instead of just burning off steam? Think. In the past hour, I've thought more than that Greek philosopher did in a lifetime. But it all boils down to me ending up with a tag on my toe. Oh, I wish I could help you. Look, what are you hanging around me for? They might try to do something to you if they find out you've been nice to me. I'll take my chances. I got nothing else to do. Oh, thanks. Don't waste your time. I don't think it's going to pay off. You know what they make me feel like? A criminal. They found my car. They did? Yeah, somebody told the manager. What's his name? Uh, Abdo. Uh, car's three miles north of here in an empty riverbed. Burned to a crisp. The only thing in the world I own. Oh, Dixie, don't let it get you. But how much do they want? Julia, an accident is an accident. That means it wasn't done on purpose. She grabbed the bag and the gun went off. And she would... She would... Just a little... Kid. Oh, Dixie, Dixie, stop it. You're not doing yourself any good this way. It could happen to anyone. To me, or the people next door, or, or even to one of them down there. Oh, come on, sweetheart, and sit down here with me. Wait a minute. Well, what is it, Dixie? More of them. And they got guns now. Not just clubs and ropes, guns. Get away from that window. Maybe I don't want to. Maybe I could get them to shoot me from here and then... It... Well, it'd be over with like that. Get back from that window. Come on. Let go of me. They wouldn't shoot. They want their fun later. Do what I say. You gotta think, Dixie. You gotta think of some way to get out of here. Sorry that girl get killed. Sorry as an honest man can be, but... Well, there's no point in dying to prove it. I think God understands, Dixie. <laughs> Just another rock. No, it isn't. Look what you... Oh, never mind, Dixie. It, it, it's what you said, a Wait rock. a minute now. It's something else. What is it? Don't hide it from oh, me. Dixie. Give it to me! Oh, shoe. One of her shoes. What are they going to throw up next? Her body? Dixie, let me take it. Let them keep it! You dirty, dirty! <laughs> oh, Dixie. Dixie. If there was only something we could do. There isn't. When people get like that, there, there just isn't. I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to... Julia, listen. They're breaking the door down. They're coming in. Well, we've got to get out of here somehow. Get out? There's no way to get out now. Now go back to your room, Julia. I won't. I said go on. It's too late, Dixie. They're coming down the hall. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Phil Harris and Alice Faye in Death on My Hands. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Yippee! 
Why the loud levity, my loquacious limousine? I just visited my neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer, Harlow. Did he check your spark plugs with the nimble nemesis of nefarious spark plugs, the Autolite plug check indicator? Yes, sir, Harlow, and it showed that my plugs were not functioning properly. So he replaced those worn-out spark plugs with the matchless magic manifested by the multiple magnificence of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Eh, Oscar? Right. And now I'm giving smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. <laughs> well, it pays to see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. He carries ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, the world-famous spark plugs that are designed by the same engineers who design complete ignition systems for many leading makes of our finest cars. And I'm off for a spring fling. So long. So, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer soon and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite resistor type or standard type spark plugs. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Alice Fay and Phil Harris in Elliot Lewis's production of Death on My Hands, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Don't make any noise. It only sounds like one person. One person can carry a gun. Couldn't be them, Dixie. They wouldn't knock. Who is it? After the hotel owner. Let me in. All right. What's on your mind? They broke in the door downstairs. But I stopped them in the lobby. They had ropes and guns. Thank you, Abdo. Oh, don't thank me. I told them that they couldn't come in after you, but that you would go out. You don't mean that. I told them within 15 minutes. Abdo, let me stay a little longer in the name of humanity till, till, till I can dope this out. I, I got enough money. I don't worry about money. Well, what have you got to lose? Listen, I give you a break. They could have come in here and got you and torn you up in little pieces, but I said no. One little word. How long after you are gone, I have to live in this town. You've got your troubles, I've got mine. Now that's the way things work. What's the matter with this town? Why does it act the way it does? After what you did, you expect them to treat you with brotherly love? You've got to be born here before they think you're human? There's a lot of world outside this flea-bitten town, and most of it's better. They should be happy that someone brings a little of it in with them once in a while. What you brought in was tragedy. But it was an accident. A statistic. The kind of thing insurance companies make a fortune predicting. Don't oh, blame me. Blame that big wheel of chance. Dixie. I just didn't get the right number on this spin, that's all. Well, you got now 13 minutes to, to think of another one. What can I do for you, Dixie? Tell me something. Just let me alone. Well, I'm going to do something anyway. Did you turn on the radio? I turned on the radio. Turn it off. I'm not going to. Turn it off. I'm not going to. What do you want music for? Because I want to dance. Are you crazy? Oh, come on, Dixie, dance with me. Come on, it used to take your mind off things. Oh, I know, oh, but come I... come on, come on, that's it. Oh, pull me closer, Dixie. Oh, I wish this hadn't happened. So I could enjoy you, Julia. <laughs> Let's, let's just pretend this is the future. And we're dancing somewhere in, in love and... and How can I uh, think like that when all I can see are those guys down there loading buckshot and guns just Dixie, to... Dixie, Dixie, just dance. But I can still think. Oh, honey, this is wonderful. You know, I've played for a lot of dances. But I never realized until now what it does to you inside. What does it do to you, Dixie? Makes me wish I'd have gone to high school. I never got there. That was Early Autumn, done by the Woody Herman Aggregate, the band that plays the blues. Not that you're blue right now. <laughs> 
And this is Charlie Schaefer, your early evening platter party host on KNOK. And I want to remind you that if you have any request whatsoever, just dial KNOK. The switchboards are waiting. Now, how about a little bit of Glenn Miller? In the mood. I like that. I can request any tune in the world, but I can't save my life. What a great place to live. Let's dance some more. Yeah, yeah. What should I request? Don't break the news to mother, or maybe I'm in the mood for life. Oh, huh? Dixie, don't talk like that. Dixie! Give me the railroad station. Um, uh, freight division. Dixie, what are you doing? Stop talking. Hello? Hello? Um... What time does the next freight train leave? Yeah. I, I... I have some valuable freight I want to put on board. Oh. An hour, huh? Are you sure of the time? Exactly one hour? Well, I... I guess there wouldn't be time tonight. Thanks anyway. Oh, Dixie, you just couldn't get to that train. It's my only chance, but I need an hour. An hour of safety to get to it. I'll be right back. Dixie. Where are you going? To find a policeman, or to talk to those men, or to do something. The police are all over in another town. They couldn't get here in time. Now you just wait here. I'll be right back. Emily, if, if anybody caught me on my knees like this talking to you, I suppose they'd think I was crazy. But I'm not. Emily, you know it was an accident. Pure and simple. It wasn't my fault. Only nobody really believes it. They're waiting for me outside. Your people. And they want me in exchange for you. Only it isn't an exchange. It's, it's just blood revenge. An eye for an eye. And it doesn't make sense. I know that saying all this will... Never do you any good. But, Emily, I just wanted you to hear how sorry I am, how deeply and tragically sorry I am. Emily, have a good long rest. Maybe someday I'll meet you in person again and we'll talk about it. And that someday might be today. What are you doing down in the lobby, young lady? Where are you going? Mr. Abdo, we've just got to do something. Get some police or get rid of those men out there. I have long ago sent somebody for the police. But I don't expect them to get here. Well, then why don't you let him stay here longer? Because I can only hold these men a while. After that, they come in. I don't want to see it. Just why do these men want him? I, 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 I don't want to talk anymore. Well, I'm going to find out. Where are you going, lady? I want to ask you why you want Dixie. That ought to be plain. He didn't kill that girl. It wasn't his fault. You must have a better reason. Whose little girl was it? Yours? Or yours? Whose? Is that why you want him? Because it was one of your children? Lady, you'd better go on about your business and leave ours to us. We got our own reasons for getting that skunk. What'd you find out, Julia? What happened? Well, Abdo's been trying to get the police. They won't come. Don't worry. How many of their neighbors do you think they'll shoot down to save me? I don't know, Dixie. I don't know. Look, I got five minutes, that's all. Five minutes to walk out of here. And I need an hour. I'm sure the ringleader of that gang would... I talked with him. I'm sure he's the father. Oh, what's the use? I give up. But you can't, Dixie. You can't. What do you expect me to do? Perform a miracle? It's Abdo. Let me in. Are you... Are you ready to go, son? No, I'm not ready to go. I still got five minutes. You must have made a mistake with the time. Your time is up. It is like... Look at this watch. Look at it. Still better than four minutes. I'm sorry. 
But now is the time. Before they come in the hotel after you. I don't get it. I don't get this whole setup. Why did you bother to stop them once if you send me out to them now? I did what I felt I must do. For me, that was enough. Well, I'm not going. Do you understand? I'm not going. They'll have to work to get me. Haven't you done enough to me already? To you? The little girl you... who was killed... was my little girl. Oh. Mr. Abdo, I'm... I'm really sorry. I'll go. You won't have any more trouble from me. I'm going with you, Dixie. Here, I'll turn off the lights in the lobby. That might help. Shall we take the elevator? No, honey, the stairs. I want to make it last as long as I can. Dixie, not see I want to cry. Do I? But it wouldn't help. I'm having trouble enough seeing now. I'll go out with you and fight. Let me, Dixie. You're going to stay right here in this lobby. You said you'd do anything for me, and that's what I want you to do. How are you going to do it? I'm going out. Turn right alongside the building, and then I'm going to run. Run, you hear me? Then maybe somewhere, somehow, I can find help. So long, Julia. Dixie, I love you. Good. Take it easy. Stay right where you are. Why should I? Shut up. Now, if you know what's good for you, walk over to that car and make it fast. Take that gun out of my face. You know what I tell you? Stop talking. Hey! Yeah. All right, everyone, stay where you are. Hey, what do you think you're trying to do? I said stay where you are. I'll put a bullet through the face of the first man who moves. Are you going to let a guy get away with a crime like that? Oh. Maybe kill him. Whatever or not. Come on, guys. Oh. The next one will go through somebody's head. I want you to notice this badge on my coat. You people pay me to protect you and everybody against lawlessness in this town. And I'm going to earn my money whether you want me to or not. Some more police will be here in two minutes and anybody standing around will be arrested. Now go on home. Break this up. All the fun is over. Can you drive? Thank you, officer. I said, can you drive? Well, I could yesterday, but I don't know now. My knees... Well, try. I've got to be ready for anything. Where do I go? To jail. Oh, that's all right, mister. You'll be safe there. Hello. Hello, Julia. Would you care to go and get that sandwich we talked about a thousand years ago? Oh, I'd love to, Dixie. What did they say? The coroner acquitted me ten minutes ago. Accidental homicide. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Well, what are you going to do now, Dixie? Oh, just catch up with the band and drift, I guess. Dixie, I I don't suppose I could... Go back with the band? Well, just singing, that's all. You could do a bigger job than that if you want to. You mean it? Sure. Look, here's your wedding ring. You know, I never threw it away... Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's stars, Phil Harris and Alice Fay. Friends, this is Harlow Wilcox again to remind you that Autolite is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These products include world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, which are carried by your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer. See him soon, and have worn-out spark plugs replaced with ignition-engineered Autolite resistor-type or standard-type spark plugs for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. 
And remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Charles Boyer in Another Man's Poison. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Jeff Chandler and Dick Powell on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed by Lucian Morawack and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Death on My Hands was written for Suspense by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman. Included in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Barbara Whiting, Byron Kane, Franklin Parker, and Gil Stratton, Jr. Alice Fay and Phil Harris may be heard on their own radio program every Sunday over another network. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Charles Boyer in a tale we call Another Man's Poison. Buy world-famous Autolite resistor or standard-type spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. We want to thank the National Safety Council for choosing Autolite for the Council's Public Interest Award of 1950. This award is presented in recognition of exceptional service to safety. Autolite is proud to have been chosen as one of the leaders in this important field and pledges continued efforts toward accident prevention on the highway. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Elliot Reed as star of Return Trip, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Elliot Reed in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Nurse? Yes. There's someone to see you. Yeah? This is Superintendent Andrews of the State Institution. Oh, what do you got there? I've uh, set up a dictaphone out in the hall. Uh, careful of the wire, nurse, when you close the door, please. The doctor said... Yes, yes, I'll make it as brief as possible. Uh, you may go now, nurse. Very well. Uh, do you mind if I uh, hook up this microphone at the head of the bed? Suit yourself, fella. Well, it was a choice between a dictaphone and a stenographer, and I figured that in your condition... I don't feel too bad. Well, go on, ask your questions. No, I, I understand you were driving the bus... Uh, tell me what happened. You mean I can tell it in my own way? That's right. Great. I had an uncle once, you know, that was a writer. He wouldn't have gone near this kind of a story, though, with a ten-foot pen. No, he went in for happy endings. <laughs> Uncle Mort wouldn't even have liked the beginning of this one. Kind of dreary-like up there at the asylum that afternoon. You remember, there'd been quite a snowfall the week before. And far as the eye could see, everything was a dirty gray. Like a corpse that's been waiting too long for the undertaker. Well, around four o'clock it got so dark, the lights had to be turned on in the asylum. And then the wind started moaning like a lonely banshee. Day for a murder, as the fella said. Well, there were three passengers sitting in the bus when I went outside for the return trip. Two men and a woman. Maybe I ought to call her a girl, because she wasn't really much more than that. Anyway, these three passengers all had return tickets, and I went down the aisle collecting them. Tickets, please. 
Can I have your tickets, please? Driver. Driver, how soon do we start? Right away, miss. But we're two minutes late already, driver. Oh, these little jerkwater bus lines never keep to their schedules. Now we'll never get out of these mountains before that blizzard lets loose. Can I have your ticket, please, mister? You really think there'll be a storm? Why, sure, sure, it can't fail. And, lady, when they have snow up in these godforsaken mountains... Well, this morning on the bus coming up, a man was telling me... Well, here we go, folks. bag was sitting right across the aisle from the girl, second row from the front. Halfway back in the bus sat the third passenger, all huddled up in his overcoat. He didn't open his trap. Well, that was the picture as we swung out onto the highway for the return trip. This guy in back of me seemed to be itchy to start a conversation with somebody as soon as we got rolling. Well, uh, might as well get acquainted, miss. <laughs> 50 miles before we get down to civilization, you know. Uh, John Willard is the name. I said, uh... What? Oh, I I beg your pardon. Were you speaking to me? Well, uh, yes. I'm afraid I, I was... Yeah, sure, sure. These visits to the asylum, they're always depressing, aren't they? Well, the, this is my first time. Oh? Uh, some friend? My husband. Husband? Oh, well, now, that's too bad. I, I hope he... Hey, what's that? Some kind of a siren. Yeah, that's the asylum alarm, all right. But, Driver, wh- wh- One what? One of the did... inmates must be playing hide and seek with the keepers. Happens every once in a while. Oh, gosh, what if it's my brother? Oh? He the busting out kind? Well, it kind of upsets him to see one of the family, but then if we don't come to see him, it upsets him even more. I see what you mean. Do they. do they always catch them? Well, they tell me the place has never lost a customer yet. Oh. You know, a moment ago, I. I was praying that it wasn't Jim, but now I don't know. Even if they had to... Well, I mean, it would it would be better than seeing him as he was today. Any, anything would be better listen, than... Listen, listen. Hey, that's a police siren. Sounds like they're almost on top of us. Yes, there they are. There they are. Look out. Look out. They're going to pass us. Pass nothing. They're flagging me down. All right. Just keep your seats, everybody. <laughs> they're guards. With rifles. Hey, we're... Uh... We're looking for somebody. Yeah, we heard the asylum alarm. Is someone... Uh, Seen anyone along the road? Not even a jackrabbit. Officer, who escaped? Greg, Albert Greg. Oh. Whew, what a relief. Hey, Holly, take yourself a walk down the aisle and keep your rifle ready when you look behind those back seats. Are you kidding? When was this coming out party? I don't know. Maybe as much as a couple of hours ago. Does this Greg have a gun? Can't guarantee he hasn't. But it was a file that sprung him. A tiny steel file. He must have been working away at the bar since the day he was committed, a month ago. His stay was short. Nobody back here. Okay, now, check the gents for identification. You know how it is, Drive. You can't take chances. Oh, of course not. Here's mine. Huh? Oh, okay, Drive. Uh, your name, Frank Keniston? You can read, can't you? <laughs> Friendly cuss, ain't you? You know, that's the first peep that passenger has let out. I was beginning to think he was a deaf mute. Yeah? Well, uh, here, driver, you can have this stuff back. Oh, thanks. John Willard? Uh, yes, sir. Okie doke. Come on, Denton, let's scram. We gotta find Greg before he finds anybody. Yeah. Hey, driver, you can turn around now and go back. Go back? Go back? Why? Oh, oh no, no. This Greg is a killer. What I mean is, when the mood strikes him, he strikes. Well, what's that gotta do with us turning back? Didn't I tell you this man kills even without reason? Now he's got plenty of reason. He's gotta get out of these mountains, but quick. If he's down the road, there are lots of ways he could stop a bus. I say turn back. But that prisoner's liable to break any minute now. We could be snowbound up here for days. And if I have to spend a, another, even a, a night, one night in that asylum, so help me, they'd have to keep me there. Oh, listen, driver, listen just to me, please. Just a second, Mr. Willard. You're just one passenger. There are three. Now, let's take a vote. What about you, miss? I, I whatever you say. Mr. Uh, Keniston? I say keep going. That settles it. Hurry up, Denton. Wait a minute. Uh, what what does this killer Greg look like? Uh, well, the description says uh, slight build, weight about 140. Uh, dark hair, brown eyes, 27 years old. Uh, Denton, get the lead out of your britches. Yeah, but you know, I still... Do. We warned him, didn't we? Now, if they meet up with him, it's their funeral. Yeah. Well, we can take care of ourselves, fellas. After the guards left, I really set that bus to rolling. 
Out of the mirror up above the driver's seat, I could see that the girl was plenty scared. But she had nerve, I'll say that for her. When we slid around some of those snowbank curves, her lips would be drawn so tight the lipstick had a white border. But she didn't say boo. Willard, the windbag across the aisle from her, gave up trying to draw her into a conversation. And as for the third passenger, that English guy, Keniston, sitting halfway towards the back there, he kept acting like a clam afraid of losing its oyster. Might as well have had a lockjaw, if you get what I mean. Well, we hadn't gone more than another mile or two before the wind started to rise and kept it up until you'd have thought all the devils in hell were trying to break loose. It got black as the inside of a tomb until the snow started to fall. But with that wind whipping it around, it didn't exactly fall. Mister, that's what I call a blizzard. This is getting on my nerves. What have we got here anyway? A collection of zombies? Somebody say something. I, I was just going to say... You were going to say that the weather is rotten. Yeah, and she can say that again. But that isn't what I was going to say. No? What then, lady? It, it it occurred to me why the guards asked for identification. Huh? The description of Killer Greg. Slight build, 140 pounds, dark hair, brown eyes, 27 years old. So what? It's a, it's a remarkable thing. That description would fit you, Mr. Willard. Huh? Oh? And Mr. Keniston, too. What's that? Me? That's a peculiar thing, isn't it, driver? Yeah, Come to think of it, both of them could fit that description. And I've also heard that he's got a very soft face, almost like a woman. What do you think, Mr. Keniston? I don't happen to feel like talking. Yeah? Well, personally, I think uh, the more I think of what she said, the more remarkable it becomes. Yeah, she's got something there. Only remarkable isn't the word. What do you mean, Mr. Willard? This man, Greg, may be insane, but he's not dumb. Now, put yourself in his place. He knows he hasn't got a ghost of a chance making a getaway in the asylum clothing, see? So he borrows the wardrobe and identification of some stranger. Do you follow me? We're way ahead of you, Willard. It, it wouldn't be difficult for a killer. I should say not. But that still isn't the end of his problem, see? He's fighting against time. Yes. He's got to get out of these godforsaken mountains down to civilization before they can throw a noose around the whole area. And he knows, he knows if he's brought back alive, he'll be wearing a straitjacket until he's old as Methuselah. You've got quite an imagination, Willard. Yeah? Well, thanks. Now, the odds that Greg will be able to get himself transportation are mighty slim, except... except for this bus line. So let's suppose... You've got a great imagination, all right. You've got it all figured out. A bit too fat, if you ask me. Remember, please, sir, you're the one who was so dead set against turning back. Really, Keniston? Well, I'll leave it to the lady here and the driver. Do I act like a lunatic? Huh? Well? Search me. There were times, long periods of time, when Jim didn't either. My husband, I mean. That was the terrible part of it. He'd be, he'd be just like the old days, and we'd be so happy together, and then, and then all of a sudden, just without warning, he... he... Oh, I heard of lots of cases like that. Well, they tell me that sometimes it takes half a dozen of those uh, special doctors, those... Uh... Psychiatrists? Yeah, psychiatrists. Yeah, well, sometimes they got to put a person under a microscope and study them for a long time before they can be sure, uh, one way or the other. <laughs> and many's the time they make mistakes. Well, I heard it one time when... Shut up! Nobody's going to talk like that about me. It's Kennison that's been acting crazy. And I'll bet it wouldn't take a half a dozen psychiatrists but, to... What's to... that? Huh? An avalanche! An avalanche! No. Well, it's coming down! Oh, no. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Elliot Reed in Return Trip, a radio play by Maurice Zim. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Nowadays, renewing old friendships interrupted by the war is a popular American pastime. For most of us, hardly a week goes by without some friend of pre-war vintage dropping in to say hello. Well, that's one of the reasons so many Americans keep Roma California Sherry on hand always. 
for the gold and amber radiance and tempting nut-like richness of Roma Sherry capture the very spirit of gracious hospitality. And Roma Sherry does more than welcome guests. Roma Sherry is the perfect first call to dinner. The happy, mellow, moderate wine that suits your every entertaining need. Like the other fine Roma California dessert wines, Roma Port, Roma Muscatel, and Roma Tokay, Roma Sherry is a true wine from just the luscious goodness of the finest grapes. Patiently guided to taste perfection by Roma winemaking skill and resources, unmatched in America. That's why Roma is America's favorite wine. Why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. So insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, and enjoy unvarying goodness at reasonable cost, always. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, Elliot Reed, starring with Wally Mayer as Mr. Willard, Kathy Lewis as the girl, and Raymond Lawrence as Mr. Keniston in Return Trip, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, Superintendent, what do you think of the yarn so far? Let's hear the rest of it. Okay, okay. If you'll help me get a swig of that water. Sure. The way they got me rigged up here. Oh, thanks. Let's see now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Acts 2, 3, and 4 coming up. Well, after the avalanche struck, I just sat there gripping the steering wheel, sort of stunned. There wasn't a sound except for the wind, and that was muffled by the snow barrier that packed us in. Even on the far side, the bus was buried up to the middle of the windows. Well, all this was only a matter of seconds, I suppose. And then suddenly the quiet was broken by the most gosh-awful racket. It, it was as if somebody had up and given the signal for my passengers to go completely nuts. Get me out of here! Get me out of here! Look out! We don't get an axe! The axe! Let go of it, Willard. Let go of that axe. No. No. That did it. He's the one. He's the one. Lucky I saw him dab that fire axe. It's what the district attorney likes to call a a lethal weapon. And then some. Uh, Step back. He's coming, too. Tie him up. You'll find a rope in the dashboard compartment. Get it for me. Driver, I'll report you for this. You will, huh? I was going to smash your window so we could get out of here. Oh, yeah? Sure. What did you think I... Oh. Oh, so that's it, huh? Here's the rope, driver. Now, look uh, here. Wait a minute. You can't do this. You can't tie me up, you fools. I'm not killer, Greg. May... Maybe he isn't. Maybe. But like that guard said, we can't take chances. If you're innocent, mister, you can prove it to the authorities. If we ever live that long, have you forgotten we're trapped here by an avalanche and a blizzard that could go on and on and on? Just the same... <laughs> this is ridiculous. Hey, miss, are you feeling all right? No, I, I'm not crazy, driver. But I guess I was a little. Actually, there's no proof that, that Killer Greg is on this bus. Well, if you put it that but way... It's I... all my fault, and I'm sorry. My, my only excuse is that I was just so upset by seeing Jim, my husband. Well, I still say No, that... no, no. Now, now we've got to start acting like rational human beings. Let, let poor Mr. Willard up from the floor. Thanks, lady. Well, all right. But I'm warning you, Willard, no funny stuff. Oh, snap out of it, driver, will you? We've got to get out of this mess. Hand me that axe. Do I look that dumb? Oh, oh, all right, all right. Then use it yourself. Smash your window so we can crawl out. Willard, even you don't look that dumb. What makes you think the windows won't open? Huh? Then open one. What for? To let in the blizzard? But we've got to get out of here, driver. Not me. It would take a bear to make even a city block in that windswept hell. But we can't stay here. Why not? We're not freezing yet. The driver's right. Our best chance is to sit pat until the storm lets up. Yeah, but what if it doesn't, huh? What if it lasts longer than we do? What then, huh? What then? What Shut then? up! Blowing your top won't do any good, Willard. Nobody's ever confused me with Pollyanna. But things could be worse. This is as good an igloo as any, and if and when the weather clears, well, we can send out a party for help. Or maybe a road-clearing crew will come to our rescue. Yes. Yes, I, 
I suppose that that's the sane thing to do. Wait here. Uh, how about you, Willard? You also decided to do the sane thing? I don't like that crack. You one more like it? Look, we're not starting that again. Now, it's going to be a long night, and we might just as well make ourselves comfortable and try to get some sleep. <laughs> sleep. Cut it out. Now, miss, you take the back seat. It's the only one that runs the full width of the bus. You can use your lap robe for a quilt. All, all right, driver. I, I want to apologize again to everyone for the way I behaved. I... Casting suspicion. Forget it. it. Need any help? No, no thanks. I, I just don't know what came over me starting that idiotic talk. Please believe that I did. Why? What's the matter? Why are you staring at the floor? Well, say something. Look. Look. A file. A tiny steel file. The one that Greg. After the avalanche hit, there was a mad scramble. One of you lost it then. One of you is Greg. Killer Greg. Let me out of here. Oh, let me out of here. We just let her wear herself out, kicking and banging on the door. Nobody said a word. Willard and Keniston just stared at me and at each other. By and by, the girl stopped her fussing, and then she stood and stared at the three of us in rotation. It would have made your flesh crawl. Outside, the blizzard was getting worse, if possible. Finally, I reached into the watch pocket of my pants and brought out the old timepiece. What? What time is it, driver? I, I broke the crystal. It still says a quarter of four. It's it's 5.30. Only an hour and a half since we started out. An hour and a half. 5.30 in the afternoon. The very best we're stuck until morning. 14. 16 hours. Might as well be forever. Look, miss, we just got to make the best of it. I still think you ought to go back to the rear seat. And sleep? If you can. Willard, the driver and myself will be keeping a rather close eye on each other. In the light of recent develops, developments, you, you'll be all right. Here, driver, give me that axe. Huh? Let her have it for her protection. Sure. Sure, let her have it. Yes. Yes, give it to me. Okay. You holding on to the file, too? Of course she is. The file could also be a lethal weapon. <laughs> Well, she took the axe and the file back to the rear seat with her, and we all sat down to wait. Those were the longest seconds of the longest minutes of the longest hours that ever... Well, somehow it got to be nine o'clock, ten, eleven. Finally, it was midnight. Ever fought against sleep? With the cold numbing you and the wind lulling you. Sometimes even the fear of sudden death can't win against those odds. Time and again, the girl's eyes would close just for a second. And then they stayed closed longer. And her head nodded and her body slumped over against the corner of the seat. I got up and started down the aisle. Where are you going? Shh, Kenneth. Can't you see she's asleep? Where are you going? Her lap robe slipped to the floor. I was going to pick it up and cover her so she wouldn't freeze. Any objections? I'll do it. Oh, no, you won't. Go ahead, driver. You see, Keniston? Willard thinks I should do it. That makes it two to one. Help me! Help me with this wild cat! Get that file away from her before she dabs my eyes out! She was like a devil on a pinwheel. And I was lucky to tear loose before she did any more than nick me about the face. Afterwards, when Willard told her what I was up to, she apologized. But I didn't go near her again all the rest of that night. Well, about five o'clock, the blizzard stopped. And at seven, the sun managed to break through. Then we held a council of war. We can't send out for help. Why not? Don't you see, Mr. Willard? If we split up the men, whichever of you is Greg would have too good an opportunity. Whether he goes or stays. You could go alone. I'd never make it. We could all go together. How about that, driver? Well, no, I'd, I'd rather stick with a bus, Keniston. 
But before we decide anything, let's get out and look around. We got a window open on the far side of the bus and crawled through, the girl first. She was still clutching the axe and the fire. Here. Come here and look. What? Another few yards and we'd have escaped the avalanche entirely. We can shovel our way out. I'm sure we can. There were two shovels in the tool compartment at the tail guard of the bus. That only let two men shovel at a time, with the third man getting a breather meanwhile. It took a lot of shoveling. What's the matter, driver? Hurt your hand? No, oh, nothing much. Ooh. This feels good to take off those stiff leather gloves. Nasty blisters you got on that right hand. I'm a thumb and fingers. Hey, Dennis, are you shoveling or talking? We'll never get out of here at this rate. It's your tour turn anyway. I'm tired. Not as tired as Willard looks. I'll relieve him. No. No, that's all right. I can keep going yet for a while. Okay, then. Keniston? Here. Let me take a turn. I know I won't be much help, but I can at least try. No, 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 no. You're mountain guard. Though I'm sure you could do as well as Keniston. Keniston? Where's Keniston? Why, he's right... Stop him! Keniston was making a mad dash through the snow. Willard dropped his shovel and tore after him. I yelled for Willard to let him go, but I don't think he even heard me. For a while, it looked like Keniston was going to make it. But then he floundered and fell in a snow drift. And before he could get underway again, Willard nailed him. Oh, no, you don't! Oh. Well, he'll stay put for a while. What'd you do, knock him out? Well, what else was there to do? Is he? Oh. I know all the time it was Keniston. You think his, his running away proves it? It's the same as if he confessed. He knew it was his last and only chance. What, what are we going to do with him now? Tie him up. Then we're getting him and the bus out of here. Say, say, I wonder, I wonder if there's a reward. <laughs> No time at all, we had the bus clear and headed for civilization. Those snow-covered mountain roads weren't exactly my idea of a speedway, but I gave my motor the gun. Willard and the girl didn't take their eyes off Keniston. I kept watching him, too, out of the mirror over the driver's seat. He looks like he's coming, too. Don't worry, driver. Those knots I made in the rope won't give. Besides, I'm keeping the axe handy just in case. He's opening his eyes. Watch him now. Watch him. Yes, watch me. And listen to me, too. Shut up, Keniston. I'll stop this bus and put you out for good. Not before I've had my say. Willard and you, too, lady. Why do you think I tried to make a break for it? Because you are... You're a killer, Greg. You fools. You were blind, stupid fools. Was it my watch that had this crystal smashed at the quarter to four yesterday afternoon? So it was mine. So what? At a quarter to four yesterday afternoon, Killer Greg waylaid the real driver of this bus and took his place. What? That's how the crystal came to be broken. Shut up, Kennison. You can't talk your way out of this. It, it, it could be a coincidence. Sure, sure. That's what I thought, too. Coincidence. Until I noticed the blisters on the thumb and first two fingers of the right hand. A file would make blisters like that. A file held in the right hand of Killer Greg. Look at him. Look at him. It's true. Greg. Greg! Don't come a step closer, any of you. If you make the slightest move and I'll crash the whole lot of us. Don't do it, Greg. Stop the bus. We won't do anything. It was a perfect plan. It had to work. If only that avalanche hadn't come along. But I'll still make it. I'll make it even if I have to. Look out! Then turn! It rolled over and over and over and over. The bus and the glass all smashed. <laughs> Everybody was all mangled. And <laughs> all right, all right. Go to sleep now. Sleep? Who can go to sleep? Who can go to sleep? Anyway, I outlived those three. Killer Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Suspense. 
Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. These days of hard-to-get meat and butter offer a real challenge to the American housewife who takes pride in her meals. That's why so many smart women serve Roma California Burgundy with dinner. They know that even the simplest meals taste better, becomes more enjoyable when served with a fine, robust Roma Burgundy. Discover for yourself the satisfying taste harmony of Roma Burgundy with food. The next time you serve a savory pot roast, oven-browned meatloaf, or a piping hot dish of spaghetti heaped with a spicy sauce, bring out all its flavorful goodness with a bottle of red Roma Burgundy. Or, if you prefer a lighter wine, let Roma California Claret or famous Roma Zinfandel add magic taste and friendliness to your next meal. Remember, Roma, America's favorite wine, costs no more than ordinary wines. So insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, America's first choice in wine. Elliot Reed appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, producers of To Each His Own. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Leon Ames as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you After the Movies, a suspense play starring Mr. Ray Milan. I'd been called to jury duty a couple of weeks before all this happened, and it was one of those kind of sensational trials. And the judge told us jurors not to go out in any public places where we might be approached or influenced. So I'd been sticking pretty close to the hotel. So it was a real treat when they said we were free for a couple of days because the witness was sick. Of course, the movies is a public place, but Ann didn't think that would really count, and neither did I. We went to the early show across the street from the hotel and got out about half past nine. I thought she was darling. I didn't care so much for him, though. I didn't think she was too hot, either. Say, what's the difference, really? The first movie I've seen since the trial started. How about some ice cream? We got those little cakes at home. Some ice cream might go nice with them. I don't know if I can go home. You mean this jury thing, you know? Oh, you're free for a couple of days. Isn't that what they told you? Not gonna do any harm for you to sleep home tonight. I suppose not. What kind do you want? What? Ice cream. Chocolate. Come on. Well, well. Hello there. How are you this evening, folks? Yeah, Hello. fine. Just fine. What can I do for you? About a quart of ice cream, chocolate. Right. Say, how's the trial going? You're on the jury, aren't you? Yeah, but uh, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Oh, yeah. I should know better than to ask. You know, I bet you we have five, seven jurors a day come in here from a hotel across the street. Hey, you think you've been on this trial a long time? Some people stay on for months. Well... I'll tell you what I think about this Harmon fella. I'm not supposed to let anybody talk to me about it either. Oh, say, that's right. I forgot about that. Well, that'll be 60 cents. Yeah, I got it, Ann. Now, what did I do with my wallet? No. Oh, here. That's 60 out of one. And thank you. Well, I hope now that you know us, you'll trade here sometimes even after the trial's over. My name is Adelson. Well, I'm Mr. Bennig, and this is my wife, Ann. I'm happy to know you. I hope you'll be through with the thing real soon. I hope so, too. Good night. Al. Yeah. Look what I found. What? An envelope on the floor right here. Somebody dropped something, huh? Yeah. It's open, too. I wonder if we should, you know, to find the owner. Say. Money, bills. Hey, let me see. How much is there, Al? Al? How much, Al? Ten thousand dollars. Huh? Ten thousand? Who dropped ten thousand dollars on the floor of a drugstore? In just a moment, Mr. Ray Milland in the first act of After the Movies. 
Uh, hello there, Harlow Wilcox. Why, it's Santa Claus. That's right. What are you doing here, Santa? Well, I thought you'd like to hear about Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, and Vixen. Your reindeer? No, no. My ignition engineered auto light spark plug. On a sleigh? Oh, well, I turned in my sleigh for a sky sedan. And since I replaced my worn out reindeer. <laughs> I mean spark plugs with ignition engineered auto light spark plugs. Why, I've been getting... I know. Smoother performance, fast starts, gas savings. Ignition engineered auto light spark plugs, you know, are world famous for quality and dependability. Ah, uh, how right you are, Harlow. Now I know what you mean when you say... Ignition engineered auto light spark plugs are designed by the same auto light engineers who designed the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of the complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on leading makes of America's finest cars. That's why Autolite spark plugs work as a perfect team with your car's ignition system. Well, hang up a big stocking, Harlow. You've been a good boy to tell me about ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. <laughs> Glad to do it, Santa. And whether you choose the resistor type or the standard type, you'll be right. Because you're always right with Autolite. And now with After the Movies and the performance of Mr. Ray Milland, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. $10,000? You mean the envelope was just laying there on the floor? I almost stepped on it, and then I picked it up, and I saw there was something in it. Al, what should we do? Well, gee, a thing like this, I, I don't know what to say. Well, if I was you, I'd keep it. That's what I'd do. And uh, since it was in my store... No, no, we couldn't do that. Well, I could. It ain't stealing. You found it. And it was my store you found it in. Well, we better turn it in. Look, if there's a reward, uh, we'll get together on it, won't we? There's some kind of a note in it. A note? Yeah, in with the money. This is your first half as agreed in... Uh, no signature. It doesn't make much sense to me. Mm, me either. Hey, hey, where are you going with that money? If anybody comes looking for it, we live on 5th Street, 229. If there's a reward, we'll see you get your share, Mr. Adelson. Come on in. Don't worry, Mr. Adelson. Don't worry? $10,000 is a lot of money. <laughs> I said there was nothing to worry about, but I wasn't feeling quite as breezy as I sounded. $10,000 is an awful lot of money. Anne was still trying to figure it out when we got home. One thing I'd always said about Anne, she had a good mind. Now she remembered the note and she took off from there. Al, it must mean something. It was written to somebody. It must mean something to them. After all, it's $10,000. Let's get on with the ice cream. Oh, all right. Look, Annie, if nobody claims it by tomorrow, we'll put an ad in the paper or something. It's not our worry. Yeah. Here, chocolate. We could keep it, couldn't we? I mean, the law says finders keepers. If nobody can prove it's theirs, we can keep it, can't we? Isn't there a law? Well, I guess as far as the law is concerned, we could keep it. Of course, we'd have to give part of it to Mr. Adelson. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Al. That money belongs to somebody. All right. If they claim it, all right. If they don't, well, all right. Why worry about it? It belongs to whoever that note was written to. Uh huh. Now listen, listen. This is your first half as agreed in the E H business. But if they are not hung up when the time comes, don't expect to get the rest or stay healthy very long. No signature. No signature. Al, that last part about staying healthy—that's a threat. That's what it is. Threat? Well, yeah, it could be. The man who's giving the money is threatening the man who's getting it, that if he doesn't... Doesn't what? Al, don't be so dense. Help me a little. Doesn't do what they're paying him to do. It's a bribe. Don't you see, Al? This money is a bribe. A bribe? Hey, that's right, Annie. You could be right at that. Well, now we're getting somewhere. All right, a bribe. And it has something to do with something being hung up. If they are not hung up when the time comes, it says. What could be hung up that's so important to anybody? Jewelry. 
that's it, a jury that can't reach a verdict. Al, I'll bet that's it. Somebody is trying to bribe somebody on a jury to... To what? Al, those initials, E.H., Edward Harmon, the name of the man that's on trial. The jury that you're on. Gee, I don't know, Ann. They all seem like such nice, decent people. Yeah, but listen, listen. This is your first half, the $10,000, as agreed in the E.H., that is the Edward Harmon business. But if they are not hung up as a jury, don't expect to stay healthy. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense, Annie. Now, now we've got to call the police. Police? Well, sure, we've got to report it right away. Well, maybe I should give it the district attorney in the morning. No, don't you see, Al? You're on that jury. Why, if we delay telling them for even a, an hour, they may think you've got something to hide. No, I think I'd better wait till the morning. If you don't phone them, I will right away now. Well, I hope you're right. I hope this is the right thing to do. My name is uh, Albert H. Benig. That's right. I live at 229 Fifth Street. Yeah. I want to report something to you. There's a drugstore on the corner across the street from the courthouse, and my wife and I were in there earlier this evening, and my wife found something. Yeah. Well, on the floor. There was an envelope with $10,000 in it and a note. And we think it has something to do with the Edward Harmon trial. Yeah. No, just my wife. Yeah, she's sitting right here with me. Yeah, that's what I think. Now, you'd be doing me a great favor if you'd... Yes, we'd wait right here. We'll be expecting you. What did they say? They said they'd send somebody up just as soon as they could. Well, weren't they excited about it? Didn't they say anything? Well, Anne, I guess with people like that, these things are just sort of routine. That must be them now, Al. I'll go. I must say, they took their time about it. Oh, good evening, gentlemen. Come in. Thanks. You're Mr. Pennig, Albert H. Pennig. That's right. This is my wife. How do you do? No, how do you do? I... I sort of expected to see someone in uniform. I should have known, I suppose. Uniform? Yes, you gentlemen are from the police, aren't you? Uh, no. No, we're not. Oh? You expecting the police, lady? Y yes, we were. You better not take too much time, Johnny. I think you people got something that belongs to us. Something you found in the drugstore in the corner. Oh... We lost it there. Druggist told us you had it. Well, we did find something, yes. Ten grand and five hundred in a white envelope. Well, I guess it's theirs all right, Ann. Yes, but... But what? Well, I'm sure it's yours, but there was something else, too. We better just give it to him, man. The note. I always said that was foolish. There was a note. Yes. You read it? We glanced through it, of course. We thought it might tell us who the money belonged to. And it did, didn't it? No, oh no. Come on, lady. Now, wait a minute. This is a gun, man. Hey. The note told you that the dough was to buy off somebody on the jury of the Harmon trial, didn't it? You talk too much, Johnny. Come on, let's get out of here. What's the difference? Use your head. All right, what about it, Mrs. Benning? How did you know it was in the note? We got to know these things. We work for Mr. Harmon. We know you're on the jury, too, Mr. Benning. Al. Where are you from, Mrs. Benning? I mean, where do your folks live? What part of the country? Why, Washington. Spokane, Washington. All right. Mr. Benning, you go on down that trial tomorrow. Just don't nothing had happened. Anybody asks you about your wife, you tell them she's gone on a little visit to her folks in Spokane. Visit to my folks? The case will go to the jury on Friday. If everything goes like it should, your wife will be back here safe and sound first thing Monday morning. Oh, good Lord. But you can't do a thing like this. You can't. Be reasonable, Mrs. Panic. We got to. You people know too much about this thing. Well, we wouldn't say anything. I promise. I swear it. Now, how can we take a chance like that? Armin is up for murder. Better get your things together, Mrs. Pennick. Go with us, Sam. We ain't got all night, though. I'll take the money, Mr. Pennick, before I forget it. Thanks. I hope you understand our position. What are you going to do? Well, obviously, the money went to the wrong party. 
So we got to use another method. If everything goes like it should on that jury, your wife will be okay. But if it doesn't... You can't. You can't do that. Oh, but we can. Saves us a lot of money, too. And, Mr. Bennig, not a word to the authorities. Your wife would make a cute corpse. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ray Milland in After the Movies. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Santa Claus, no kidding. Did you really name your Autolite spark plugs after your reindeer? I certainly did, Arlo. How come? Well, for one thing, those reindeer were always unexcelled for fast starts, smooth performance, and gas savings. And so are those ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Uh, they sure are, Arlo. And, of course, those reindeer are famous as a perfect team, just as ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs are famous for working as a perfect team with your car's ignition system. Because, you see, they're designed by the same Autolite engineers who designed the complete ignition systems, used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of America's finest cars. Well, that's why you say they're ignition engineered, eh, Harlow? Sure, Santa. So, folks, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the standard type or the resistor type, remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ray Milland in Elliot Lewis's production of After the Movies, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. After they left, I just sat there. Maybe another guy would have rushed right off and done something, but I couldn't. I had to think. It had all happened so suddenly, in less than an hour, the whole thing. And picking up the money on the floor at the drugstore and then figuring out from the note that it was a bribe to someone on the jury of the Harmon trial. The jury I was on. And those gangsters arriving and claiming the money and taking Anne as a hostage for my verdict. The police hadn't arrived. I left home, sneaked out the back way, took the side streets and went to the office of the chief of detectives. So you came down here. What are we sitting here for? Why don't we do something? Well, we got to know what we're doing before we start doing it. Anyway, from what you told me, I don't think she'll be in any real danger. No real danger? She's been kidnapped by gangsters. But why? That's what doesn't make sense to me yet. I told you, the money was some kind of a bribe. They thought we knew about it. But you didn't. How could we? Ann just picked up the money off the floor and... They said that they'd have her back by Monday? That's what they said. You can believe them if you want to, but she's my wife. Okay, okay. Um, what do these two cookies look like? I don't know. Average size, dark, I think. I, I, I don't remember what they look like. Did you catch their name? I didn't ask them. <laughs> You're not going to be much help for a while, are you? Okay, it's all right. Um, by the way, my name's Dan. Oh, oh. Mine's Al. You'll probably be seeing quite a lot of me in the next day or two, so we might as well get acquainted. And, uh, Al. Yeah. Take it easy. We'll find your wife. <laughs> His being friendly like that made me feel a lot better. But we still weren't doing anything. First, he got out a lot of pictures, and I had to go through all those. But of course, I couldn't recognize anybody, and then he started making phone calls. That didn't make much sense to me either, except that he figured they might have a stolen car, and he was trying to check on it. Finally, he called a police car, and we drove back toward the courthouse. It was 12 o'clock, but Mr. Adelson hadn't left the store. He was anxious enough to talk, but it didn't look as though he was going to get us any place. I tell you, Lieutenant, it was right there on the floor. Right there. Yeah, but when you talk to these two men... Oh, yes. Well, I talked to them. Uh, the one, that is. And he said he'd lost an envelope, he thought, in my store. And yeah. I said, yes, we'd found it, and Mr. Bennick had it. So you talked to him. What did yeah. they look like? Well, now, how can I know what they looked like when they called me on the telephone? Okay. I guess that's all, Mr. Adelson. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I, I wish I could help that's you. That's perfectly all right. But if there's anything else that you... We'll think... call you. Hey, hey, Mr. Bennick. Yeah. Did you tell him about the note? Note? Yeah, the note that was in with the money. So there was a note. <laughs> 
Sure. In with the money. Wasn't it, Mr. Benny? Well, what about it, Al? Well, I... I'm sorry. I... I guess I forgot... We drove back to Fifth Street and parked in front of our apartment. Dan didn't say a word until we got into the elevator. And then he spoke to the elevator boy, not to me. You take Mrs. Bennig and a couple of men down tonight about 10.30. Yeah, that's right. Police? Mm-hmm. What'd they look like? Well, I couldn't really tell you. They had their hats pulled down, sort of. One was tall and the other was short. That's about all I noticed. Oh... Wait a minute. Yeah? The tall one had kind of a limp. He had a cane. A limp, huh? You hear any names? Yeah, and now that you speak of it, the short one called the tall one Johnny. Funny, I didn't think of it. The tall one and the short one, and the tall one's name was Johnny, and he had a limp. But that breaks the case wide open, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll see that you get a citation. got off at my floor and I opened up the apartment and we went in. And he still didn't say anything. He prowled around the apartment, poking into bureaus and closets for not saying a word. Then he came out in the living room and sat down in the big armchair and looked straight at me. All right, Al. What about the note? Well, I, I'm sorry, Dan. I didn't think it was important. You're not sore, are you? Me? What have I got to be sore about it? Your wife. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry. Now, what about the note? But all it said was something like, this is the first half as we agreed and no signature. Have you got it? No. They took it when they took the money. And you couldn't remember that one was a tall guy and the other was a short guy and that the tall guy's name was Johnny. But I was all upset. I didn't even know if I heard his name. Are you trying to protect her, Al? No, no. I've told you everything I can. <sighs> okay, forget it. And let's see. A bribe. That means that somebody wants something or is on the spot. The fix will be on by Monday, they say. Now, who is there in this town that employs gunsels that would have a deal with that much dough set for next Monday? Oh, there could be a million deals like that. Quiet, let me think a minute, will you? Johnny, a cane, and a short guy. It's on the tip of my tongue. And it wasn't so long ago, either. Sure, sure. Why didn't I think of it? Think of what? Bill Quinlan, the defense lawyer in the Harmon case. Those are his boys. Had him up a dozen times. He always comes and gets them off. The Harmon trial? Yeah, this Harmon is up on a murder rap. A bank robbery, a guard was killed. His lawyer is Bill Quinlan. Quinlan's bribed more juries than I got hairs on my head, if you could ever prove it. Get a couple of hung juries and they let you off the hook. He's pulled it plenty of times. Well, isn't that a little far-fetched? Yeah, it's like I say, Al. It's all we've got. I'll have the boys check the jury list anyway. Where's your phone? In there. Uh, Dan... Yeah. Dan, uh, I'm on that jury. You what? Well, don't you see? If I opened my mouth, they'd kill her. They told me so. So that's it. I didn't dare tell you, Dan. I hoped you'd find her Why, without... Why, you long-legged, thick-headed idiot. Don't you think I've been in this business long enough to know it a little better than you do? Don't you think I know how to give people protection when I have to? Do you think we go around trying to get people killed? Do you know any more that you haven't told me? No. You know who the juror is they're trying to bribe? Nope. Yeah, okay. At least now we know where to start looking. Dan. Yeah? Uh, you, you're not sore at me, are you? Me? No. What have I got to be sore about? <laughs> I knew where to start looking, but it wasn't as easy as that. I was still on the jury, of course, and they didn't dare make a move against Harmon because of Anne. The case went to the jury Friday, and there was still no word of her. And, of course, I had to vote not guilty. They understood that. But as it turned out, the vote was eight to four, so it didn't really matter. With a hung jury, Harmon was scheduled for a new trial anyway. By now, it was Monday the day Anne was supposed to return, but there was no word. What if they'd found out the police knew I was on the jury? It was nearly midnight when Dan came to the apartment. He looked as though he hadn't slept for three days. I hadn't either. He told me to come along with him. He didn't say much until we were way down on Avenue C in the Lower East Side. Don't let it get out, fella, but I think we're going to come out all right. When'd you find out? About an hour ago. We trailed Harmon. That's why he got bail. Dan. 
Don't kid me. Are you sure that she's... As sure as we can be. We know where they are. She'll be there. Now, that's the place, third house down. Ellis, you and Wilson stake out the back. Farley, Edwards, take the front. I'm going in. All right, get going. Dan. Yeah? I want to go with you. Oh, you stay in the car. I'm going with you. Okay, come on. Now, let's go. Now, there's a light in the front. They may give us a little reception now. They wouldn't do anything to her. Would they, Dan? I'll try the door. Yeah, it's locked. Can we bust it open? I got a skeleton. All right, close it behind you so the street light won't show us up. Okay. They're coming. Now, those are my boys. Let's try in here. I don't think anybody's around. Mm-hmm. Come on. Maybe they took us someplace else. Shh. Quiet. No, Al. You better stay out. Why? What is it? What is it? It's her, Al. Your wife. She is dead. She was dead. And the next day there was the funeral. A lot of friends came around and shook hands and looked at me sad. And I stood by where she was lying with all the flowers around her. This wasn't the way it was supposed to work out. Dan came too. For a long time he stood there, looking at her and my friends and me. You called them, didn't you? I called them, yeah. You called them and she thought you were calling the police. That's why the police never showed up. I called them. She was so insistent I had to call somebody. I didn't think they'd take her away. I thought they'd just take the money and leave, forget the whole thing. But they took her, too. What about the money? The money they paid me for the trial? Mm, The money for the trial, the $10,000. I told you. They took it. They took the money and and they took her. All except $500. I kept that in my pocket. They didn't get that. That's what I paid for the funeral with. I know. We had the numbers of the bills when we picked them up later last night. They had it all except $500. That's what brought me back to you. It's funny. I did it for her. To buy her nice things. And all I bought her was a funeral. Say goodbye, Al. You'll have to come with me. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ray Milland. At my workshop, we make toys for all the little girls and boys. We work hard to make them right, make them perfect, like Autolite. You said it, Santa. Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and cable, starting motors, all engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. And because all Autolite parts are original factory parts, you can be sure you're right. Because you're always right with Autolite. (laughs) 
Next week on Suspense, Mr. Alan Ladd as star of A Killing in Abilene. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Dennis Day, Cornell Wilde, and Ginger Rogers, all appearing in tales well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Parts of this program were transcribed. After the Movies was written for Suspense by Jack Finney and was adapted by Robert L. Richards and David Ellis. Ray Milland appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture King Solomon's Mines, with Deborah Carr, Stuart Granger, and Richard Carlson. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Alan Ladd in A Killing in Abilene. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor-type or standard-type spark plugs, Autolite safe batteries, Autolite electrical parts, and your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite... Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Miss Betty Grable in The Copper Tea Strainer, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leader. Friends, even a camel can't compete with an Autolite Stay Full battery because... An Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Yes, sir, that dandy, dynamic, dependable Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. An Autolite Stay Full battery has extra plates, too, for extra power. Protected by fiberglass insulation for longer life and stronger life. Why, in recent tests conducted according to the Society of Automotive Engineers' Life Cycle Standards... Autolite Stay Full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without all these features. So remember, be battery right. Switch to Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Betty Grable in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was in the two-by-four dressing room changing into my street clothes. It was raining, beating down on the low skylight like a fury. It made such a racket that I didn't hear a thing. Until the buzzer rang and the outer door opened. The first I heard your voice, I was sorry for you. You sounded tired and you had a cold. You'd be surprised if I ever told you, but I wasn't frightened at all when you spoke to Irwin. You the photographer who runs this place? I'm James Irwin, and this is my photo agency, yes. You have some work to do? I got work to do. <coughs> There's a, there a dame named Jeannie Dunn here, Irwin? When you said my name, I got a little scared without knowing why. I'd been modeling a sunsuit, and I was cold anyway. Irwin was never a guy to pay for decent heating. Now I got cold way inside and my fingers trembled as I tried to zip my dress. I leaned against the partition to try and hear better, but the rain was too loud. I couldn't figure out why I was so jittery. I, I was blank. I, I couldn't remember what had happened all day or yesterday. But I knew you were dangerous to me and I had to find out why. I opened the door a crack to hear better. Oh, Jeannie's posed for me for the past five years off and on. Say, why don't you wait until she gets dressed and ask her yourself? Any pictures of her handy? Say, who are... Easy, easy. This is police business. Oh. And that was all it took to make Irwin dangerous, too. Then he was against me. I stood there, hidden by the door, sick of you pawing through my pictures. Even sicker of Irwin fawning over you because you were a cop. <laughs> She's really stacked, isn't she, Cat? But if she's done anything wrong, don't worry. I'll tell you all I can believe me. I'll cooperate. I believe you. You're the type. I couldn't stay out of sight any longer. I slipped into my shoes and stepped out from behind the door. Miss Jeannie Dunn. What do you want, mister? 
I want to find out a few facts. You live with your mother, don't you? Sure, the old lady's an invalid. Hey, what happened? Shut up, I'm talking to Miss Dunn. She's got a boyfriend, too. She might not tell you herself, Cap. Get out of the room. Get out and stay out until I call you. Hey, look, Miss... Get out! Okay, all right, sure. Okay. Thanks for that, anyhow. But look about Ted Wark. If it's anything you're trying to pin on Ted, then Irwin's right. I won't talk. No. <coughs> I... I didn't mention that name, did I? Ted wouldn't do a thing. Nothing wrong. What time do you usually leave home for work, miss? About eight, if it's any of your affair. Yes, I'm afraid it is. Could you be more specific? Describe your routine, say, this morning, for example? This morning... I, I've had such a headache all day, I really don't know about this morning. Actually, <laughs> I can't remember. Most mornings, I get up about 6.30 and fix breakfast. Yeah. Does your mother eat with you? My friend, Mr. Irwin, told you. My mother's not well. She stays in bed until noon. And you leave her breakfast ready for her? That's right. Oh, being sick, your mother hasn't much appetite, has she, miss? No. I leave her teacup on the kitchen table with the tea measured out in a strainer ready to pour hot water through. Now, mister, you'd better tell me what... How long have you been going with this fellow? What's his name, Ted? A year or so, but... How old are you? I beg your pardon, miss. Thirty. About thirty. <coughs> you plan to marry him? Why, yes, as soon as... Well, as soon as possible. Uh, what with supporting your mother... <coughs> Excuse me. Prices nowadays, a dollar don't go far. Uh, you'd better take care of that coal, mister. Oh, thank you. Are your mother and Ted Wark friendly? You'd better take care of that coal. I repeated that stupidly so as not to hear your questions. Then I stared at something you fished out of your coat pocket. I felt the arteries jumping on the sides of my neck. You were looking at my neck. Maybe I could ask you sometime if that was a tip-off you learned by studying people like me. You toyed with the thing in your hand and it picked up a sliver of light from a flood lamp. It sparkled like a, a jewel. Only it wasn't any more a jewel than any of the junk on my bureau. It was a common tea strainer made out of bright new copper. You watched me and spun the thing by the handle between your finger and thumb. I couldn't stop looking at the shiny wire, a mesh like a net. Well, miss, what do you say? Are your mother and Ted Wark friendly? Suddenly my mind cleared. Everything I'd managed to block out came back. Everything. There was no more escaping the past. Or you. Stop playing with that tea strainer. Huh? Put that thing away. Get it out of my sight. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Betty Grable in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Harlow. Harlow, you're on. No, no, Hap. I refuse to go on tonight. Why, Harlow? I'm hurt. Autolite won't let me say what I want to say about Autolite Stay Full Batteries. The sponsor won't let you talk about his product? I tell you, Hap, they inhibit my artistic expression. I want to sling wonderful words about my personal experience with Autolite Stay Full Batteries. And all they'll let me say is, Autolite Stay Full Battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Yep, needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Well, that's important. And what's more, Hap, an Autolite Stay Full battery has extra plates, protected by fiberglass insulation for stronger life and longer life. Well, folks want to know those things, Harlow. No, maybe so. And in recent tests conducted according to the Society of Automotive Engineers Life Cycle Standards, Autolite Stay Full batteries did give 70% longer average life than batteries without all these features. Well, now, Harlow, folks should be told those facts. Well, maybe you're right, Hap. Maybe I shouldn't be angry. Maybe I should put in a commercial right here. Oh, it's too late, Harlow. Here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Betty Grable as Jeannie in The Copper Tea Strainer. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Kit! 
Can you faint dead away and keep sitting in a chair talking and acting normal? I did, Mr. Detective. At the sight of the tea strainer you kept spinning between your fingers. A cold blackness paralyzed me and our two voices seemed to be coming from a great distance. My stomach felt sick. You hit at me with questions and I fought with all my will to keep from giving dangerous answers. The rain banged louder on the skylight. A flood lamp sputtered out. And my breathing quieted down. You said your mother and Ted Wark are friendly? Yes, yes, I told you. Where did you get that tea strainer? Five and dime store. Why, miss? Nothing. Uh, <coughs> you, uh, You leave your mother's breakfast ready for her? Hadn't you asked me that before, too? I, I wasn't sure. But the words started memories flashing through my mind like jumpy movie scenes. You studied me with your tired, expressionless eyes. But you couldn't see into my memory. The nagging clatter of my alarm clock at home was waking me one morning. Any morning except today. The others were all alike for the last ten years. All right, you devil. Get up. Lord, another day. Dear, are you awake? Yes, Mother. Sleep well? Oh, I'm always in pain. You know that, dear. If you're up, you could rub my back a while before you have breakfast, dear. Yes, Mother. Oh. Oh, my, you're so fortunate to be able to eat a hearty meal and have a career that takes you out into the world. While I lie here in pain. Oh, I'm not complaining. It's just... Yes, Mother. Hadn't you better take your medicine before I rub your back? Oh, my medicine. Oh, yes, indeed. And, Jean, don't forget to have the prescription refilled. It's getting low, and I can't bear the I'm day sure without... there's plenty, Mother. I'll get it for you now. And I wish you would. I don't know how I have to... I went into the bathroom while Mother kept droning on and on. The bottle was almost empty. Mother! You haven't been taking more than you should of this, have you? Don't be absurd. You heard the doctor say that my medicine, more than one capsule a day, is poison. She talked and talked, accusing me of being careless with her medicine and neglecting her. She said if it hadn't been for me, she would still be on the stage and famous. But I realized she was in pain and unhappy, and some mornings I was afraid all of my strength would be drained before I could get away from her. Especially when she harped on Ted and me getting married. Uh, dear, don't be angry, but I simply must ask whether you're serious with your young man this time. This time? Well, after all, Jean, in the past years, there were several young men I certainly thought you were going to become engaged to. And every single one lost interest. Oh, Mother. Oh, yes, they did. You can't deny it. At your age, dear, a girl has to consider her future. Uh, now, that young man, um, uh, William something, he surely wanted to marry you, and he had a bit of money, too. Now, why did he stop coming to see you, dear? Was it anything you might have told him? Huh. You're trying to use me to excuse your own shortcomings, dear. Huh. What on earth? How could I scare away any of your young men? When I was on the stage, young men used to flock around me like bees. And now your Ted certainly thinks well enough of me to bring me flowers and look at my scrapbooks. Even if my own daughter... I then... wonder how long that will go on. When will you ask him whether he thinks a daughter has the right to let a helpless old invalid die alone? <laughs> horrible, horrible girl. Or have you asked him that already? After the sacrifices I've made for you, ruining my own health, destroying my youth and my career, so that you would have the best from life. Oh, Mother... Perhaps the easiest way for both of us would be for me to not try and hang on to this mortal coil any longer. To close my eyes and never wake up. She used death as a weapon against me many times. I felt weak and nauseated, although I was certain she was bluffing. Then I would rush out with no breakfast in a panic to feel the healthy life of the city around me and lose myself in the traffic and crowds. <coughs> Rotten deal, isn't it, miss? Huh? Honest, I'm interested in you and Ted Wark. You serious about each other? What are you getting at, mister? What's happened? I have a right to you know. You two really in love? 
paid no attention to my panic. You kept prodding me with that question and twirling the tea strainer. Faster now, it seemed to me. Was I really in love with Ted? I couldn't have answered even if I'd wanted to. How can you tell a stranger your dreams? Uh, miss, tell me. Exactly what's the matter with your mother? What treatment is she getting? That was funny. Ted asked almost the same question last night. You'd give a lot to know about last night, but you'll never get a word out of me. If you had seen Ted and me last night, you wouldn't have had to ask if we were in love. Last night was one of those miserably few times I found a neighbor to come sit with Mother. And Ted took me to a little neighborhood bar where they have a jukebox and postage stamp dance floor. We were dancing, crowded in like cigarettes in a pack. How about a kiss, baby? Ted, not right here in public. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here but us, Jeannie. Us and the mob. Mm. Anyway, it's just as crowded at Ciro's. They tell me. Well, we'll get to the ritzy places someday, baby. We got it coming to us. Oh, darling, you make it sound real sometimes. Uh, you stick it out a little longer, baby, and it will be real. Just trust me. There's always ways. Sure. A million bucks. Yeah, a million would help, wouldn't it? Oh, forget the gloom, honey. Uh, your feet had enough of my dancing. Uh-uh. You want another beer, you mean? Well, there is a booth. Oh. Hey, watch where you're going, you big Ted. ape. Ted, don't start a fight. Come on. Uh, I should have poked him. Well, <laughs> maybe you'll tame me down, baby. Here, sit next to me, huh? I don't want to reform you, darling. It's not that. But if anything happened to you, I'd die inside of me. Oh, baby, I... I don't know the words like you do. How can I tell you? You don't have to tell me in words, darling. I want to, though. Somehow I, I want you to know. I, I... I love you, Jeannie. More than at first, and I was crazy about you then. We could be so happy together. Together? <laughs> Yeah, that's what we both want more than anything else in the world, isn't it, baby? Ted, what's the matter? Huh? Matter? Oh, there's nothing the matter. I, I'm just figuring things out. Yeah, what do you folks have? What? Oh, uh, what'll it be, honey? Beer's fine. Uh, two beers, huh? Yeah, all right. Coming up. Then we'll have to be leaving. I promised Mrs. Grogan I'd get home by midnight. Oh, baby, you promised me we'd make a night of it. I'm tonight. sorry, Ted. But Mother was worse this evening before I left. Jeannie, what really ails your mother? The doctor has a long list. She's pretty bad off. Nothing's bad enough for her to keep you chained down like a slave. Ted, tell me the truth. Has she gotten to you with her... her talk? Oh, honey, don't... Ted, us. please. I want the truth. Well, I bring her flowers and try to win her over, Jeannie, but it's no soap. She says, what do I want to do, kill her by taking you away from her? She said that, huh? She did. I'm glad I know that. I'm glad I know that for sure. L look, maybe it's because she's so sick. Maybe, maybe she's not getting the right treatment. Say, what is the doctor giving her? Some stuff in capsules mixed with strychnine. Strychnine? Right. That's poison. Yes, she has to be very careful. You, uh, need a prescription for that, don't you? Uh-huh. Here, I'll, here, I'll show you the prescription. I have it somewhere in my handbag. Oh, here. Yeah. My Latin's sort of rusty. Excuse me, Ted. I'll freshen up and we'll go. Be right back. Okay, baby. The mirror in that dingy little powder room was cracked and clouded. But I could see my own face all too clear as I tried to dab on some rouge. My face was an old face, with a thin, cruel mouth. I tried to remember how I looked ten years ago when I had the screen test. I was Garbo and Dietrich, only younger, the director said. It was then my mother started getting sick and needing me. I looked into the mirror and saw my strange, pinched face. That was when the whole plan formed in my mind as I stared into that cloudy mirror. Oh, 
Oh, excuse me, miss. <clears throat> you better take care of that cold. Yeah, thanks. Now, uh, tell me, did Ted Wark ever blame your mother? Did he ever say that she stood in the way of your marriage? <gasps> I never told you any such thing. Ted wouldn't have done... Done what, miss? Mother's dead, isn't she? You're not very subtle. Why else would the police persecute me? She's dead. You believe your mother was killed, miss? No, no. You, you keep putting words into my mouth. Maybe she was worried about being in the way. Would your mother have been likely to have... Mother suffered night and day. I, I suppose that's why she acted so depressed. The tea would what have been... What tea? The oh, leave me alone, please. You believe your mother took her own life by making herself a poison cup of tea? Because she didn't want to be a burden any longer? Yes. Yes, that's what must have happened. But I lied. You led me into that lie. And then because I couldn't help myself, I relived the most terrible day of my life. A day I'll never confess to you or to anyone on earth. I woke up this morning with a headache. The pain running deep back of my eyes. I had a feeling of dread with the thought of last night in the mirror. Are you awake, dear? Yes. Oh, I haven't slept a wink, Jean. Oh, Jean, did you get my prescription filled as I asked you to? No, but there's plenty. You were out later than usual last night, weren't you, dear? I don't mind for myself, but it is an imposition on Mrs. Grogan. Oh, your young man such a she must have gone on complaining as usual But I didn't hear her I seemed to be moving in a strange world all my own As I dressed and went into the kitchen Sounds lost their familiar proportions And the sharp tinkle of tableware hurt my ears As I went about setting the table When I put her teacup in its regular place In the center of the faded blue cloth The spoon fell against the saucer it was like a file rasping a slate in my ears. I ran from the kitchen to get the medicine bottle from the cabinet. There were only two capsules left. My heart was pounding. Only enough for two normal doses. Not enough for... I yanked my coat on and ran out the front door. I, I hadn't planned on this. I ran all the way to the corner drugstore. never do hear that door open. Why, why, Jean, is your ma bad off? No. Well, yes. Her prescription has run out. I, w I was shaking all over, having this unexpected job to do. I knew the medicine bottle had plenty the day before. I thought I, I, thought I must be going crazy. I'd known Mr. Harmon since I was a kid. His patient, wise in face and celluloid eye shade... But I found no comfort in him now. Well, young lady, I asked you twice for your prescription. Huh? Jean. Oh, my sakes, uh, are you well? No, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Harmon. I, I can't find it. It's gone. Oh, well, <laughs> you, you sit down at the fountain, my dear. I'm not supposed to, of course, without a prescription, but I'll make up those capsules anyway. In the meantime, uh, lemon syrup and soda... Remember how you loved that when you were a little pigtail type, eh? I think I cried then. I scarcely was conscious as I hurried home. I took a drink of whiskey in the kitchen, gagging on it. Jean, where did you rush out to? I answered her while I struggled to unscrew the cap from the medicine bottle. I took four capsules and emptied them into the tea strainer. I emptied two more to be positive. On the bottle's label, it said, Warning, no more than one capsule in any one 24-hour period. Be careful. <gasps> and put two spoons of sugar in my cup, dear. It was too bitter yesterday. Did you hear me, Jane? I hear you. I was careful, all right. Three heaping spoons instead of two to hide the bitterness. A double measure of black tea, carefully, very carefully over the white pottery stuff in the strainer. And it was hidden completely. I left the tea kettle whistling on the electric plate. 
ready for mother. I didn't see mother again. I left the apartment half running all the way downtown to the studio in the rain. Erwin was crabbing as soon as I walked in. Oh, good morning, Duchess. All right, hop into your sunsuit now and make it snappy. And make up for black and white. What's the excuse today? Have to go to a funeral or something? I did it, he, I did it, did it, he said, silently and got through a series of poses. My mind had gone blank and I, I struggled to keep that way. Numb. All I knew was I mustn't let, mustn't let myself remember. Keep busy and blank. And that's the way it was when you came in and asked me questions. You spun that ugly little tea strainer till my eyes ached watching it. And you tore the protective blanket from over my head. You released my memories, but I told you nothing of the scenes you conjured up in my mind. I told you nothing. But still you knew that I lied when I agreed that my mother must have killed herself. You're not telling the truth, miss. But the odd thing is you're closer to the truth than you realize. I didn't kill my mother. I didn't. Did you know your mother had enough lethal medicine under her pillow to kill a dozen people? What? She'd been hoarding them. Perhaps because she brooded, she was a burden. No. But, miss, your mother never would have taken those capsules the hard way and a cup of tea. There was the flaw in your lie, wasn't it now? What? Your friend Ted Wark got a hold of your mother's prescription. Maybe he took it from your purse. That doesn't matter. Oh, no. No. No, no. I'm afraid I must place you under arrest, Miss Dunn. But I didn't kill my mother. You said... You said... No, no, you didn't kill your mother, miss. Your mother had a caller this morning after you left. He brought her flowers and some more medicine. Oh, no. Not Ted. He couldn't have done. No. No, you lie. So your mother never had a chance to use the overdose she had hidden. No. You, you lie. And your mother's caller never had the chance to feed her the poison he brought with him either. Because as soon as he arrived, he made the mistake of accepting your mother's hospitality. He drank a special cup of tea. Half of it, anyhow. Enough. Your mother is still alive, miss. I'm arresting you for the murder of Ted Wark. Thank you, Betty Grable, for a wonderful performance. Well, hello. All over your mad at the sponsor? Oh, half. You know I never hold a grudge. <laughs> In fact, I like to talk about Autolite Stay Full batteries. I like to tell people an Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I like people to know Autolite Stay Full batteries are made by Autolite, which makes more than 400 products. For cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants from coast to coast. Yes, and Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, coils, distributors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Here again is our star, Miss Betty Grable. I want to thank Tony Leader and his wonderful cast of actors for helping me to make my first suspense visit so pleasant. I'm a suspense fan from way back, and... I'm sure all of you are as anxious as I am to hear next week's show when Mickey Rooney appears in the Cornell Woolrich story, The Lie. It's another truly gripping study in... Suspense! 
Betty Grable appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Film Corporation and will soon be seen in the Technicolor picture, The Beautiful Blonde from Bashful Bend. Tonight's suspense play was written by John T. Copeland, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Bob Hope, Claire Trevor, James Stewart, and many others. So make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Mickey Rooney in The Lie. You can buy Autolite Stay Full batteries, Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world, Roma Wines presents Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Rita Hayworth as star of Three Times Murder, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Rita Hayworth as Laura with Hans Conried as Elmer in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! One of the most thrilling World Series in recent baseball history. And now, the exclusive that I promised you earlier in the program. A report so sensational that I'm going to devote all of my remaining time to it. I have before me a copy of a document delivered in person today to the district attorney's office by one Fredonia Bell. Fredonia Bell was the trusted personal maid of Laura Starling Morton, whom you will remember from the widely publicized murder trial of just four months ago. This document is a statement written by Laura Starling Morton in her own hand, and it begins as follows. Quote, I only regret that it will be impossible for me to be present when this is read aloud. What I shall shall relate here concerns three men. Of these three men, it is not on behalf of my husband, Robert, that I write, nor on behalf of my husband, Charles. This is for Elmer. But I don't think that Elmer will ever see it, for Elmer, too, is going to die. Laura? Laura? Yes, Robert? Laura, where's my electric razor? In the medicine cabinet, where it always is. Oh, for the love of... No, Robert, I wish you wouldn't shave while you're in the bathtub that way. What's the difference, darling, where I shave? I like to shave in the bathtub. Well, I just don't like to see you meddling with electricity while you're in there. You might get a shock or something. Yes, sure, sure, Mrs. Thomas Edison. (sighs) All right, so go ahead. I don't care. Listen, darling, listen. I like to shave in the bathtub. I'm relaxed in the bathtub. I read in the bathtub. I think in the bathtub. And I'm not going to change my habits even for you. I know, dear. I suppose that is a lot to expect. Uh, oh, boy. Ah. Robert. Robert! It was a good, loud scream. Then I stood in the door of the bathroom and looked. A good, long look. Then I called a doctor. The doctor called the police. The police called the district attorney. And I found myself confronted by a young man with red hair and glasses who gave the immediate impression of being clever, unscrupulous, and objectionable. That was Elmer. 
Mrs. Williams, I'm Elma Garner of the district attorney's office. How do you do, Mr. Garner? I thought that you and I'd better have a little private chat. What about, Mr. Garner? About your husband. What about my husband? Miss Williams, I'm going to be very frank with you on a number of counts. I'm what's known as an assistant district attorney. My Mr. Job... Garner, I have just lost my husband. I hardly I'm think... I'm coming to that, Mrs. Williams. The district attorney has put me on this case because he thinks he doesn't have a case. Routine investigation. Now, maybe that's because a DA is essentially a nice man with nice instincts. And I'm not, but I don't agree with it. About what? About not having a case. Because I can smell him, Mrs. Williams. I can smell him a mile away. What can you smell, Mr. Garner? Murder. Oh, oh I see. Good. Your attitude's very good. No phony hysteria, no fake indignation. Realistic. I like that. I'm that way myself. Mr. Garner, I'm trying my best to maintain my composure under trying circumstances. And I must say, your extraordinary insinuation does not make it any easier. Now, look, I know you killed him. You know that I know you killed him. Mr. Garner! Now, I said I was going to be very frank with you, Miss Williams. I am. On your side of the story is the fact that although I know you killed him, it may be a little difficult to prove that you killed him. Not too difficult, but a little. I should think it might. Since it's utterly untrue. Yeah. Now, let's see what cards I hold. You're a laboratory technician. You were before you married, at any rate, right? Right. And your technical knowledge would have told you that a man using a faulty electrical appliance while sitting in a tub full of water stood an excellent chance of electrocuting himself. I also know that a man firing a bullet into his head would stand an excellent chance of killing himself. Well, the insulation on the cable of that electric razor was frayed. Now, that might have happened through normal wear. It also might have happened because it was tampered with by you. And then again, as you say, it might not. Would it surprise you to know that we've got your fingerprints all over that razor? It would surprise me more if you hadn't. Or on everything else in the house, for that matter, Mr. Garner. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're a very intelligent woman, Mrs. Williams. You're right. It would have looked funny. You were smart not to wipe off those prints. Very smart, eh? Thank you. However, so much for the means. Now for the motive. We can establish, of course, that you and your husband didn't get along. Unfortunately, but... you could establish that about many husbands and wives. And that your husband was insured for $50,000 in your favor. And that there's about 50000 more in community property and that you inherit, right? Naturally. Well, $100,000 quite a nice little motive, Miss Williams. But it doesn't prove anything, does it, Mr. Garner? Well, that depends on how it's used by the prosecuting attorney. That's me, you know. I know. Do you have a lawyer, Mrs. Williams? Not yet. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're a very intelligent woman, Mrs. Williams. That would have looked bad, too, if you had a lawyer right on tap. But you're going to need a lawyer, you know. So it would appear. All right. What about me? You. Sure, I'm a lawyer. You just finished telling me that you would be the prosecuting attorney. Well, that's just the point. Oh, I spend a lot of money on a lawyer who probably can't get you off anyway. When you can spend it on me, you'll have a sure thing. See? Yes, I see. All I want is half. Fifty thousand dollars. No. What's the matter, too much? No. Now, look here, sister. You don't seem to realize that I'm in a position, depending on how I handle this case, either to set you free or to hang you. That, Mr. Garner, is where we disagree. You mean you're willing to gamble and I can't do it, huh? If you, if you wish to put it that way. All right. But $50,000 is going to look cheap. Cheap when they slip that noose around your neck. And there she sits, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Cold, calm, emotionless. The same Laura Williams who carefully calculated, carefully planned and premeditated the murder of her husband. I ask the death penalty. I must ask it. For ponder well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. If you set her free, if you set her free, believe me, this will not be the last accident to mark the bloody trail through life of Laura Williams. And when that accident occurs, when the next victim is struck down, his innocent blood will be on your hands. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Uh, we have, Your Honor. What is your verdict? Uh, on the grounds of insufficient evidence, we find the defendant not guilty. Uh, 
Well, Mrs. Williams, I guess the sporting thing is to say congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Garner. I'll say one thing. You got what it takes. You know, the jury was evenly divided the whole first day. Do you know that? Yes, I knew it. Uh, so I wasn't too far wrong at that, was I? Just far enough, Mr. Garner. Say, so listen. Uh, again, just a sporting proposition. Tell me. Did you? Did I what? Oh, come on. We're alone here anyway. It doesn't matter because you can't be tried twice for the same thing. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know it. Well, did you? Yes! You cheap, contemptible blackmailer! Yes! I killed him! How do you like that? I killed him! For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Rita Hayworth with Hans Conrad in Three Times Murder. A radio play by John DeWitt and Robert L. Richards. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles reminding you that football season's here again, and along with it, those pleasant Saturday evening get-togethers after the big game. So here's a tip when you play host. A sure way to delight your guests. Serve Grand Estate Wines. For Grand Estate Wines, presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, give you the ultimate in wine excellence. Yes, the brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate Wines please the most discriminating guests. To assure the outstanding quality of these limited bottlings of Grand Estate Wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes. Then at Roma's famed wineries, necessary time, and the patient, priceless skill of Roma master vintners guide each precious bottle of Grand Estate wine to rich, mellow taste luxury. Yes, the host who possesses all five Grand Estate California wines is sure to please all tastes at all times. For pleasant entertaining, serve Grand Estate medium sherry, ruby port, or golden muscatel. For gracious dining, enjoy Grand Estate Burgundy or Sauterne. Remember the name, Grand Estate Wines. Crowning achievement of vintner skill. Presented by Roma, the greatest name in wine. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, Rita Hayworth, who, as Laura Starling Morton, continues the reading of a document in Three Times Murder. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Perhaps I gambled too recklessly with Elmer. I have since had cause to wonder. But there were things that I could not foresee as well as Elmer. Suffice it to say that after my acquittal with $100,000 from Robert's estate, I moved into another city and took up my life again under another name. That there is Laura Starling. I met and married Charles Morton, a charming and eccentric man of twice my age, whose genius as a research chemist accounted not only for those qualities which endeared him to me, but for a very considerable personal fortune as well. That my conscience bothered me not in the least, and I was quite happy, and that as the years went by, I had seen, I thought, the last of Elmer. Charles! Oh, Charles! Yes, yes, my dear. I have your coffee. Coffee? Well, you said you wanted coffee. It's ready now. But I have some coffee. Well, you took that out there three hours ago. Now come in and get your coffee. <laughs> yes. In a, in a moment, my dear. As soon as I finish, yes. Charles, you come out of that smelly laboratory and have your coffee. Besides, I have a surprise for you. Oh, you have? Well, I'll be right in. And bring that other coffee cup with you. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yeah. oh, what's all this about a surprise? Look. Huh. Oh, yes. <laughs> I seem to have left my glasses in the oh, laboratory. Charles, <laughs> you're simply priceless. Why, it's a cake. It's a cake, yes. Well, this is our anniversary, darling. Our fourth anniversary. It is? Oh, why, so it is. Oh, Laura, this is so thoughtful of you. I, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm hopeless, my dear. I know it's the husband who should be thoughtful, but oh, I... <laughs> you're just you, darling. Now sit down and relax for a while. Oh, yes. 
Why, here's your cup. Thank you. Charles, what's in that cup? The coffee. Charles, I'm sure that even in the atomic age, coffee does not come in the form of white crystals. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'd finished my coffee and I was doing some other things there. And... Charles, what is it? A thiochlorate. You see, at the moment, I'm testing... Charles! What? Why, that's deadly poison. Well, so it is. You see, the thiocene radical follows its oh, tendency Charles, to... Oh, Charles, I, I wish you wouldn't mix things up in the cups and dishes that way. It, it's dangerous. Dangerous? Well, suppose you got the cups mixed up. Suppose you oh, drank... good heavens, Laura. Half the stuff we use in chemistry is dangerous if you go to drink it. But who's going to do that? It's like, uh, well, like eating soap. You wash your hands with it every day, but who'd think of eating it? Huh? <laughs> well, now, you take that cup right back out to the laboratory and empty it and wash it out. Well, all right. Charles? Yes? I was wondering, since it's our anniversary... Yes? Let's go out to dinner and celebrate. Why, yes. Yes, I think, I think that's a splendid idea. And it... Oh, my goodness. What? I completely forgot. My brother's coming to see us today. Your brother? Well, my half-brother. Charles, I, I didn't know you had a brother. Oh, didn't you? Well, you see, he's been in the army for almost five years. He just got back a short time ago. I got wire yesterday saying he's passing through town and he'd like to see me. So I thought naturally... <laughs> Does he know you're married? Why, I suppose... Uh, well, I suppose he doesn't. As a matter of fact, we've never been very close. Neither of us much letter writing, you know, so on. But he's the only relative I've got. And all the sympathy I've wasted on you because I thought you were an orphan or something. Oh, I was, practically. When's he coming? Why, uh, this afternoon sometime, I think. Well, I guess there's your answer. I am sorry, my dear. Why, Charles, that's all right. Maybe your brother would like to go out and celebrate with us. Well, I... Right in here. Hello there. Hello, Charles. Come in, come in. And I want you to meet my wife. Laura, this is my brother, Elmer. There was no doubt that it was Elmer. There was no doubt but what he recognized me. And there was no doubt in my mind as to how he intended to play his hand this time either. For he gave no public sign of recognition, but simply looked straight at me and smiled and smiled and smiled. So, you've gone into private practice, eh, Elmer? Criminal law, I suppose? Mm-hmm. Well, there's no appreciation in this country of men who hold public office, financially at least. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Elmer, you always did have your eye on the dollar, didn't you? <laughs> what about your racket, Charlie? What have you been up to? Huh? Oh, just puttering around here in my laboratory. You mean right here at home? Oh, of course. Oh, I guess that's new since you were here last. Well, there's a lot that's new since I was here last. Yes, it's right in there, right through those doors. Oh, isn't that sort of a nuisance for a wife, or isn't it? Not in the least. Why should it be? Oh, not Laura. Don't try to cover up my feelings. <laughs> Just before you came, she was scolding me for carrying thiochlorate around in the family coffee cups. <laughs> well, now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that a coincidence? Why? Well, I was just thinking what a fine setup for a murder. Somebody poisons a chemist in his own laboratory. It looks just like an accident, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> You'll find yeah. that Elmer has a morbid mind, my dear. He used to try people for murder back in Illinois. Oh, I tried some beauties, too. <laughs> well, I've got to get along. Uh, sorry I can't accept your invitation for tonight. Well, but you are staying over for a few days, oh, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'll see you again. Soon. Well, good, good. Oh, don't, don't bother to come to the door with me, Charlie. I know you want to get back to work. Well, as a matter uh, of fact... Perhaps that... Laura will, huh? Give us a little chance to get acquainted. Why, yes, of course. Well, uh, call us, Elmer, don't forget. Oh, you can depend on it, Charlie. Well, well, well. Little Laura Williams. What do you want? What do you think old Charlie would say, if he knew? I asked you a question. Well, I suppose he'd go on loving you in his own peculiar fashion. It'd never be quite the same, though, would it? There'd always be that little gnawing down, huh? Uh, I'm afraid things would be kind of under a strain around here, Laura. You do have a price, I suppose. I might. <laughs> By the way, why are you so eager to pay at this time? I'm happy here. I'm at peace with myself and the world. I don't want anything to... to change. No other reason? What other reason would there be? I suppose all this property would go to you in the event of another little uh, accident, huh? You don't really believe that. The motive and the means. Money and poison. How much, Elmer? 
Oh, no. No, no, no. You've got me wrong, Laura. I don't want money. When did that happen? <laughs> Does it ever occur to you that I might simply be interested in my brother's uh, welfare? No. All that has occurred to me so far is to wonder why I had to pick the one man in the world who is related to you. You want to hear my proposition? I'm waiting. The motive and the means. Well, there's always the means for an intelligent person such as you, Laura, but if we took away the motive... The motive? The money. The will. No motive, no temptation, you see? I see. And in a way, of course, that's for your own protection, too, because if Charlie ever so much as slipped on a banana peel and you inherited that money, there isn't a jury in the world that wouldn't convict you, Laura, simply on your past record. You realize that, don't you? Yes. So, you see, no motive and no case either, you see? What do you want me to do? Get him to change his will. In favor of his only living relative, I presume. Uh Uh-huh. That's me. And then? Well, that's all. You're in the clear, because after that, Charlie couldn't suspect you, even if I told him. He probably wouldn't believe it. Throw me out of the house for persecuting his little bride. Maybe even change his will right back again, you see? All right. You can do it, can't you? I suppose so. Oh, I know you can. I know you'd better. Oh, darling, I don't want your money. I only want you. I know, but after all, I'm considerably older than you are, my dear, and chances are that someday... No. The whole idea of losing you and then then profiting by it, it's just hateful. But uh, who else would I leave it to? Leave it to your brother. Alma? Why not? It doesn't matter, but... Well, I... Oh, please, darling, for me. All right, my dear, if it really makes a difference to you. Now, don't you worry about it anymore. I'll take care of it sometime. No, I want you to do it now, right away, today. Well, I, I'd have to get in touch with my lawyer. I'll call him for you. I'll get him on the phone right now. <laughs> my goodness, Laura. You act as though it were a matter of life or death. Ambassador Hotel. Mr. Elmer Garner, please. Thank you. Yeah. This is Laura. Uh-huh. It's all right. It's all arranged. Is there? Yes, the lawyer's coming tomorrow. Are you sure? Well, I was standing by the phone while he talked to him. Did he tell the lawyer what changes he wanted made? Yes, he did. Not that I think you'd ever tell a lie, Laura, but uh, how do I know this is all true? Hasn't he told you? No. Well, then perhaps you'd better drop by this evening. Well, that's more like it. I'll expect you after dinner. <laughs> I'll be there. Elmer arrived this evening, less than an hour ago. We were having coffee in the living room. Earlier, Charles had been showing him through the laboratory. It was not until after that that I had a moment to speak to him alone. Oh, wonderful ch- fellow, old Charlie. So trusting. Did he tell you? Oh, what? The will. Oh, that, yes. It uh, seems that I am to be old Charlie's beloved heir. <laughs> he still can't understand it. Are you satisfied, then? My dear Laura, I was never more satisfied in all my life. Almost evens things up, doesn't it? Almost. You never forgot that, did you? That you lost. Lost? Who says I lost? The game isn't over till the whistle blows, sister. It is for you. Now get out of here. Okay. Okay, all in good time. Yeah, sorry I had to leave you, but those reactions have to be checked every hour, you That's know. all right, Charlie. Laura and I were just going over old times in Illinois. You didn't know we uh, both came from Illinois, did you? No, no, I hadn't realized. Oh, I'm sure I told you, Charles, you must have forgotten. Oh, yes, yes, well, all right. Uh, coffee ready? Yes. Will you have coffee with us, Elmer? Oh, you bet I will. Anything in it? No, nothing, my. Charles always, always takes his black pill. Laura does make the best coffee. Well, here's to Laura's coffee. There was something about his smile when he said it. That smile. And then all of a sudden I saw it. I saw the whole terrible thing. Uh. Don't. Don't drink it. Don't. <coughs> Charlie seems to have keeled over. Charles! Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that was 
Thiochlorate poisoning. What a fool. What a fool. What a fool. Uh Uh-huh. The motive and the means. And the motive is the real beauty this time, Laura, because you had to kill him before he changed his will. Me, huh? You killed him. Sure, but that's not what the jury's going to think. And, of course, I'll get the money anyway. You couldn't very well collect it. Because they're going to hang you, Laura. They're going to hang you. Elmer is downstairs in the living room. I am in my study. And once more, I am waiting for the police. There is no escape for me, of course. Elmer knows that. But there's one little thing that he has forgotten. The last play of the game. For I've just drawn up a will of my own, leaving my property and everything that I inherit from Charles to Elmer. It's dated three days ago. This statement I shall give into the safekeeping of my personal maid, Fredonia Bell, who, after all is said and done, has been the one true friend I've ever had. I shall give it to her with certain instructions for its eventual disposal, which I know she will follow to the letter. When that is done, I have beside me a glass of water. It contains thiochlorate, the motive and the means. Because, you see, when the police come, it is Elmer who will have to do the explaining, not I. And he will have to explain two bodies. Charles and mine. But the irony of the document, ladies and gentlemen, the terrible irony is that it was delivered to the district attorney's office by Fredonia Bell this evening at 8 o'clock. And why did the good Fredonia wait until now? Because she was thus following explicitly the instructions of her mistress, Laura Starling Morton, whom she adored, and who specified that the envelope be handed to the police exactly 24 hours after the execution of Elmer Garner. Good night. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ken Niles, and it's my exceedingly pleasant duty, Miss Hayworth, A, to compliment you in the name of some 20 million listeners who must have loved your performance just now, and B, to present to you this gift basket of grand estate wines with the compliments of Roma. Well, thank you, Mr. Niles. Excuse me, I'm a little out of breath. I don't usually kill so many people, at least not in one day. (laughs) (laughs) How does it feel to play a murderer? I love it. I've been looking forward to appearing on Suspense for a very, very long time. And, of course, Bill Spear, your world champion producer director, is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Well, from the way Bill is waving congratulations and blowing kisses from the control room, I'd say he still loves you. Rita, I suppose you'll uh, welcome a restful evening at home after such an exciting broadcast. Oh, as a matter of fact, we're having a few friends over tonight, Ken. Well, from your basket here, let me recommend for your guests Grand Estate Ruby Port or Golden Muscatel. You'll find either of these Grand Estate California wines a delightful expression of hospitality when friends drop in. A delicious treat later in the evening with cake, nuts, or cheese. You've sold me, Ken. Good. And Rita, Grand Estate Ruby Port and Golden Muscatel, like all Grand Estate wines, are born of choicest grapes, then skillfully guided to taste perfection by Roma's master vintners. Necessary time and patient care endow each precious drop of Grand Estate wines with a brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste that bespeak a truly magnificent wine. So, to enjoy the ultimate in wine excellence, The wine to serve is Grand Estate Wine, presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner. I'll remember that. Fine. Say, Rita, we're looking forward to seeing you in Columbia's Down to Earth. Isn't that the one with Larry Park? Yes, I enjoyed making it. But the picture I'm really looking forward to is the new one I'm about to start, also a Columbia picture. Oh? Well, why are you so particularly excited about it? Well, Ken, 
Because in it will be my favorite actor, and it'll be directed by my favorite director, both the same man who also happens to be my husband. His name is Orson Welles. <laughs> Good night, Rita. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. John Lund as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Suspense is broadcast from coast to coast and to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you an hour, a full 60 minutes of Suspense. Directed by Anton M. Leader and produced by Robert Montgomery, who tonight also stars in a play entitled In a Lonely Place by Dorothy B. Hughes. This is Robert Montgomery. The other day, a friend of mine repeated a familiar phrase. He indicated the travel folder on his desk and said with a kind of triumph, I'm going to get away from it all. He's lucky, my friend is. He's going to change the scene, the whole scene. New horizons, new vistas, new people, or no people at all. New thoughts, or no thoughts at all. He has a rendezvous with a cloudless sky and a peaceful stream and the easy whisper of the wind. Only time stands between him and a fresh beginning. Indeed, he has a lonely place where there is no loneliness. Yes, my friend's lucky. He can get away from it all with a simple change of scene, and he has no fear of being alone with his thoughts. It isn't like that with Dixon Steele. It isn't like that at all. And so, with the performance of Robert Montgomery as Dixon Steele... And with our play, In a Lonely Place, by Dorothy B. Hughes, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! I stood there at the foot of sunset, at the end of the city of Los Angeles, looking out through the evening fog at the Pacific. The swirling mists kept lifting themselves like gauzy veils coming up to touch my face. There was something in it like flying, the sense of being lifted high above the crawling earth, of being part of the wildness of air, and something more, of being wrapped tight in a strange world of fog and cloud and wind. I had liked flying at night, but the war's ending had finished that. Since then it had left me, that feeling of power and exhilaration and freedom that came from being alone in the sky. But here, tonight, at the edge of this noisy, fog-drenched ocean, I had it again. Then I turned away. I was already late for my appointment with Brub and his new wife. I walked past my coupe, parked at the curb, and went up the path to the little white cottage. The lights from the living room windows made little concentric circles in the heavy fog. It would be good to see Brub again. You old son of a secret. What do you mean by not calling us before now? Let me see you. <laughs> it's the same boy, Brub. I haven't changed a bit, and neither have you. Oh, sure I have, for the better. And this is why. Sylvia... This is Dix, Dixon Steele. Hello, Dix. Oh. We're old friends, really. You've been Brub's favorite topic of conversation as long as I've known you. Oh, we flew together, Sylvia. Brub took care of me like a big brother. <laughs> you needed some looking after Colonel Steele. Uh, remember the night in Soho? Save it when... for later, mister. And it's not Colonel anymore. The Army made me a gentleman, gave me the only mark of distinction I've ever had, and then took it away from me. <laughs> Say, why didn't you tell me you were married into such a lovely girl? Well, thank you, Dick. Tell you? You called me up five months ago, and last April the 8th, to be exact, 
told me you'd just get in and let me know as soon as you were located. That's the last I heard. You checked out of the ambassador three days later and you didn't leave a forwarding address. How could it tell you anything? Keeping tabs on me, Brub? Oh, trying to find you, you crazy lug. <laughs> and here I am. It's like being home again. Well, brief me, boy. What have you been doing and how's it going? Slow, Brub. Slow. I've, I've got a little apartment and a car and, <laughs> and a typewriter. And that's about it. And the typewriter's a new touch. Trying to write a book, like 90% of the other G.I.s. A detective novel. My rich Uncle Fergus back east is staking me for a year to see what I can do. He calls it giving me a hand over the period of my readjustment. So that keeps me busy most of the time. And the rest of the time? The rest of the time, I hardly know what to do with myself. You were a hot pilot in England, Dix. Just a kid at that. Sure, it's going to take a little time. Would anyone care for something to eat or drink? Cold beer? Dix? No, thanks. Not at the moment. I'm too relaxed. We were a casual generation, Dix. And they put us in the middle of something that, that wasn't very casual. There's bound to be a reaction. Oh, Brub's always looking for the hidden motive power. <laughs> That's because he's a policeman. A policeman? Well, not a policeman now, darling. A detective. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> darling. <laughs> what, what happened to you, Brub? All oh, my old buddies ask me why, and I, I can't help them. I don't know why. All I do know is it's, it's rotten hard work. <laughs> no, the things men do. You with a badge and me with a typewriter. And that reminds me, I ought to be getting back to it. Oh, but it's still early. Well, what's the hurry, Dix? Well, Brubble want his rest, Sylvia, if he's going to dig around for the glory of the L.A. police force. It is L.A., isn't it, Brub? It is, indeed. And you do need some sleep. Plenty of work in L.A., no? Plenty. Well, I'll be seeing you two. Well, good night, Dix. We'll expect you to come off. And... Hey, hey, wait a minute. We don't have your number. My number? Sure, we'll want to get in touch. Oh, yeah, right. Crestview, 90898. 90898. Good. Right. You'll be hearing from me, Dix. I'd be hearing from Brub. And why not? Good old Brub with his tired eyes and rumpled hair. Brub had been my big brother. But he hadn't known everything there was to know. Some things a man keeps secret. It's amusing to keep some things secret. I wondered if they were surprised by my quick exit. But I had to get out of there. I, I couldn't stay. I, I had to figure things out. So Brub was a detective now, and he had my telephone number. <laughs> there was something amusing about Brub being able to lay his hands on me whenever he wanted. Amusing and more exciting than anything that had happened in a long time. The hunter and the hunted, arm in arm. The hunt. Sweetened by danger. I was driving slowly, hugging the curb, and then I saw her. A girl, an unknown girl, standing alone on the corner of Camden Drive, waiting for a bus. And buses didn't run often out here at night. I pulled up a block ahead and got out, shutting the door so it made no sound, and then I walked back toward her. She heard me coming in the fog. She turned her face to me. Smiling a little, glad to have someone to share the darkness and the silence with her. I walked up to her, slowly, and I was smiling back. Yes, hello? Hello, Dix. Speaking. Oh, is this Sylvia? How'd you know? <laughs> Recognize your voice. I've been ringing and ringing. Where have you been? Well, I guess I slept through it. I was up late last night working on the book. Well, can you break away long enough to have dinner with us tonight at the club? Tonight? Oh, uh, fine. Fine. What time? Oh, about eight. Oh, I almost forgot. Don't dress. We're informal at the beach. Thanks. You had me a little worried. My dinner coat shrank while I was away flying. <laughs> Rubs, too. <laughs> they fed you gentlemen all together too well. <laughs> all right, then. Tonight at eight. Thanks for calling, Sylvia. I had slept late. The day was almost gone. The apartment was already in shadows. The afternoon paper was on the lawn just outside my window. The paper. I threw on a robe and ducked out quickly. Then I was back in the room, standing in the middle of the floor, holding it, still folded in my hand, listening to the blood hammer in my head. I switched on the floor lamp and sank down into an easy chair. 
I lit a cigarette, and I took a deep drag. Then I unfolded it. That was all I had to do. It lay spread open in my lap. They'd found their biggest type for the headline. Strangler strikes again. Huh? Dick's over here. Oh, hello, Sylvia. Where's Brub? He called at the last minute to say he'd be detained. It's like being married to a doctor. Would oh, you like well, a drink, meanwhile? Here he is now. Oh. Sorry to be late, darling. Hello, Dix. Hi. Glad you could join us. You look exhausted, Brown. Hard day? Haven't you seen the papers? No, I didn't get a chance. Why? It's another one. Oh, Brown. Well, what's it all about? Another woman killed. The same way. Did the commissioner call you in? Yeah, the whole department. We've been with him since five. We've got to stop it. Yes, darling. Oh, uh, was it uh, someone important? No, no, it never is. Oh, I forgot you're just a visitor, Dix. You see, the only pattern we can find is in the time schedule. They come one a month regularly. You must be starved, Rob. Wouldn't you like to order? In a minute, baby. I want to unwind. Well, have a highball anyway. Malcolm. Uh, yes, Mrs. Nicolai. Three scotch and sodas, Malcolm. We'll order later. Certainly, ma'am. The first one was about four months ago. May, to be exact. May 16th. The night before my birthday party. It was a girl down on Skid Row. She was a nice enough kid, dancer in a cheap joint. We found her in an alley. Strangled. No clues. And that was number one? Yeah. In June, number two. We found her in Westlake Park. Wasn't any reason for it. Nice, normal girl, young and attractive. She'd been killed the same way. And no clues. And then the others? Last night was the fourth. No motive, no connection between any of them. Huh. And never the same neighborhood. And last night? Beverly Glen Canyon, up where it's country. She was lying in the brush at the side of the road. There were about 500 car tracks superimposed on that particular stretch, so it wouldn't do any good to lift them. Yeah, but we've got one clue, a great one. We know the killer uses a car. How can you tell, bro? Well, her name was Mildred Atkinson, and she'd been playing bridge with three girlfriends in Beverly. At 11, she and another girl went out to the bus stop together. A friend caught a Wilshire bus and left Mildred behind, waiting for a Hollywoodland. So how did she get up to the canyon where we found her this morning? It's a long way. The answer is she went for a ride. Where's that drink? Just another minute, darling. Uh, Los Angeles is too big, too sprawling. You can't patrol every street every night. Uh, he's safe. He's insane, of course. Sure he is. A maniac walking in the streets. Mild-mannered and soft-spoken and looking as normal as anyone. A homicidal maniac. I sat there watching Brub's angry black eyes... And Sylvia's white, pallid face. He's insane, of course. Their imaginations were poor, blunted little things reaching only as far as the obvious. He's insane, of course. So that was to be the chorus. What could they know of the world of imagination and beauty in which a sane man, as sane as any, could kill and kill again? Don't you like your drink, Dick? What? Huh? Oh, sure. Lost in a fog, eh, boy? Yeah, but I know why. Do you? Uh, could it be that little Banning girl over at the next table? Uh, could it be that she reminds you of someone? Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Brub. What girl at what table? Uh, now he sees her. What's the mystery about Betsy Banning? Does Dix know her? No, darling. It's just that she's a dead ringer for another girl we used to know in England. Especially Dix. He knew her well. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, you're right. Little Brucie. This, uh, this girl is so much like her. Well, you're wrong, Dick. She's not as pretty as Brucie. Don't you remember? Remember? Yes. I remember Brucie. But I didn't want to remember Brucie. Brucie of the sea green eyes. Brucie whom I had loved and wanted and needed. No, I'd been through it before. It was now that mattered. It was today in Southern California, 6,000 miles away from her, with something else hammering in my head to be looked at and examined. What? Oh, yes, tires. They were good tires, no patches, no distinguishing marks. Robert said it himself. They couldn't get tire marks from dry concrete. I hadn't thought so. Still, I should have made sure certain gambles are legitimate. Like taking Mildred to that drive-in last night. 
gambling on the muddled memory of waitresses who served hundreds of average-looking men and women every day, every night. Sure, it was a risk, but risks were like spice, like stunt flying, as long as you used them like spice, sparingly. Like stunts, planning them with precision, I could afford to take risks. I just couldn't make mistakes. I left the club right after dinner. Got back to the apartment early. I pulled up in front and got out. I started up through the patio to my place at the rear when I saw I wasn't alone out there. She was hurrying in, not noticing me. In the blue light, her hair and her slacks and her jacket were all blue. Different depths of blue. I did it out of impulse, without thought. I I beg your pardon. Who... Who is it? Well, I'm your neighbor. My name's Steele. So your name's Steele. Uh, did you drop something? I don't know. Did I? <laughs> no, you didn't. It's just conversation. <laughs> Try again another time. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I just lost my dinner date. I thought maybe you'd lost yours, too. Sorry. Mine will be here any minute. You've got red hair. I didn't notice that. It's no secret. Like I say, I'm your neighbor. 4A. If you do ever lose a dinner date, let me know, will you? Uh, I'll be sure to make a note of that. Good night. <laughs> I got some cold beer and some cheese from the refrigerator and draped myself over the divan. The night was a scorcher. A Los Angeles September night. I lay there eating and drinking and waiting for it. Not that I thought for a minute it would come, but I was waiting for it, and it did come. Oh, it's you. I've just lost a dinner date. Well, come in, come in. Maybe you'll find him here. I hope not. I told him I had a headache and was going to bed, and that I was disconnecting the phone, but I still want dinner. You mind if I finish my beer? Go ahead. I'm Dick Steele. Who are you? My name's Laurel, and that's all you get for the time being. <laughs> all right, Laurel. I don't mind beginning at a crawl. I suppose you're in pictures. Uh, not often. I don't like getting up mornings. No, I don't either. That's why I'm a writer. Why'd you come by, Laurel? Because I'm hungry. And because tonight I didn't want to sit opposite a man who's rich and 60 and eats oatmeal. You have a grudge against money? No. Only that against the men and women who go with it. People who think that everything in life is for sale, I hate them. Sometimes they pay the rent and the jeweler. They don't pay mine. <laughs> How did we get onto this? Haven't you finished the beer yet? All finished. And already. Let's go, Laurel. We ate at Carl's, out on the road to Malibu. We didn't say much. We ate and smoked and had coffee. And I watched what the lights did, glinting on that red hair. When we left there, I knew it. I knew it was the beginning of something, of something good. She was beside me and with me, and that was enough. I'd needed her for a long time. Ever since Brucey. That's how long. This girl, this Laurel, could make it up to me, could make me forget. I parked on an open stretch overlooking the dark beach in the ocean. She wanted to go down closer, so we left the car and struggled through the sand down to the water's edge. I held her hand tightly. The spindrift salted our lips. I haven't done this in a long, long time. Having fun? Oh, wonderful. You can really smell the ocean here. Breathe, Dix. <sighs> Breathe deep. Laurel, would you laugh at me if I said I was happy? That I never thought I'd be happy again? That I didn't think I could be? No, Dix. Laurel. Laurel, you're wonderful. <laughs> Am I? Laurel, come here. Come here. No, no, not at all. What's up? Uh, who was that redhead I seen you with last night? 
What are you talking about? Where did you see me? Oh, you didn't see us. We were pulling out of Carl's restaurant when you went in. Sylvia spotted you, and I spotted the redhead. There are always people looking, Brub. There are always eyes to see. Why, sure, boy. You can't take a step in this world. You know that. But listen, how about lunch? Fine, fine. What time and where? Noon, at the Beverly Hill Station. Beverly Hill Station? Police station, kid. Pick me up there. Okay, Brub. I'll see you there. Noon. That was a nice station you got there, Brub. Flowers and shrubs and a white facade. It looks like a small eastern university. Mm, Beverly Hills is just a small town, Dix. Almost a village, but the force is first rate. I'll be working out of there from now on. How's the case coming? Uh, the case? Oh, oh, that. Yeah, it's a dead end, I'm afraid. You mean you're closing the books? Uh, we don't ever close the books. After the newspapers and all the rest of them, forget it. Our books are still open. That's the way it is. Well, that's the way it has to be, I guess. Yeah, it's been tough cases before, but we find the answer. Our department's had cases running 10, 12 years. Sometimes it's just because we're waiting for the next move, but we find them. <laughs> this is Dick's, old pal, remember? What are you trying to tell me, that the criminal doesn't escape? That's right. One way or another, he's caught. Sometimes it's because he's caught there in that lonely place, living with himself. So it ends in suicide or the insane asylum, but there's no escape. You were saying the other night that this killer is insane. He is. I can't figure it. He's been pretty smart, hasn't he? The insane are more clever about their business and more careful, too, than the sane. It's normal for them to be sly and secretive. That's part of the mania. But they give themselves away. How do you like this apple pie? Just like Mom used to make. How do they give themselves away? Yeah, they repeat the pattern. Now, take the strangler. Look at his pattern. I don't see any. <laughs> I must be writing a lousy detective novel. Okay, look. It's a girl at night, alone. He comes along in a car. She accepts a ride. You're positive about the car? It has to be. My theory is he didn't use it on the last one, on Mildred, until he'd made the approach on foot and lulled her. She was waiting for a bus, and he's waiting on the same corner. They get to talking. He invites her to have a cup of coffee, and then he mentions his car isn't far away, and he'll give her a lift. He takes her to the drive-in. Drive-in? And... What drive-in? Oh, oh, that's something new. One of the car hops recognized Mildred's picture after the story broke. She remembered her coming in with a man and ordering coffee. Good girl. That's a big help. Yeah, it is. And the man... Did she remember him? Yeah, it could be you or me or our grandfathers. No, she couldn't remember. <laughs> Half a loaf is better than none, eh? I've got to go up to Beverly Glen, the scene of the crime. Uh, Want to come along? Well, I, I, I had a date. Well, come on. I can give you a better idea of what we're up against. All right. I'll charge it up to research on the book. Good. Show me take your car or mine. What was that? My car? Why? Was Brub suspicious? Did he want my car back up on that street? That street? Was this lunch arranged? No. I'd already hesitated too long in answering. It couldn't matter which car. It had been too late and too foggy. Did you say something, bro? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thinking about the redhead, I said, whose car do we take, yours or mine? Oh, we might as well take mine. You don't mind another passenger? Not at all. And the chief wants to come along, Jack Lochner. We'll go back by the station for him. We swung out towards sunset, all three of us up front. Lochner was a tall, thin man with wispy gray hair. He didn't look like the chief of anything. I drove carefully. I suppose it's the thing to do with cops beside you. Nice day for a ride. Yeah. Okay, so I'll shut up. This is it, Dix. Turn right, Beverly Glen. My hands began to sweat. If Brub hadn't called out, I knew I would have turned onto that street myself automatically. And I was a visitor from the east who didn't know the country very well. There was tension in my hands and arms, fear that I might recognize the place at the side of the road and react to it. And then slowly, I relaxed again realizing that I didn't know the road, that I could never find the spot, even if I wanted to, for it had been dark. 
we climbed into the valley. There was a chill in the air, and the sun was far away. Nobody spoke. These two men were on a case that had them tired and sore. It wasn't the time for a conversation piece. I drove on, waiting for somebody to tell me to stop. Here we are. Huh? Just pull up along here, Mr. Steele, if you will. <clears throat> is uh, this where you found her? Right there in the brush. You see how thick it is in here? He'd have known that. He'd have figured that she wouldn't be found for a long time with the leaves falling on her, covering her. And every day there'd be more leaves. Not many people look off at the side of the road when they're driving. Not unless there's something scenic to look at. This canyon would be perfect. Then how was she found so quickly? Look, the milkman picked this spot in the world to have a flat. The killer figured it smart. See how the road curves here? Well, you could see any lights coming from behind, two loops below. And he can look up to the top of the hill, see the lights of a car approaching him, when it takes the first of those uh, two curves. He can sit with her in the car, looking like a spooner, until the other cars go by. He was playing it safe. So he does it. He opens the door of the car, he rolls her out into the leaves, and he's away. No chance of being caught at it. And strangling's the easiest way. Yes. Yes, that makes sense. How about it, Brub? Find anything? Uh, the experts have been over every inch with their microscopes. He won't find anything. But he wanted to have another look around, so I came along. Well, it seems hopeless to me, Mr. Lochner. If there's nothing here, of all places, where can you look? There's only one place we'll find anything. And where's that? In his car. In the, the murderer's car? That's where the evidence is right now. Enough to send him to the gas chamber. <laughs> Cigarette, Captain Lochner? Yeah, thanks. Got it? Yeah, got it. You, um, you haven't been able to get a description of that car yet, have you? Not yet. We're working on the people at the drive-in. One of them is going to remember. And when you find it, then you'll go through it for those clues that you were talking about. Hairpins and lipstick. No, and... Mr. Steele. Nothing like that. What then? Dust, Mr. Steele. Dust? You heard the man, Dix. He said dust. Like this stuff all over me. No matter how much I beat it, I can't get it all out. Yeah, that's dust. We've got dust from the drive-in, dust from her clothes and her shoes, and dust from here, from a little thicket off Beverly Glen. Three different kinds. And all of them in his car. Oh, it's really fantastic. And even in 10 or 12 years, the dust will still be there. Some of it will, yes. You want my opinion of this case, gentlemen. The Strangler doesn't have a chance. I swung the car around and we rolled back down the canyon and into town. They were sitting beside me again, up front. Sitting on the dust they wanted so desperately. Breathing it into their lungs. Having it settle on the flesh of their hands and their faces and in their hair. The golden little molecules that would send the strangler to the gas chamber floated gently and unseen before our eyes as we drove back. <laughs> and I felt good. My hands were easy on the wheel. I could be talkative now. I was expected to be curious and impressed. I would come back to it again. Uh, did it help you, Brud, coming back? No, I didn't find anything. Didn't expect to. You know something... He's from the East. He is? Oh, the, you mean the waitress recognized an Eastern accent? No, he talked just like anybody else. No accent. That's just Lochner's reconstruction. He's from the East. I know that. He's a mugger. I'm, I'm afraid I don't follow you, Captain. What's a mugger? Certain gangs used to operate in New York. One man would get the victim so, you see, with his right arm, and the others would rob him. Until they found out it could be a one-man job. You don't need more than two fingers to strangle a man. Or a woman. He's a mugger. He doesn't use his fingers. There aren't any finger marks. He used his arm. He's from the East. As a fellow Easterner, Captain Lochner, you must admit that a Westerner could have learned the trick. I've seen the way they did it in New York. He knows how. Same way. I think you're right, Lock. We keep getting closer. You will, Mr. Steele. I'll get out right here. All right. Thanks for the lift, Steele. Thanks for letting me go along. I'll see you at the station, Bob. Hey, 
Ever since this thing started, I've been afraid for her. For her? You mean Sylvia? She's lived in the canyon all her life. She never had any fear, wandered all over at any time of day. But the canyon at night, the way the fogs come in, is it's a place for him, and I've scared her. She's alone so much, I never know what hours I have to keep. You know our street, how dark and lonely it is, and the way our house is set up there. Oh, I'm the one who scared Dix. I've infected her, and I can't help it. I can't pretend. Until we've caught him, she isn't safe. Sylvia isn't safe. I saw how it was with both of them. How they clung together, fear in both of them. The woman fearing to have her man close on the heels of a murderer, and Brub, afraid for her because she was a woman, because she was his woman, and women were being stalked in the night. And yet, even though he was afraid, he would leave her, because he was a hunter, and this was a big hunt for wild game. Yeah, wild game. <laughs> In tonight's full hour of suspense, Mr. Robert Montgomery stars as Dixon Steele in the play In a Lonely Place. Tonight's study in Suspense. In just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now... Back to our Hollywood soundstage and act two of In a Lonely Place, starring Mr. Robert Montgomery in a narrative well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was very tired. Tired of thinking about Sylvia and Brub and the fear that had bound them as desperately as their love for each other. I was weary of the big hunt, for I was hunting on my own. I was looking for happiness. I spent the next few days with Laurel. It got so that I didn't count the hours anymore. All I knew was beauty, and I knew intensity, and I called it happiness. And all the time, I knew it wouldn't last. I sensed the restlessness coming into her. I could feel it. Dix, Dix, what is it? Did I say something? Laurel? Laurel? Oh, what is it? You tell me. You've been sitting there without moving for more than an hour. Oh, just daydreaming. Was it something nice? Tell me about it. Uh, turn off the radio, Dix. It's making me nervous. All right. You like a drink? Yes, please. Thanks. You know what we ought to do tonight? Go out on the town. Put on our Sunday best and have the biggest dinner on the menu. The sky's the limit. How does that sound? Where do you want to go? To a drive-in? Tex. I'm sorry. I seem to be all thumbs. Well, here, let me make you another... No, 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 that's all right. I didn't want it anyway. No, baby. No drive-in for you tonight. You're not the drive-in type. <laughs> what type am I? The Ciro type, baby. Expensive and plush and chromium plated. Ciro's, that'll do fine. I'll call and reserve a table for 10 o'clock. Save your money. You can take me to a drive-in tonight. I won't take you to a drive-in. Why not? Are you afraid someone might see you there? Is that why? What do you mean by that? I mean you keep me hidden away from sight. As if we might run into some of your friends, like that Brub and Sylvia. As if I wasn't good enough for you. <laughs> Look, baby. Relax. <laughs> You're not making sense. Didn't I say I wanted to spread out tonight? Get, dre get dressed up for once and go to Ciro's? Hide you away. You come with me tonight and I'll show you off for everybody to see. No, I'm tired. I don't want to get dressed and go places. All I want is to go up to the drive-in. We're not going to the drive-in. We're not going. Dix, you're, you're hurting me. Hello? Hello, Dix. How are you? Fine. What's on your mind? Can you come over to the house? I want to see you. Sorry, bro, but I got a date tonight. 
I've just had a letter from England, Dix. It's about Brucey. Brucey? That's right. Okay. I'll be right over. Okay. It seems uh, that I can't have dinner with you after all. All right. You don't seem very unhappy about it. Laurel. Yes? I'm sorry if I hurt you. Forget it. It's all right. We haven't been soft lovers. We haven't played it that way. The world keeps coming in between us. That makes me afraid. Why should you be afraid? Because I might lose you. I have to keep telling myself to remember. To remember that I can't take any chances. That I can't lose you. I can't, Laurel. Don't be afraid, Dex. You see, I love you. Very much. Have a chair, Dix. All right. Would you care for anything to eat? No, thanks, Sylvia. I just finished him. Remember Adam Tyne, Dix? No. Sure you do. The flight commander from Bath. Nice, quiet fellow. We saw a lot of him that spring of 43. Well, we knew a lot of fellows over there, bruv. I don't remember. I... Well, it's not important, except that I've had a letter from him. First one in more than a year. It's a sad piece of news, Dix. Let's have it. Brucey is dead. Brucey? Is dead. Brucey. Oh, Dex. <laughs> Dex, I didn't know. I'm sorry, oh. Dex. I guess none of us realized how much how much you and Brucey. Brucey. We didn't know, Dex. No. How could you? How could anyone know? Uh, how did she die? Buzz bombs? No. Well, then how? How? She was murdered. Murdered? Yeah, murdered. Well, how... Why? Why? Who? The police have never found out. Better not talk about it, Dix. Well, I want to talk about it. I want to know who did it. Why, why should anyone kill Brucey? They don't know. Her family missed her for two weeks. When she was found, it was in a rocky cove. She'd been strangled. <laughs> Brucey was dead. Brucey, whom I had loved, who was my only love. Brucey was dead, and no one cared, no one in all the world cared, except me. Brucey! I called Laurel when I got home that night. She didn't answer. I stepped outside and looked up to her apartment across the patio from mine. It was dark. She didn't come home at all that night, or the next day, or the next night. No word from her, not a sign, nothing. The following morning was a dirty gray rag. I called Laurel's number once more. No answer. I had to get out of that cramped room, away from the unremembered shape of my dreams. I didn't take the car. I wanted to breathe, to put motion into my body. I walked as far as Wilshire and then went up to Beverly Drive to my favorite delicatessen. Dix, Hi. where'd you spring from? Well, a guy gets hungry, bruv. How are you, Captain Locker? Fine, fine. Good to see you again. Slide in. Okay, thanks. Would you like to order now, sir? If you please. Salami sandwich on rye and a beer, please. It'll be just a few minutes. Well, more trouble in Beverly? No. Same old case. We're not going to let it happen again, that's all. And uh, you think it comes from this neighborhood? Huh? It's the last clue we have. We pick up a little more each time we check. Yeah, but where do you check? How? Yeah, we've been talking to the help again. At the drive-in where he stopped with her that night. Any luck? I don't know yet. In these neighborhood spots, a lot of people come by to eat regularly. I got to thinking about it. There must have been some of the regulars around that night when he took Mildred in for coffee. The nerve of Driving in there, coming in under all those bright lights and gambling that no one would remember what he looked like. Like you and me, bro. An ordinary man. Yeah, an ordinary man with the nerve of a jet pilot. I see what you're after, bro. 
have the help ask questions of the regulars when they come in. Were they at the drive-in the night of the murder? And did they see the couple? That's it. And I suppose you're hoping this fellow's a repeater, too. And then it'd be a break, but there's no chance. No chance except for his nerve. You mean he might have the nerve to walk in again? He might, Dix. He just might. And you think the help might spot him if he did? I think they might. They're keyed up to remember, Mr. Steele. A little car hop, Jean, her name is, swears she'd know him again if, if he came in. She'll know him if she sees him again. Only she can't describe him. That's the trouble with people in these cases. You remember how it was when we were flying, Brub? How do you mean? You said yourself he's a gambler. He's reckless. I mean, he'll take chances like going to that drive-in before killing the girl. Well, it occurs to me that it's the same kind of recklessness we had when we were flying during the war. We took chances, but we were sure that we'd pull out of them. Mr. Steele makes sense. And something else. He's probably an ex-serviceman. How do you figure that? Well, the people who saw him at the drive-in all say he's a nice-looking fellow with nice clothes. At least that's what the newspaper accounts have to say. Am I right? So far. Then it's ten to one. He's the right age, good healthy specimen, average. The average were in the service. <laughs> I know it's, that's not a very brilliant deduction, but it, it fills out the picture a little more. I'll buy that, Mr. Steele. Yeah, I will too. Well, I'll be getting back to the office. I'll be in a little later today, Chief. Okay. By the way, Captain Lochner. Yeah? Every time I see you, I seem to be asking a lot of questions. I hope you haven't minded. Not at all. Brub vouched for you a long time ago. You just keep asking them. I will, Captain, and thanks. Yeah, I'm late now. I want to check over those Bruce reports again. See me as soon as you get back. Well... Right. Here's your order, sir. I beg your pardon? Wasn't yours the salami sandwich? Oh, yes. Thank you, I... Would that be all today? Yeah, that's all right. Your check, sir. And thank you. Bruce. This is a pretty common name. There must be 100,000 in the United States. At least. And hundreds in Los Angeles. Yeah. He said he was going to check the Bruce reports. It's not the same one, Rob. It couldn't be. Not Brucey. I'm sorry, Dix. I know it's a raw wound, but I couldn't help talking to Lochner about her. I was knocked off my pins when I heard the news and I wanted to report on the case. I figured you'd want one, too. You were right. Then what happened? Well, Locke cabled the London police. He thought it did help us. That maybe Brucey was one of a series, like our series. It's far-fetched, but the killer might have been an American. England was full of G.I.s at the time. And uh, was she one of the series? They don't know. It was a series, but it didn't start right after Brucey. A couple of months, then it began. The same pattern. Strangler. Well, what was the matter with him? Couldn't they catch him? No, he was never caught. After six months, it stopped, just as suddenly as it had begun. Maybe he was shipped back home. If I could ever find him, if I could ever get my hands on him, the man who killed Brucey, I... I guess we feel the same about that. And do you want to come back with me, Dix, and see the reports? No, I... I don't think I could take them, Brub. Do you understand? I... Of course I do, Dix. Of course I do. I went back to the apartment and lay on the divan for the rest of the afternoon thinking about Brucey, strangled, so many miles away and Laurel, who lived just across the patio from me and had disappeared as if the earth had swallowed her I thought of them both and soon their figures swam together in my mind and were commingled so that they became one it was already dark and I found myself very hungry. I got in the coupe and drove over to Wiltshire, not knowing where I'd eat. Past the Savoy, Romanoffs, the tropics. And then suddenly, the brilliant lights of the drive-in glittered ahead of me. I didn't stop to think. I twisted the wheel and pulled into a parking space right up front, right under the lights. They were looking for a man of my height, a man of my build. I was here for them. I'd come. Two young fellows were in the car to my left, a middle-aged couple to my right. No police. No police in sight. I was safe. The girl who came with the menu was pert and pretty, no more than 16. Good evening. Hello. Want to see a menu? Well, I know what I want. I'll have the special tonight. <laughs> it's kind of a celebration. Yes, sir. All below. I wondered what the girl's name was. I wondered if she was Jean, the car hop whom the police had alerted, the girl who would come up to each customer in the hope of finding me. 
And here tonight, <laughs> she had found me, and she didn't know it. I ate slowly, lingering over the food, and before I left, I handed her a large tip, just to be sure she remembered me. She thanked me, smiling, and said, Come again. And I promised I would. I went out Wiltshire to the ocean. The fog blew in at 14th Street, and I should have turned back then, but I didn't. I could hear the boom of the breakers, and I could smell the sea in the fog. And the fog itself was sweet and cool. It was silent. The world was shrouded in mists and silence. Except for the thump of the water and the far-off cry of the foghorn. And then, at that moment, I knew what I was going to do. I got out of the car and I listened to my footsteps across the pavement toward the beach. And then I listened to the silence as I began walking in the sand, sludging through heavy, damp sand. I passed the club where I'd gone to dinner one night with Brub, where I'd seen a young girl, a pretty brown-haired girl, who looked like Brucey. I went on, trying to forget. I drifted along the deserted beach, looking for the shape of a living thing, of a woman. But I was alone. I passed a beach house where people huddled together in warmth and gaiety and found myself trembling with hatred for Laurel. If she had come back to me, I'd not be shut out like this, cut off. I always leave you before you're ready. I groped on, my feet chained in the mud, and I stumbled and fell to one knee. I stayed there, my head buried in my arms. I was there for a long time, lost in the world of swirling fog and a crashing wave lost in a lonely place and the red knots tightened in my brain. Suddenly, something came running through the darkness. A small, dark shape hurtled upon me and I realized it was a dog. A friendly terrier. I stroked it gently and held it close. And then there were footsteps coming over the sand. I could feel my blood begin to pound with excitement. Where there was a dog, there was a master mistress. The sound of the steps came closer, and then she stepped forward out of the fog. I looked up from the door and said, hello, and then I smiled. She couldn't know that behind that smile lay my hatred of Laurel, my hatred of Brub, my hatred of Sylvia, my hatred of Lochner, of everyone in the whole living world, of everyone. But Brucie... And Brucie was dead. Laurel, at last. <laughs> Laurel. No, it isn't Laurel. What brings you, Brub? Am I invited in? Yeah, of course. Sit down. Yeah. Anything wrong? Plenty wrong. Is it Sylvia? No. What makes you think it is? Well, I don't know. You look so worried. You mean... You mean you don't know what's happened? I don't know from nothing. I awoke to a beautiful morning, to birds singing, to California sunshine, and I decided it was a day for the beach. I've been out there all day riding the breakers. Oh, <laughs> wonderful sport. You were at the beach today? Sure. What's wrong with that? He was out again last night. The strangler. He did it on the beach. Bro, again? The little Banning girl. Betsy Banning. You remember the girl who looked like Brucie. Yeah. I remember. When I get him, and I will get him, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him with my hands. The way he likes to do it. Oh, now, take it easy, bro. Would you like a drink? She always took her dog out for a run at night, no matter what time it was. She wasn't afraid. She was like Sylvia. The ocean was always something safe, something good, and, and she had her dog. And the dog? Buried in the sand, dead, strangled. Poor fella. Right on time, just about a month, on the nose every month. And no clues? On the sand, no, no clues, no buttons, no fingerprints, no cigarette stubs, no match folders, not even a calling card. Well, 
There's not much I'm good for at a time like this, but if there's anything I can do, Brub, anything... I... I was in the neighborhood. I had to stop by and talk. I'll be going now. Thanks, Dix. Any time, Brub. You know that. Any time. The sand had been my first mistake. For sand was an evil, penetrating thing, and you could never wholly be rid of it. If dust could tell a story, then sand screamed out its secrets aloud. That was why the morning afterward early, I had gone down to the beach and spent the whole day there in the sand. That was why I had been ready for Brub when he came. That was why I was ready for the whole L.A. police force if they wanted to come. After Brub left, I went out of the house and drove to the cleaners on Pico and left a bundle of dirty clothes. Then I ate in Beverly and afterward went into Warner's Theater for a double bill. On the way home, I thought I was being followed. A large gray sedan that stayed with me for three miles, but I was wrong. We were together at a red light, and when it changed, the sedan shot ahead of me and disappeared into the night. I slept without dreams and didn't wake until late afternoon of the next day. And still Laurel hadn't come back. Do you love me? I'd asked him. And she said, yes. She lied in my face and in my arms. I hated her. A cheat and a liar. No one cared. No one ever cared. Only Brucey. Brucey, who was dead. Who had left me alone. Alone forever. For all of my life. Mr. Steele? Yes. Uh, Captain Lochner would like to see you up at the station, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Well, take your time. There's no hurry. Well, that's all right. I'm ready now. Uh, you can follow me in your own car, if you like. It doesn't matter. You might as well take yours. You know the way, don't you? Oh, yes, I know the way. So they wanted to look at my car while Lochner kept me occupied. <laughs> I laughed out loud driving over. Let them crawl through it. Let them look at the sand and the dust. Let them make casts of the tires. It didn't mean a thing to me. It only made the game more exciting. Thought maybe you could help us, Steele. I'd be glad to, Captain. You name it. It's the Bruce case, the English girl. I understand you knew her. Yes, yes. Brub and I both knew her. Wonderful girl. I've been doing a good deal of thinking about Miss Bruce. Brub told me your idea. It, it could have been the same man. I got a list here of American men who were friendly with the Bruce girl. They were all in England when it happened. Just look it over. See what you can remember about these men. Anything they might have said or done. Here. Oh. Uh, I see Brub's name is on it. Yeah. Mine, too. But you'd been transferred before then, Dix. I My transfer Lock. wasn't completed until after I got back from Scotland. I had a month's leave accumulated. You came home after that? No, no, no. I was sent to Paris and into Germany on the cleanup. I was overseas another six months. And what about the men on that list? I can't tell you a thing against any single one of them. They were all good men. Not one could have had anything to do with this. It's impossible. Okay, okay. Rob's been telling me the same thing. It's another dead end. Well, that's enough for the day. I'm going home to sleep for 20 hours. Thanks for coming over, Steele. Good boy, Dix. Why? Because I stood up for the fellas? You did, too. We had to. I never knew about Scotland. How'd you like it up there? It was wonderful. Because she was with me. Brucie. She loved it there. And I loved her. car was where I'd left it. If the police had gone after dust, they hadn't taken much. The floor mat was no cleaner than it had been before. I went home and sat in the living room, watching it get dark, not bothering to turn on any of the lights. There were no slips, no mistakes. There had never been any. There never would be any. I'd go back east. I'd get my trunk off tomorrow by express, and then I'd go by plane. Goodbye, Brobs. Goodbye, Sylvia. Thanks for the buggy ride. But first I'd find a room not too far away, and hole up for a few days. Once I was gone, Laurel would come back to her apartment and I'd be waiting in the shadows. I'd take care of Laurel. 
I sat there in the heavy darkness, my fingers aching, my head banded by iron. There were footsteps outside. No, not Laurel. A man coming home late from the office. But she might come tonight. I've been cleared by the police. No one need be afraid of me tonight. She might come. I sat behind the dark window, hardly breathing. And then I heard them coming, clicking on the pavement, high, pointed heels. I looked out. Slacks, a careless coat over the shoulders, a scarf to mask her flaming hair. I moved quickly, out the door, stepping softly through the windows, coming up behind her. So you decided to come back. Turn around, look at me. Sylvia. Yes, Sylvia. Where's Laurel? Where's Laurel? What have you done with her? Laurel's all right, Dix. She's all right. Where is she? Dix. Where is she? She isn't coming back. She's safe, and she's going to stay safe. So you've poisoned her against me because you hate me. From the beginning, you hated me. No, Dix, no. Only I did feel something was wrong with you. From the first night you walked into our house, I knew something was terribly wrong. You knew? What could you know? A jealous dame. You couldn't even stand to see Brub have a friend like me. Wanted me all for yourself, didn't you? And now, Laurel, you take her away from me, too. Laurel came to us because she was afraid. Afraid of you and what you might do to her. That's a lie. Is it, Dix? Tell me, what happened to the girl who had coffee in the drive-in with you? What happened to the girl in Westlake Park? The girl down on Skid Row. Sylvia, I'm going to kill you. No! Oh! Ah! All right, get him. Hey, all right. It worked, Bob. It worked. in my apartment, Lochner and Brub and Sylvia, and some of the boys I'd seen from the Beverly station. They put on the lights and sat me down on the divan, and they stood around looking down at me, all of them but Sylvia. They stood between me and the chair in which she sat huddled, and Lochner was looking down to talk to me. I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Mildred Atkinson. That's very funny. And suspicion of the murder of Betsy Banning. And the attempted murder of Sylvia Nikolai. Have you anything to say? Yes. I think you're crazy. Listen to me, Dix. It's no use. We have Mildred Atkinson's fingerprints in your car. There's only one way they could get there. Would you be lying? You, an old friend, just to trap me? And we have the dust. Do you know what a good lawyer could do with your precious dust? I'm not through, Dix. There's quite a bit of lint from the Atkinson girl's coat. Lint. And there are hairs from Betsy Banning's Scotty dog. We found them on the suit you took to the cleaners. <laughs> but you can't think of everything, Brub. Especially when you're rushed. When your luck runs out. Dix. Dix, look at me. Why did you do it? Why? Was it because you loved Brucie and she wouldn't have you? Is that what set you off? Is that what made you do it, Brub? I... Why, Dix? Tell me why. Because... Because... I killed Brucey. This is Robert Montgomery again, with thanks to our cast for their splendid performances. Next week for Suspense, we've chosen a story with triple threat possibilities. The title, the story, and the author, taken by themselves, are enough to command our interest. In combination, they become a dramatic force powerful in suspense. I speak of Nightmare by William Irish, a story which fuses reality with unreality and a frightening pattern of fear and suspicion. If you've ever had a nightmare... You know its impact. You know the difficulty with which you cast it aside. If you've never had a nightmare, we cordially invite you to have one on us next week. When with Nightmare by William Irish, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Good night. Mr. Montgomery may currently be seen in the Universal International production, Ride the Pink Horse. In a Lonely Place by Dorothy B. Hughes was adapted for radio by Irving Ravitch 
Directed by Anton M. Leader and produced by Robert Montgomery. Lud Gluskin is our musical director and conductor, and Lucian Morrowick composes the original scores. Next week, hear Nightmare on radio's outstanding theater of thrills, one hour of... Suspense! Remember to give gladly to the 1948 Red Cross Fund. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Ronald Reagan in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of a man who wanted to apologize for threatening a stranger. And when he got there, the stranger was dead and the police were waiting. It's called Circumstantial Terror. Our star, Mr. Ronald Reagan. This is Harlow Wilcox with a $100,000 reminder. That total will be given to recognized charities in cash through the Autolite family charity drawing. And you may be one of 25 persons selected to name your own church, hospital, or any other local or national recognized charity to share in this huge sum. There's no obligation except printing your name and address. But your favorite recognized charity may share in thousands of dollars. To tell you how important this is to his organization, we are privileged to present General George Kenney, President of the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation. This generous Autolite offer will greatly aid the work of such groups as the Arthritis and Rheumatism Foundation. If you are one of the 25 persons chosen to name your favorite organization, I hope you will remember the 10 million people who suffer the pain and the crippling of arthritis. They will be most grateful for your help. Good luck to you in this Autolite family charity drawing. To enter this drawing, just visit any of these Autolite family car showrooms and fill out a registration form. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. It may mean thousands to your favorite recognized charity. So sign up tomorrow. And now, Autolite presents Circumstantial Terror, starring Mr. Ronald Reagan, hoping once again to keep you in... Suspense. I wasn't the only one who was mad at him. All the other guys felt just about like I did. About Curly Weber, that is. You see, if he hadn't let the pressure go too high, we'd have all been in good shape right now. As it was, the boiler blew up and wrecked the cleaning plant where I worked. The owner collected the insurance money and got out of the business, which left us with no jobs. After a few months of looking around for a job, I was in a pretty bad way. Then I connected. Only trouble was it wouldn't start for three weeks. By now I was broke, irritable, and mad at the world. So I wasn't what you'd call a pleasant type fellow when I walked into this liquor store for a package of smokes about 11 o'clock one night. So, what else could I do, Eddie? There I was with egg on my face and that phony salesman telling me I was going to have to take what he gives me or get nothing at all. What do you have to buy from him for? His outfit has the distributor tied up. 25% of what I make, I make from his scotch. I'd like a pack of cigarettes. Hold your horses, mister. I got another customer. So, I check around town to see if maybe I can get the scotch somewhere else. How'd you make out? Go ahead. Take a guess. Come on, mister, get off the dime. Just give What's me a... What's the matter with you? Ain't you got no manners? Just give me a pack of cigarettes and stop shooting off your mouth. Me shooting off my mouth? Look, buster, I got a pretty good trade right now, so why don't you take your two-bit sale somewhere else? I don't even like the way you look. Listen, smart guy, I've taken a lot of lip from guys like you in the last few months. One more crack out of you and I'll smear you all over the joint, do you hear? All right, mister, all right, take it easy. Sam don't mean no harm. That's just the way he talks. Then let him talk to somebody else like that. Hey, why don't you give me cigarettes, Sam? We can talk some more after he leaves. 
Uh, okay. What kind do you want, mister? I don't want any kind. I just want you to remember something. Next time you see me, you'd better cross over to the other side of the street. It'll be healthier for you. Remember that. I went back to my room and poured myself a drink. No doubt about it, I'd acted like a fool. But four months of being unemployed didn't exactly develop an even temper. It was a half hour before I realized I still hadn't got any cigarettes, and another 15 minutes before I could talk myself into going back to the liquor store to apologize for losing my temper. The street was dark, and the only light on the whole block came from the glowing window of the liquor store. I still wasn't sure what I was going to say to Sam when I got there, but I knew I'd fix everything up all right. I'd gotten to within about a hundred feet of the store when I noticed a black, or what seemed to be black, coupe parked in front of the store. Just about the time I noticed it, I heard a shot. It seemed to come from the direction of the store. I stopped for a second. Then a guy rushed out of the store right in front of me, jumped into the car, and before I could do anything, it roared down the darkened street out of sight. I ran to the store and looked in. Nobody around. Then I looked behind the counter. The guy I'd argued with, Sam, was on the deck. I could tell right away that it was a waste of time to check his pulse, but I did it anyway. He was dead, all right. Then I started for the door to call the cops. Hey, what's going on? Oh, oh what did I tell oh. you, Irv? I saw who did it. He ran out the door as I was coming up the street. Come on. Grab him, Irv. He did it. That's the guy I was telling you about. Come on, buddy. Let go. I tell you, I oh, didn't Irv. do it. I didn't do it. I Irv. saw the guy that did. Let go. Hold on to him, Irv. That's the guy Sam had to throw out of the store. He was casing the joint. That's what he was doing. Irv. Let go of me. Yeah. Hold him good, Irv. I'm going for the cop. Don't worry. He ain't going nowhere. As I was getting up to go after the police, these two guys rush in and hold me. I didn't do it, I tell you. He's lying, officer. We'll find out if he's lying when the guys from Homicide get here. I don't even own a gun. That gun laying by Sam's body is Sam's gun. Looks to me like this guy shot him with his own gun. If you don't shut your mouth... Easy does it. What happens when the guys from Homicide get here? You want my honest opinion, mister? Yeah, sure. I didn't put the cuffs on you for laughs. I think you've had it, buddy. It's only an opinion, but from what I can see here, and what I've gotten from these witnesses, you're nailed, buddy. Nailed good. And I was. By the time it was presented to the grand jury, the state had a real good case prepared against me. The liquor store owner's gun only had his prints on it, which made it look as if I'd tried a phony hold up and jumped him when he drew it. And there was money scattered all over the store, which made it look as if I'd been surprised before I had a chance to get away. That guy Eddie who'd been in the store when I had my argument wouldn't let me up. He pounded nails in my coffin every time he opened his mouth. I'd had a job when all this happened that I had trouble giving me a motive. And being broke and unemployed made it look that much worse. As a result, I wasn't surprised when the grand jury came through with an indictment for first-degree murder. As far as I was concerned, it was all over but the hanging. Now, how are you? You, uh, Frank Thompson? Right now, I wish I weren't, but I am. Who are you? I'm Ernest Gibbons. I've been assigned as public defender in your case. You're wasting your time. Why? Are you guilty? No, I'm not. Well, then I'm not wasting my time. <clears throat> Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Well, I think you got most of the facts straight in my mind. Now, I want you to tell me in your own words what happened. Did you read the transcript of the inquest? Yes, I did. That's all there is to it. Uh-huh. Well, look, Frank, I'm here to help you if I can. Now, don't make it tough for me. I think we can beat this if you help me. How? Well, first, let's forget that story about running in after the storekeeper was shot. Now, nobody believes that. Would you believe it if I tell it to you again? Should I? Yes, because it's the truth. Well, can you describe the man you saw running out? More or less. Well, what do you mean by more or less? Well, I got a pretty good look at his face. He had a mustache. 
But I couldn't tell you how tall he was or how much he weighed. It seemed to me to be just medium all around. Uh, however, you said at the inquest that he got in a car and he drove... Now, can you describe the car? It was a black coupe. And what year? I don't know. Well, how about the make? I couldn't tell. It was too dark. Mm -hmm. The license number, all or any part of the license number? None of it. All his lights were out. Uh -huh. In other words, if you wanted to lie, this would be a pretty good way of blaming someone the police couldn't possibly track down, wouldn't it? I guess so. But I'm not lying. All right, now let's see. The state has set the trial for a week from today. In a hurry, aren't they? <laughs> I guess they figure that they've got you sewed up. The papers have public opinion running pretty high against you. You know, the man left a wife and three little kids. Well, that's tough. Real tough. It was a couple of days later that Ernie came to me and said they were selecting the jurors who'd hear the case. This was a part of the law I didn't know a thing about, so when he said I had a right to sit in in the selection, I went along, if only to get out of the cell for a few hours. Well, to put it simply, it's more of an interview than anything else. It also gives us a chance to get jurors we think might be more easily swayed to our way of thinking. <clears throat> I'm to the point where I don't care much one way or another. I just wanted to get out of the cell for a little while. Maybe I'd be better off if I just played guilty and get it over with. Oh, now you're talking foolish, boy. There's a lot that can happen in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. It's all going to happen to me. <laughs> Some of it might be good, you know. Don't hold your breath. Well, over here, Frank. Just sit down, right? There. Okay. I'm going to try to get as many women as I can on the jury. You're a pretty good-looking boy. It helps sometimes. What about the prosecution? Don't they have anything to say about it? Well, I doubt if they challenge more than once or twice. Now, they think they have such a strong case, it doesn't matter much to them who's on the jury. They're right, too, aren't they? Now, that remains to be seen. <clears throat> uh -huh, here they come. Yeah. Right now, I'd trade places with any given one of them. I don't think you'd get any takers. <laughs> oh, well, uh, not as many women as I'd like to have seen. Ernie. Ernie. What's up, boy? The guy with the gray suit. Where? Over there, next to the dame with the fur coat. Oh, yeah. Well, what about him? Don't challenge him. What? Don't challenge him. That's the guy. What guy? That's the guy that killed the shopkeeper. That's the guy I saw running out of the store that night. Get him on the jury. Don't let him get away. I don't want to die for what he did. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ronald Reagan in Circumstantial Terror. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense. Uh, hey, Charlie, what Nash model is this? Well, this is the new Nash Statesman, Harlow. You know, this year, Nash offers the widest range of models and prices in history. And you can get such optional features as power steering, power brakes, and even power lift windows. And of course, Harlow, Nash has Autolite equipment, too. And Autolite is proud of its long association with Nash and Nash dealers everywhere. That's why we're privileged to salute Nash as a distinguished member of our Autolite family. Distinguished is the word for the new Nash Harlow and advanced, too. The 1954 Nash gives you greater safety with exclusive unitized Nash air flight construction, greater economy on regular gasoline, greater comfort with a new exclusive Nash all-weather eye air conditioning system that heats, ventilates, and cools at your command. And Harlow, next week, Nash introduces a completely new kind of car. Watch for it. Okay, Charlie, and thanks for the ride. Always a pleasure, Harlow, especially in a new Nash. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Ronald Reagan, in Elliot Lewis's production of Circumstantial Terror, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was.
was tough sitting through the selection of the jury, especially when I knew that the prosecution could, for no apparent reason, disqualify the man I'd pointed out to Ernie. If he was the man I'd seen run out of the liquor store the night of the shooting, then he had to be where we could keep tabs on him. Ernie sacrificed a couple of his limited number of preemptory challenges just to make sure the guy came up for selection. When he did, there was no objection on either side, and we had him. Later that afternoon, when Ernie came to my cell, we tried to figure out what we were going to do with him. Well, now that we've got him, uh, what are we going to do with him? Well, it's your job to figure out, Ernie. You're the lawyer. We're no better off now than we were at the beginning. We haven't got a shrewd of evidence to substantiate your claim. I saw him. Isn't that enough? Well, you're on trial, not him. Well, supposing I get up in court and say he's the man, what would happen? He'd probably declare it a mistrial and discharge the jury and go to work on another trial. But you'd stay in jail. Wouldn't they question him? Maybe. It was pretty obvious he'd say you were off your rocket. Remember, Frank, you're the one who's accused. Defending yourself by accusing him just on your say-so is pretty flimsy. Who'd believe it, would you? Well, couldn't you do it? Couldn't you tell someone? Proof, Frank. Proof. What can I possibly do but quote you? What am I going to do? Just what we're doing. Go through with this trial. Then I'll appeal, no matter what the verdict is, and see if we can rope our friend into making a mistake. But he'll duck as soon as the trial's over, won't he? Probably, but at least uh, he'll be around while the trial is on. Now, if you cause a mistrial, he'll be gone a lot faster. It isn't fair. I know he's the man. This is a court of law. The burden of proof is on the accuser. What real proof have they got against me? They don't have to catch a man in the act of murder to convict him of it. Circumstantial evidence can be strong enough. And and in your case, it seems to be. It's driving me nuts to think that this guy is going to help send me away for a murder he committed. Well, they haven't sensed you yet, boy. Let's see what happens. And if it does happen? Maybe we'll have something I can use to ask for a new trial. If we get into trouble. Where's the trial going to be? Well, Judge Thurston will preside, I think. Let me see, that'll put it in the uh, City Hall Annex. Where's that? In the Annex, that's a small building on the north side of the City Hall. That's uh, next to the parking lot. Why? Just asking, that's all. Frank? Yeah? Don't try any grandstand plays. Any tangle with the jury might result in a mistrial, and I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. I won't mess with them. That's good. Well, I gotta get going. Going home? I guess so. Tell me something, Ernie. Sure. Well, what do you want to know? What are my chances, Ernie? And don't kid me. I wouldn't kid you, Frank. I, I don't know right now, but uh, I'd sure be lying if I said they were good. Thanks. That's what I wanted to know. That's what I liked about Ernie. When he asked for the truth, he gave it to you. After he left, I lay back in my cot and thought about the whole mess. Everything had happened so fast, I really hadn't had time to take stock of my position. Now I did. And what I came up with made me want to beat my brains out against the steel bars out of sheer frustration. It wasn't anybody's fault. If you discounted the guy that actually did the killing, I didn't have any beef with the law or the people who were carrying out the law. It was just that they didn't know they were going to convict an innocent man. I guess I lay there thinking about ways to clear myself. Most of the ways were more daydreaming than anything else. I finally came up with the conclusion that anything I did was going to have to really go from the time I started it. There wouldn't be time for talk or reason. In the morning, I got dressed and ready for the first day of the trial. When I got to the courtroom, I was seated beside Ernie. Then came the time when papers were being shuffled and everyone was getting set for the opening arguments. Well, then you take it easy, Frank. We're going to fight real hard. You know what a backfire is? You mean like when a car... No, I mean like when you're caught in a bad brush fire without any water. Well, I'm not with you, kid. Uh, what are you going for? You light another fire downwind, let it give you a big burn spot to stand in while the main fire goes past. Uh, you explain it to me later, Frank. The judge will be here in a minute or two, and I want to get my paper straightened here. <laughs> he doesn't like to see an unprepared attorney. Listen to me, Ernie. I'm in the path of a real big fire right now. I know you are, boy. I know, but what... So I gotta try a backfire. A guy can get killed in a backfire, but at least you gotta take a chance. What are you trying to tell me? Now, say it fast, because... You will hear from me. Stick with me, Ernie. I'm a pretty good guy, but I'm in real bad trouble. And I'm the only guy that can get me out of it. Well, what... What are you gonna do? This! Look out! He's making a break! Get out of my... way! It 
was the only thing I could do. I couldn't sit by while 12 people tried to make up their minds whether I must die for a murder I didn't commit. As I went out the window, I folded my arms in front of my face to keep from being cut to ribbons with a broken glass. I lit feet first in the parking lot and started running. I didn't know where I was going. All I knew was I had to get away fast. By the time everyone got organized, I'd pretty well lost myself in the alleys of the city. I got to a place where they were putting up an office building and ducked into the sub-basement, crawled into a corner and stayed there. Somewhere around midnight, I slid out and started to the only guy in town I knew wouldn't turn me in as soon as he saw me, Ernie Gibbons. When I got there, his place had a light on in the kitchen, so I went around the back. Hi, Ernie. What? Let me in. Oh, oh, come on, Harry. What are you doing here? If they find out about this, I'll be disbarred. I won't stay long. Wait till I turn the light off. Now sit right there, Frank. And don't move around too much. Thanks. Okay. Tell me why you did it. I told you this morning in court. This is my backfire. I couldn't just stand around while they made up their minds whether to kill me or let me rot in jail. I didn't do it. I'm going to get the guy that did. Oh, then they'll really have you. And they'll have me for something I did, not something I didn't do. Well, why'd you come here? I need an address. An address? You mean the guy with the mustache? Yeah. Got anything on him? He isn't around, Frank. How do you know? By the time I got through with the mess you left behind, it was pretty late in the day. What are you talking about? Just this. We knew he'd duck out as soon as the trial was over. But during the trial, we might have been able to work something. That's why I warned you about causing a mistrial. This afternoon, I went over to the address he'd given. And he moved out a few hours after your break. Any forwarding address? Oh, don't be so naive. The man is a murderer. I don't think he knows you saw him running out of the store, but he isn't taking any chances. He's lost, Frank. And you're in a bigger jam than before. What do I do now? Oh, yes, you tell me. I won't give myself up. Well, that's up to you. You're on your own now. What's your position in this? I should turn you in. But you won't. Oh, you're a sense they have the book thrown at you when they get you. I gotta think. Yeah, sure. You need to do something for me, will you? I might. What is it? I'm a pretty hungry man. Could you rustle me up some food? Oh, sure, Frank. I'll fix you some food. Ernie. Yes? What about that witness that claims he saw me casing the place, that Eddie character? Yeah, well, what about him? He's the state's number one witness, isn't he? Well, I guess so. What's he got against me? Why is he trying so hard to get me? Well, I think that for the first time in his life, he's somebody and he's going all out to prove it. I'm going to see him. No, no, you're not. You're in enough trouble. They offer him. Give me his address, Ernie. Well, you're out of your mind. Give me his address. I want to talk to him. Oh, but Frank... I know you've got it. You've got the addresses of all the witnesses. Get it. Okay. It's here in my briefcase. Hey. What? Well, that's funny. I, I never noticed this before. Noticed what? What are you mumbling about? The witness against you lives right over the liquor store where the guy was shot. Ernie. Yeah? Just a thought. But he's the fellow that accused me of casing the shop. Suppose it was the other way around. Suppose he was casing it for our friend with the mustache. Well, you'd have to prove a connection between the two men, but... So how are you going to do that? I don't know. I'll figure that out when I get there. Oh, I can't let you do that, Frank. Don't try to stop me. Well, you could get picked up on the way there. I'll be there in a few it's minutes. three or four miles from here. You're lending me your car. I am? Yeah. Give me the keys. Okay. Here. So long, Ernie. I wish I could stop you, because... Don't try it. I wouldn't want to hurt you. Oh, well, thank you. So long.
is it? Whitey Wilson, come on, open up. I don't know any... But you know me, Eddie. Thompson! That's right, Frank Thompson, fall guy. What do you want from me? I want to know why you're so anxious to see me burn. You tried to hold Sam up and killed him, that's why. You know better than that. I do? What other reason would I have? Hold it down to a roar, Eddie. I gotta get some sleep. Come on in, mister. You with the mustache. Thompson? Yeah, that's what Eddie said when he saw me. All right, Eddie, what's this guy doing here? He's, uh... He's my brother, but it don't mean... Cozy, it. huh? One guy in a witness box and one guy in a jury. You really got it made. Yeah. What are you gonna do about it? Make you tell the truth. What are you talking about? Why'd you kill him? Need the money? Get out of here. After you write me a confession. So I can burn instead of you? That's right. You're wasting your time. Am I? Get the cops, Eddie! No! Get up, you. Am I wasting my time? Am I? I don't write nothing. You won't. Okay. Okay, now. Start writing. Here come the cops. You're dead. No, mister, you are. If the cops get here before you finish writing, I'll kill you. If I'm going to fry for something you did, I'm going to be sure you go with me. Now make up your mind. You want to die right now or take a chance with a jury? Okay. Give me a pen. I hope you understand why I sent for the cops, Frank. I didn't want you getting any more trouble. Oh, sure, that's all right. <laughs> well, how's it feel? Mighty good. It's a pretty town when you don't have to look at it from behind steel bars. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Well, looks like I'll be able to make that job I told you about. Only a few more days to wait. Mm, where will you be staying? I don't know. You got any money? Enough. You got any money? No. Then it's settled. You'll stay with us until you get on your feet. All right. <laughs> you heard me. Okay. Lend me a quarter. <laughs> sure. What for? I ought to buy a pack of cigarettes from a machine. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Ronald Reagan. Congratulations on an excellent performance, Ronald. Well, thanks, Harlow. Say, uh, what about this $100,000 Autolite family charity drawing? Am I eligible? Well, if you're over 18, you are. I'm eligible. <laughs> well, all you do is visit any Autolite family car dealer showroom, print your name and address on a registration form, and have the dealer sign it. And if you're one of the 25 people selected, you can name your favorite church, hospital, or any other local or national recognized charity to share in $100,000. And all I do is fill out a form? You mean there are no puzzles to solve or anything like that? That's right, Ronald. Nothing to solve, buy, or try. And where do I register? At any of the following showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Sounds like a wonderful opportunity, Harlow. Thank you, Ronald Reagan. Friends, you can help your favorite recognized charity share in $100,000 just by signing your name and address. So why not sign up tomorrow? Next week, the story of a cross-country train trip during which a police officer finds himself torn between his assignment and his personal feelings for... The Girl in Car 32. Our star, Mr. Victor Mature. That's next week on... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Circumstantial Terror was written for Suspense by Ross Murray. In tonight's story, Howard McNear was heard as Ernie. Featured in the cast were Vic Pern, Clayton Post, Charles Calvert, Hal Gerard, and Kurt Martell. Ronald Reagan is currently starred with Steve Forrest and Dewey Martin in the MGM production Prisoner of War. 
And remember next week, Mr. Victor Mature in Thomas Walsh's story, The Girl in Car 32. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story of a killer and the family which he held in a night of fear. We call it Strange for a Killer. So now, starring Mr. John Daner, here is tonight's suspense play, Strange for a Killer. How's this, Henry? Oh, swell. Anywhere along here. Oh. Thanks, Buck. So you sure you don't want to stop in for a minute? You haven't seen the kid yet, have you? Gee, I'd like to, but I have yeah. to get home early myself tonight. The wife's got some kind of meeting, and I'll have to take care of my own. Okay. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Night, Hank. Night. All right. Uh, Hold it right there. Oh, I didn't see you, officer. What's wrong? You'll have to wait a while. You can't go down that street. But that's where I live. My wife's waiting for me. You'll be a little late. Well, now, wait a minute. Look, I... will you keep your voice down and stay back? You'll get hurt if you don't. Oh, you after someone? Roy Jaleska. Jaleska? That's right. And he's been living in this neighborhood? Where? Right across the street, down three doors. There's a cop every ten feet from here to the river. You better go back in that drugstore and wait. Call your wife if you want. Yeah, I think I'd better. Where'd you say he was? Across and down three doors. Yeah. We're in the apartment house right next to her. You don't think there'll be, be any shooting? Man? Just tell her to stay inside and keep a door locked. She'll be all right. Oh, Thanks. Hi, Charlie. Hey, it's that Jaleska guy there after, you know. He's been living in the boarding house right next to you. Yeah, I know. How long has it been going on? Yeah, they've been here almost half hour now. A half hour? What are they waiting for? Don't ask me. I got here about 5.30 when the police were just coming in. They only took about five minutes to cover the whole block. And a party of uh, six or seven of them went in after them. And they haven't come out? No. No, I've been watching. <laughs> Why, I wonder. You haven't heard any shooting, eh? No. We ought to hear something by now. Hey. Does seem funny, doesn't it? Unless he got out of his room. Ah, he couldn't get far. Oh. Well, I want to get Jesse on the phone. She'll be wondering why I'm late. Yeah, sure. What's the matter, honey? I thought you weren't going to answer. I... I was looking after Johnny. Are you okay? Just getting hungry. Well, go ahead with this supper. I'm going to be late. Uh, Jess, I don't want to scare you, but there's going to be a little trouble next door. Now, I don't want you to leave our apartment. Yes. The police are after someone who's been hiding out in the boarding house next to us. Now, the whole block is surrounded... And I won't be able to get home till it's over, and you're not to come out. Yes. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, Jesse. All right. You just stay inside, keep the door locked. There's no need for that now. Hmm? Goodbye, dear. 
What? Jesse? Hello? Hello? Hey, Charlie. Yeah? How high is that boarding house? Is it three stories? Yeah, that's right. Just like your place. And that alley between them, how wide is it? Oh, it's pretty narrow, I guess. But there's a cop on both ends. And the roof. Uh, Charlie, could anyone make the jump across? Is it too wide for that? I don't know. Why? She didn't sound right, Charlie. Like... Yeah? Like there was someone with her, Charlie... I tell you, I spoke to her on the phone about ten minutes ago, and I'm sure there's something wrong up there, Captain. What makes you sure? Well, she was afraid of something. I, I know she was. Something right right there in the room with her. Where do you live? In the boarding house? No, the apartment house next door on the third floor. Reader? Yes, sir? Farrell's got some men going to the apartment house next to Jaleska. Stop him. Yeah. He's in there with her, isn't he? He's in with my wife. I don't know, fella. He could be anywhere now. Well, you didn't find him in his room? No, he's not in the boarding house. I knew it. He's with Jesse and my son. Take it easy, Hayden. Well, he got across the roof, didn't he? Our apartment is on the top floor. He could get in easy enough. Maybe. Look, let me go up there, Captain. Please, let me go up there. No, I want to be with my wife and kid. I'm sorry, Hayden. If it's true he'll use them as hostages to make us hold our fire, it's better that they're only two. What difference does it make? Look, we're not even sure he's there. You haven't given us any real proof. It's the only way you can make sure. Look, now... Look, if everything's all right, if he isn't there, I'll call the drugstore and have them tell you so. If he is, I'll... Well, I'll let you know somehow. We can think of some kind of signal. You, you can't stop me anyway. It's my home. My wife that's in danger. I have a right to be there. I could stop you, mister. I should stop you. But you won't. I can go. All right, listen to me. Yeah? You may be wrong about no, this, No, what do you want me to do? Go straight to your wife. Don't do any investigating on the way. No looking down the alley or around corners. Get in your apartment. Lock the door behind you. He's trapped, Hayden, and he's scared now, and he'll kill you if he thinks you're onto him. I, I know it. Now, if he's not in your place when you get there, call headquarters and ask for Grimes. I'll have him standing by. He'll flash the message to my car. Yeah. If he is there... Well, there's nothing I can tell you. You'll be on your own. But don't try to signal... Now, if I don't get your call ten minutes after you go in, we'll know. Yes, sir. I can say this, Hayden. If he's there, don't try anything brave. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's about all. Just be careful. We want this man, Hayden. We want him badly. But we don't want anyone hurt getting him. You understand? I do. Thanks. Okay, Captain. Farrell's holding up his men, but he wants to know the score. Uh, get over to my car, Reader. Have his men surround the apartment house, block every exit, put someone on the fire escape and on the first floor. But no mis... No noise. Do it quietly. Okay, Hayden. You can get going. Yep. If he's not there, get the call in right away. Sure. Jesse? Jesse? It's me. Jess? Oh, honey. Honey, is everything okay, is it? Come in, Henry. You sounded funny over the phone. I thought there was something wrong. It's okay, isn't it? Why don't you answer me, Jess? Henry. Henry. Where? Where... Get your hands over your head. Get up against the wall. Don't make any noise or I'll kill you. You are listening.
listening to Strange for a Killer. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. The money you meant to save but never actually did will never see you through an emergency. Start immediately to put regular sums aside through your bank's bond-a-month plan or through weekly payroll savings deductions. United States savings bonds are safe to invest in because they're as sure as Uncle Sam. And when you need them, you've got them. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. John Daner, starring in tonight's production, Strange for a Killer, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. What you thinking? But don't you try it, mister. This is a 45. I'm not afraid of your gun. That's because you've never been hit. You're bigger than me, and I know what you're thinking, but don't you try it. I'm warning you. You won't ever know what it means to wish you could die till you get a slug in the stomach. Henry. That's no, all right. I, I know he means it. I mean it. It won't do any good, you know. No matter what happens to us, no matter how long you stay here... They'll get you. Listen, it, guys. Just like me, those blue suits don't make them supermen. They make mistakes like everyone else. They've already made a big one. How? They shouldn't have sent you. My wife didn't sound right when I spoke to her over the phone. I came up to find out why. Yeah. She gave it away. She's sorry about that. Jesse, it's all did right, he... Henry. Please, it's, it's no, all right. Did he hurt you, Jess? Never mind that. She just got out of the hospital. Would you like to see her go back? I hope they kill you. <laughs> they might. I thought about it. I guess maybe you better start thinking about it, too, because it's going to happen the next time you make a crack like that. Henry, don't. Don't. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and you're going to give me the right answers. The right answers, mister. The first time you get hurt bad. What do you want to know? Where were you when you made that phone call? Drugstore. Across the street. And your wife don't sound right. Do you think maybe something is wrong? Yes. You want to get up here? You want to find out why? Yes. What takes you so long? What? What? We don't hear you coming up the stairs till almost 15 minutes after she hangs up. What are you doing all that time, huh? Oh, no. No, no. At first, I wasn't sure she did sound like well, there was something wrong. It was only after I hung up and got to thinking about it that I started to worry, and then I made up my mind to come up. But that was later. You don't stop to talk it over with the cops? Why should I? How could I know it was you in here? Cops all over the block looking for me, searching every building. Streets probably closed off, and your wife sounds scared over the phone, but she won't say why. Sounds like someone's with her. She don't say who. But you don't think it might be me? Well, yes. Maybe I began to. Yeah, but you don't say nothing to the cops, though. No. Just come up all by yourself. Yes. You sure of that? Yes, I... (laughs) Okay. No! No, please! Please don't leave him alone. Oh, Oh, Henry. Uh, Henry. Oh, it's, it's all right. I'm all right, Jesse. All right. What's the big plan with you and the cops? I don't know. I don't know about their plan. I don't know what they're going to do. But they know you're in here. Don't stop, mister. I did go to the police when I thought it was you here with my wife. I don't think they believed me at first, but I talked the captain into letting me come anyway. If you weren't here... I was supposed to call him right away. And if I was? Nothing. Just wait. And if they didn't hear in ten minutes, it meant... meant I couldn't call. And you were in this room. You old lady. Go get the kid. No. No, why do you want him? We'll do anything you say. You don't need to touch our kid. You look okay. You don't want to hurt the kid. Get him, lady. Henry. It's, it's all right. I'm sure of it. 
You haven't got much time, Jaleska. You know it. Killing our baby is something you wouldn't do. You can bring him in, Jesse. Yes. If you say so. You're so sure this is the end of the line for me. And those cops down there, they're so sure. Well, I'm telling you, I got lots of time, and you're going to help me take it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, back up to the wall and peel off that jacket. Uh, what? Come on, take off the jacket, throw it on the floor. Sure. Why not? What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm not going to do anything. You're going to take it for a while. What do you mean? You don't see it, huh? I'm kind of surprised. Well, I don't see any way out for you, if that's what you mean. They know you're here. Yeah, yeah, they know I'm here. You made sure of that, didn't you? So they're covering every way out, doors, windows, alleys. What do you suppose would happen if I tried one of them? I think they'd kill you. Yeah, yeah. I start out that window and every cop down there comes to make sure I don't finish the trip. Maybe a couple come running up here. That leaves lots of cops down on the bottom of the fire escape and a couple of cops up here in the room. But not many anywhere else, huh? In the alley or in the streets or down near the river. They'll all be watching a guy in the fire escape, won't they? And the guy in the fire escape, he don't need to be me, does he? No, it won't work. You're crazy to think that'll work. I gotta take that chance now. You're going out on that window, mister. And you're gonna take your time doing it. They've seen me. They know what I look they like. They saw a guy in a leather jacket right close up. Now you're a guy in a white shirt three stories over the street coming down a fire escape. That makes you a different guy. That makes you Roy Jaleska. <laughs> a little guy, huh? Bring him in. He's asleep. You won't... He's asleep. What's his name? Johnny. Johnny. It's a nice original name. He's <laughs> a cute little kid, too. I, uh, don't guess you're gonna put up any arguments, huh, mister? No. <clears throat> no arguments. Yeah. I'll be right here with the wife and the kid until I see our little scheme is working, so don't you try no tricks on the way down. No. What does he mean? Henry, what's going to happen? You can read about it in the papers, lady. Now go turn out the light. The light? Turn it off. <laughs> but don't you try nothing, either one of you. You got your kid in here now, and there's no telling who'd get hit if I had to shoot wild. Turn it out, Jesse. Henry, I don't... Come on. Come on. Now you, the window... Okay, they're all waiting. Get going. You can't let him go out there. Jesse, it's all right. Hold on to Johnny and wait for me. It'll be all right. Oh, Henry. I stepped out onto the iron platform. Below on the street, I could feel every eye on me. We see you. Don't take another step. And then I knew there was a part of the plan he hadn't told me. I jumped back against the wall. But it was already too late. From the window behind me, Jaleska fired down into the police. Their guns flew up automatically and everyone was aimed at me. There's pain. Pain. Pain from everywhere. There were waves of pain. Voices. The voices I knew. Darling. Huh? Don't touch him. Don't touch him. Let him alone. He's losing uh, blood. I've got to get a doctor. You'll get a doctor, lady. Well, why don't you uh, go? What are you waiting for? Haven't you done enough? Uh, He's been shot. He's hurt. And you just you stand get... there. I thought you uh, wanted to get out. Well, get out. Get out. Jesse. Henry. Jesse. Henry, it'll be all right. Don't try to move, uh, darling. You'll be all right. Is he right. gone? Please. No, mister. No, he ain't gone. A little scheme. Don't look like it's gonna work. It should have. No reason it shouldn't. But they're moving up on the stairs right now. Oh, don't move, Henry. We'll get a doctor. It'll all be over in a minute. Hey, are you glad, huh? No. No, I'm not glad. It's ugly, all of this. I feel sorry for you. Don't, lady. I've been running for a long time. I think it's going to feel good to stop. 
It's a funny thing when they're after you, when you're running away. You, you look the same, you act the same as you always did, but it's, it's different on the inside. You're tight, twisted. No matter what you're doing, you, you can't relax. You can't get a good deep breath. Yeah, I think I'm glad. Jaleska! Brian Jaleska! Those guys are gonna do a lot of bragging tomorrow. We know you're in there. Come out with your hands up, or we're coming in after you. So are they finally get me. You killed a man. Yeah. Yeah, but one day you're just a guy, and then something happens, and you're a killer. Won't you go now, please? Sure, please. sure, I'll go. Why not? Don't make much difference now. Buddy, listen to me. You know what I mean, don't you? You're just a guy. Yeah. Put your gun down. Maybe they'll give you a chance. What chance? I've been waiting for a chance all my life. G give her the gun. It'll be better. Look, forget it. Will you get out of the way, lady? I'm going out. Well, you would. You wouldn't try. Mm -hmm. Oh, why don't you let me have your gun? Get back. Get way back. Jesse. It's all right, yeah. Henry. It's all right. That's it. Yeah. Stay there. I'm... You'll stay just like that. Henry. Okay, son. Hold it right there. Don't come any farther. There are six guns on you, Jaleska. You haven't got a chance. Now drop that thing and come down with your hands over your head. <laughs> Jesse. Yes. Why didn't it work? They shot at me. And then there was at least a half minute when he could have got out that door. Why, why didn't he? What made him wait? Oh, don't he... talk, darling. It's all over no, now. No, no, no. What, what happened? Tell me. When the police fired, he started for the door. But he came back, Henry. He went out into the fire escape and lifted you in the room. Then he started for the door again, but it was too late. Is he all right? I don't know. I think so. Will you get a doctor, please? The one's on his way. All right, take it easy, mister. You're going to be okay. He just lies easy. Yeah. Sure. It's funny. Huh? No. It's not funny. Strange. Strange. For a killer. Suspense, in which Mr. John Daner starred in tonight's presentation of Strange for a Killer. Next week, tune in again for radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's script is written by Robert Essen. The music was composed by René Guerrigan and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Tony Barrett, Eve McVeigh, Jack Crucian, Leonard Weinrib, Charles Seal, and Tom McKee. Tomorrow night on CBS Radio, hear the scientific touch on the FBI in peace and war. A new wrinkle in criminology and an exciting wrinkle in countermeasures. Remember, on most of these stations every Wednesday night, the FBI in peace and war. Stay tuned now for Douglas Edwards with the news, followed by Disc Derby. Thursday night, The Whistler brings mystery on the CBS Radio Network.
Suspense. This is The Man in Black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In Hollywood this evening, our star is the young American actor who, within a single year, has become one of the most provocative of Hollywood's leading men, Mr. Gene Kelly. Mr. Kelly appears tonight as a gentleman named Art Kramer, a gentleman of most uncertain scruples, engaged with other gentlemen of similar disrespectability in distinctly unlawful practices. Our suspense play by Robert L. Richards is called Thieves Fall Out. And in it, in support of our star, you will hear Hans Conried as a racetrack devotee by name Kennelly, and William John Stone as Sam Gross. And so with Thieves Fall Out and with the performance of Gene Kelly as Art Kramer, we again hope to keep you in suspense. ABC Enterprises. No, he's not in. No, I don't know where you can locate him. Hey, Rita. Yes, I'll tell him you called. ABC Enterprises, ABC Enterprises. Why does he give all these guys his phone number if he wants to keep this business so quiet? Yeah, uh, you know. Wants to do favors for people he meets in bars, brags, how he can get things for him. You know. I'm sure, I know. And the next day, I have to give him the brush off. He's going to brag to the wrong guy someday. Hi, Yachty. Hello. Hello, Arthur. Hiya, babe. Where you been the last couple of days? Uh, ducking all the guys I owe money to. What time is Sam getting the boys together? Mm, about half an hour, down at the warehouse. You better start down there pretty soon. What's the difference? I won't get enough out of it to buy a round trip to Coney Island. Any calls? Yeah, Canelli called a little while ago. That punk. Another guy who wants dough I haven't got. Did you stall him? I tried, but he said he was coming up anyway. Oh, what'd you let him do that for? You know I don't want to see that guy. I couldn't help it. He knows the way here. Okay, okay. Anything else? No. Arthur, if you're not going down right away, can I talk to you for a minute? What about? Oh, something. Joe, watch the switchboard for me, will you, while I talk to Arthur in the next room? What's she got that I haven't got? No cracks out of you. Please, Arthur? All right, but make it snappy. Now what? Oh, Arthur, what, what's the matter lately? You know what's been the matter, everything. Me too. Oh, don't start that again. Rita, it's no use. Look, you're a good kid, but it's no use. You didn't used to say that. All right. So now I owe nearly ten grand around this town. And there's some plenty tough monkeys. If I don't get it up pretty soon, it's going to be too bad. Top of that, I had a loaded truck and a trailer hijacked last week, and there goes my take for the month and more. And you want to know what's the matter. Oh, Arthur, honey, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you get out while you still can? Why don't I quit? What are you talking about? Oh, you used to have a decent business, Arthur. Sure, sure, and I didn't eat. Well, what about now? It's making a wreck of you. It's, it's dangerous. You know what's going to happen. This whole black market thing's going to crack pretty soon. And when it does, ah, you... Ah, don't be silly. Yeah? Kennelly's outside to see Artie. That punk. All right, let him come in. What's one more? Okay. Uh, better let me talk to him alone, baby. All right, Think about I, what I said, will you? Sure. Oh, hi, Arthur. I thought I might catch you. Yeah, I'll bet. Close the door. Sure. Hey, listen, Arthur. I need that dough. Well, I haven't got it. I told you that. Uh, no, 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 look. I don't want there should be no trouble. There's not going to be any trouble. Take it easy. I didn't mean that. But I took them bets from you on my own. Now, my boss is after me. If I don't get that dough by Monday, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, I haven't got it, and I won't have it for another month. Can't you get it from Sam? No, I'm into him as far as I can be now. What do you mean? Sam must have plenty sold it down in some safe deposit vault by now. It huh? isn't in a vault. It's up at his place in Connecticut. Anyway, he won't give me any more. Connecticut, huh? I didn't know he had a place in Connecticut. Yeah, near Riverside. It's a hideout, way away from everything. Oh. McPhail has one, too, about five miles away. When's he go there? He's hardly ever there. Nobody's there. What do you care? You're thinking of the days when you used to climb through second-story windows? Oh, you, you should not have said that, Art. I don't even know where the joint is. No, I was kidding. 
Anyway, listen, I'm, I'm sorry about the dough, but you'll have to wait. Uh, Art, you don't know the spot on me, Nick. Mean... You'll get it from me when I've got it. I'm uh, leaving. Uh, Art, the listen. You coming? Where you going? Down to the warehouse to watch my share of last month's take go down the drain. Where is it? Artie. Okay. You late? Yeah, I stopped in at the office. Hi, McPhail. Hi, Mo. You uh, weren't waiting just for me to hand out the chips, were you? You're yeah, right. We weren't. I just wanted you to know how it worked out. It was a good month, Art. Except for you. I know, I know. Come on, Sam, come on. Pass around the sugar. Let's get it over with. Well, here it is. In cash. Total take was 53 grand. 17 goes to you, McPhail. And you got the figures all here if you want to see. I know you wouldn't double-cross me, Sam. I wouldn't double-cross anybody. And don't forget it. Here's your dough. Yeah. Oh, yours is six. You understand you didn't bring in as much business as McPhail. I ain't complaining. I get 21. Part of that is paying expenses. The rest is my percentage. Don't I get anything? What? Your cut would have been nine grand. But there was that truck and trailer. Those things cost dough, you know. To say nothing of a whole load of prime meat. You have to take it all out now? I already have. I'll give you 500 to keep going. No, oh, that's fine. 500. Listen, Sam, I need dough. You always need dough and never have none. Listen, He's you... He's right, Art. You've got to get yourself straightened out. If I give you any more, it'll just go to the bookies and gambling joints like the rest of us. Listen, Sam, I tell you, I gotta have it. There's guys after me. I think he's yellow, Sam. You keep your big mouth out of this. Yeah. I was a respectable businessman when you were running a lousy clip joint on Sands. Yeah, yeah, and you're starved. And you're still starving. Because you haven't the guts to keep a couple of mugs from hijacking your stuff. Why, you... Cut it out No, Cut it out. There's not gonna be any trouble in this organization. There's plenty for everybody. Now, listen, Art. Yeah, why don't you go up to my place in Connecticut for a few days? Take it easy. And let me talk to these guys who are looking for you. I know who they are. They don't want any more talk. Anyway, I go nuts up there in the country. Go on. Pick up my car at the station. No, thanks. Well, hell, I'm going. I'm going out to the country and tend them a victory garden. Your victory garden? Yeah. I see you about Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Mac. Yeah? Uh, wait a minute. So long, Art. Uh, so long. Say, uh, Mac, uh, I'm sorry I made any cracks. Yeah, <laughs> forget it. Uh, Mac, you uh, going up to the country? Yeah, bet your life. Going down and get on the 520 right now. Say, uh, you know, uh, I think I'll take Mac up. Uh, Mac, I, uh, well, I kind of need a rest. I, I, yeah, I think... yeah, you'll need something. Uh, do you mind if I ride up on the train with you? Why not? Why not? It's a public train. Oh, you know, uh, Mac, I was sorry about Say, that. Say, Artie, Artie. Yeah? Don't mind me. I talk a lot. And I don't mean it. Ah, oh, forget it, Mac. I know. Say, you want to see my victory garden? Are you kidding? No, no, I got a garden. It's a beaut, too. Want to see it? Sure. Sure I would. I, I always like gardens. Well, well, in that case, you'll have to stop over at my place on your, on your way to Sam's, huh? It'll be a pleasure. Come on in, Artie. I want to put this dough in the safe, and then I'll then I'll show you around. Sure. <laughs> ah, when the war is over and I'm legitimate, I'm gonna build onto it. Have a lot of lawn, gardener, real country gentleman. Uh, what's this? Your office? I do a little business here once in a while. Keep my dough in the safe there until I bank it. <laughs> Know anything about safes? No. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Not that I don't trust you, Artie. Yeah. There she is. Put him up, Mac. What? You heard me. I'm not a movie. A stick up, huh? Why, you yellow little rat? You don't think you can pull this on me and live, do you? It's not a stick up, Mac. I just want you to do me a little favor, and I want to be sure you do it. Yeah. Yeah, get on that phone. This had better be a gag. It won't be unless you do exactly what I tell you. What? Call Reed in town. Ask her what Sam has lined up for Tuesday. Say you called me over at Sam's house just now and talked to me, but I didn't know. Go on, get going. 
Atwater, three. Five, five, six, two. Listen, Art. I'm no guy to kid around with. And I don't like this. Talk. Yeah. Rita, this is Mac. What's Sam got lined up for Tuesday? I just talked to Artie over at Sam's place. Yeah. Yeah, up here in the country. He said he didn't know and to call you. Oh, I say. Cut it short. No, no, no. Never mind. Okay. All right. Now what's the gag? You never were very smart, were you, Mac? Eh? That's my alibi. You just told Rita you talked to me at Sam's place. You get it? Why, you... Neatly done, Art Kramer. Virtually a perfect alibi. And $17,000 in cold cash. was someone else who thought he had a perfect setup too. Canelli, the little bookie, whose former occupations were even less savory. It wasn't hard for Canelli to find where Sam's place was in Connecticut, in New York's underground of petty crime, and find out anything. And it wasn't hard to jimmy a window, done that often enough. Ah, And then to find the money. There was a wad of money here at Sam's place somewhere. Art Kramer had said so. Probably in a safe. That wouldn't be any trouble either. Not in the living room, of course. Yes, maybe this room. An office, a desk and phone. And a safe there in the wall. And just as he'd thought, old-fashioned, easy to crack. First to drill a little hole, then the soup. There'd be a quick, neat little explosion and the safe would fall apart in his hands. But wait, what's that? A car driving up, stopping. Who? Art Kramer had said nobody ever came up here. Mm. But it was leaving now, driving away. Probably just a mistake. No, no. Steps outside. Somebody coming in. What to do? Escape cut off. Hide. Here in the office behind the door. Hide the bag of tools, quick. He's coming in here. What are operator? I want New York City. At water three... Five, five, six, two. Yeah, that's right. Hello, Rita. Sam. Listen, Rita, get a hold of everybody. Artie, Mac, Moe, everybody you can. I've got a tip off. There's going to be a raid. Yeah, cops. Tell the boys to duck. Lay low until they hear from me. Find out where they're going to be and call me right back as soon as you contact everybody. Got it? Yeah? Oh, okay. I'll get a hold of Mac myself as long as he's up here. Artie, too? Well, I'm calling from my place now. I don't see him anywhere. Well, he must have changed his mind. Well, I didn't look in the garage. He came by cab. He's probably around someplace, yeah. Well, I'll wait for your call, then. Okay, Rita. And make it snappy now. Hey. Connelly. What are you no, doing? Listen, Sam, I just... The safe. Why are you... No, dirty? No, no, no. Sam. Sam. Hit him too hard. He's dead. Dead. Yes, hit him too hard. Murder. That's a lot different from housebreaking. Murder. The phone. Somebody calling Sam. Fear, blind, unreasoning fear. Smash it. Rip it out of the wall. Though whoever was on the other end could actually hear, actually see what was in this room. Murder and a murderer. There. Why, oh, why had he done that? Foolish. Just nerves. Don't get hold of yourself. Think, think, think. What now? The money. Yes, have to have the money now. Make a getaway. Mexico, South America. Maybe Sam. Yes, the body. He'd even touch him. But turn him over. There, the wallet. Empty. That's funny. Other pockets. No, no, nothing. The safe, then. Finish the job quick. Then get out. Find the drill again. Hurry. Again, somebody coming. Who? Never mind. Not going to be caught this time. Can't be a murderer. Close the door. Lock it quick. Pocket the key. Hide. Maybe whoever it is will go away. Then come back and get the money later. Here 
there he is. Hide quickly. The kitchen. Get out the back window again if you have to. But wait, wait. He's not following. I wonder who it is. Just have a look. Through the crack of the door. Careful. Yeah. Art. Art Kramer. The suitcase must be going to stay. But wait, why not? Art wouldn't know anything. Couldn't with the office door locked. Give him a plausible story. Stay overnight and get the money when he's asleep. A chance, but have to take it. Yeah. Have to have the money now. Why not tell Art he'd come looking for Sam to borrow? Then, looking through the house for him, call him. Yes, make it look natural. He can't answer now. Call him. Sam. Sam. Hello, anybody here? Hello. Who is it? Who is it yourself? I'm looking for Mr. Gross, Sam Gross. Well, what are you doing here? Hello, Arthur. I was looking for Sam. I thought you didn't know where this place was. Oh, I found out. Yeah? Uh, what made you think Sam was going to be up here? Why, I heard a tip in town. There might be some trouble. I figured he might come up here to duck out. What kind of trouble? Cops. Yeah? I didn't hear anything. I don't know, but I do something. You know, I need dough the worst way. I figured Sam might let me have a little. He paid off today, didn't he? That's right. Art, did you get any? Me? Well, if you did, I don't like to keep asking you, but I need it, Art. Why, uh, why, uh... Look, uh, Canelli. Huh? You know, I meant to get in touch with you about that. I wanted to talk to you this afternoon. You mean you got something? Uh, come on inside, I'll tell you. Oh, sure, Art, sure. I, uh, got an idea. An idea. It came like a flash to Art Kramer. Frame Canelli for the murder of McPhail. Plan some of McPhail's money on him as evidence. And who would ever believe Canelli's word, a man with a criminal record against Art's? Why, Rita would swear that McPhail himself had said Art was at Sam's place, simply denied that he'd ever seen Canelli. And Canelli would be McPhail's murderer, and Art Kramer would be safe forever. Now, uh, about that money. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did get some. Not much, understand? Well, even a little would help. Uh, how much do I owe you all together? Nearly 4000 huh? Well, uh, suppose I gave you two. I shouldn't give you that much the way I'm fixed. Well, it, it ain't what I need, but it would help. Okay, uh, here's two grand on account. Oh. Then. You know, it uh, doesn't leave me with much. I appreciate it, Art, really. Say, uh, you're uh, really on a spot, huh? Yeah. How much more do you need? Oh, not a four, five, anyway. Oh, oh well, uh, you know, I just thought I'd know where you can get it if you work it right. You do? Yeah. You uh, know McPhail? Oh, I know him. Not well. Well, I do. He took in plenty this month. What good does that do me? I tell you, I know the guy. Well, He's the softest touch in the world. He'd give the shirt off his back to anybody if they told him the right story. Yeah. How come you don't put the bite on him? He doesn't like me, but anyone else. <laughs> you mean, uh, I just ask you? Sure. You get anything you want. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if you ask for ten, even twenty, you, you'd get it if he had it. No fooling. Sure. He's up here in the country now, too. Right up the same back road, four and a half miles. Hey, uh, how do I recognize the place? It's a big place on the right. The only house for a mile. You can't miss it. Say, I'd, I'd run up there if I were you. Uh, maybe I will, huh? Maybe I will. A break. The kind of break Canelli had prayed for. Get the money from McPhail. Yes, quicker and safer than trying to get back in that room with a dead body on the floor. Get it from McPhail and have a good head start. Art won't find Sam's body in there for at least a day or two. The door's locked and Canelli has the key. He can be on a plane with McPhail's money and be out of the country by tomorrow. A break, the perfect break. Uh... Well, thanks for the tip, Art. You sure McPhail's up there, huh? Sure, he's always there, every weekend. He's got a garden, a victory garden. <laughs> That's a laugh. Well, I guess I better get going, huh? Yeah, look around the grounds for him first. If sure. he isn't outside, just walk right in. Uh, the door's always open. He's a simple guy, trusts anybody. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Art. Skip it. Maybe someday you can do the same for me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe someday I can. Well, so long. So long. And now, Art has a job to finish. Phone the cops. From here? No, better not. They might trace it. 
the gas station at the crossroad. Plenty of time. Canelli will be there five or ten minutes before he finds what he'll find as the cops find him. How easy he fell for it. But never mind that now. The gas station. The phone. Hello. I want the police. Uh, hurry, please. Hello, uh, Riverside Police? Uh, listen, I-, I was just driving down Nine Mile Road. I was going by the old McPhail place. You know the place I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I, I was going slow and I heard something. It sounded like someone was being killed. Yeah, yes, a murder. There were shots and somebody screaming and more shots. A man's voice. Oh, it was terrible. You better get up there right away. Oh, never mind who I am. I don't want to get in any trouble. No, but get up there. Yes, murder. Get your call, all right, sir? Yeah, thanks. ABC Enterprises. Yes, did you locate him yet? Oh, well, keep trying and call me back. Joe, I'm worried. Eh, hey, don't worry about him. If you can't find Mo, neither can the cops. I'm not thinking about him. I'm worried about Sam and, and Arthur. Well, maybe they went out. Sam said he'd wait for my call. It isn't that. It's, the phone's dead. I've got to get in touch with him somehow. Can't it wait? You know it can't. Not with the cops raiding the warehouse and arresting everyone in sight. Well, how about a telegram? Oh, too slow. I hate to send anyone around to the house, but Sam will understand this time. What are you going to do? Get the telephone company to help. Hello? I want the Riverside, Connecticut traffic operator, please. Yes. You know, it's funny about that phone. It rang two or three times, and then suddenly it went dead. Oh, hello, traffic operator? Have you a phone listed under the name of Gross? Samuel Gross. Well, there's something wrong with it, and it's very important that I get in touch with Mr. Gross right away. I'm a secretary. Will you send a man up right away? Thanks. And would you tell Mr. Gross that I've been trying to reach him? Thank you. See, when Sam finds out there's something wrong with his phone, he can phone me from outside. You're a pretty smart girl sometimes, Rita. Yeah. Don't you believe me? I just wish I was smart enough to get some sense across to that guy, Art Kramer, once in a while. You kind of like him, don't you? Cut it out. Eh, don't worry about Artie. He'll be all right. Sure, I suppose. I suppose he'll be all right. Mr. Gross, I'm from the telephone company. Mr. Gross isn't here. Oh. Well, we just got word from New York that his secretary's been trying to reach him, but his phone is out of order. I was sent up to look at it. Sure, go right ahead. I'm a friend of Mr. Gross. I know he'd want you to fix it. Okay. Where is it? First door to your right. Well, looks like we've got more visitors. Yeah, cops. Well, I better get after this phone here. I'm sorry to trouble you. I wonder if we could use your phone. It's out of order, I'm afraid. There's a man here fixing it now. What's the matter, officer? Trouble? Yeah, a little killing up the road. We didn't want to handle the phone there. Might be fingerprints on it. Uh, murder? That's right, but the old McPhail place. Caught the guy red-handed. Murder and robbery. We even found the dough on him. Yeah? Who did it? Says his name is Connelly from New York. I wouldn't tell you all this except it's an open and shut case. Couldn't explain what he was doing there or how he got the money or anything. Well, you'll read about it in the papers tomorrow. You, uh, have him outside now? Yep. Well, we better be going. Hey, mister, that door you got, you got it's locked. You got a key? Why, no. Well, what's the matter? You lost a key someplace? Well, I, I, I must have. The, the, the room with the phone in it. Oh, well, maybe I can help you out. I got a little gimmick here that might open it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, we got to have things like that in this line of business, you know. Uh, this the door? Yeah, that's it. There you are. Oh, thanks. You uh, don't need me in there for anything, do you? No, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Hey, say, officer. Yeah? You better come in here a minute. Uh, wait a second, will you, Jim? Uh, sure. What's the matter? Hey, mister. You been here all day? That's right. Why? Nobody else been here all afternoon? No, sir. Oh, what's this? You find something wrong in there? You said it, mister. Put up your hands. Hey, what's the idea? You don't know, huh? Jim. Take a look at what we got here. Yeah. 
Well, well. Cover him, Jim. Okay. Well, what is... Hey, let me see that. Sure. Sam. No. Robbery, too. Been through his wallet and started on the safe. Just like the other guy. Let's frisk him. No. No, I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Uh, here's the dough, all right. A roll big enough to choke a horse. Look, you guys. I tell you, I didn't do this. Yeah. Kind of interrupted you, didn't we? Come on. Look. I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't. I didn't do this. I did. I did. I did. I did. And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. I'll read it to you. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Arthur Kramer and George Kennelly were executed here today within ten minutes of each other to bring to a fitting conclusion one of the strangest series of coincidences in the criminal records of this state. Both men committed the same crime, murder and robbery, within a few miles of each other on the same day and at almost the same time. Both victims were operators in the New York black market. Kramer was convicted of the murder of Samuel Gross. Kennelly killed Edward McPhail. Both killers were caught on the scene of the crime, were arrested by the same officers, taken together in the same police car to the same jail. Both proclaimed their innocence, yet pleaded guilty in the face of the overwhelming evidence against them. A curious factor in the case was that though both men denied knowing the other... They tried repeatedly to attack each other in the prison yard until guards were forced to keep them out of sight of each other at all times. Police have always believed there was some connection between the two crimes, but have never been able to find out what it was. And so closes Thieves Fall Out, starring Gene Kelly. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Appearing with Gene Kelly, who is to be seen currently in Metro Golden Mayor's Technicolor musical Thousands Cheer, were Hans Conried as Kennelly and William Johnstone as Sam Gross. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be Mr. Vincent Price. Mr. Price will be heard in a suspense play by E. Jack Newman, dealing with the Gestapo and called The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Don't miss suspense when this series moves to a new day and time. The day, Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd. The time, 8 p.m. Eastern War Time and 7 p.m. Central War Time. In the Mountain and Pacific Time Zones, listeners will hear suspense on Mondays, beginning December the 6th at 9 p.m. Pacific War Time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In hotels, restaurants, and homes of distinction, wherever hospitality is a gracious art, the best serve C-R-E-S-T-A, B-L-A-N-C-A, Cresta Blanca, Cresta Blanca. Yes, the famous name of Cresta Blanca is a symbol of good taste wherever distinguished people gather. When you serve superb Cresta Blanca California wines, you pay guests the truest compliment a host can offer. Distinguish your dinner table by serving Cresta Blanca Burgundy or Cresta Blanca Sauterne, yours to enjoy for gracious dining. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you Gloria Swanson as star in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. 
presented by Roma. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines for your everyday pleasure. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California bring you Gloria Swanson in Murder by the Book, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear for Suspense. I must have been asleep. At first, I thought it was one of those dreams. And then I realized the phone was really ringing. I seemed to remember. It had rung before, and I hadn't answered it. But maybe it had been only this once, ringing a long time. Because just as I got there, it stopped. Hello? Hello? I suppose I'd had one of my spells. I never could remember very well just after them. But I know I'd been working or trying to. It was my latest, and I thought it would be my best. It was about a woman who kills her husband. But I'd had all kinds of trouble with the end. Everything was all right up until the explanation, how she did it. I knew, of course, but somehow I just couldn't write it. It, it wouldn't gel. It had been going on like that for some weeks. Then today, I, I must have had another spell. I'd been having them ever since the accident. Ever since Ned was drowned. They'd begin with headaches. It would get worse and worse, and I'd lie down. And when I'd wake up, I wouldn't remember for a while. Sometimes when I woke up, I wouldn't even be in the same place. Instead of lying on the couch or on my bed, I'd, I'd be sitting up in a chair or at my typewriter. Once I even found myself sitting in a car out in the garage. It was a strain of everything, of course. That's why I'd started going to Dr. Winter. And now it seemed as though my poor nerves were fated. One shock after another. Because now, Dr. Winter was dead. You see, he'd been murdered. Yes? Emily? Yes? Uh, this is Harry, Harry Bailey. Where have you been? Why, I've been right here, Harry. Well, why don't you answer your phone? I've been trying to get you all afternoon. Oh, I, I must have been asleep. Oh, well, how's the book coming? Oh, not very well, I'm afraid, Harry. Still stale, huh? I guess so. I'm awfully sorry, Harry. I, I know I promised it to you weeks ago, but... Oh, forget it. Those things happen. Listen, Emily, I've got a great little proposition for you. It'll make you some money, it'll get your mind off the book for a while, and it'll be a, worth a million dollars worth of publicity for us. <laughs> oh, what's the catch? Well, I was talking to young Hayes. He practically runs the old man's newspaper chain for him now, you know. And he wants you to cover the winter case for the whole syndicate. Oh, Now, uh... wait a minute, before you make any snap judgments. In all the time I've been your publisher, I've never given you a bump steer yet, have I? But... Harry, I'm not a reporter. That's just it. You write it from your point of view. The way it looks to the country's foremost woman detective story writer. The clues, the evidence, how it all fits together. Truth is stranger than fiction and so on. You see what I mean? Well, oh, I don't know. You see, I was as... I was a patient of his, Harry. All right, all the better. Famous man murdered in small resort town. Just so happens famous woman mystery writer lived in same small town. Even was murdered man's patient. <laughs> Knows everybody by their first names. And so forth and so on. Emily, this will put your name in headlines in every city in the country. I know. That's the trouble. Oh, you see, well, what will Cora say? Well, why? What's it to Cora? Well... I'll grant you she may have had a slightly exaggerated idea of his importance, but after all, she was his man Friday for the past year. And now to have her own mother, mm, stepmother anyway, writing it all up in the papers and making capital out of it, oh, I... don't be silly, Emily. Somebody's got to write it. And you'll do it with sympathy and honesty and understanding. Well, it's the greatest thing that could happen as far as getting a, a fair break in the papers is concerned. And it's a chance in a lifetime for you, Emily, no kidding. Oh, I'd like to. Uh, as I say... Mm. All right, Harry, I'll do it. Had a girl. Now, listen, I'll have Hayes draw up the contracts right away. Anything you say, Harry. Well, I'll be in touch. Right now. Good night, Harry. Hello, Mother. Hello, darling. Who was that? Harry Bailey. He wants me to cover the winter case for the Hayes syndicate. He what? I told him I would. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother, how could you? Why not, Cora? Because... 
Because it's bad enough that he's dead without dragging it through the papers all over again. But it will be in the papers anyway, darling. And as Harry says, it, at least I can give it sympathy and understanding. Sympathy and understanding. My Cora. Please, Mother, please don't do it. Stay out of it. We'll only get more heartaches out of it, that's all. Why, Cora? Why, you almost sound as though you were afraid. Are you afraid of anything? Afraid? All right, then maybe I am. Maybe that's just what I am. Afraid. I had never really understood Cora. She was Ned's child, not mine. I was only her stepmother. Not that we weren't the best of friends, but she'd always been a little strange. More like a mother, I imagine. And then the shock of losing Ned, and, and this on top of it. There were times when she seemed almost in a daze. It was hard to blame her. The next day, Harry phoned to say the contracts were all in order, and I was to report to a Lieutenant Hahn of a homicide bureau who would permit me to interview the girl they were holding for the murder, and in general, act as my guide, philosopher, and friend. But upon appearing at his office, I found a gentleman with his hat on his head and his feet on his desk who didn't bother to remove either and uh, merely stared at me. Something? I'm Emily uh, Carlyle. Uh, I was told to report to you. You're Lieutenant Hahn? Uh-huh. I was told that you w would sort of uh, show me the ropes. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. I deduce from your attitude that you are not particularly pleased by the prospect. I cannot tell a lie. You deduce right. Well, isn't this nice? We're not going to get along. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Miss Carlyle, or is it, Mrs.? Miss, my married name is uh, Wales. I was married to Ned Wales, you know. Ah. Uh -huh. Suppose we clear the air a little, Lieutenant. I take it the barrier between us is the old one of professional versus amateur, dealer in fact versus dealer in fiction, and uh, you disapprove of uh, fiction? No, I got nothing against detective stories or detective story writers. I even read them myself once in a while for laughs. Well, that is encouraging. Uh, what? To find that you can not only read, but laugh. <laughs> okay. Then uh, just what is the difficulty, Lieutenant? I don't like to see people tried in the newspapers. I have no intention of trying this girl. Uh, what's her name? Claire Ogilvy. I have no intention of trying her. All I want to do is present the facts. Tell the story. Uh -huh. Well, I guess you want to see her, don't you? Among other things, yes. Unless, of course, you have something better to do. Oh, no, no. You're in my assignment from now on. I'm in the doghouse. Well, I can think of uh, less appropriate places. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Why? Uh, this is a big case. National sensation, special prosecutors, hullabaloo in the papers, special feature writers like you. Yeah? And I'm in a minority of one around here, so nobody likes me. Stop being cryptic, Lieutenant. Uh, what are you driving at? you got a big thing on their hands, and they want a conviction. I don't agree. About what? About the girl. You see, uh, I think she's innocent. <laughs> interesting. The girl was even more interesting. She was about 25, a pretty girl, and she was lying on her bunk in the cell, staring up at the one dim light in the ceiling. She didn't even look around when I came in. This is Miss Emily Carlyle, the writer, Claire. She wants to talk to you. Uh, I'll be back after a while, Miss Carlyle. Go away. Leave me alone. I can't, Clara. I have a job to do. That makes you different, I suppose. No, but I still have a job to do. That's what they all say. They've got a job to do on me. Who's trying to do a job on you, Claire? A lot of smart people who make their living at it, like you. You mean that uh, they're trying to say that you killed him and uh, you didn't? I loved him, you fool. Why would I kill him? Why would I kill him? Why did you confess to killing him? He was dead, wasn't he? What difference did it make? That's what they wanted me to say. So what difference did it make? Then you didn't kill him. All right. I killed him. That's what you want me to say, too. All right, I killed him. I don't want you to say anything, dear. I just want to know what happened. He was killed. Murdered. That's what happened. They, uh, they say you quarreled with him. I dug my nails into him. I wanted to hurt him. There was blood on my dress, and so I burned it, and they found that. Then when I heard what had happened, I ran away, and they found me. Oh, they've got everything fixed just fine. I had a job to do, that's all, and they did it. 
And the sooner they get it over with, the better. And then everybody will be happy. Maybe even me. Why did you quarrel with him? Have you ever been in love with some man and then one fine day you found out you were just the last of a long list of other women? Have you? Have you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I, I have. Oh. Well, then you know why I quarreled with him. Yes. All right, then, and I'll tell you something else, too. I didn't kill him, but now I wish I had. Do you hear me? I wish I had! <laughs> I suppose she told you she killed him and you believed it. First she sh said she had killed him, and then she said she hadn't. You didn't answer the second part. She indicated you have certain evidence. Okay. Come in here. The, uh, DA's got the original sample, but pictures should give you a rough idea. Oh, uh, what's that? Piece of a dress that was found under the bed. They match it to the dress she burned, oh, more or less. Uh, and, uh, uh, what's that plaster thing? Cast of tire marks. Did you read Dick Tracy? Oh, I've used plaster casts of tire marks myself in my books. But, uh, uh, you know, they, they look a little vague. They are. Uh, you know something, Lieutenant? I'm inclined to agree with you. About what? About the girl. I think she is innocent. Oh, so you can write it from the whodunit angle, huh? Less asperity, Lieutenant, if you please, and a little more attention to detail. Uh, by the way... Why is everyone so anxious to believe this particular girl did it? Because they think they can make it stick. Why look further? Because it's good for them. They make their reputations that way, just like your boss makes circulation. Let's face it. You and I know that what Dr. Winter was like. There must be a dozen girls in this town who have just as much reason for killing him as this one. That's what I said. As for the confession, she's obviously an hysteric. Any good alienist could break that down. Oh, I said that too. And as for this stuff, I don't know much about tires, but... This dress pattern is as common as a cotton handkerchief. There must be 50 of them within a mile of where we're standing right now. Same goes for the tires. I've told them all that. Then there must be something wrong with your methods, Lieutenant. Now, what do we deduce from all this? I'll tell you what I deduce. What? As a woman who's killed a man in this town, a murderess. A murderess that's still on the loose. <laughs> For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Gloria Swanson in Murder by the Book. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better-tasting wines from the world's largest reserves of fine wines. Vacation time is in full swing, and that means more time for baseball, tennis, golf, fishing, gardening. Whatever form of recreation you choose, here's a delightful way to cool off and refresh yourself. Just serve a tall, cool Roma wine and soda. Half-filled glasses with robust Roma California Burgundy, delicate Roma Sauterne, or any Roma wine. Fill up with ice and soda, sweeten to taste, then sip and be surprised. You'll agree with everybody that refreshingly delicious Roma wine and soda really is a treat that beats the heat. Treat your family to Roma wine and soda tomorrow. Serve Roma wine and soda whenever guests drop in and all summer long. And for better taste, be sure you use America's favorite wine, Roma wine. R-O-M-A, Roma wine. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our New York soundstage Gloria Swanson as Emily Carlyle in Murder by the Book, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. At first, I was quite excited about the whole thing, about covering a murder case, I mean. It was good for me. It took my mind off myself, the book I should have been finishing and couldn't. And uh, poor Ned being drowned last summer. That had been more of a strain than even I realized. I knew that now. Not that I wasn't terribly fond of Ned, but we hadn't been as close as we once were. But it had been a shock. That's why I'd been going to Dr. Winter myself. It as much as told me that the spells I had were, were a direct result of what happened to Ned. 
Oh, it shows you how tiny and yet how strange our little world can be here. Here I was, writing up the case of Dr. Winter's murder for the newspapers. Of course, right away I discovered that the evidence against the girl they were holding was all circumstantial. And Lieutenant Hahn got me prints of the pictures. The piece from the dress they said she was wearing and the, and the tire marks. And uh, I, I went out to do a little checking of my own. First, I went to Gorman's department store. Actually, it's the only real store for women's things in town. Well, 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 Miss Carlyle, long time no see, eh? <laughs> uh, what can I do for you? I was wondering if uh, you could identify a dress for me, a certain dress. A dress? Why, sure, what kind of a dress you have in mind? No, I don't want to buy one. I just want to find out about one, a, a particular dress, this dress that this picture was taken of. That's only a piece of it, of course. Oh. Oh. Oh, that? Yes. You've uh, sold quite a few of them, uh, haven't you? Uh, 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 say, I hear you're going to write up this winter case for the papers. Is that right, Miss Carlyle? Why, yes, I am. As a matter of fact, this dress... Uh, oh, I, I know this dress, all right. We had them last spring. Sold like hotcakes. Four dozen of them. Uh, did you keep any record of uh, who, so who you sold them to? Could I get a list? No, uh, no. Uh, no complete record. Mostly cash sales, you know. Made up a partial list, that's all, a partial list. Well, that's what I want. That's better than nothing. Going into competition with the police department now, huh? <laughs> no, I'm trying to help them, Mr. Gorman. Uh, if you'll give me... You'd better see them about that yourself, then. Lieutenant Hahn. Gave him the list three weeks ago. You'd better see him. Oh, I didn't know he had one. He never told me. The cops don't always tell everything they know, eh? <laughs> uh, you go see Lieutenant Hahn. He's the man you want to see, Lieutenant Hahn. I felt a little silly. Why hadn't he told me? But then, of course, I had never asked him. My next stop was Morton's big service station on the corner of North and Main. They did practically all the tire business in town. How do, Miss Carlyle? Fill it up? Why, uh, yes, uh, I guess so. Oh, uh, but I wanted to ask you something. Sure, Miss Carlyle, what is it? Well, uh, you see this thing? Mm -hmm. It's the imprint of an auto tire, and I wonder... Oh, from the winter case, huh? The cops was already in here. I heard you was working on the case, Miss Carlyle. Mm, in a way. And I was trying to find out about this tire, I mean... Well, that uh, tire, ma'am, that's a 616 Goodstone. It's pretty new, too. You can see from this middle tread here, you see. I don't see how anybody could prove much by this here. Uh, do you sell many of these? Uh, what did you call them? 616 good stuff. Oh, yeah, plenty. That's what I mean. I don't see how you could prove much without that tire. You find them on all kind of cars. I know, but... Look uh, here, you got them on your own car, Miss Carlisle. Same kind, 616 Goodstone. Almost new, too. You see what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I see. Yeah, plenty of them kind of tires around. Hey, you want that tank of gas now, Miss Carlisle? No. No, thank you. Never mind. It's funny how you never notice things like tires, if you're a woman anyway. They did always handle things like that, and then afterwards, Cora had done it. Cora. <laughs> and of course, as the boy had said, there were hundreds of tires like it. Hundreds. Cora wasn't home yet, and I wandered around the house and tried to think, but I didn't get very far. I was afraid one of my headaches was coming on. I decided to try and write my first article. But when I sat down at the typewriter, I remembered I hadn't put the cover over it the last time, and it was all dusty. I went to the room closet and rummaged around in the basket we keep there for old rags. I just started to dust off the typewriter. When I noticed it, the rag I held in my hand. It wasn't just an ordinary rag. It was a piece of a dress. And it wasn't just an ordinary dress. It had a cute little red and white print pattern. The kind of a dress the police said was worn by the woman who had murdered Dr. Winter. It was then I heard Cora coming in. Instinctively, I thrust the rag that was in my hand into the desk. Mother, are you home? Oh, hello, darling. Been shopping? Oh, just a few odds and ends. What have you been doing? Oh, a little of this little of that. Mm. Um, Cora, what about the car? Won't we uh, be needing new tires pretty soon? Well, no, I had new ones put on all around only a little while ago. You remember? Uh, I'd forgotten. When was that? Oh, six weeks ago, anyway. 
Then it was before? Before what? The, the murder. Will you stop it? Do you have to go through with this thing, Mother? I think it's better for me to write it than some stranger, don't you? If you wish. But it's so different from what happens in stories. For instance, I can't even remember what we were doing the night. The night it happened. Can you? We were home. Are you sure? Don't you remember? It's... Isn't it silly? You had one of your headaches. I was in my room. You were in yours. Then I was asleep all evening. I suppose you were. But you don't know. You weren't with me. What a pity. I'll no. start supper. Oh, Cora. Yes? Whatever happened to that old print dress? It was yours, I think. What print dress? You know, with a red and white flowered print. You did have one like that, didn't you? I haven't seen it for quite a while. But it couldn't have just disappeared. The last time I saw it, you had it. And then I don't know what happened to it. I had it? Don't you remember? No. Would, uh... Would this be it, Cora? Oh. So this has all been a cross-examination, has it? There were certain things I had to know, Cora. Well, I won't stand for it, do you hear? You can do anything you like about yourself, but I won't let you drag me into it. I won't. You were in love with him, too, weren't you, Cora? <laughs> yes. Yes, now are you satisfied? Yes, I was in love with him. I was in love with him. When I woke up, the sun was shining, and I was lying on the bed in Cora's room, and Cora was gone. I made some coffee, and then I went down to see Lieutenant Hahn. What's the matter, Miss Carlyle? You look sort of played out. Uh... I had rather a restless night. I, I've been thinking about this thing, Lieutenant. Uh, I've, uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. Been doing a little checking up, I hear. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, why didn't you tell me you had that list about the dresses? Was it uh, because you knew that someone in my house had bought one of those dresses? You're speaking of your stepdaughter, Cora Wales. Yes. We did know it, of course, but we knew the same thing about a couple of dozen other women. It didn't make much difference. Oh, Got any new ideas? Look, Lieutenant, I've been writing a new book, or trying to, about a murder. A woman who kills her husband. I didn't know how to finish it. But now, look, it's all sort of mixed up in my mind, but you know the old theory about a murderer will always return to the scene of the crime? I don't get it. I know. Uh, put it this way. If someone killed because the person they killed knew something... They'd have to kill anyone else who knew that same thing now, wouldn't they? You still going on the theory the Ogilvy girl's innocent? I know she's innocent. You know? Well, that's pretty strong talk, Miss Carlyle. Well, call it woman's intuition. Call it whatever you like. I just know that there's someone... Look, Miss Carlyle. Maybe I had you wrong yesterday. I can see you're not kidding about this thing. Not that I pretend to know what you're talking about, but if you've really got something, you better tell Papa. No, no, you, I can't. You say you think somebody's going to come back to the scene of the crime. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I think. I, I just know that... Um... Look, Miss Carlisle, I don't like it. You're upset and you're frightened. No. I, I want to help you. No, no, I, I have to, uh, to do this my own way. Do what? I don't know. Well, I can't very well use a rubber hose to get it out of you. But I just want you to remember that whatever I do, it's part of my job. What? What's part of your job? To see that nobody else gets killed around here. Including you. I could feel the headache coming on as I left his office. I almost ran to my car. All I could think of was that I had to get home before it happened. But it was coming over me awfully fast. Faster than it ever had before. The house was empty. I threw myself on the couch and pressed my hands over my eyes. The pain was horrible. Horrible. And then suddenly I had the feeling that I wasn't alone. That someone was standing there, standing over me. Someone I couldn't see. Someone who was crushing my brain, squeezing my temples in a kind of terrible, invisible vice. Someone who was trying to kill me. I was having a dream. Another of those horrible dreams. I was dreaming that I'd gone upstairs to Cora's room and she was there packing her things. She didn't see me or hear me. And I crept into the room very softly. 
It seemed as though I had a heavy poker or something in my hand. I crept up very softly behind her. I raised the poker, and then she whirled around. She saw me. You knew it wasn't an accident, didn't you? You knew he didn't just drown. You knew I killed your father. I pushed him. And I went to and when I went to Dr. Winter, he found out too. Something buried in my subconscious, he said. And he made me tell him. He told you all that, didn't he? So now I'm gonna to have to kill you too, Cora. I'm gonna to have to kill you! Miss Carlyle, all right. You better come along now. I hear the doctors keep talking about schizophrenia. That's a double personality, you know. They seem to think I did all those things without even knowing it. Drowning Ned. Trying to kill Cora. That's what the spells were, they say. The other personality, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But I wish I could talk to Dr. Winter. I went to him first about the spells. He said he could cure me if I told him the truth. Only, of course, I can't talk to him now. He's dead. I killed him. In just a moment, we will hear from Gloria Swanson, tonight's star of Suspense. Presented by Roma, that's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Yes, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. That's because Roma Wines taste better. Taste better because Roma selects and presses only the choicest California grapes. Then these natural juices are guided unhurriedly by Roma Master Vintners and winemaking resources unmatched in America to full taste richness. These Roma wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before. And from these, the world's greatest wine reserves, Roma later selects for your pleasure. Treat your family and guests to the better taste of Roma California wines. For everyday use or for friendly entertaining, serve Amber Roma Sherry, Ruby Roma Port or Golden Roma Muscatel. Roma adds so much to your pleasure, and yet now costs so little, that you'll want to keep a supply of better-tasting Roma wines on hand. Remember to ask for Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. This is Gloria Swanson. It was a great pleasure to appear on tonight's broadcast of Suspense. Next week, Suspense will originate from Hollywood, when Roma Wines will bring you Vincent Price. Good night. Tonight's suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Vincent Price as star of Suspense, produced for Shenley by William Spear. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The story is Turnabout, written for Suspense by J. Bennett. The thing was done, consummated. Sleep was now death. And nothing had marked the transition. Not a scream, not a gasp, nothing. Nothing but the dull thud the gun butt had made when it came down once, twice, three times. And then Walter Carlton went out of the night-filled room as silently as he'd come in and went home. Oh, it's you, sir. Yes, Robert. Do you enjoy the concert, sir? Very much, Robert. Make me a cocktail like a good fellow. Bring me a magazine. Yes, Mr. Carlton. 
He sipped his cocktail and lazily turned the pages of Esquire. Stopped at a Hemingway story, read it, and liked it. Turned a few more pages, then looked up and said, Oh, Robert. Yes, Mr. Carlton? Pack my bags for me, will you? I'm uh, going on a trip in the morning. Oh, will you be away long, sir? That all depends, Robert. That all depends. <laughs> In the morning, he said goodbye to Robert at Grand Central Station, then boarded the train and got off at the very first stop. Went back to Grand Central Station, got into a phone booth and called up Martin Ross, the district attorney. It's good to hear from you, Walter. I've been rather busy, Martin. You know how the stock market's been lately. How about you? Oh, pretty quiet until early this morning. Yes? Police found some down and outer in a furnished room on the west side. It skull bashed in. Oh, that's too bad. Martin, I, I feel that I've been neglecting my friends. So, I'm inviting myself over for dinner tonight. Why, certainly, Walter. We'd be glad to have you. Good. And have Emily trot out that roast duck and wine sauce recipes of hers, huh? Otherwise, I don't come. <laughs> You'll have your roast duck. Good. Be here at seven, Walter. At seven, Martin. Walter, you certainly can spin yarn. Just look at Billy. His eyes are popping out. Now, Billy, it's time you went to bed, dear. But, Mother, it's just... Now, we let you stay up two extra hours, son. Oh, all right. Good night. Good night, Mr. Carlton. Oh, Billy. Yes? Yeah? Why don't you call me Walter? Uncle Walter, hmm? I think it's time you did. Can I? <laughs> of course. Gosh! Good night, Uncle Walter. Good night, Billy. Oh, this is ideal. Rustic seclusion and yet a mere 40 miles from the city. Ideal. Yes, it is. I've always wanted this sort of life. Gets a bit inconvenient, though, when a case pops up and I have to be in town a lot. Mm, yes, that rooming house murder. How are you progressing? Well, I... <laughs> Emily doesn't like to hear about such things. Oh, I understand. Tell me anyway. What? Now, Walter. How are you progressing? <laughs> Why are you so interested in this case? Because I am the murderer. The murderer? Oh, Walter. Oh, 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 Walter. <laughs> You're a car. Meow. <laughs> what are you doing with that cat? Meow. Walter. A gun. Walter, where did you get a gun? Walter, what are you... Going? Martin, wasn't this the way that Todd Blake was killed? Something blunt and hard brought down with force on the... I think now you believe that I murdered Blake. I'll be going up to bed now. And uh, perhaps I should tell you that I'm sharing Billy's room tonight. What? Mm -hmm. The door will be barricaded. And the slightest effort on anyone's part to get in will... Well, I'll leave it to your imagination. Oh, you, you... You wouldn't... Martin, no. Martin, the first killing is the hardest. Let me assure you that the transition from cat to child is a very simple one to make. See you in the morning. I, I can't eat, Martin. Oh, I... you've got to, Emily. He mustn't suspect. Here they come. Good morning, Martin. Emily? Good morning, Billy. Gee, but I'm hungry. Like a man-eating lion, huh, Billy? <laughs> Here, you sit next to me, huh? But I always sit next to... Can I, Mother? Sure you can, Billy. Can't he, Emily? Uh, yes. Over here, Billy. Or I can keep a good eye on you. In case there are any tigers about. Billy, eat your food. Yes, Mother. Oh, Billy? Yes? Billy, I'll bet my eggs are better than yours. Now, Emily, they're made exactly as I always eat them. You're a great hostess. Billy, how about tasting them for me? Walter, you're not going here to... Here you are, Billy. Take the spoon, partner. Sure, Uncle Walter. Now eat. Billy, no! Mother, you hit the spoon from my mouth. Why? Yes, Emily. Why? It's 9.30, Martin. Aren't you going to your office? No. I think you'd better. I want you to go through your daily routine as though I were not here. I'm not leaving my wife and child alone with you. Do what you want with me, but I'm not going. Get into your coat, Martin. 
Emily or Billy will be in this house at all times. And the first bad move you make will be their last. How long do you think you can get away with this? Until justice is done. Justice. Until the murderer is brought to the bar of justice and made to pay the supreme penalty. What are you talking about, anyway? You'll be enlightened in due time. Now, get to your office. And be sure you remember what I said about bad moves. <laughs> Is it, Cobb? I just got something on the Blake case. We've been pumping sweats in the janitor. He's the one who discovered the body. So? Well, this Blake wasn't too nice a guy. He and Swenson didn't get along. We almost got into a fist fight one day, and then... Hey, you're not even listening to me. I'm listening. Well, Chief, I think you should hold Swenson for more questioning. Let him go. Now, Chief, let me spell this out for you. Swenson is the one who finds Blake dead. He says he went up to ask about the rent. Well, it's pretty convenient that rent day fell on that morning, isn't it? Yes, convenient. Yeah. Claims he knocked on the door, got no answer, so he takes out his pass key and goes in. Story smells too pat for me. He thought of everything. What'd you say? Oh, nothing. No. Let Swenson go. Oh, but chief, we ought... Oh, okay. You're the boss. happened, Uncle Walter? Well, and then the Maharaja said, Sahib, it is time for little boys to go upstairs to bed. Aww. <laughs> go ahead. I'll be up later and we'll build the fort again. You promise? Promise. Now, say good night to Mother and Dad. Good night, Mother. Good night, Billy. Good night, Dad. Good night. Martin, do you know that Emily hates me? Tell him, Emily. Why don't you let him alone? Walter. What happened? Emily thought she'd become brave. Tried to dash a cup of tea into my face, hoping that would give her a chance to grab my gun from my shoulder holster. Emily! Stop it, Walter. Unfortunately, I was too quick for her. I sent Billy out of the house on an errand and took the hot tea kettle and... You... That's why she's wearing a long sleeve dress, Martin. What? Roll up your sleeve, Emily, and show him your arm. Oh, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. No, no, Emily, Martin. Emily, let me go. Emily, let me go. No, it's no use, Martin. It's no use, I tell you. I think you'd better listen to her. It really is no use. In just a moment, we will return for the concluding act of... Suspense. Welcome, recording star Mel Torme. It's terrible trying to sing with a bad cold. So I always take four-way cold tablets to relieve cold miseries fast. Good idea. Tests of all the leading cold tablets proved four-way fastest acting. Four-way starts in minutes to relieve muscular pains, headache, reduce fever, calm, upset stomach, also overcomes irregularity. When you catch cold, try my way. Take four-way cold tablets. The fast way to relieve cold distress and feel better quickly. Four-way, only 29 cents. Our program will continue in a moment after a word about another fine product of Grove Laboratories. To get rid of embarrassing dandruff in three minutes, change to Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Three minutes with Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep unsightly dandruff away forever. Apply Fitch before wetting hair, rub in one minute. Add water, lather one minute, then rinse one minute. Every trace of dandruff goes down the drain. Three minutes with Fitch and embarrassing dandruff's gone. At the same time, Fitch can brighten hair up to 35%. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today. Martin, I'd like to speak to you. What do you want? You're disappointing me. What do you mean? By not bringing the murderer to justice... I'm getting impatient. You're the only murderer I can bring to justice. Mm, you're wrong. Swenson could be the man. Walter, I swear... It should be simple to steamroller a jury into a verdict. Build fact upon fact. Invent some. Should be simple for one so competent as you. Never. Never is a long time, Martin. Death is also a long time. 
I won't do it. Martin, listen to me. Uh, a number of years ago, before I met you, I had a wife. I was quite in love with her. Todd Blake wrecked my marriage. He was never any good. I swore then and there that when the time was ripe, I'd kill him. You? You waited all these years? Mm -hmm. Waited and planned every little detail. I'm not sending an innocent man to the chair. Then I advise you to pick up that phone and inform the police that I'm the murderer. What? But when they get here, they'll find Emily, Billy, and probably you quite dead. Don't you see, you fool, that if I'm to go, then I'll go pulling the house down with me? This is District Attorney Ross speaking. Have John Swenson picked up and booked for the murder of Todd Blake. You're doing very well, Martin. Extremely well. Why don't you let us alone? Ah, but I'm complimenting him, Emily. All the newspapers praise Martin's presentation of his case in court. Why must you go... Motive? A bitter personal grudge. Weapon? A hammer in Swenson's tool chest. Fact upon fact. Oh, excellent, excellent, oh, Martin. Stop it, stop it. Oh, I'm sorry, Martin. I was merely commending your legal ability to build fact upon fact. You know, there's a brilliant example of that in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Raskolnikov had a conscience. You're right. Therein, Dostoevsky's hero and I differ. Raskolnikov had a conscience. While I, the will to live. Therefore... John Swenson must die. The defendant will rise and approach the bar. John Swenson, after a trial by jury of your peers under due process of law, you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree and are hereby sentenced to die in the electric chair on midnight of February the 3rd in the year 1900. Hello, Martin. You're home early. Nothing much to do at the office. Of course. Now, uh, let me search you before you enter. Normal procedure, you know. <clears throat> Go ahead. Mm -hmm. well, you can come in now. Emily. What is it, Martin? He's gone up to sleep now. Yes? Emily, there's a gun in the driveway hedge. I hid it there before I came in this evening. Martin. I'm going out to get it. When he gets up in the morning, somehow or other, I'll kill him. Don't go out there, please. I'm not standing for any more. I'm getting that gun. No, no, Martin. He's too smart for this it. This time I'm smarter. He's upstairs with Billy. He won't even know I've gone out of the house. He'll know. Walter always knows. I'm taking that chance. I'm getting it. Please, Martin. Hello, Martin. Walter. Yes, Martin. Thought I'd come out for some air, so I opened the window quietly, not to disturb Billy's sleep, slid down the porch roof and into the garden. <laughs> I think I did it better than Douglas Fairbanks ever did in the movies, don't you? You've got the gun. I have. You fool. I watch every move you make. From the instant you step out of your car till you're in the house. Every day I do it. Take off your shirt. Oh, why? Then I'll rip it off. <laughs> now I have something prepared for you. A piece of rubber hose. Exactly. It doesn't tear or bruise the skin, but will do an effective job. Oh! You're a fool. You want things this way? Good. Get up. Come on, get up. That's it. Now, get on to the house. Go ahead. You feel as though your back and ribs are broken. It's hard to breathe. Did it pay, you fool? In a few more days, I'll be out of your life for good. All right, now get into the house. Get in. My, Martin! 
Oh, Everly. Everly. Oh, my darling. Take him upstairs. <laughs> Phone his office in the morning and tell them that the district attorney won't be in for a few days. He has a cold. Hello, Chief. It's good to see you back in the office again. Hello, Cobb. How's your cold? Better? Cold? Oh, yes, yes, it's better. Uh, you look all worn out. I'm all right. Is Swenson case getting you down? He gets the works tonight, you know. I said I'm all right. Oh, you can't fool me, Chief. Been with you long enough to know how you feel whenever you have to send somebody to the chair. You're too good a guy for this grind. <laughs> I'm a good guy, eh, Cobb? None better. Oh, uh, Swenson's mother's in town. What? Yeah, it seems she got wind of what's happening. She was up to visit Swenson. Yes? Been trying to see you, but I had the boy shoo her away. Nice little old lady, about 80 or so. Feel sorry for her. I don't want to see her. I don't want to. Sure, sure, Chief, I understand. Oh, you understand nothing. You... Oh, I'm sorry, Cobb. My nerves are shot. I'm going home. Take it easy, fellow, huh? Cobb. Hmm? I want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. I... <sighs> It's no use. Well, no, it's, it's nothing, Cobb. Are you expecting anybody, Martin? No. You, Emily? No. Answer it, Emily. Yes. And Emily, a few more hours and you'll be rid of me forever. Remember that. Yes. Tell me what the Maharaja said, Uncle Walter. Uh, of course, Billy. Now, when the Maharaja started speaking, I took out my gun, as I'm doing now. Walter. Merely telling the child a story, Martin. A story which may have a tragic ending. So, Billy, the Maharaja said to me, Sahib, I have never seen such shooting in my born days. Why, that tiger was a full mile away from you and... A yet... mile? Yes, that's right, Billy. I was riding along on my elephant, uh, Punda, when I saw, dim in the distance, the fierce form of the man-eating tiger. Gee! I unslung my rifle and started to adjust the sights when... Yes, Emily? It's Swenson's mother. What? What does she want, Emily? To speak to Martin. She won't go away. I won't talk with her. I don't want to see her. Of course you won't talk with her, Martin. The way you are tonight, your tongue's likely to go off like a half-cocked gun. She never saw you, so I'll substitute for you. I don't want to see her, I tell you. Relax, I... Martin. Just as soon as you know Swenson's beyond saving, you'll be yourself again. In time, you'll forget he ever lived. Where is she, Emily? In the living room. Come along. Uncle Walter, you didn't finish the story. I'll finish it, Billy. All right, Emily. Just let me look over your shoulder into the room. Mm -hmm. And now I'll holster my gun and we'll go in. And Mr. Ross? Yes. I'll just close the door, Mrs. Swenson, so we won't be disturbed. This is Mrs. Ross. Now, what can I do for you, madam? Mr. Ross, isn't there something you would do for my son? Mm, no, nothing, Mrs. Swenson. But he's a good man. He did no wrong. Well, that he's good, I have no doubt at all, but he made a mistake. Surely, madam, one must pay for one's mistakes. But he is a good man. He did no wrong. To kill is wrong. The Bible tells you that. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He's a good man. He did not kill. But the law says that he did. You threw sand into the eyes of the law. My son did not kill. I only followed the truth, madam. You can save my son. I can't. Believe me, if I could, nothing would stand in my way. Then it's... No use. Go back to the city, madam. May you find comfort for your grief. I walk the road from the station with little hope. I'll go back on it with no hope. Time will heal. It always does. Time will not heal me. I'll go down to the grave with my sorrow. Oh, please, Mrs. Swenson. I'll, I'll wipe my tears away and go. Oh, I can't find my handkerchief in my pocketbook. The tears blind my eyes. Here, let me help you. 
But I find this in my pocketbook. Put down that gun. An eye for an eye. Put it down. I'm not Ross. I'm not... Mrs. Swenson, you, you killed him. An eye for an you eye. You know what you've done. Emily, Do you? Emily. She had a gun hidden oh. in her purse. Oh, Mrs. Swenson. Listen to me. You've saved your son. Do you hear? Oh, you don't know what you've done. You... Emily... I'm phoning the first. Yes. Yes, uh, Mrs. Swenson, everything's going to be all right now. You didn't kill the district attorney. You... Oh, Mrs. Swenson, my husband will see to it that... Uncle Walter! Uncle Walter! Billy. Billy, come away from him. Uncle Walter! Billy, he's dead. Please, child. Uncle Walter! Oh, you haven't finished the story. Suspense. You've been listening to Turnabout, written for Suspense by Jay Bennett. In a moment, the names of our players and a word about next week's story of Suspense. Are you all out of tune because you're irregular? Then help yourself get back in tune with Kellogg's All Brand. You'll feel right on pitch when Kellogg's All Brand goes gently to work, relieves constipation due to lack of bulk by supplying your system with bulk-forming whole bran. Yes, a daily bowl full of Kellogg's All Brand with milk helps put you right back in tune. The natural way. The good-tasting way, too. Fact is, Kellogg's All Brand is the one brand cereal that combines proved effectiveness with appetizing taste and crispness. It never gets mushy in milk. So remember, if constipation's a problem, gentle it away, as millions do, with Kellogg's All Brand. The good food way to keep regular as clockwork. A-double-L hyphen B-R-A-N. Kellogg's All Brand. At your grocer's. Heard in tonight's story were Leonard Stone as Walter Carlton, Melville Ruick as Martin Ross, and Ginger Jones as Emily Ross. Others heard in the cast were Peter Laser, Larry Haynes, Catherine Emmett, Neil Fitzgerald, and Raymond Edward Johnson. Listen again next week when we return with End of the Road, written for suspense by Alan Sloan from a story by Eliezer Lipsky. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. On CBS Radio. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Van Heflin in Murder of Aunt Delia, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Oh, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Wilcox. Well, Hap's sister-in-law. What brings you here? Well, I just stopped by to tell you Hap has a nasty cold and he can't get started. Cold? Started? Mm -hmm. Say, he should switch to Autolite resistor spark plugs. These white gap wonders get your car going faster in cold temperatures. Save gas, too, because they make your engine run smoother on leaner gas mixtures. Oh, well, Hap says he's not long for this world. <laughs> long? Auto light resistor spark plugs give him up to 200% longer electrode life. And Autolite's exclusive built-in 10,000 ohm resistor cuts down spark plug interference with radio and television, too. So tell him to see his neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer and have him install a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. He'll feel better because his car will run better. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Murder of Aunt Delia and with the performance of Van Heflin, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Ever stick out your thumb and pull out a million-dollar plum? 
Well, I'm the little Jack Horner that did that. Only my name isn't Horner, it's Dort Sharples. I was hitchhiking along Highway 70 across the Arizona desert, heading for L.A. It was August, and it was hot. The lizards were fanning themselves. There wasn't much traffic, and nobody had stopped. I'd walked about eight miles outside some little burg, and I was tired and sore. Finally, a black sedan came along. I was all set to holler cuss words at him for not stopping when suddenly he slowed down. It was a young guy about my age. He was alone. Hop in. Well, thanks. I... Well, I sure appreciate this. All right. I could use some company. For a second there, I... I didn't think you were going to stop. I wasn't, frankly. Well, a guy has to be kind of careful, I guess, huh? You know what changed my mind? <laughs> Maybe you won't like this, but... Well, it suddenly struck me that you look like me. Yeah? Yeah, I guess maybe I do at that, now that you mention it. I thought to myself, what if that was me walking along? Besides, if you've got a face like mine, it must be an honest face. <laughs> yeah, maybe you got something there. You going to Blythe? Now, where's that? Uh, the next town, across the Colorado. No, I'm going clear into L.A. Well, I happen to be going through there on my way to Santa Barbara. If you want to spell me at the wheel, we can make Los Angeles by a little after midnight. Brother, you got yourself a co-pilot. <laughs> By the time we crossed the river into California, I'd learned that the guy's name was Glendon Braley, that he was going to visit his invalid aunt. This aunt didn't own all of Santa Barbara, not quite. The guy didn't volunteer this information. I had to probe it out of him. Between Blythe and Desert Center, an idea began to percolate. And not just from the heat, either. I'll bet your aunt will be glad to see you, Braley. How long did you say it's been? Well, I was ten when I left... That'd make it 17 years. You see, my mother died when I was three, and Aunt Deja took me in. Ah, oh, does she know you're coming? I sent her a wire. Ah, uh, you think she'll recognize you? I doubt it. The reason I'm going back, her husband died about a month ago. He and I never got along. That's why I left Aunt Deja's place. You mean you ran off? No, uh, another aunt in Delaware took me. And then, what with school, and then the army, and getting a job afterwards? Well, I, I just lost track of Aunt Deja. Ah, uh, hey, you got a lot of relatives in the East? No. My other aunt died when I was 21. DJ is the only relative I've got left. Well, I guess that means you're coming to something pretty good someday. Yeah, huh? I suppose so. It's funny, but the idea sort of scares me. Oh, boy, I wish somebody scared me like that. <laughs> I kept pumping him until I could have written his autobiography. Yes, I mean autobiography. I stored away facts about this uncle that he hated, about how Braley used to like to draw pictures when he was a kid, about how he got his only spanking when he was eight for spilling ink on his aunt's favorite tapestry, how he couldn't eat peas, how he got sick on enchiladas at the Santa Barbara Fiesta in 1929, everything. Could I remember it? <laughs> People used to tell me with my memory I, I could have been a lawyer. But that takes work. Just east of Indio, before Highway 70 runs into 99, I figured that I was thoroughly briefed. Want me to drive a while, Sharples? No, thanks, unless you want to take over. No, technically, maybe I shouldn't be driving at all. Oh, I've got one of these mail-order driver's licenses, but I doubt if I can pass the California test. You see, Hey, I you have... know something funny? Huh? I think we're getting a flat. Oh, rats. Yeah, the car ride's kind of funny. I, I think it's the left rear tire. Oh, this would have to happen clear out in the middle of nowhere. We better stop and take a look, huh? I don't even know if the spare's any good. Of course, I may be imagining things, but we better make sure. I'll check it. Well, there's not a soul in sight either way. Oh, well, we won't need any help. I hope not. How is it? Maybe you better come and look. Okay. Say, come to think of it, there may not be any tools in the car. I bought it in a hurry off a used car lot. I've got all the tools that I'll need, really. All right. It doesn't look flat to me. No? Look close. Well, it still doesn't <laughs> see... I was right about the tools, wasn't I, Braley? <laughs> I put the blackjack back in my pocket and I dragged Braley off the highway into a ditch. I made sure he was dead. Then I changed clothes with him and covered his body with sand and brush. I was back in the sedan and on my way and still no other car was in sight. 
I adjusted the rearview mirror so that I could see my reflection. I watched the lips move as my voice said, Dort Sharples? Never heard of him. My name's Glendon Braley. I pulled into L.A. about 2 a.m. I waited till morning, though, before I went to Rena Zita's apartment. I wanted her to be wide awake when I told her my idea. That dart, it sounds crazy and dangerous. Well, for a million bucks, we can afford to be crazy. Suppose Emily finds out that you aren't this guy. Who knows? His aunt hasn't seen him since he was a kid. There are no other relatives, no connections on the coast, or back east for that matter. But I'm sure you can carry it off, Dorothy. Listen, Rena, I know everything about this guy, even when, he, even when he lost his first baby tooth. What do you want me to do? Just stay where I can get in touch with you. Be ready to come on up to Santa Barbara. How long will you have to wait to come into this money? The old lady may live for years. I don't think so. She's pretty well along. She's an invalid. You know, a lot of things can happen to an old lady. Well... No, no, it's a real break. I might have done it alone, kid, but I thought of you. It's real sweet of you, Dort. Real sweet. Then we're partners? Okay, Dart. Great, kid. But now look, you get in the habit of calling me Glendon Braley. <laughs> Kiss me. Glenn. It didn't take me long to cover the hundred miles to Santa Barbara. The reunion with Aunt Delia was quite touching. I sat on a low stool right by her wheelchair, drinking tea that her housekeeper, Mrs. Parker, kept pouring. And uh, we talked over old times. Oh, Glennie, it's so good to have you home again. Glennie. Nobody but you ever called me that. The kids always call me Glenn or Curly, mostly. <laughs> and how angry you used to get. You hated to be called Curly. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, when I got in a fight about that with... Uh, Pudge Mossman, you, you sent me to bed without any supper. <laughs> and uh, then you took away my paints and crayons for a whole week. Not a whole week, Lenny. I relented on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, I, it, it seemed like a week. <laughs> you did love to draw. Oh, uh, that must be Mr. Crittenden. Uh, Crittenden? Yes, uh, my attorney. He's been just wonderful to me since your uncle died. Handles all of my affairs. I've asked him to come up to meet you. Oh, I hope you don't mind. No, not at all, Andy. That's all right, Mr. Parker, don't bother. Come right in, Bryce. Hello, Delia. Ah, you look positively radiant. Oh. <laughs> well, well, well. Is this the prodigal nephew? Yes, Bryce. This is Glenny. Or should I say, Mr. Crittenden, my nephew, Glendon Brayley. How do you do, sir? How do you do? So, this is Glenny. <laughs> well, my boy, let me warn you that I know every infamous detail of your crime-ridden career. That is, up until the time you were ten years old. No, please. <laughs> I'm afraid, Annie, that Mr. Crittenden has a, a, a ipso facto case against him. <laughs> no, I, I offer this tapestry on the wall as Exhibit A. Look. Yeah? yeah? What do you mean? Well, now, if you'll examine it closely, you'll see traces of a stain. Annie, isn't that where I, I spill the ink in... Uh, well, let's see, it's uh, uh, about 1929, right? Why, Glenny, do you remember that? Well, I certainly do. You you spanked me with a hairbrush. <laughs> yeah, the accused has paid his debt to society. <laughs> Case dismissed. Oh, Glenny, that stain is worth more to me than the tapestry itself. Oh, now, Annie. Well, I think she means it, Glendon. Your arrival's already made her look ten years younger. Oh, how absolutely absurd. In fact, Delia, I think you could get up out of that chair this minute and trounce me soundly at a game of tennis. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any doubt about it. I was in. And Delia's health improved so rapidly that I realized I'd have to think of a way to speed things up. That meant that I had to get Mrs. Parker, the housekeeper, out of the house for good. So I began devising little things to make her appear inefficient. And he wasn't supposed to have spices, so I sneaked in the kitchen and doctored the food up with pepper. After Mrs. Parker set the heating unit for the night, I got up and turned it off. And he woke up freezing. And Mrs. Parker became so confused and upset that she began helping me out by forgetting things and making mistakes all her own. Then, one afternoon... Uh, Glenny, I know Mrs. Parker means well, but as Dr. Davis says, I got to have someone I can depend on at all times. Well, I haven't liked to say anything. After all, she's been with you for so long, but uh, 
Well, the, the poor old soul needs a rest. It's going to be difficult to tell her. Well, now, I'll attend to that, Auntie. And I'll, I'll see about getting another housekeeper, an intelligent, capable, younger woman. <laughs> Raina, this is me. Huh? You know, Mr. Braley. Oh, yes. How are you? Great. Now, listen, kid. I'm calling from Santa Barbara. Yeah? Get up here right away. Check in at the San Martin Hotel as Rena Derwin. Right. And, and wait there till I call you. We're in, baby. But good. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Mr. Van Heflin in Murder of Aunt Delia. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, Hop asked me to return this book to you. Your life story, he said. Oh, you mean Wilcox of Wide Gap? Mm -hmm. Ah, That's a great yarn. Uh, yarn. You'd like to hear one of the more electrifying episodes? Oh, sure. All right, listen. There it stood, a huge green monster. I'd been trailing it for weeks. Taking a wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plug from my pocket, I sprang forward. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Look, I cried out, you obstinate, obdurate auto, it's time you switch to these Autolite resistor spark plugs. You will idle smoother, run better on leaner gas mixtures, save gas. Another thing, your narrow-gap spark plugs have been messing up television reception around town. But with Wide Gap Auto Light Resistor Spark Plugs, you'll reduce to an acceptable level spark plug interference with radio and television. And what's more, Auto Light Resistor Spark Plugs, with that exclusive built in 10,000 ohm Auto Light Resistor, give you 200% longer electrode life. So get Wide Gap Auto Light Resistor Spark Plugs. Get them right now. Remember, you're always right with Auto Light. And now, Auto Light brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Van Heflin. In Murder of Aunt Delia, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. By the time Rena arrived in Santa Barbara, I had fixed up a set of references of her ability and character that would have flattered Florence Nightingale and Susan B. Anthony. Rena came out for an interview, pretending she was sent by an employment agency I was supposed to have called. She made a terrific impression on the old lady. At a nod from me, Addie hired Rena on the spot. And Mrs. Parker left with a cardboard suitcase, a month's pay, red eyes, and the sniffles. After we got Addie to bed that first night, Rena and I met out on the veranda. How was I? Dutch. Shh, that name. Nobody's around to hear. Well, don't take any chances. Call me Mr. Braley all the time. All right. Mr. Braley. How did I do? Perfect. Come on, let's walk out by the bluff and away from the house. Oh, this is sure some layout. Looks great in the moonlight. It'll all be ours, baby. You mean to plan to live here after it's all over? Oh, maybe for a little while. Depends on how long it takes me to convert her estate to cash. Uh, we can't do anything to excite suspicion, you know. No. No. Right up ahead there is a cliff. A 200-foot drop onto some rocks. You're going to... Push her? Oh, no, no, nothing as brutal as that. It's an accident. You take Aunt Delia out for an airing in her wheelchair. As you're pushing the chair, you trip and you fall. The chair starts rolling. You run after, but poor Auntie goes over the edge. You, you are hysterical with shock. Yeah? What's wrong with you taking Auntie for an airing? Look, if I could do it, what would be the point of you being here at all? Look, you're just an employee and brand new one. You have no reason on earth for croaking her for a dough. They just might get that idea if I was wheeling her, see? Yeah, I guess you're right. And, and, and that's why it's important for us not to have much to do with each other. It's going to be difficult, though. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Braley. No one can see us now, honey. Look, baby, now let's not form any habits that will be tough to break. Just one kiss? Please. Wait, I come on, stop that, you little... Ah, oh, baby. The next afternoon, Addie and I were in the library. 
I was trying to look interested in the scrapbook she was pouring through. I hoped she wouldn't notice how fidgety I was. My eyes are so weak now, Glennie, but I know every detail of these just from memory. <laughs> Here you are on your first tricycle. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Is I ever that small? It doesn't seem possible, does it? Oh, here's what I was looking for. The cow you drew when you were nine. Huh. You were quite the artist. Yeah, that's great. I was a surrealist or something. I colored it green. <laughs> green cow on purple grass. <laughs> it caused quite a sensation at your yeah, school. It's a wonder I wasn't expelled. Oh, Clement. I've always been just sick about this picture. One of the few of you and me together. You broke away from me just as the photographer took it. Yeah, I'm just a blur. Say, what's the cat doing in it? Well, don't you remember? That's Xerxes. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh Xerxes, they, they Persian. <laughs> Gee, the fun that he and I used to have together. Uh, of course, I, I used to tease him a lot when you weren't looking, but he sure was a... Uh, he, uh... <clears throat> what's the matter, Auntie? Lenny, are you trying to fool your old Auntie? What do you mean? You were frightened plumb out of your wits by cats. If Xerxes so much as brushed up against you, you'd scream bloody murder. That's why you jumped when the picture was taken. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I... I... You were that way when you first came here. Don't you remember? Poor old Dr. Thompson. He said it was a deep-seated phobia, and you'd probably have it all your life, like Napoleon. Did it go away, Glennie? This, uh... This fear of cats? Well, uh, most of it. Uh, you know, a guy sort of, uh, he doesn't like to remember what a coward he was when he was a kid. Maybe she was satisfied with that explanation, but I, I thought she watched me a lot closer after that with her dim old eyes. Rena and I couldn't put it off much longer. I might make a real break. That night, Rena and I... Set it up. I said, uh, tomorrow, right after breakfast. Oh. You'll come with me, won't you? No, honey, let me, it'll, it'll be better if I'm not around. But you don't have to be right there. Just be where I can see you. I couldn't do it all alone. I don't know. All if... right, all right, but don't lose your nerve, kid. Now, don't lose your nerve. <laughs> I didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, Rena and I got the old lady in her wheelchair. There you are, Auntie. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lenny. My, but isn't it a lovely day? It certainly is, Mrs. Farnham. Perhaps I'd better have a scarf over my head. I'll run upstairs and get one. Would you mind, dear? Uh, hey, there, there are two scars uh, here on the sofa. Oh, and never mind, Miss Derwin. There's some down here. Oh, all right. Which one do you want, Eddie? The uh, green and red one or the uh, blue and yellow? Why, uh, oh, oh, it doesn't matter, Glennie, either one. Well, this one I think will go better with that robe you're wearing. Yes, so it will. Well, come on, let's go. Wait. I've, I've changed my mind. What? You mean about going out? Yes, yes, it, it's so much bother. Bother or nothing. You, you, you need some fresh air, I'll Andy. just sit here by the open window. Well, look, you, you need some sun. Come along, Miss Derwin. Please, Gandy. I, I don't want to go. I just want to stay here and rest. Please. Well, yeah, sure, Andy, okay, if you don't want to go... Addie finally calmed down, but she still had Rena put her to bed. Then she asked me to drive to town to get her some medicine that she was out of. I was hoping the old lady was coming down with something that would save Rena and me the trouble of that last wheelchair ride, but no. Next morning was cloudy and sultry. When I got downstairs, Rena already had the old girl out on the lawn in her wheelchair. She came over to me and whispered. She just wants to stay there, Dorian. No ride. Well, that's tough. She's going anyway. Come on, Rena. Suppose she makes a fuss. I think two of us can handle an old lady in a wheelchair. But if she screams. So what? This estate's as isolated as Alcatraz. Come on now. Let's get it over with. All right. It's starting to sprinkle. Now hurry up. Let's finish this before we get wet. Lenny, Miss Durbin, it's starting to rain. Yes, yes, we're coming, I Addie. I knew it would rain today. I knew it. Sure, sure. Well, here, here we go, Addie. You came just in time. I, I thought you'd forgotten me. Forget you, Addie? Well, don't be silly. Oh, my, it's starting to come down. Hurry or we'll be soaked. Lenny, the house is back that now way. Just relax, Annie. Rena, help me push her, will you? Sure. 
Come on, let's make this quick. Come on, faster. Glenny, what are you doing? Stop it. Not too fast. Glenny, do you hear? I'm frightened. Head her for the cliff. You're not my Glenny, are you? You're not my Glenny. Okay, Rena. Stop me. Let her go. It was done. I looked over the edge to make sure. She was dead, all right. I made Rena tear her hose and skin her knee, and I rubbed some dirt on the wound. It's raining hard now. As we got back to the house, I I heard a car swerving around the last turn on the grade. It pulled up the driveway by the porch, and a man got out. It was Crittenden. Rena. Yes? Get hysterical, Rena. And limp. Huh? Uh, Mr. Crittenden! Mr. Crittenden! (laughs) What are you doing out in the screen? Where's your auntie? Oh, something awful has happened. I was just going to phone to you. I tried to catch you. My, what's wrong? Well, my, my aunt is dead. Oh, Jesus. Yes, she is. No, Mrs. Oh, Derwin, stop fault. that. It's not your fault. Well, what's happening? Aunt Delia, ask Mrs. Derwin to, to wheel her out over there so she could admire the view. Is this rain? Well, no, it wasn't raining then. Mrs. Derwin tripped and the wheelchair coasted downhill. She oh. tried to catch up, but it, it plunged over the cliff with Annie. Oh, and, good Lord. And I, I, I just stepped out to tell Miss Derwin she'd better bring Annie into the house. And Miss Derwin tripped just oh, as... Call an there. ambulance. Maybe there's still a chance. <laughs> Crittenden ran down to peek over the cliff, and I went into the library and phoned the ambulance and the police, too, just to make it look good. I was downing a double shot of bourbon when the lawyer came in. Uh, That poor woman, at least she didn't suffer. Thank heavens for that. Uh, Use a drink? No, thank you. It's quite a shock. I'll I'll never forget that that scream when she... Don't torture yourself. This young woman, uh... What's her background? Miss Derwin? Why, an employment agency sent her out. Uh-huh, yes. I, uh... It wasn't carelessness on her part, Mr. Gritton, and it, it might have happened to anyone. If it hadn't been for the slope to the edge of that cliff, she'd have caught Auntie in time. I know Gentlemen, she would. Gentlemen, I've lost control of myself. I'm uh, sorry. Miss Derwin, this is uh, Mr. Crittenden, uh, Mrs. Farnham's uh, attorney. How do you do? Mrs. Farnham has spoken of you on the phone. Could I bring you gentlemen anything? No, nothing for me. Thank you, thank you. Why don't you sit down and relax? You've had quite a shock. Yes, sit down, Miss Derwin. Thank you. Well, seems to be nothing to do, but just wait. <laughs> I'm a fuss budget about these things, perhaps, but that bust of Shakespeare on the bookcase, isn't it in rather a precarious position? Well, I uh, never noticed it. Uh, right over your head there. <laughs> Makes me nervous. I'll, I'll just slide it back. Rather... Top heavy thing. Look out, door! What? Oh, my. Oh. That was close. Barely missed you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, no harm is done. Lucky you had the presence of mind to call out, Miss Dillon. What was it you called, Mr. Brayley? Why, I, I didn't call him anything. I just... Look out, to... Dort. It was what you said. Why did you call him Dort? Why, I... Well, it was just an exclamation. She saw the statue topple over. Well, and then called she... you by your real name. Hmm? Mr. Gritton, I'm afraid I don't quite see the reason for this, uh, this peculiar questioning. I'm sure that my poor aunt would resent your prying into the affairs I'm of the household. I'm afraid you're mistaken. This prying, as you call it, is made at your aunt's request. What do you mean? She telephoned me yesterday afternoon to tell me about a strange doubt... A suspicion. About what? About you. Me? Why should she, she have any... She was disturbed by the horrible feeling that you are an imposter. And he thought that I... Well, that, that's, that's absurd. Your recollections of your childhood here were quite convincing. Except for one or two things. Well, this is all very... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, my fear of cats. Well, people do get over childish phobias after all. It's that's more than that, bit... Sim. Remember a drawing she showed you? A watercolor of a cow? Sure, sure. The, the green cow. What about it? And the scarves. Remember you thought the blue and yellow would go better with her robe than the red and the green one? Well, so what? Doesn't it strike you as peculiar that a boy who could draw quite a fine cow should paint it green? And then years later, be so exacting 
about harmonizing his aunt's scarf. You see, Glendon Braley was colorblind. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Van Heflin. Well, Mr. Wilcox, before I go, do you suppose I could get Van Heflin's autograph? Why, well, I don't think he'd mind, would you, Van? Well, not at all. How would you like me to sign it, miss? Well, would you just write yours for A-L-R-S-P? A-L-R-S-P? Uh-huh. Autolite resistor spark plugs. How do I get mixed up with these commercial <laughs> characters? <laughs> well, she can't help it, Van. No one can help admiring those irreproachable, irrepressible, irrefragibly superior spark plugs that mean smoother engine idle, smoother performance on leaner gas mixtures actually save gas. Autolite resistor spark plugs are just one of the more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats made by Autolite in its 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, coils, distributors, generators, starting motors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz will be our stars. The play is called Red-Headed Woman. And it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Murder of Aunt Delia is an original play by Lou Houston. Van Heflin appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer... Producers of Battleground, starring Van Johnson, John Hodiak, Ricardo Montalban, and George Murphy. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Burt Lancaster, Mickey Rooney, and Ida Lupino. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stayful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.